The Saiyan Saga takes place five years after the events of the 23rd Tenkaichi Budokai. A farmer is outside handling chores when suddenly a massive object plummets from the sky at a distance. Pondering whether it's a meteor or a UFO, the farmer leaps into his truck to investigate. To his surprise, he discovers a small space pod at the heart of a giant crater. The space pod begins to unfold and an individual emerges. Ascending from the crater onto the grass right before the farmer, the stranger expresses irritation towards some someone named Kakarot for there still being inhabitants on planet Earth. Perplexed, the farmer wonders about the identity of this individual, and a device on the alien's eye emits a beep. Mocking the farmer for having a meager battle power of only five, the alien is amused. The alien moves toward the farmer, and in an attempt to defend himself, the farmer shoots his shotgun, but the alien effortlessly catches the bullet and hurls it back, hitting the farmer and killing him. The eye device beeps again, prompting the alien to notice a substantial power in the distance, leading him to fly toward it, suspecting it might be Kakarot. At the same time, Piccolo stands menacingly over a mountainous region and suddenly senses a formidable force approaching, initially thinking it might be Son Goku. However, Piccolo surprised to notice the stranger instead. Displeased that he didn't find Kakarot, the alien and Piccolo exchange words, with the alien checking his eye device, revealing Piccolo's battle power of 322. Despite Piccolo's objections, the alien confidently dismisses him as no match. In an angered response, Piccolo unleashes a devastating shockwave at the alien. However, when the smoke dissipates, the stranger remains unharmed, asserting that all Piccolo managed to do was create a show of dust. Piccolo stands in fear as the stranger readies himself to retaliate, but suddenly his eye device beeps again, detecting an even greater power level further away. Convinced that it must be Kakarot this time, the alien departs, leaving Piccolo astonished and unable to comprehend the situation. As he flies away, Away, the alien declares that Kakarot has lost sight of the pride of the strongest warriors in all the universe, the Saiyan race. At Kame House, Bulma cheerfully announces her arrival as she strolls in, showcasing her new, short, boyish haircut. Master Roshi, the turtle, and Krillin express their joy at her arrival, and Bulma reveals a special gift for Master Roshi. Playfully, he wonders if the gift involves feeling her up, prompting Bulma to punch him. Meanwhile, Goku is soaring toward Kame House on the flying Nimbus. At the same time, Krillin inquires about Yamcha and Bulma dismissively mentions him, exclaiming she doesn't care about him after what he did to her. She then changes topics and inquires about Launch, and Krillin informs her that she went off in pursuit of Tien five years ago. As Goku approaches Kame House, he communicates to someone on his lap where they are. Elsewhere, the alien remarks on Kakarot's swift movements. Back at Kame House, Goku dismounts the flying Nimbus while still holding someone in his hands and enthusiastically shouts to his friends in the house. House. Krillin recognizes Goku's voice, and nearby, the alien notes Kakarot's sudden stop and continues to pursue him. To everyone's surprise, Goku is holding a little boy in his arms. Bulma inquires about the child as she steps outside, and Krillin jokingly questions if Goku is taking up babysitting. However, Goku reveals that this little boy is his son. Everyone is taken aback as Goku places the child down. The boy is dressed in a stylish outfit with a hat adorned with the four-star ball. He politely greets everyone with a good afternoon noon and Bulma reciprocates. Goku reveals the boy's name is Son Gohan and Master Roshi notes that he's named after Goku's late grandfather. Bulma bends down to question Gohan on his age and he replies that he's four years old. Surprised by Gohan's good manners, Bulma then notices he has a tail reminiscent of Goku's past. Concerned, the group asks if anything peculiar happens on the night of a full moon, but Goku explains that they go to bed pretty early around his house and wonders about the inquiry, but Master Roshi brushes it off. Krillin wonders if Gohan is as strong as Goku, but Goku mentions that Chi Chi disapproves of training him. Chi Chi believes that since there's peace in the world, martial arts have become obsolete and it's time for studying. Bulma then inquires about the Dragon Ball on Gohan's hat, and Goku explains that it's his grandpa's memento, the four star ball. He also mentions having the three star ball and the six star ball at his house. Their conversation is interrupted though, as suddenly Goku becomes serious as he senses a formidable power approaching. Everyone else is oblivious, but Goku states that it's nothing like he's ever felt before. The alien then lands at Kame House, much to everyone's surprise. He recognizes Kakarot as the spitting image of his father, and questions why Kakarot hasn't eradicated all humans on the planet yet as he was supposed to. Krillin, thinking the stranger is drunk, approaches him rudely, but Goku warns him not to get too close. Unfortunately though, it's too late, and the alien smacks Krillin with his tail, sending him through Kame House. Goku turns to the stranger in anger 
bigger, but Guo surprised at the revelation of his tail wrapped around his waist like a belt. Goku panics about the tail, and the alien states that Kakarot has finally figured out who he is. However, Goku is confused, and the alien speculates that Kakarot must have suffered a severe head injury. Goku insists he's son Goku, and not whoever this Kakarot is, and the alien demands a straightforward answer about whether he was hit on the head or not. Goku vaguely recalls a head injury from his childhood, noting the scar, and Master Roshi mentions his conversation with Goku's grandfather, stating that long ago, son Gohan found a baby with a tail and a violent personality. He explains that one day, Gohan accidentally dropped the baby in a valley, causing a severe head injury. The baby nearly died, but miraculously survived. Subsequently, the violent personality disappeared, and the baby became an obedient, well-behaved boy. Goku realizes that he's that baby, leaving Bulma puzzled about the alien's connection to Goku. The stranger now realizes Kakarot has forgotten everything, and vows to find a way to resurface Goku's memories. As Krillin stands up and warns Goku about the stranger's strength, the stranger begins to explain that he and Kakarot are the same, as Kakarot is no earthling, but a Saiyan warrior, a member of the most powerful race in the universe. The stranger then declares himself as Raditz, Goku's older brother. This revelation surprises everyone, and Goku finds the notion absurd. Krillin then questions why Goku would be on Earth if he's an alien. Raditz then simplifies the situation, stating that Kakarot was sent to Earth to eliminate the humans obstructing the Saiyans' planetary conquest. He states that Saiyans locate hospitable planets and sell them to other species, but in order to do so, all inhabitants must be wiped out first. He goes on to state that while adults are dispatched to planets with high-powered inhabitants, babies like Kakarot are sent to the weaker planets like Earth, where they can grow stronger under the influence of the planet's full moon. Goku inquires about the moon, and Raditz explains a Saiyan's ability to transform into a great ape by looking at the full moon. Master Roshi, Bulma, and Krillin recall Goku's transformation in the past, but Goku remains unaware of what the great ape is. Suddenly, Raditz notices Goku's tail is missing and questions what happened to it, and Goku clarifies that it was cut off some time ago. An enraged Raditz disassociates both himself and his brother from the humans, but Goku emphasizes that he doesn't care if they're related or if he's an alien. Goku rejects Raditz's idea of him and confidently tells him to leave Earth, prompting Raditz to state he can't do that and reveal that there are only a few Saiyans left in the universe. Unfortunately, their home planet was destroyed in a meteor collision, wiping out most Saiyans, including their parents, but Goku remains unfazed. Raditz explains that there are only four Saiyans left, including himself and Goku, and implores Goku to join them, as there's a planet they need to conquer, and Goku's aid is the last piece of the puzzle they need to dominate it. He then cites the thrill of battle and attempts to appeal to Goku's Saiyan instincts, but Goku remains steadfast in his refusal to join him, stating he'd rather die than slaughter innocent people. Determined, Raditz changes tactics and points out Gohan, wondering if taking Kakarot's son will convince him to cooperate. Goku warns Raditz to stay away, but in an instant, Raditz strikes Goku in the stomach, incapacitating him and seizes Gohan. As Gohan cries, Raditz informs his brother that he has only one day to reconsider his offer. However, he states that should Goku decide to join the Saiyans, they'll need proof of his good intentions. Raditz then tells Goku that to prove himself, he must present him with the corpses of 100 Earthlings on the very island they stand on. Otherwise, he'll kill Gohan. Raditz reiterates his demand for Goku to eliminate 100 Earthlings as Goku, barely able to move, listens to Raditz deem Earth the next target of the Saiyans after they finish their business on another remote planet. Raditz states that he and his two friends could wipe out Earth's population in a little less than a month, so Kakarot taking a few human lives should be nothing. Weakly, Goku pleads for Raditz to release his child, and unnoticed by everyone, Piccolo watches from the rear of the house, seething with anger. Raditz begins to take off, but not before warning his brother not to fight him, as he'd surely be defeated, leaving Gohan crying for his father on the beach while Goku lies incapacitated. Raditz leaves, and cursing the predicament, Goku summons the flying Nimbus. However, Krillin and Master Roshi object, questioning his chances of victory. The group take a minute to compose themselves, and Krillin questions what their next move will be, noting the strength of Goku's brother is unlike anything they've ever seen. Goku, rising to his feet, identifies Raditz's tail as his weak point, and says that if he can somehow manage to grab it, he can defeat him. Master Roshi concurs, 
occurs and notes that Goku used to have the same weakness, but Goku acknowledges that he can't fight Raditz alone. Although Krillin and Master Roshi volunteer to fight, confident that the Dragon Balls can bring them back to life if they're killed, Goku tells them he learned Shinron can't grant the same wish twice, meaning if they die again, there's no coming back. Goku questions if they'll still help though, and they agree, although Krillin remains skeptical of his chances of survival. Bulma suggests using the Dragon Balls to eliminate Raditz and save the world, but Master Roshi doubts they can gather them all before the Saiyan returns. Goku then questions Bulma on if she has the Dragon Radar. As she retrieves it, Bulma notices Raditz's incredible speed, and everyone notices him stop, relieved that he hasn't returned to outer space. As the group prepare to depart, they're told that they don't stand a chance as Piccolo reveals himself. Goku questions Piccolo's presence, and Bulma moves away in horror. Piccolo explains he's already encountered Raditz once before, and states that Krillin and Master Roshi won't be any help in the fight. The solution he proposes is a team up between himself and Goku, confident that if they fight together, they might be able to overpower Raditz. Goku, skeptical of Piccolo's change of heart, learns that Raditz obstructs Piccolo's plans for world domination. However, Piccolo states that once Raditz is gone, he'll be coming for Goku next. Reluctantly, the two agree to collaborate for now, and Goku grabs the dragon radar from Bulma, then boards the flying Nimbus and inquires if Piccolo can keep up. Together, they speed off, leaving Master Roshi optimistic about their chances. He tells Bulma to recall the radar's location so they can follow suit, determined to witness the battle for themselves. Goku and Piccolo continue their approach toward Gohan and Raditz, adjusting their direction to the right. Meanwhile, at the crater, Raditz becomes irritated by Gohan's crying and decides to lock the child up in his space pod before going to search for food. However, his eye device beeps, detecting a battle power of 710 nearby, precisely from his own pod. Raditz refuses to believe that a young child possesses such strength, suspecting his device is malfunctioning. At the same time, Goku tells Piccolo that they're close, and suggests that they descend slowly to sneak up on Raditz, but Piccolo reveals it won't make a difference, as Raditz knows they're coming thanks to the device on his ear, capable of sensing a target's position and strength. Opting for a different approach, Goku decides they have no choice but to attack his brother head on. Meanwhile, Raditz's device once again registers a 710 reading, leading him to believe it's definitely broken. However, readings from another direction emerge, with two distinct values of 322 and 334. One of them matches Kakarot's battle power, and confused, as he states there's no way Kakarot would try to challenge him, Raditz once again concludes that his device must be broken. Suddenly, Raditz spots Goku and Piccolo flying in, confirming that his eye device wasn't malfunctioning after all and Gohan indeed possesses a battle power of 710. Goku and Piccolo touch down, and Raditz questions why his brother has shown up, to which Goku demands the return of his son. Raditz questions Goku's intent to refuse his Saiyan heritage and oppose his older brother, and Goku confirms, exclaiming he has no brother. Growing impatient with the conversation, Piccolo discards his turban and mantle, revealing that he too has trained with weighted clothing. Relieved to shed the extra weight, Piccolo's battle power is now at 408, and Goku follows suit by removing his weighted clothing as well, elevating his battle power to 416. Raditz then laughs, dismissing their power as inconsequential, and states that the two don't know their place. Goku declares that strength isn't all that's necessary to win a fight, and having heard enough, Raditz exclaims that he doesn't need Kakarot after all, as he's a disgrace to the Saiyan race and will die. Goku and Piccolo brace themselves for battle as Raditz charges at them. In an instant, he appears behind them and delivers a swift elbow to their backs. Shocked by Raditz's speed, Goku and Piccolo wonder how he did it, and Raditz states their mediocre defenses will only keep them alive for a few minutes. As Goku and Piccolo contemplate their next moves, Raditz decides to share a piece of information before their demise. He states that the two other surviving Saiyans possess battle powers much greater than his own. Piccolo and Goku contemplate the formidable strength of the Saiyans, and as Piccolo states Goku must be excited, Goku Goku denies this, stating that this time he's a little nervous. Opting to deal with it later though, he inquires about his son's whereabouts. 
Goku learns from Raditz that Gohan is confined in the crater behind him, as he wouldn't stop crying. Goku ascends, peers into the crater, and assures Gohan that he'll rescue him. Raditz, however, laughs, predicting that Goku won't get the chance, as he'll be dead soon. Subsequently, Goku and Piccolo charge in and engage Raditz in a series of rapid strikes. Despite their efforts, Raditz evades and counters with a powerful back kick, thwarting their advance, and takes flight. Goku and Piccolo ascend into the sky, but Raditz suddenly unleashes a dual energy blast down at the two, which Goku manages to avoid, but Piccolo, however, suffers an injury to his left arm. As explosions ensue on both sides of the blast, Goku stands, and Raditz seizes the opportunity to launch a surprise attack from behind, propelling Goku through the air. Weakly, Goku rises, and suddenly shows concern for Piccolo, as he observes the severe damage to Piccolo's left arm. Undeterred, Piccolo states he can still fight, prompting uncontrollable laughter from Raditz. In the midst of this, Piccolo inquires if Goku has some sort of new trick up his sleeve, but Goku denies this, stating he's all out. Piccolo then says he has no choice, and begins to tell Goku about something new he's been developing. Mocking their attempts at devising a plan, Raditz laughs, while Goku questions Piccolo about the feasibility of his new technique, especially with just one arm. Piccolo reassures Goku that it'll work, but emphasizes the need for Goku to keep Raditz occupied while he accumulates enough ki for the technique. Piccolo then tells Goku he was planning to use the technique to kill him, prompting laughter between the two, confusing Raditz. Goku tells Piccolo to do his best and charges in, and simultaneously, Piccolo announces his special beam cannon, while Goku engages Raditz with punches. Piccolo continues charging his attack, while Raditz turns the tables, landing several hits on Goku before kicking him into the distance. Goku, however, regains control, ascends into the air, and prepares a Kamehameha. Raditz panics as his eye device indicates Goku's rising battle power of 924, and realizes Goku can somehow focus and increase his battle power deliberately. Meanwhile, Piccolo's power level is caught on the Saiyan's device as well, as it's escalated as high as 1030 and rising, leaving Raditz astounded. At the same time, Goku fires the Kamehameha, narrowly dodged by Raditz, who attempts to escape but is pursued by the redirected blast. Raditz, however, prepares to take the blast head on and manages to stop it with his hands, surviving the attack. To Goku's disbelief, Raditz remains unharmed, and the Saiyan retaliates, sending a shockwave at the battered Goku, who falls to the ground with tattered clothing. As Raditz rushes in and prepares to strike the vulnerable Goku, Piccolo completes his key charge. Raditz is taken aback as his eye device reads a power level of 1330, realizing that Goku and Piccolo possess remarkable control over their power, and before Raditz can react, Piccolo unleashes his special beam cannon directly at the Saiyan. As the blast hurls toward Raditz, a bright flash of light ensues amongst the combatants. However, Raditz somehow managed to survive the attack as he dodged at the last minute, leaving Piccolo astonished as he only managed to graze the Saiyan's shoulder. Raditz states that had the attack actually hit him head on, he wouldn't have survived, and Piccolo fears the worst, as Raditz, though irritated by the minor injury, prepares to unleash a counterattack. Raditz bids Piccolo a farewell, but suddenly, he's halted by pain as Goku's grabbed his tail, taking him by surprise. Goku tightens his grip, forcing Raditz to the ground. Goku tells Piccolo to use the technique again, and Piccolo seizes the opportunity and instructs Goku to hold on while he prepares another special beam cannon. Raditz, in desperation, pleads with Goku not to kill him. Despite Goku's initial dismissive response, Raditz claims to have had a change of heart, expressing a desire to quietly depart from the planet. Piccolo urges Goku to ignore Raditz's pleas, but Raditz continues to implore Goku to believe him, despite Piccolo's repeated warnings. Reluctantly, Goku releases Raditz, who seizes the opportunity to elbow Goku in the face, sending him flying backward. Hovering over Goku, Raditz steps on his chest, asserting that Goku is too soft to be a Saiyan and disassociates himself with him, stating that he has no issues with killing anyone, even his younger brother. With his foot pressed firmly on Goku's chest, Raditz declares 
declares that death is imminent, prompting screams of pain from Goku. Raditz goads Piccolo to attack him again, stating that he'll be dead soon as well, and Piccolo contemplates the likelihood of Raditz evading another special beam cannon. As all hope seems lost, suddenly, the eye device alerts Raditz as Gohan violently emerges from Raditz's space pod, destroying it in the process. Much to everyone's surprise, Gohan lands visibly enraged, tears streaming down his face. Goku urgently instructs him to flee, while Raditz panics as his eye device registers a power level of 1307 from the young enraged boy. Violently, Gohan yells for the man to stop hurting his dad as he launches himself at Raditz, forcefully headbutting him in the chest and cracking his armor. Gohan lands and reverts to his normal state, leaving Raditz staggered. Goku expresses surprise, and Gohan approaches him as Goku once again implores his son to escape. As Raditz slowly regains his composure, he dismissively remarks that Gohan's battle power has dropped to one and proceeds to smack him away, knocking him out. As Raditz prepares to deal the finishing blow to Gohan, Goku pleads with him to stop. However, ignoring Goku's pleas, Raditz continues on, stating that Gohan has much more power than Goku, but it's a shame he won't learn to use it. As the Saiyan draws closer to finishing the job, Goku seizes the opportunity, leaping up and positioning himself behind Raditz, trapping him in a full Nelson hold. As Raditz wonders how Goku can still move, Goku urges Piccolo to use his special technique again. Piccolo begins to charge his key once more, asking why Goku didn't grab Raditz's tail again, but Goku states that Raditz could cut it off if he needed to, eliciting shock from the villain, surprised that his brother knew about this. Raditz attempts to break free, but finds it difficult due to Gohan's earlier attack. He warns Goku that if he doesn't let go, they'll both be killed, but Goku seems to be unconcerned about the consequences, giving this is the only way to stop Raditz. As his attack nears completion, Piccolo states that he'll gladly take Goku's life along with Raditz, as killing him would be a bonus. Goku urges Piccolo to hurry once more, and Raditz attempts to reason with Goku, promising to leave and change his ways, but Goku remains steadfast, no longer falling for his brother's deception. With determination, Piccolo smugly apologizes for the wait, as Goku yells for him to unleash his attack as he declares the special beam cannon and unleashes the technique, piercing through both Raditz and Goku. The powerful blast pierces through Raditz's chest, emerging from Goku's back, and both warriors plummet to the ground with severe, bloody wounds in their chests. Raditz is in awe that he managed to be killed on such a weak planet, but laughs at the thought of his brother sacrificing his own life. However, he learns from Piccolo that Goku won't be dead for long, as he can be revived using the Dragon Balls. Raditz curses his brother, but laughs, revealing that everything that transpired today has been broadcasted to his other Saiyan comrades in space. He predicts their arrival soon, anticipating the devastation they'll bring. Struggling through their injuries, Goku queries the time until their arrival, and Raditz grimly replies one year, surprising Piccolo. Raditz then brags, stating that this is Earth's last year for survival, and Piccolo, frustrated with Raditz's ominous ramblings, decides to end his life. At the same time, aboard a flying plane, Master Roshi, Bulma, and Krillin spot Piccolo standing alone. Puzzled, they wonder about the events unfolding below. Meanwhile, in the depths of space on a remote planet, a bald, mustached alien with an eye device confirms that Raditz is dead. Another alien, smaller with wild hair and a similar eye device, states that Raditz was pathetic to have been killed by fighters with power levels less than 10,000. However, he muses over the Dragon Ball's wish-granting abilities. The larger alien suggests reviving Raditz, but the smaller one deems it a waste and expresses a desire for eternal life, an idea that the larger alien concurs with. Both aliens take off from the planet into space pods resembling Raditz's, discussing Kakarot's child's remarkable high battle power, speculating that the mix of both Saiyan and Earthling blood produces a powerful hybrid. The larger alien hints at the concept of a Super Saiyan and contemplates breeding with Earthlings to re-establish a stronger Saiyan empire. However, the smaller alien argues that the children would likely be too strong for their own good, and opts to sticking to the original plan of wiping out all 
all life on Earth. Back on Earth, Piccolo recounts the events to Krillin and Master Roshi, while Bulma tends to Gohan. Relieved, Goku jokes about dying as Krillin tells him they'll wish him back, and Goku peacefully passes away as his body mysteriously disappears. Piccolo suspects Kami must have intervened and believes that the deity has a plan for Goku. At the same time, the two remaining Saiyans decide to enter hibernation for their lengthy journey to Earth. Bulma inquires about Goku's body being taken by Kami, and Master Roshi expresses relief that it was Kami who intervened. Krillin notices Gohan's four-star ball hat and suggests gathering the other Dragon Balls to revive Goku before the Saiyans arrive. Bulma, growing irritated, wonders about Yamcha's whereabouts and is reminded of how Goku's older brother knew their location. Piccolo explains that the strange device on Raditz's face allowed him to detect their strength and location, and Bulma, approaching Raditz, instructs Krillin to retrieve the device. After putting it on, Bulma notes that the technology is incredible and states that although it's a bit damaged, she should be able to fix it and use it to locate Yamcha and Tien. Roshi suggests returning to Kame House, and Krillin plans to search for the Dragon Balls afterward. Roshi queries Piccolo's plans, but stops mid-sentence as he witnesses Piccolo regenerating his missing arm, shocking everyone. Piccolo instructs the group to search for the Dragon Balls while Kami deals with Goku, and decides to take Goku's son with him. Krillin assumes that Piccolo intends to eat Gohan, but Piccolo clarifies that Gohan has untapped fighting potential, and he wants to harness it before the other Saiyans arrive. Concerned about what Chi-Chi might think, Master Roshi suggests informing her first, but Piccolo insists there's no time and threatens to kill anyone who stands in his way. As he carries Gohan in his arms, Piccolo promises to return the boy after a year, but not a moment before, and takes off, as Krillin fears the impending scolding from Goku and Chi-Chi. Meanwhile, in the afterlife, a grand station with houses in the clouds features a path leading to a large building. Souls walk down the path, directed by a guide to face judgment. Inside, Kami and Goku, now with a halo, approaches a massive desk where King Yama sits. Kami requests Goku to receive training from someone named King Kai, and King Yama, after reviewing Goku's achievements, questions his choice to traverse what's known as Snake Way to get to King Kai instead of going to heaven. In the midst of this discussion, Goku wonders if aliens also arrive here when they die, and Kami explains that everyone in the universe comes for judgment before King Yama. Goku then inquires about Raditz, and Yama reveals that he saw him and sent him straight to hell. Goku questions if Raditz put up a fight, and Yama confirms, but states that he overpowered him. Goku expresses admiration and wonders if he should be trained by Yama instead, leading Kami to disclose that King Kai is stronger than King Yama. Yama overhears this and threatens to send Kami to hell in the future, but Kami nervously tries to play it off. Goku receives approval to train with King Kai, and Yama points him in the direction to begin his journey through Snake Way. However, he tells Goku not to come crying to him if he falls off Snake Way on his way to his destination. Goku takes off, expressing gratitude, and Kami reflects on the impending danger to Earth, thinking that while Goku's gone, the Earth's only hope is Gohan, but wonders how he'll turn out, as there's no telling how Piccolo will raise him for the next year. However, his thoughts are interrupted as King Yama screams at him to leave, as his murmuring was getting annoying. Meanwhile, a guide meets with Goku and takes him to the beginning of Snake Way, where Goku learns he must traverse a 1 million kilometer long road to reach King Kai. Shocked, Goku wonders if anyone has ever reached the end, and the guide explains that King Yama managed to do so in the past 100 million years. The guide then warns Goku about falling through the clouds, as if he does, he'll fall into hell and never escape. Goku acknowledges this and wishes he brought a lunch, but is informed that he doesn't need food as he's dead. Goku then questions the guide on if he knows fortune teller Baba, and when he confirms, Goku tells him to ask her if she can tell Master Roshi not to bring him back to life for one year. With that, Goku sets off using his energy to fly, and meanwhile, Roshi contemplates breaking the news of Goku and Gohan to Chi-Chi and makes Krillin do it, expecting her disapproval. At the same time, Goku, having used up all his energy flying, opts to run along Snake Way. Piccolo leads Gohan to a shallow lake and urges him to wake up, as he's been unconscious since Raditz knocked him out. In a rather abrupt manner, Piccolo drops Gohan into the water to jolt him awake, and when the boy does so, he wonders what's going on. Announcing they need to talk, Gohan turns and notices Piccolo, and Piccolo is met with Gohan's fear, who starts crying and desperately calling for his father. Already irritated, Piccolo yells that there's no time for this, and grabs Gohan from the water. The 
boy continues to cry, and Piccolo sternly commands him to be silent or he'll break his neck, and Gohan complies. Piccolo then explains to Gohan that his father was killed protecting him, and as Gohan breaks into tears, Piccolo yells at him to stop. Piccolo goes on to state that Goku's friends will use the Dragon Balls to revive him next year, but a more significant problem looms. Two even more formidable adversaries are set to attack Earth, so they don't have much time. Even with Goku's return, Piccolo says that their combined efforts won't be enough to thwart the impending threat alone, so they'll need Gohan's help. Piccolo declares his intention to train Gohan to defend the Earth, despite Gohan's protest that he doesn't know how to fight at all. Piccolo insists Gohan possesses latent power, and he intends to bring it to the surface. Gohan continues to deny this, calling Piccolo a liar, so Piccolo decides to prove him wrong. To demonstrate, Piccolo grabs Gohan's head and hurls him at a nearby mountain. Initially frightened, with Piccolo privately hoping for the boy's powers to show itself, Gohan becomes enraged mid-flight, unleashing a powerful blast that obliterates the mountain, resulting in a massive explosion. When the smoke dissipates, Gohan sits in front of a large crater he created, and Piccolo himself is astonished, thinking that Gohan's power is even greater than he imagined. Piccolo then thinks to himself that he's about to train a boy who could very well be his greatest adversary in the future. Amazed by his own feet, Gohan learns from Piccolo about his hidden power emerging in moments of high emotion. However, Piccolo emphasizes that such power alone won't suffice in battles. Although Gohan expresses a desire to become a scholar rather than a martial artist, Piccolo asserts that defeating the two Saiyans threatening Earth takes precedence. Terrified, Gohan confesses his fear, prompting Piccolo to threaten him once more. Urgently, Piccolo decides they'll commence training immediately and instructs Gohan to remove his jacket. Gohan, wishing to train under his resurrected father, faces Piccolo's mockery and insults aimed at Goku as he states he's not suited to be an effective teacher. Unbeknownst to them, Goku continues his journey along Snake Way. Concerned about the upcoming training, Gohan questions what he should do, and Piccolo reassures him nothing difficult, stating that the initial phase will be survival training. He intends to leave Gohan alone in the wilderness for six months before delving into combat training, deeming it necessary to see what he's capable of. Gohan panics, fearing solitude, but Piccolo informs him that bloodthirsty beasts will be his companions, emphasizing that this experience will toughen him both physically and mentally. Reminding Gohan that the fate of the world rests in his hands, Piccolo advises him to believe in his own power and its effectiveness. After bidding a farewell, Piccolo advises Gohan not to think about running away, asserting that this is a preferable situation compared to the surrounding area. Overwhelmed, Gohan panics, wondering what he'll do about food, a bath, or a bed, but Piccolo laughs off his concerns, stating that he'll find none of those prepared for him out here. Gohan perceives Piccolo as cruel, to which Piccolo responds that cruelty is their shared fate, as he flies off, leaving a scared Gohan crying in fear. Meanwhile, Kami watches the unfolding events from the lookout, contemplating the change in Piccolo's demeanor and heart, and Mr. Popo acknowledges that the old Demon King Piccolo wouldn't have trained Son Goku's son, no matter the circumstance. Kami then reveals that after Piccolo killed Raditz, his soul went to the afterlife, which poses an anomaly, as those killed by the Demon Tribe usually cannot move on, as their souls remain trapped, drifting between heaven and earth. Kami deduces that this fact proves Piccolo is changed from the previous Demon King, but speculates that perhaps Piccolo realizes he and Kami may die when the Saiyans arrive in one year. Kami goes on to state that he and Piccolo's life are one and the same, and asserts that his counterpart may be trying to leave behind a legacy, even if it involves Son Goku's son. Mr. Popo brings up the Dragon Balls, and Kami indicates that their next use will be their final one. Meanwhile, alone in the wilderness, Gohan faces his fears, crying and feeling trapped. Suddenly, a large dinosaur appears, causing Gohan to run away screaming, begging for anyone to help him. Gohan trips and narrowly avoids being eaten as he unknowingly uses his powers to leap high above the dinosaur onto a nearby mountaintop. At the top, confused on how he got there, Gohan spends the day crying until nightfall where he continues to sob, believing he's going to die. However, spotting a few apples, he considers himself lucky but wonders how they got there as there are no trees nearby. Regardless, Gohan eagerly consumes them only to find them sour. Dissatisfied, Gohan longs for a decent meal, angering Piccolo, who observes from a distance, responsible for placing the apples in front of the boy. As Gohan falls asleep, Piccolo asserts that this will be the last time he'll help him, and says that if he can't survive on his own after this, he was wrong about him and his power. Meanwhile, Goku continues 
continues his journey along Snake Way, complaining about his hunger. Under the full moon's glow, Gohan rests atop the mountain, while Piccolo, seated cross-legged, hovers in mid-air, also in slumber. Gohan wakes up and catches Piccolo's attention, contemplating the challenge of descending from the mountain and finding something to eat. As the boy begins to cry, he momentarily stops and marvels at the unusually bright night. Curiosity leads him to gaze at the full moon for the first time, and suddenly, Gohan goes silent, his heart pounding louder as his gaze intensifies. Piccolo floats nearby in confusion, and Gohan's gaze triggers a transformation reminiscent of Goku's past. Transformed into the great ape, Gohan, too large for the mountain, tumbles to the ground, much to the shock of Piccolo. Witnessing Gohan's destructive rampage and colossal mouth blast, Piccolo panics, fearing the Earth's destruction before the Saiyan's arrival. Recalling Raditz's warning about full moon transformations, Piccolo resolves to eliminate the moon. Gohan reverts to his normal state, falling asleep naked on the ground. Descending near the unconscious boy, Piccolo reflects on the Saiyan's strength and realizes the importance of their tails in their transformations. Deciding to remove Gohan's tail in an attempt to prevent this from happening again, Piccolo decides to help Gohan one last time, crafting a sword and an outfit for the boy, resembling Goku's. However, the turtle hermit is replaced with the demon logo. Planning to provide Gohan with special hell training in six months, Piccolo aims to transform him into a member of the demon tribe. With these thoughts, Piccolo departs, leaving Gohan to sleep peacefully, mirroring Goku's restful slumber along Snake Way. The next day, zooming over the ocean in an air car, Chi Chi and the Ox King are en route to Kame House. Chi Chi, infuriated about Gohan's overnight absence and neglect of studies, vents her frustration while the Ox King attempts to pacify her. At Kame House, Boma, in her bathrobe, has spent the night working with Raditz's eye device, finally achieving a beeping response. She jumps up excited, ready to share the news with everyone, but witnesses Master Roshi, Krillin, and the turtle sleeping. In response, she uses a machine gun to wake them up, scolding them for sleeping while she worked. Testing the device's functionality, Boma first measures Master Roshi's battle power and reads 139. Krillin steps up next, eager to hear what his battle power is, and learns he has a rating of 206, surpassing Master Roshi. Boma states that the device can find powerful people all over the world and detects powerful forces at varying distances. A 250 is revealed to be Tien, and 177 is revealed to be Yamcha. Piccolo is also identified on the device with a battle power of 329, and Boma deduces Gohan must be with him as well. As Krillin contemplates going to save Gohan from Piccolo, Master Roshi advises against it, surmising that Piccolo must have a bigger plan for Gohan to save the Earth, and notes that even if they wanted to help, they wouldn't be able to defeat Piccolo. Bulma then suggests using the device's information to rally support for gathering the Dragon Balls and reviving Goku. Suddenly, Yajirobe appears, delivering a message from Korin that he's aware of the situation with the Saiyans and wants Yamcha, Tien, Krillin, Shoutsu, and even Yajirobe to meet him at once. Krillin wonders why, and Yajirobe explains that Kami will be training them for the next six months. Departing, Yajirobe then informs the group not to revive Goku until the Saiyans show up, as he's training in the afterlife and needs more time. He explains that fortune teller Baba will be arriving soon, and that they should talk to her if they have any questions. With that, Yajirobe departs, leaving the group in astonishment. Soon after, another air car approaches, and the group is surprised to see Chi Chi aboard with the Ox King. The Ox King bows before Master Roshi, and Chi Chi demands to know Goku and Gohan's whereabouts. After a hesitant pause, Master Roshi reveals that Gohan was taken by the Demon King Piccolo. The Ox King wonders where Goku was during all of this, and Master Roshi reveals that Goku is dead, leading Chi Chi to faint. Six months pass by, and Yamcha, Tien, Shoutsu, Krillin, and Yajirobe undergo rigorous training with Kami. Meanwhile, Goku continues his journey toward King Kai, and Gohan, having survived and grown stronger, impresses Piccolo with his progress. The dinosaur from earlier reappears, but Gohan effortlessly evades it, showcasing his enhanced abilities. As the dinosaur lies incapacitated, Gohan skillfully cuts a slice of meat from the creature's tail, lights a fire with his key, and roasts the meat with his sword, earning Piccolo's acknowledgement from a distance. Their next phase of training begins, as Gohan launches a kick at Piccolo, but Piccolo effortlessly blocks it with his hand. Undeterred, Gohan attempts a punch, but Piccolo dodges and counterattacks with a kick from behind, telling Gohan not to lose sight of his target. Gohan admits he couldn't see Piccolo's moves, and Piccolo advises him to feel where his opponent
tone it is rather than look. Gohan brushes off the dust and complains, prompting Piccolo to zap him with eye lasers, exclaiming if he has time to complain, he has time to react, and emphasizes their limited window of six months. Piccolo urges Gohan to focus solely on training, emphasizing that improvement is crucial for facing the impending threat of the Saiyans. Meanwhile, Goku, exhausted after six months of traveling, finally reaches the end of Snake Way, leading to King Kai's place. As Goku leaps from the road and reaches the Kai's planet, he notices a small house and assumes this is the place, but is abruptly pulled onto the planet's surface, experiencing its heavy gravity. As Goku struggles to stand, he suddenly sees a monkey who he assumes is King Kai. Goku greets him and the monkey walks around chanting, so the Saiyan assumes this must be part of the rigorous training. As Goku attempts to mimic the monkey's strange movements, an unfamiliar figure in a fancy outfit intervenes as an awkward silence falls between them. Goku inquires who this person is, and he jokingly introduces himself as King Kai with the monkey named Bubbles. The Kai reverts back to his previous joke, but Goku is unaware of what he means. King Kai takes another crack at telling a joke for Goku to laugh at, but Goku still doesn't understand, prompting silence from King Kai. The Kai wonders why Goku is on his planet, and Goku inquires about martial arts training. However, the Kai insists that he could never train someone who doesn't understand comedy, prompting Goku to fake laugh so they could get started. Goku questions once more if King Kai will train him, and the Kai says he'd be willing to, but insists that Goku must pass the test first in telling a joke that can make him laugh. Goku panics, but manages to blurt out a joke about a futon flying away. Surprisingly, King Kai chuckles, deeming Goku's joke successful. Now prepared to teach Goku martial arts, King Kai tells the Saiyan to try attacking him so he can gauge his strength, but Goku states he can barely move. The Kai then reveals the planet's intense gravity, making Goku's body 10 times heavier than on Earth. He tells Goku to jump as high as he can, and as Goku continues struggling with the gravity, King Kai anticipates an entertaining training session. The Kai announces the commencement of training and inquires about Son Goku's intended duration. Goku, uncertain of the time spent on Snake Way, reveals his urgency due to the imminent arrival of the two Saiyans on Earth. King Kai, demonstrating his ability to determine the Saiyans' arrival time, states it should take 158 days for them to arrive, but assures Goku that the period is sufficient, as training on his planet is equivalent to thousands of years on Earth. Acknowledging the Saiyans' formidable strength and stating that their power is even stronger than his own, King Kai suggests that surpassing him is crucial for Goku's success. The training begins as the Kai tells Goku to chase and catch bubbles in order to overcome the planet's gravity. Goku takes off, but struggles to move, prompting him to remove his weighted clothing to increase his speed. As Goku draws closer to catching bubbles, the monkey speeds up, leaving Goku in astonishment. As the Saiyan questions his ability to catch bubbles, King Kai tells him to go home, but Goku wonders if he can get something to eat to restore his energy. After eating a large portion of the Kai's food, Goku gets back to training, but not before King Kai tells him to put his weighted clothing back on to make his pursuit of bubbles more effective. Goku asserts that he won't stand a chance with his weighted clothing on, but the Kai lets him in on his secret, stating that the world the Saiyans are from had about the same amount of gravity as the planet they're standing on. King Kai goes on to say that the Saiyans are born with an innate ability to fight, which makes them incredibly deadly, but Goku asserts that he's a Saiyan too, prompting confusion from King Kai. As night falls on Earth, Gohan, battered and bruised, gets acknowledgement from Piccolo as he states he's not such a crybaby anymore. Gohan then questions Piccolo on his relationship with his father, and Piccolo reveals that their fight isn't over, and after dealing with the Saiyans, Goku is next. Gohan mentions Goku's positive remarks about Piccolo, saying he's not as bad as he used to be after his previous iteration died, but Piccolo dismisses it in anger and demands Gohan to sleep. 40 days later, Goku achieves the milestone of catching bubbles, impressing King Kai. The Kai then excitedly anticipates that with 118 days left to train, Goku may be able to master the Kaioken, a move that he himself hasn't been able to perfect. Meanwhile at Kami's lookout, the remaining Z fighters are deemed to have surpassed Kami, and with the future now in their hands, are instructed to set off to continue refining their skills. Piccolo continues Gohan's training, and King Kai focuses on Goku, as a decisive battle looms on the horizon. The Saiyan space pods continue their journey toward Earth, as everyone persists in their training. Goku, with his hands raised, charges energy for a technique, and King Kai challenges him to track the super speed of a massive brick he throws. The Kai unleashes the object at super speed and amps it up more, and Goku 
skillfully launches his blast and detonates the brick with ease. Impressed, King Kai marvels at Goku's ability to learn the technique known as the Spirit Bomb in such a short amount of time. The Kai then goes on to explain the nature of the Spirit Bomb, stating that it allows you to borrow energy from all surrounding life, concentrate it into a single point, and release it at will. He says that with the Earth being larger than his own planet, Goku could draw a tremendous amount of power from it, enough to even destroy it if he's not careful. However, the Kai says that the Spirit Bomb should only be used as a last resort and Goku agrees, stating that he'll have to make use of the Kaioken technique. As the two continue to converse, King Kai suddenly shouts in disbelief, realizing that he miscalculated Goku's return time down Snake Way, causing concern about the Saiyan's imminent arrival in just one day. Goku worries about the six month delay, but King Kai assures him it will only take two days to get back to Earth in his current state. Panicked, the Kai urges Goku to instruct his friends to revive him with the Dragon Balls, as the Saiyan places his hand on the Kai's back to contact them. Goku contacts Master Roshi, who wonders where the voice is coming from, but soon realizes that Goku is speaking to him from the afterlife. Goku explains the situation, stating that the Saiyans will be arriving on Earth tomorrow, and that he'll be a little late given the time he'll need to traverse Snake Way once more. Goku urges Roshi to summon Shinron immediately, and the old man rushes out of the bathroom, alerting Bulma and the others. In the afterlife, Goku prepares to depart, and King Kai mends his clothes. Goku, pleased to retain the turtle mark, jokes about the Kai's outfit, unaware of the Kai's logo that's now placed on his back. On Earth, Shenron emerges, offering one wish. Oolong suggests using the wish to get rid of the Saiyans, but Shenron, having been created by Kami, states he cannot exceed Kami's power. Master Roshi then wishes for Goku's revival, and Shenron easily grants it. Meanwhile, Gohan and Piccolo notice the sudden darkening of the sky, and Piccolo notes that the Saiyans are likely a arriving sooner than expected. On the Kai's planet, Goku is revived and thanks King Kai before departing, but not before being told that he won't be able to come back to life again if he dies. Goku descends to Snake Way, and King Kai ponders Goku's unfathomable strength, saying he never thought someone like him existed in the lower realm. Rushing along Snake Way, Goku, flying at super speed, prepares for the Saiyan's arrival, and the next day at 11.33 AM, the Saiyan space pods crash into a city making their stormy entrance on Earth. A gathering of onlookers surrounds the two craters in the middle of the street, puzzled about the recent events. The emergence of a figure, the smaller of the two Saiyans, induces panic amongst the crowd. Piccolo, Gohan, Yamcha, Krillin, Yajirobe, Tien, and Chaozu all sense the arrival of the Saiyans, Tien noting they arrived much sooner than expected. Both Saiyans exit their ships, causing confusion and murmuring in the crowd. The smaller Saiyan, referring to the planet as Earth, jokingly expresses appreciation for the planet. The larger Saiyan suggests giving the onlookers a friendly greeting as he merely raises an arm, obliterating the entire city as Tien and Chaozu witness the resulting explosion from afar. In the aftermath, the area is decimated, sparing only the Saiyans and their space pods. Acknowledging his excessive approach, the larger Saiyan now known as Nappa is scolded by the smaller Saiyan, Vegeta, for potentially hindering their ability to sell the planet. Vegeta corrects Nappa about the Dragon Balls and emphasizes their first objective, gathering information from the one who killed Raditz. Frustrated by Nappa's actions and the likelihood of his explosion destroying the Dragon Balls they came for, Vegeta mentions their plan to search for the person with the highest battle power on the planet. He believes this individual will be either Raditz's killer or Kakarot's son. Despite Nappa's observation of several individuals with battle powers exceeding 1000, Vegeta asserts their no match for them. Vegeta quickly identifies the two highest power readings and decides to investigate as he and Nappa take off. Yamcha and Krillin notice the Saiyan's movement, debating whether they're heading toward Tien and Chaozu or Piccolo and Gohan. Piccolo warns Gohan of the Saiyan's imminent arrival and in another location, Tien prepares to confront the Saiyans while Chaozu insists on joining him. At Kame House, Bulma and the others watch news coverage of a massive earthquake in East City, recognizing it as the Saiyan's arrival. Bulma suggests going to find the Saiyans using Raditz's device, but Master Roshi advises against getting involved, noting that their power is beyond their comprehension. Meanwhile, Goku continues racing down Snake Way. As the clock strikes 12.20 PM, Piccolo and Gohan, the latter now wearing an outfit resembling Piccolo's, await the approaching threat. They notice people coming from all directions, and Krillin appears, prompting skepticism from Piccolo. Krillin tells Piccolo that 
he's been training for a year just for this moment, and Piccolo acknowledges Krillin's slight improvement, as Krillin informs both him and Gohan that Tien and the others will be arriving soon. Gohan recalls his father describing Krillin as small but strong, and after some dialogue is exchanged between the two, Krillin questions Gohan's training with Piccolo. The conversation is interrupted though, as Vegeta and Nappa arrive. Krillin is astonished by their overwhelming energy, and as the two land, Vegeta questions if the group have been eagerly awaiting their arrival. Piccolo confronts Vegeta and Nappa, demanding to know their intentions. Vegeta recognizes Piccolo's voice as the one who killed Raditz, revealing that their eye devices also serve as communicators. Nappa questions whether Piccolo is something called a Namekian, and Vegeta states it would make sense given he defeated Raditz. At the same time, Piccolo remains confused, while Krillin and Gohan inquire if he's really some sort of alien. Vegeta, suspecting Namekians possess above average power levels and unique abilities, assumes Piccolo was the one who created the Dragon Balls. Krillin is puzzled about how the Saiyans learned of the Dragon Balls, and Nappa clarifies that those are the main reason they came to Earth in the first place. Piccolo then clarifies that while he appreciates the backstory and understanding of his ancestry, he's certainly not the creator of the Dragon Balls. Preparing for an imminent attack, Piccolo stands firm, ready to get things started. At the lookout, Kami expresses surprise at discovering he and Piccolo's alien origin, and speculates the origin of the Dragon Balls, noting that he created them in the past, but feels someone on his home world must have done something similar. Vegeta, noting Piccolo's refusal to comply, decides to force the information out of him. After reading the group's battle powers of 981, 1220, and 1083, Nappa deems them too weak to pose a threat. Vegeta, however, instructs Nappa to remove his eye device now known as a Scouter, acknowledging the group's ability to manipulate their battle powers at will. Nappa complies, criticizing Raditz for relying too much on the Scouter's readings. This prompts disbelief from Piccolo and Krillin, as he called Raditz a weakling and reminisces on how it took the combined efforts of Goku and Piccolo to just barely take him down. Vegeta then orders Nappa Nappa to plant the six Cybermen that they have. Nappa does so, and pours liquid from a bottle onto the seeds, prompting confusion from Krillin. Suddenly, six plant-like monsters sprout instantly, surprising Gohan, Piccolo, and Krillin. Vegeta directs them to attack the group, and suddenly, Tien and Chaozu arrive, as does Yamcha, much to Krillin's satisfaction. Tien notes the presence of more opponents on the battlefield, and Krillin asserts that the situation has changed. Vegeta, however, welcomes the challenge, and with six combatants and six Cybermen, suggests turning it into a game. Piccolo is angered by the Saiyan's dismissive attitude, but Krillin urges caution, stating that this could buy them some time until Goku's arrival. Tien volunteers to face the first Cybermen, much to the enjoyment of Nappa, who assumes the Earthling will be dealt with quickly. As the Cybermen charges at him, Tien effortlessly repels it and charges in. The Cybermen retaliates by splitting its head open and spraying a corrosive liquid, but Tien manages to evade the attack, and Krillin and Piccolo Piccolo narrowly avoid the corrosive substance. Tien counterattacks, delivering a swift elbow to the Cyberman's face, and it plummets to the ground. Nappa is taken aback as Krillin and Shoutsu cheer on Tien, but Vegeta finds the situation promising and declares they might get some form of entertainment after all. The Cyberman struggles to move as Tien stands over it menacingly. Nappa mentions that the Cybermen have battle powers over 1200, equal to Raditz, and Vegeta points out that Tien surpassed that. However, Nappa remains astonished. As the Cyberman begins to rise, Vegeta intervenes, merely using the flick of two fingers to completely obliterate it from the inside, much to everyone's surprise. When Nappa questions Vegeta's action, the Saiyan dismisses the Cyberman's chances of winning and reminds the others not to hold back. At the same time, the Z Fighters note Vegeta's devastating power. Krillin volunteers for the next round, but Yamcha steps forward, exclaiming playtime is over. Krillin insists on going first, but Yamcha cuts him off, explaining that Krillin Krillin has already been revived once with the Dragon Balls, and can't be resurrected again if he were to get killed. Vegeta and Nappa release the next Cybermen, and Yamcha charges in as the two disappear. Their movements become too quick for Gohan to see, prompting Piccolo to instruct him to sense their key. Yamcha and the Cybermen exchange punches, with the Cybermen flying to a nearby mountain. Pursuing it, Yamcha is met with a sudden attack, but dodges it and retaliates with a powerful Kamehameha, sending the Cybermen crashing to the ground. Yamcha lands, confidently declaring his intent to face the remaining four Cybermen alone. However, the Cyberman unexpectedly revives, latches onto Yamcha, and self-destructs, creating a huge explosion, much to the surprise of the other Z-Fighters. As the smoke dissipates, Krillin rushes to Yamcha's lifeless body
body, declaring him dead, and realizes he sacrificed himself in Krillin's place. Dissatisfied, Nappa exclaims he didn't want to see a draw, and Vegeta tells Krillin to clear the trash from the battlefield. Overwhelmed with anger, Krillin charges up, unleashing a two-handed blast and directs it at Vegeta and Nappa, fueled by a desire for revenge. The blast catches the attention of the Saiyans, and the Z Fighters move out of the way to avoid being hit. The Cybermen attempt to escape, but swiftly, Krillin alters the blast trajectory into the air, causing it to fragment into six smaller blasts aimed down at the four remaining Cybermen, Vegeta and Nappa. Three Cybermen are obliterated, and the fourth is nearly hit, with Vegeta and Nappa also taking the brunt of the attack. As the smoke dissipates, cheers erupt from the onlookers, and Krillin notes that he missed one of the targets. Suddenly, the surviving Cybermen leaps from the remaining smoke and targets Gohan, but Piccolo intervenes, grabbing its arm, delivering a powerful punch to its stomach, tossing it into the air, and finishing it off with a mouth blast that disintegrates it. Gohan expresses gratitude, but Piccolo dismisses it, clarifying that his actions were merely a warm-up for the impending battle, not a rescue mission. Soon after, emerging unharmed from the dust, Vegeta, alongside Nappa, asserts that if a spectacular fight is what the heroes desire, they'll have it, but it'll be over quick. Tien and Krillin express disbelief at the villain's survival, with Krillin noting that he used all the power he had for his attack. Nappa declares his intent to take on all five opponents alone, anticipating an entertaining confrontation. As Nappa powers up, causing the earth to shake, Chao Tzu informs Tien that his telekinetic abilities are ineffective against Nappa. As the Saiyan's energy surges, the tension builds as Nappa prepares to strike, leaving everyone in shock. The ground continues to tremble as Nappa intensifies his power, and he charges toward Tien. Tien attempts to block the incoming punch with his arm, but Nappa forcefully punches it off with a single strike, eliciting a scream of pain from Tien. As Nappa prepares to land the final blow, Tien swiftly takes flight to avoid being killed. While airborne, he readies an attack against Nappa, but in an instant, Nappa ascends beside Tien and kicks him forcefully back to the ground. Witnessing this, Chao Tzu panics, and struggling to rise, Tien fights through his injuries as Nappa acknowledges his persistence. Krillin rushes in to assist despite Piccolo's objections, and noticing the Earthling running in to interfere, Nappa gestures with his hand, creating a massive explosion that sends Krillin flying backward, thwarting his plans. When the smoke clears, it's revealed that Nappa's created a hole so deep in the ground that even Piccolo couldn't see the bottom of it. In the ensuing chaos, Krillin panics as Chao Tzu is nowhere in sight. Fearing he'd been caught in the blast, Vegeta suddenly alerts Nappa to check behind him as Chao Tzu comes flying in. Chao Tzu clings to Nappa's back, much to the surprise of Krillin and Tien, as Nappa struggles to get him off. Tien implores Chao Tzu to escape, however, through telepathy, Chao Tzu bids Tien a farewell, begging him not to die. Realizing the impending sacrifice, Tien yells for his companion to stop, but Chao Tzu elicits a bright flash of light and self-destructs on Nappa, as Tien and the remaining Z Fighters watch in awe. Tien, consumed by rage, screams out for the loss of his best friend, while Piccolo acknowledges Chao Tzu's bravery, noting his sacrificial move was an excellent strategy. However, when the smoke clears, Nappa remains virtually unscathed. Meanwhile, Goku maintains his rapid descent along Snake Way, sensing he might not make it in time. Simultaneously, Nappa harbors a desire to annihilate the rest of the fighters, while Krillin mourns Chao Tzu's sacrifice, stating he gave his life for nothing. Tien, overcome with anger, points out that Chao Tzu has already been resurrected once by the Dragon Balls and can never be brought back again. In response, Nappa callously suggests sending him to join the departed Chao Tzu in the afterlife. Recognizing Nappa's attack patterns, Piccolo discreetly informs Krillin and Gohan of the opportune moment to strike. Vegeta, having listened in, approves of the plan, asserting that a brief lapse of attention could lead to missing a chance. Piccolo, however, warns Vegeta that he won't be laughing once son Goku arrives. Puzzled, Vegeta questions Goku's identity as Nappa descends toward Tien. Piccolo and Krillin swiftly react, launching a coordinated assault. Piccolo's punch propels Nappa toward Krillin, who pounds him downward. Piccolo urgently instructs Gohan to unleash a blast, but Gohan hesitates, leaving Krillin and Piccolo to execute the attack themselves. However, their efforts prove futile as Nappa regains his bearings and evades the attack. He states that the group almost had him, but now all they've done is sped up their own deaths. Tien, determined to avenge Chao Tzu, states that once he's finished, he'll join him in death and they'll never be separated again. Tien then charges up and unleashes a powerful 
Tri-Beam Attack, much to Nappa's surprise as he's engulfed in it, surprising everyone on the battlefield. However, when it's all said and done, Nappa emerges from the attack, sustaining minimal damage. Tien acknowledges he's failed as he drops to the ground dead. Vegeta, unimpressed, ridicules the fallen warrior, while Krillin desperately cries out for Goku, wondering where he is. Piccolo contemplates the seeming invincibility of Nappa, while Krillin is dismayed by the loss of all his friends. Urgently, Krillin implores Goku to hasten his arrival, leading Vegeta to question the identity of this Goku. Nappa, intent on killing the remaining trio, excludes Piccolo for now, as he and Vegeta still seek information on the Dragon Balls from him. Despite Krillin's comment on Piccolo's luck, Piccolo asserts that the Saiyans aim to eliminate them all anyway, so it doesn't matter. Krillin then questions Piccolo's confidence in their victory, but Piccolo asserts he has none, as Nappa far surpasses Raditz, leaving Krillin fearful at the idea of meeting his end. At the lookout, Kami wonders where Goku could be, sensing his imminent demise. He confides in Mr. Popo who inquires further, and asserts that Piccolo is about to die. On the battlefield, Piccolo proposes to Krillin that they descend to the ground, as Nappa asserts the futility of their actions. The two descend, and Nappa swoops down from above, prepared to finish them off. As our heroes prepare for the confrontation, Vegeta intervenes, telling Nappa to stop. Confused, Nappa questions Vegeta on why he stopped him, and Vegeta says he needs to ask something of the group. Questioning whether this son Goku is Kakarot, Vegeta questions why Krillin keeps shouting for him, and Krillin asserts that's indeed who he is. Despite Vegeta's skepticism, stating that Kakarot being the Earthling's last hope is laughable at best, Krillin passionately declares Goku's enhanced strength, saying he's not the same man as before. Although Nappa dismisses the notion, assuming Kakarot to be scared, Gohan unwaveringly believes in his father's arrival. Vegeta, amused by their trust, decides to wait for Goku, enraging Nappa. Despite Nappa's desire for immediate action, Vegeta insists on waiting for three hours, threatening to kill the group if Kakarot doesn't appear within that time. Frustrated for having been asleep for a year and itching for action though, Nappa launches in, but Vegeta commands him to stop, scaring Nappa, who apologizes for getting carried away. Vegeta then turns to Piccolo and Krillin, declaring that they have three more hours left to live. Soon after, apologizing for his fear, Gohan is dismissed by Piccolo, who disapproves of cowards. Krillin tries to defend Gohan, stating it's his first real fight, and Piccolo ponders the immense power possessed by Vegeta, who frightened the formidable Nappa. At the same time, curious, Nappa questions Vegeta's motives, prompting an explanation about Kakarot's perceived betrayal of the Saiyan race and the desire to make him suffer by killing his friends and son in front of him. Vegeta anticipates torturing Kakarot, which is an idea Nappa gets behind. Nappa expresses eagerness to handle the trio, and Vegeta allows this, so long as Piccolo is left alive to tell them about the Dragon Balls first. Despite Krillin's suggestion to flee, Piccolo emphasizes that the Saiyans plan to destroy the Earth's inhabitants anyway, so they'll meet the same fate regardless of choosing to run. Krillin implores Goku to expedite his return as the Saiyan races down Snake Way, and Kami anxiously awaits. However, three hours come and go, and Goku is nowhere to be found. Vegeta removes his scouter, noting that three hours have passed, and expresses disappointment over Kakarot not only being a traitor, but a coward as well. Gohan passionately defends his father against the accusation of cowardice, while Krillin questions the reason for Goku's delay. Nappa, having discarded his outer armor, is prepared to engage the group, stating that Kakarot won't be able to witness their deaths. Krillin fears their impending demise, but Piccolo, maintaining a sliver of optimism, outlines a plan for potential victory. He assigns Krillin the task of distracting Nappa, allowing Piccolo to seize his tail, followed by Gohan delivering a powerful attack, enough to potentially defeat the Saiyan. Gohan nervously says he won't run away again, and Piccolo reiterates that the fate of the Earth rests in his hands. Despite the grim circumstances, Krillin finds hope in their strategy. Meanwhile, Kami suddenly senses Goku's key, signifying his return. Kami swiftly teleports to retrieve Goku at the end of Snake Way, and the two head back to Earth, much to King Yema's surprise, as Goku actually managed to make it back from King Kai's place. After a quick return to the lookout, Goku, assisted by Kami, receives words of encouragement and leaps off the palace, descending toward Earth. Approaching Korin Tower, Korin notes that Goku looks tired and tosses the Saiyan the last two Sensu beans, wishing him good luck in his battle. Goku consumes one to restore his energy, and summons the flying Nimbus just before reaching the ground, and they swiftly head toward the battlefield. At the same time, Krillin initiates the plan by charging at Nappa, catching Vegeta
his attention, who surmises they must have a strategy. As Krillin nears, he blasts the ground, propelling himself into the air. Seizing the opportunity, Piccolo rushes in from behind to grab Nappa's tail and yells to Gohan to attack. However, Gohan's subsequent move is thwarted as Nappa elbows Piccolo, much to everyone's shock. Piccolo loses consciousness, and Vegeta scoffs at the group's belief that they wouldn't have trained their tails by now for scenarios such as these. Nappa taunts the trio, saying how even their planet's best couldn't stand up to a single blow. He then turns his attention to Gohan, standing directly in front of him, insisting that being part Saiyan, the boy needs to provide him with some entertainment. With a forceful kick, Nappa propels Gohan into the air and then backs him into a nearby mountain. Nappa tells Gohan not to die on him just yet, and despite coughing up blood, Gohan manages to rise to his feet just as Nappa advances toward him. However, Krillin intervenes, leaping in to deliver a powerful kick to Nappa's face, followed by a punch, sending him flying into the distance. Krillin pursues Nappa, who regains composure and heads back towards Krillin. As Nappa throws a punch, Krillin expertly maneuvers with backflips to evade the attacks, catching Vegeta's attention, who notes his moves aren't half bad. Nappa rushes toward Krillin again, and seizing the opportunity, Krillin raises his right hand, concentrating his energy to form a sizable disc above his palm, announcing the Destructo Disc. He propels the disc toward Nappa, who initially stands his ground, poised to take on the attack. However, Vegeta urgently tells Nappa to dodge as the disc narrowly misses and the attack slices through a mountain like a saw blade, leaving a noticeable cut on Nappa's cheek. Now infuriated at the minor injury inflicted, Nappa retaliates with a blast aimed at Krillin. Although Krillin manages to evade the direct hit, he succumbs to the shockwave. Just as Nappa prepares to deliver the final blow, Piccolo intervenes, blasting Nappa in the back and leaving a distinct burn mark as Krillin crashes to the ground. Nappa, surprised by Piccolo being awake, is met by Vegeta's laughter, assuming the Earthlings may be too much for him. Piccolo states that the Earth is not to be underestimated, and suddenly, Piccolo senses an extraordinary power, as does Gohan, prompting confusion from Nappa. Piccolo then declares that Son Goku is headed their way. Piccolo shouts that it's undeniably Son Goku, sparking excitement in Gohan about his father's imminent arrival. Nappa inquires about Kakarot's whereabouts, prompting Vegeta to pick up his scouter once more and investigate. Meanwhile, Goku continues soaring on the flying Nimbus, sensing two significant key, two even more substantial key, and one smaller key. Perplexed by the seemingly incorrect number of fighters on the battlefield, he wonders if someone died and urges Nimbus to hasten its speed. As Vegeta studies his scouter, his eyes widen with realization. Nappa wonders if what the Earthlings are saying is true, and Vegeta informs him that he's not sure if it's Kakarot, but whoever it is will arrive in four minutes and has a battle power that exceeds 5,000. Nappa expresses his shock, and Vegeta speculates that if the others could manipulate their power rating so drastically, Kakarot likely possesses the same capability, meaning that 5,000 may only be the starting point of his power. With urgency, Vegeta commands Nappa to kill Piccolo and Gohan, exclaiming that with this new power approaching, they may prove to be an issue if they team up with it. Nappa raises the question about the Dragon Balls, and Vegeta speculates that on the Namekian's home world, planet Namek, they might even have more potent Dragon Balls. Believing in the legend due to Kakarot's resurrection, Vegeta asserts that the priority is to eliminate the current threats. Gohan, alarmed, urges Piccolo to flee, expressing his determination to stall Nappa until Goku arrives. He emphasizes the consequence of Piccolo's death, leading to Kami's demise and the Dragon Balls being lost. However, Piccolo dismisses Gohan's belief in his ability to hold off Nappa alone, and Krillin finds himself unable to move. Offended at the idea of a kid holding him off, Nappa charges toward Gohan, and Piccolo rushes in to save him. To his surprise though, the young warrior unleashes a furious kick to Nappa's face, propelling him into a nearby mountain. The dust settles, and despite emerging from the debris battered, Nappa quickly recovers, furious, and states it's time to end things now. The Saiyan then charges up, and launches an explosive blast directly at Gohan. Unable to escape in time, Gohan finds himself in imminent danger, but Piccolo intervenes, positioning himself in front of Gohan and taking the devastating blast head on. As the smoke dissipates, Nappa believes the boy to be dead, but is taken aback when he discovers that the attack hit Piccolo instead. The battered Piccolo weakly advises Gohan to escape and then collapses to the ground. Panicked, Gohan questions why Piccolo saved him, to which Piccolo simply repeats his plea for Gohan to run. Tearfully, Gohan implores Piccolo not to die as his dad will be there soon, and Nappa mocks Piccolo for facing an early demise.
demise. Meanwhile, Goku continues his swift journey on Nimbus. He senses a diminishing key and realizes that someone is dying. At the lookout, Kami is fading away and notes that Goku didn't make it in time, but expresses relief that in the end, Piccolo surpassed even him, the god of Earth. On the battlefield, Piccolo chuckles at the irony of the great demon king Piccolo sacrificing himself to protect a child, acknowledging that Gohan and his father must have rubbed off on him. Piccolo says that Gohan is the only person who ever treated him with respect and thanks him for the time they spent together for the last few months as he passes away. Goku feels Piccolo's key vanish and Kami bids farewell to Mr. Popo as he vanishes from the world of the living. Gohan, engulfed in grief and anger, places his hands over his head and initiates a Masenko attack. Krillin notices Gohan's insane boosting key and Vegeta, monitoring his scouter, is astonished by Gohan's battle power of 2800. Gohan directs his Masenko at Nappa, but Nappa deflects it with relative ease, much to Gohan's surprise. Nappa notes the destructive force of Gohan's attack, and Vegeta notes the sharp decline in Gohan's battle power. Gohan apologizes to Piccolo for being unable to avenge him, and notes his lack of strength to even escape. As Nappa approaches Gohan for the final blow, he attempts to crush Gohan with his foot, excited to see Kakarot's face when he finds his son smashed to a pulp. However, as the Saiyan smashes down, Gohan mysteriously disappears from beneath Nappa's foot, reappearing floating on the flying Nimbus nearby. Both confusion and tension builds as Vegeta gazes skyward, and as the warrior touches down, everyone recognizes Goku's long-awaited arrival. Gohan and Krillin express genuine joy, while Vegeta sarcastically suggests Goku's arrived to spout some nonsense about defeating them. Goku approaches Piccolo's lifeless body past Nappa, confirming his death as Gohan acknowledges the Namekian sacrifice for him. Observing Tien and Yamcha's lifeless bodies as well, Goku grows angry and Nappa taunts the Saiyan's friends, going on to state the demise of Chaozu as well, who blown himself up, leaving no remains. Additionally, Goku points out that Kami has also met his end, as Vegeta notes his rising battle power. Goku walks in Nappa's direction, assumed to be eager to fight, and as the Saiyan throws a punch at Goku, he suddenly vanishes behind him and moves toward Krillin. This surprises Nappa as well as Vegeta, who notes Kakarot's speed. Goku shares half of the last Sensu Bean with both Krillin and Gohan, and the two are restored to full strength. Goku commends Krillin's noticeable increase in power, but Krillin states it wasn't enough to handle the Saiyans. Goku acknowledges the same from Gohan, and the boy attributes his teachings to Piccolo, but mourns the death of his friend. Krillin then states that reviving their friends with the Dragon Balls are no longer an option due to Kami's demise, and proposes avenging their fallen friends together. However, Goku asserts he'll handle the Saiyans alone, and tells Krillin and Gohan to keep their distance. Despite their protests, Goku's anger intensifies, prompting Krillin to hold Gohan back and let Goku take things from here. Krillin thinks to himself that he's never seen Goku this angry before, and finds it best not to intervene. Confronting Nappa, Goku stands menacingly as the Saiyan threatens to kill him. Goku then vows to make Nappa and Vegeta pay as he begins powering up, triggering seismic activity and launching rocks into the air. Surprisingly, Vegeta's scouter registers an increasing power of 7,000 and 8,000 before Goku abruptly stops. Panicked, Nappa inquires about Kakarot's current battle power, prompting Vegeta to reveal that it's over 8,000. Nappa yells in astonishment, and Goku states he likely won't need to use the Kaioken, leaving Vegeta perplexed. Asserting that there's no way he can be defeated, Nappa charges at Goku, and in a swift motion, Goku appears behind him, delivering a forceful kick that sends Nappa face first into the ground. As Gohan and Krillin sit in amazement, Nappa wonders how Goku managed to get behind him. Nappa seethes with anger as Goku confidently asserts he's not as strong as he thought. Observing from a safe distance, Krillin and Gohan ponder this unexpected turn of events, while Vegeta recognizes the difference in Kakarot's battle power compared to his battle with Raditz. Nappa inquires if Goku is saying he's nothing but talk, and the Saiyan confirms. Determined to prove Goku wrong though, Nappa powers up and charges at him. However, Goku effortlessly evades every punch and kick, and as Nappa delivers another attack, Goku disappears, creating a considerable distance between them. Krillin and Gohan struggle to follow Goku's rapid movements, leaving Vegeta astonished at Kakarot's remarkable increase in strength. With swift movements, Goku rushes toward Nappa, moving fast enough to stand on his head. Nappa attempts to crush him with his hands overhead, but Goku reappears in front of him, delivering a powerful punch to his stomach and declaring that attack for Chaozu. Goku ducks Nappa's retaliatory 
Midori kick and lands another punch which sends Nappa flying, declaring that for Yamcha. As Nappa stops himself from crashing into a nearby mountain, he grows angry and hurls an explosive blast at Goku. Unfazed, Goku stands still and neutralizes it with a shout, shocking Nappa and Vegeta as he soars into the air and declares his next attack for Tien as he knocks Nappa back down. Descending after him, Goku declares his next attack for Piccolo and delivers a forceful kick. Nappa crashes into a mountain but swiftly emerges, now visibly infuriated. Nappa asserts his status as an elite warrior, denouncing Kakarot as a low-class warrior and states that he won't be made a fool of by someone like him. Excited by Goku's strength, Krillin and Gohan watch. Suddenly, Vegeta intervenes, instructing Nappa to calm down and think clearly as Kakarot isn't an unbeatable opponent. Nappa heeds the advice, expressing gratitude while Vegeta, privately thinking on Nappa's foolishness, asserts he may have to step in the way things are going. Nappa, noting that Kakarot got him angry before, notes that he'll show him what he's really made of. Goku, expressing eagerness, confirms that this is the fight he desired, but Nappa dismisses it as a bluff. Vegeta, however, perceives that Kakarot isn't just talking tough, but has the confidence to back it up. Nappa then initiates a power-up and flicks his hand upward, causing the ground beneath Goku to erupt, similar to his destructive rampage in East City. Goku skillfully evades the explosion by flying out of harm's way, but Nappa quickly detects him and gives chase. A punch from Nappa is met with a dodge and a counter kick from Goku, leading to a brief exchange of blows. Impressed, Goku remarks that Nappa has improved significantly, provoking laughter from the Saiyan, who threatens to conclude the battle with his next move. Nappa then unleashes a massive mouth blast at Goku, who at point blank range deflects it with a Kamehameha just before impact. A resulting explosion ensues, surprising Vegeta, who's taken aback by Goku's swift and precise defense. As Goku recovers unscathed, Nappa, bewildered, can't believe Goku brushed aside his best technique, prompting Goku to acknowledge Nappa as a formidable opponent. Suddenly, Vegeta intervenes, declaring that Nappa is unable to finish the job and forcing him to step in to handle the situation. Krillin and Gohan, intrigued by Vegeta's confidence, ponder the power that even the formidable Nappa fears. Disgruntled and ashamed, Nappa warns Goku that he'll soon regret crossing them as Vegeta, a genius fighter named after the planet Vegeta, will be facing him soon. Nappa descends, intent on backing out of the fight, but asserts he can't just run away as he targets Krillin and Gohan, much to Goku's shock. In a sudden move, Nappa dives down toward the two as Goku yells he won't make it in time. In response, the Saiyan unleashes a resounding cry of Kaioken as he accelerates, crashing into the back of Nappa with intense force. This act surprises Vegeta as Goku intercepts the Saiyan before he hits the ground, catches him, and holds him above his head next to Krillin and Gohan. Goku throws Nappa's incapacitated body in front of Vegeta, announcing his inability to continue the fight and implores Vegeta to take his friend and depart from Earth. Puzzled by Goku's sudden burst of speed and power, Vegeta reflects, wondering what just happened. As Nappa groans in pain, Vegeta remains in disbelief, and Krillin questions Goku about the technique he just used, suspecting he learned it from King Kai. Goku confirms and elaborates that it's the Kaioken, a technique that enables him to control all of the ki in his body, amplifying it instantly. When executed correctly, strength, speed, destructive power, and defense significantly surge. While Krillin and Gohan express admiration for the technique, Vegeta, nearby, wonders what the group are discussing. Krillin wonders why Goku didn't use the Kaioken from the start, and Goku cautions that there are drawbacks to using the technique incorrectly. He recalls King Kai's warning in a flashback, stating that any mistake in controlling the Kaioken could break down the body, with a maximum multiplier of two, exceeding which could impose a severe strain. Meanwhile, an injured Nappa pleads with Vegeta for assistance. Vegeta callously takes Nappa's hand, smirks, and hurls him into the air. Nappa frantically questions Vegeta's motives, and Vegeta tells him he has no use for a paralyzed Saiyan. Vegeta then powers up as he declares death to Nappa, as he launches a blast at him, scaring the Saiyan, who dies in the resulting massive explosion. As the smoke clears, Vegeta turns to Goku, who safely ascended into the air, holding on to Krillin and Gohan. As Goku silently marvels at Vegeta's power, Krillin expresses his shock that he killed his own ally. Goku then tells Gohan and Krillin to return to Kame House right away, and Krillin agrees, but Gohan hesitates. However, Krillin tells Gohan that Vegeta is too much for them to handle, and if they stay, they'll only be distracting Goku. Before 
Before they depart though, Krillin wonders if Goku can switch his battle location, considering he doesn't want the remaining bodies of their friends destroyed when they bring them back to life. Goku, however, wonders what Krillin means by this, as with Piccolo and Kami gone, the Dragon Balls are rendered useless. Gohan wonders what Krillin is implying as well, to which Krillin replies that he'll explain everything later, assuming Goku manages to defeat Vegeta. Goku asserts the need to win, agreeing to change locations as requested. Krillin, expressing his apologies for relying solely on Goku, extends his hand, urging his friend not to die. After a handshake, Goku playfully pats Gohan on the head, suggesting they go fishing after all is said and done. Goku then lands, proposing to Vegeta that they finish their battle someplace else. The two soar off, leaving Gohan and Krillin behind, and eventually reach a rocky desert with numerous formations, where Vegeta chuckles, proclaiming this is the place Kakarot has chosen for his grave. Vegeta taunts Kakarot, expressing he should feel honored as a low-class warrior like him gets to tangle with the super elite. He explains the Saiyan process where a newborn's fighting ability determines their fate, sending those with inferior potential to planets lacking threatening inhabitants, and states that Goku was one of those unlucky few. Goku, appreciative, acknowledges that the Earth is his home, and asserts that even a low-class warrior can surpass an elite if he puts his mind to it. Vegeta, however, dismisses Goku's notion, deeming it a humorous joke, and vows to show him a wall he'll never be able to overcome with training alone. The Saiyans assume fighting stances, and the battlefield goes quiet as the two stare each other down. Suddenly, Goku makes the first move and charges at Vegeta. Punches are exchanged, and Goku attempts to kick Vegeta, but Vegeta skillfully evades Goku's kick with backflips. Goku pursues him, and converging once more, Vegeta delivers an elbow to Goku's face, but Goku regains control and ascends into the air. From behind, Vegeta swings at Goku, who deftly dodges. A sequence of kicks and evasions follows as the two soar through the air, exchanging blows. Amidst the battle, Vegeta taunts Goku, wondering if he can do better than this. Goku is kicked in the stomach and manages to dodge a kick that follows, as Vegeta states Kakarot displayed more power when he fought Nappa and demands to see it as he forcefully drives Goku toward the ground. Goku, however, regains control and safely lands on a nearby rock formation. Vegeta joins him on another rock, leaving Goku to privately acknowledge that Vegeta isn't even taking the fight seriously yet and has already surpassed his speed and technique. Determined, Goku declares he'll show Vegeta the power he wants to see as he ignites the Kaioken and launches a shockwave attack. Vegeta evades by flying upwards, but Goku pursues him, managing to land a punch to his face. Goku continues the assault, delivering more hits and a final kick that sends Vegeta flying into the distance. As Goku gives chase, Vegeta recovers, accelerates, and retaliates with a powerful kick. The two touch down, and despite Goku's awe at Vegeta's strength, he silently admits he's getting excited. As Goku stands smiling, Vegeta wonders if he's given up hope, or if he somehow has more power waiting to be unveiled. Goku, however, visibly thrilled by the challenge, revels in the confrontation, likely fueled by the battle-hungry Saiyan blood flowing within him. In response, Vegeta assumes Goku's hit his limit, and resolves to present him with a final parting gift, the overwhelming power befitting a Saiyan elite. As Vegeta begins to power up, the earth quakes, surrounding and swirling dark clouds, creating a thunderous atmosphere similar to a typhoon. The Saiyan's power continues to swell, and he suddenly lets out a powerful scream as the sky reverts to normal and the rock formation surrounding him crumble to the ground. Goku notes the change in the earth's conditions, but suddenly turns his attention to Vegeta, who stands before him menacingly. Vegeta declares to Kakarot that the battle is over, and charges toward him without hesitation. Mid-air, Vegeta smashes Goku with a headbutt, followed by an elbow to the stomach, sending Goku hurtling toward the ground. Goku manages to save himself, only for Vegeta to kick him from behind, redirecting him toward a rock formation. Swiftly, Goku lands atop the rocks, spotting Vegeta hovering in the air above. Vegeta launches a blast toward Goku, and in response, Goku initiates his Kaioken times 2 as he leaps into the air, the resulting explosion having been where he stood before. Vegeta launches another blast at Goku, who, with little time to react, narrowly dodges it, losing a significant portion of his shirt. Landing, Goku curses Vegeta's formidable speed and power, realizing that even a Kaioken times 2 fell short. Determined, Goku discards the remnants of his shirt, stating the intention to elevate the technique to a Kaioken times 3. Nearby, Yajirobe watches cautiously from behind a rock formation, acknowledging both Goku and Vegeta's extraordinary abilities. Contemplating the potential strain of a 
Kaioken times three on his body, Goku is spurred on by Vegeta's taunts, urging him to make a move. Goku, at the same time, thinks to himself that he won't have a choice but to push the Kaioken further, lest he be defeated by Vegeta. As Vegeta boasts about being the strongest Saiyan, even among the most elite of their race, Yajirobe remains hidden, wondering if he should leave while he has the chance. Suddenly, Vegeta is surprised as he witnesses Goku power up, yelling for his body not to fail on him as he plans to unleash the Kaioken times three. Meanwhile, on his distant planet, King Kai expresses concern about Goku exceeding a two times Kaioken, but believes it may be necessary given he doesn't stand a chance against Vegeta the way he is now. Back on Earth, the onlookers at Kame House are alerted by Bulma that Goku must be fighting as they monitor the escalating battle using Raditz's scouter. The readings surge from 17,000 to 19,000 to 21,000, but as the scouter continues to rise, it succumbs to the intensity of the ongoing battle and explodes, leaving everyone in awe. On the battlefield, Goku gains control of the times 3 Kaioken, causing Vegeta to react with alarm. With a glimmer in his eye, Goku swiftly approaches Vegeta, delivering a powerful punch that propels him through the air. Goku descends beneath the falling Vegeta, launching a direct upward assault. In a sharp turn, Goku swiftly evades Vegeta's attempt to counter with a blast and initiates a series of agile maneuvers. Vegeta attempts to throw a blast at Goku from afar, but the Saiyan manages to avoid it and appear behind Vegeta, delivering a forceful kick to his face that sends him crashing into the rocks below. Immediately, Vegeta emerges from the rubble irate, but Goku gives him no time to recover as he swoops in, leaps behind Vegeta, and executes a knee strike that sends the Saiyan flying. Vegeta manages to land on his feet and retaliate with a rapid charge toward Goku, but Goku effortlessly dodges Vegeta's punch and counters with a forceful gut punch, leaving Vegeta reeling and coughing up blood. Goku, now powered down from the Kaioken, stands out of breath as Vegeta steps back, angrily acknowledging that Kakarot's power level has exceeded his own. As Goku thinks to himself that he'll need to end the battle quickly to avoid succumbing to exhaustion, Yajirobe entertains the thought that Goku might emerge victorious in this intense confrontation. Vegeta, a super elite warrior, grapples with the disbelief that he, the supposed greatest warrior in the universe, could be defeated by a low-class commoner. Goku, reflecting on the intense pain coursing through his entire body, recognizes the toll of pushing himself with the Kaioken times three. Observing blood on his glove after swiping his hand across his mouth, Vegeta becomes enraged at the notion that someone like Goku could draw out his blood. Fueled by anger, Vegeta threatens to blow the earth into a million pieces and ascends rapidly into the sky. Fully powered up, Vegeta readies a devastating blast aimed directly at the earth, exclaiming that Kakarot can dodge if he wants, but the planet will suffer for it. In response, Goku opts to counter with the triple Kaioken Kamehameha and readies himself for the confrontation. Both Saiyans power up their blasts further, Vegeta exclaiming that Kakarot will never be able to stop his Gallic gun. As Vegeta unleashes his attack, Goku screams out, firing his Kamehameha upward. The two formidable attacks approach each other rapidly and collide midway, both aiming to win. Vegeta, shocked that Kakarot's blast is similar to his Gallic gun, continues exerting his energy while Goku does the same. The intense struggle continues, but Goku, determined to prevail, declares a Kaioken times four, and the Kamehameha intensifies significantly. This overwhelming burst of energy overpowers the Gallic gun and propels Vegeta away into the sky, much to his own shock. Exhausted, Goku powers down, gasping for breath in the aftermath. Visibly exhausted, Goku is approached by Yajirobe, who expresses relief that the battle is over. Yajirobe congratulates Goku on defeating Vegeta, patting him on the back, but Goku screams out in pain, confusing him. When questioned what's wrong, Yajirobe learns that Goku put too much strain on his body. Goku then warns Yajirobe to run while he can, stating that Vegeta is still alive, and asserting that if a Kamehameha were all it took to take him down, he wouldn't have had trouble defeating him in the first place. Yajirobe wonders if Goku can still win this, but Goku expresses doubt, saying he's hit his limit. In response, Yajirobe wishes Goku good luck and takes off. Meanwhile, despite the ongoing Kamehameha propelling Vegeta skyward, he eventually breaks free as the beam continues on. Enraged at being overpowered by Kakarot, Vegeta briefly loses composure, wondering how Kakarot's power could be higher than his, as he's a Saiyan elite, the strongest in the galaxy. After a brief moment to catch his breath, Vegeta smirks, now intent on transforming into a great ape to increase his strength dramatically, although he despises the idea of doing so just to defeat Kakarot. However, in his search for the full 
full moon to trigger the transformation, Vegeta realizes it's gone and investigates. On King Kai's planet, the Kai watches Vegeta, thinking to himself that the moon is gone now, thanks to Piccolo's intervention in the past. The Kai goes on to say though, that even without his great ape transformation, Vegeta is formidable and with Goku at his limit, things aren't looking too good. However, King Kai believes that if Goku can somehow hit Vegeta with the spirit bomb, he'll win for sure. Back on Earth, Goku wonders why Vegeta hasn't returned yet, unaware of the Saiyan's intentions. At the same time, Vegeta remains in the sky, puzzled about the missing moon, and deduces Kakarot took it out before their fight got started. Angered, Vegeta devises another plan, stating his power level may drop a bit, but the look on Kakarot's face will be more than enough to make up for it, as he soars back to the battlefield. Vegeta lands in front of Goku, as Goku thinks to himself that his only chance of winning will be to finish Vegeta with the spirit bomb. Vegeta, moments after, calls Goku out for blasting the moon out of the sky in an attempt to outsmart him, but Goku sits in confusion. Vegeta then begins to explain why the Saiyans transform at the sight of a full moon. He says that when sunlight is bounced back from the moon, it contains what Saiyans call Blutz Waves. When the moon is full, these Blutz Waves exceed 17 million Zenos, which is a unit used to measure waves of celestial light. Vegeta goes on to state that when 17 million Zenos of Blutz Waves are absorbed through the Saiyan eyes through gazing at the moon, their tail reacts, triggering their transformation. The Earth's moon may have been destroyed, but unfortunately for Goku, Vegeta reveals that there are very few Saiyans, including himself, that are capable of creating an artificial moon to reach the required amount of Zenos to trigger their great ape transformations. Vegeta then declares Goku's imminent death, as Goku wonders what the Saiyan is planning, as his power level dropped after creating a strange ball of light. Vegeta then tosses said ball of light into the air, and commands it to burst open and mix with the Earth's oxygen. A bright flash of light ensues, and when it's over, Goku notices the artificial moon in the sky, as King Kai panics at what this means. Vegeta exclaims that Kakarot will regret having lost his tail, and begins his transformation into a great ape. Somewhere further away, Krillin and Gohan approach Kame House, but they notice the distant glow of the artificial moon, wondering what it is. Suddenly, the two sense an immense key, not belonging to Goku, and assume it has to be Vegeta. Concerned, Gohan decides to go back, realizing that his father is in serious danger and will die if he doesn't help. Krillin insists they're no match for Vegeta, and Gohan concurs, but says he's going anyway. As the boy flies off, Krillin decides to join him. Meanwhile, Goku is horrified at the sight of Vegeta's great ape transformation. As the transformation concludes, Vegeta, capable of speech in this form, taunts Goku, going on to state that the power Saiyans gain in their great ape form is 10 times greater than before. Goku, now aware of the transformation, recalls his grandpa Gohan warning him about the great ape monster and the danger it poses during a full moon. He also reflects on Kami preventing his tail from regrowing. With all this in mind, it dawns on Goku that the monster who killed grandpa Gohan all those years ago and wreaked havoc on the Tenkaichi Budokai was him. Goku then apologizes to his grandfather, stating that when he dies, he'll visit him in the afterlife to apologize personally. From a distance, Yajirobe is astonished at the monstrous form, recognizing the Saiyan's attire and correctly assumes it to be Vegeta transformed. Goku resolves to show Vegeta the power of the spirit bomb and is suddenly bombarded as the Saiyan strikes down at Goku. Goku narrowly evades, but is kicked towards the ground. As Vegeta charges in laughing, Goku attempts a Kaioken and flies skyward, but Vegeta effortlessly swats him away with his tail. Vegeta charges in again, and mid-air, Goku contemplates his limited options, realizing there's insufficient time to charge a spirit bomb as Vegeta is too fast, even in his great ape form. He says not even a five times Kaioken would work, and states he needs just 10 seconds to focus his energy. Suddenly, Goku then gets an idea, deciding to borrow one of Tien's techniques. Employing the solar flare, he blinds Vegeta, providing an opportunity to fly over to the rock formations in the distance. Believing he's far enough away, Goku pleads with the earthlings and all living things for a bit of their energy, while Vegeta grows furious in his temporarily sightless state. Goku persistently gathers energy for the spirit bomb, noting that Vegeta's eyesight is gradually returning. Despite being unable to see Goku, Vegeta senses him in the distance, infuriated. As life energy begins to gather for Goku, Vegeta suddenly spots him. Realizing he's been discovered, Goku believes he has a bit more time before Vegeta reaches him, and at the same time, the energy collection for the spirit bomb is completed. However, as Goku attempts to launch the attack at Vegeta, the Saiyan releases a massive mouth 
Earth Blast, causing a colossal explosion and obliterating the rock formation Goku stood on. Yajirobe is blown away, and as the dust settles, Gohan and Krillin continue flying back toward the battlefield. Unprepared for such an attack, Goku sits among the rubble, noting how Vegeta caught him off guard completely. Rising to his feet, he then states that his efforts for the spirit bomb have gone to waste as Vegeta lands in front of him. Vegeta mocks Kakarot, noting that he's hit his limit, and Goku, barely able to move, says he doesn't have a chance of defeating Vegeta anymore as he used up nearly all his energy creating the spirit bomb. Vegeta approaches, ready to step on Goku, but Goku narrowly avoids it. Goku tries getting away, but Vegeta swiftly swats Goku into a nearby rock formation, leaving him unable to move. As Vegeta begins to step on his legs, Gohan and Krillin notice Goku's diminishing key. Vegeta lifts his foot as Goku screams in agony, his legs revealed to be completely crushed. Vegeta jokes about accidentally crushing Goku's legs and states that next he'll accidentally crush his heart. Goku, in pain, tries to catch his breath as Vegeta readies his massive finger, telling Kakarot it's the end and discourages him from coming back to life as the earth will be gone even if he does. Goku, lying in the dirt, believes it's the end, noting that Vegeta completely beat him and finds it frustrating that he won't be able to challenge him again as he's about to die. Vegeta moves in to impale Goku with one of his fingers, but Goku surprises him by firing a one-handed blast into Vegeta's right eye as the Saiyan screams in pain. Laying back down, Goku tells Vegeta to consider that a farewell present and states that he doesn't even have enough strength left to blow his nose as he tells the Saiyan to do as he pleases. Reeling and angered by the damage done to his face, Vegeta, bleeding from his eye, grabs Goku for his audacity and starts squeezing him, intent to crush him like a grape. Vegeta maintains his grip on Goku and Yajirobe, surprisingly still present, observes helplessly, realizing there's nothing he can do. As Vegeta intensifies the pressure to Goku's body, Yajirobe is distressed by the agonizing screams emanating from Goku. Krillin and Gohan approach the battlefield, noticing the strange ball of light again and wonders what it could be. When they spot Goku and Vegeta below, Krillin urgently instructs Gohan to get down and find a place to hide. Recognizing that Vegeta has transformed into a great ape, Krillin panics and Yajirobe notices that two have arrived. Vegeta continues his assault on Goku, stating that every bone in his body is broken. Krillin and Gohan land nearby and decide to sneak up on Vegeta from behind. Suddenly, Yajirobe intervenes, cautioning the two that the creature standing in front of them is the Saiyan, Vegeta. Despite being aware of the situation, Krillin exclaims that if they cut off his tail, he'll return to normal. Krillin then formulates his plan. Yajirobe and Gohan will distract Vegeta from the front and Krillin will attempt to sever the tail from behind. Krillin urges everyone to hurry as Goku is about to die and as he and Gohan advance, Yajirobe, skeptical of their chances against Vegeta's strength, holds back. Krillin senses Goku's diminishing energy and believes they may not make it in time as Vegeta continues squeezing him. However, Vegeta stops as he senses someone nearby and demands they show themselves. According to plan, Gohan reveals himself, demanding Vegeta to let his father go. Seizing the opportunity though, Vegeta invites Gohan to witness Kakarot's demise. Behind the Saiyan, Krillin raises his hand to form a Destructo Disc and at the same time, Vegeta instructs Gohan to pay close attention as he's about to crush Goku until there's nothing left. Krillin releases the Destructo Disc and as the blade draws closer, Vegeta effortlessly leaps over it, surprising both Krillin and Gohan as the projectile slices through the rock formation, including the one Gohan stands on. Vegeta lands and stunned, Krillin and Gohan watch as the Saiyan boast about knowing another one of them had been on the battlefield all along, as he knew Kakarot's son wouldn't dare come back here alone. The Saiyan exclaims that after Kakarot's been dealt with, they are next and prepares to finish off the unconscious Goku in his hands. Frustrated, Krillin apologizes to Goku for his inability to act, noting that there's nothing they can do against Vegeta's might. As Vegeta finally prepares to crush Goku between his hands, Krillin can't bear to look and Gohan screams for him to stop, but suddenly, Yajirobe intervenes, swiftly severing Vegeta's tail with his sword. Caught off guard, Vegeta states he didn't expect another Earthling to be on the battlefield as he acknowledges the loss of his tail. His transformation then disappears as the Saiyan
Saiyan drops a bloodied Goku to the ground and reverts to his normal state. Krillin expresses joy over Yajirobe's intervention, while the latter remains scared, concealed behind a rock. Gohan, still bewildered, is unaware of what transpired, and Vegeta, infuriated, vows to kill them all and charges toward Gohan. Krillin tells the boy to run away, but Vegeta lands in front of Gohan immediately, stating that he'll start the killing with him. Vegeta delivers a powerful gut punch to Gohan that sends the young Saiyan reeling. As Vegeta prepares for another assault, mocking Gohan as Saiyan hybrids are supposed to be strong, Krillin rushes in, but Vegeta, anticipating the move, turns around and delivers a devastating kick to Krillin's face, knocking him into a nearby rock formation as Yajirobe watches anxiously. Turning back to Gohan, Vegeta instructs him to rise and make their fight more entertaining. Grasping Gohan by the shirt, Vegeta belittles him, headbutting him forcefully and remarking on the presence of red blood, even in trash. Deciding to be somewhat merciful, Vegeta throws Gohan next to Goku, saying at the very least, they should die together. Goku, unable to move and limited on options, implores Gohan to fight on his behalf. At the same time, Vegeta notices that Kakarot's gained consciousness again. Gohan, feeling overwhelmed, believes Vegeta is too strong, and Vegeta, expressing his intent to kill everyone, notes the order he'll do in it. First he'll kill Goku, then Gohan, then Krillin, and lastly, the tail-severing Yajirobe, who grows scared in realizing that Vegeta knows he's there. Encouraging Gohan, Goku insists that even if his son can't win, he can at least stall Vegeta, allowing Krillin an opportunity to finish him off. Krillin slowly rises, and Gohan continues to lack confidence in his own strength. Goku, however, grows irritated, urging his son to remember Piccolo's teachings, assuring him that Piccolo wouldn't have wanted him to just lie down and die. Their conversation is interrupted, though, as Vegeta lands a knee on Goku's stomach, prompting coughs of blood from the Saiyan. Goku yells out in pain once more, as Vegeta towers over him, much to Gohan's shock. Vegeta mocks Kakarot for his resilience and continues to torture him, launching a barrage of kicks as Gohan watches. Vegeta continues his assault, and Gohan, angered, rises to his feet, demanding Vegeta to stop. Turning around, Vegeta watches as Gohan challenges him to fight him instead, and the Saiyan arrogantly questions Gohan's ability to defeat him. Gohan retaliates with an energy blast, but Vegeta effortlessly evades it. Gohan then executes a jump kick, sending Vegeta flying. Gohan pursues him, but Vegeta counterattacks with a kick to Gohan's face. Meanwhile, Goku calls out to Krillin to come closer, and Krillin weakly does so as Vegeta and Gohan continue to exchange blows. Krillin wonders why Goku didn't tell Gohan to run away, but rather than answering, Goku expresses his desire to transfer the spirit bomb he collected from Earth to Krillin. Gohan and Vegeta continue their intense battle, while Krillin seeks clarification from Goku. Goku reveals the existence of the spirit bomb, a gradually accumulating force of ki from the Earth. Goku asserts that he lost half of its power during his battle with Vegeta earlier, but believes it still possesses enough power to defeat the Saiyan. Urging Krillin to hold his hand, Goku, despite broken bones, instructs Krillin to concentrate. Krillin, bewildered, complies as Goku's hand begins to glow, transferring the energy to Krillin's hand. Vegeta smashes Gohan down, sending him to the ground as Krillin grapples with the newfound power. Goku tells Krillin not to let it overwhelm him and states that he's their only hope as Gohan is unable to control this type of energy. Successfully, Krillin forms a ball of energy, much to Goku's relief. At the same time, as Gohan stands injured, Vegeta rushes in, swiftly attacking the boy with an elbow, prompting Goku to request Krillin to use the spirit bomb against Vegeta and make sure he doesn't miss. Gohan, recovering, marvels at Vegeta's strength, while Krillin hops atop a taller rock formation, searching for an opening to launch the attack. Charging in once more, Vegeta commends Gohan's efforts, but states that he's hit his limit. Gohan leaps into the air to gain some distance, but Vegeta launches a blast at the boy barely manages to dodge. Gohan retaliates with his own blast, but Vegeta effortlessly evades, much to Gohan's shock. Krillin, observing the battle from above, struggles to launch the spirit bomb due to Vegeta's swift movements. However, a telepathic message from King Kai advises Krillin to sense the evil energy in Vegeta in order to aim the attack accordingly. Krillin, confused on who's speaking, is greeted by King Kai, who tells him the fate of the Earth rests in his hands. As Vegeta approaches Gohan, once again stating his status as a super elite warrior, Krillin finally begins to understand the nature of the spirit bomb as he readies the attack. At the same time, Vegeta unleashes a barrage of blasts toward Gohan, who narrowly evades the explosions. Krillin attempts to focus in feeling out Vegeta's evil 
energy, and as Gohan is smashed into a nearby rock formation, Goku thinks to himself for Krillin to hurry up. Meanwhile, Yajirobe notices Krillin holding the spirit bomb. The explosions toward Gohan stop, and the boy lies on the ground, as Vegeta rushes in once more, preparing for the final blow. At the same time, Krillin finally senses Vegeta's energy, but is met with yelling from Yajirobe, telling him to hurry up, which catches Vegeta's attention. Noting how stupid Yajirobe is, Krillin launches the spirit bomb at Vegeta, but the Saiyan manages to leap over it at the last minute. As panic ensues amongst the onlookers, King Kai notes that it's all over, as the attack hurdles toward Gohan. Goku, however, telepathically instructs Gohan to deflect the attack, noting that as long as he doesn't have any evil energy in him, it will bounce away. Gohan then extends his hands, redirecting the spirit bomb as it hurdles back toward Vegeta. The spirit bomb lands a direct hit, and the ensuing explosion engulfs Vegeta, propelling him high into the air. With Vegeta seemingly defeated, a collective sense of relief and celebration washes over everyone. Krillin and Gohan approach Goku, engaging in conversation, only to be interrupted by Vegeta's sudden descent from the sky. Landing not far from the group, Vegeta's remarkably intact appearance surprises Gohan, but Krillin notes it's just his body. Approaching Vegeta, Krillin notes that he was really quite a monster, but contemplates the idea of giving him a proper grave. Vegeta, however, unexpectedly awakens, asserting that the grave will be for them. This shocks Krillin, Gohan, Yajirobe, and even Goku. Rising to his feet, Vegeta acknowledges the group have certainly did a number on him and states that for a moment, even he thought he was done for. As King Kai sits in shock on his planet, Vegeta threatens to exact revenge as he backhands Krillin, sending him flying. As Krillin attempts to compose himself, Vegeta declares his intent to obliterate the entire planet. Vegeta advances, expressing his disdain for the perceived indignity the group have inflicted on his pride. Abruptly, the Saiyan declares they drop dead already as he halts and releases a massive shockwave, triggering a colossal explosion that sends everyone flying. As the dust from the explosion begins to settle, Vegeta stands atop a giant crater resulting from his attack. As the Saiyan looks around to see if the work is done, he notices Krillin, Goku, and Gohan still alive, stating his attack was pathetic as they're still clinging to life. Vegeta, nearing unconsciousness but resolute, decides to finish up on Earth so he can get some rest. To his surprise though, upon approaching Gohan, he discovers the unexpected return of the young Saiyan's tail. Krillin, at the same time, notes that Goku's tail used to grow back in his youth as well. Spotting his still active artificial moon in the sky, Vegeta prepares to sever Gohan's tail. However, an unforeseen development occurs behind him. Yajirobe charges at Vegeta, screaming aloud, and slashes his sword down the Saiyan's back, penetrating his armor. Yajirobe Yajirobe lands and Vegeta topples as the human rises to his feet in laughter, congratulating himself for accomplishing such a feat and exclaiming that Vegeta, a Saiyan, was done in by Yajirobe. However, to Yajirobe's shock, Vegeta slowly rises once more. Yajirobe attempts to slice Vegeta again, but the Saiyan dodges, staring menacingly at the Earthling before him. Yajirobe then drops his sword and attempts to reconcile, claiming it was just a joke and offers for he and Vegeta to be friends. In response, Vegeta Vegeta kicks Yajirobe away, refusing to give him any time to recover as he delivers a devastating punch to his face that propels him into a cluster of rocks. Amidst the chaos, Goku urgently directs Gohan's attention to the luminous sphere in the sky, and the young Saiyan does so, having fallen off the rock he was lying on. Vegeta races to intervene, aiming to finish Gohan off, yet it proves futile as Gohan has initiated his transformation. As Gohan undergoes his change, Vegeta attempts to thwart the process, realizing the impending danger. Krillin observes Goku's daring gamble to rely on the Great Eight and expresses concern. Vegeta recalls that in his rush, he forgot that targeting the tail would stop the transformation process. He then attempts to rip Gohan's tail off of him, but is interrupted when the Great Eight transformation nears completion and delivers a powerful smash to Vegeta's head. As Gohan rises, his transformation now complete, he lets out a mighty roar, prompting panic from Vegeta as Krillin reflects on Goku's great ape from the past and wonders if Gohan will completely lose control. In the midst of Gohan demolishing nearby rock formations, Krillin is caught under some of the rubble, fearing he's gotten his answer. Gohan then lifts a giant boulder, continuing his rampage, but Krillin shouts, urging Gohan to retaliate.
retaliate against the Saiyan. Gohan then jolts, hearing Krillin's words, and focuses his attention on Vegeta, launching the boulder down at him as Krillin notes a bit of Gohan is still inside the Great Ape. Frustrated, Vegeta, noting that he won't last much longer, resolves to sever Gohan's tail since the artificial moon he created won't go out for at least another hour. Gohan ascends into the air, intent on attacking Vegeta, while Vegeta readies an attack similar to Krillin's Destructo Disc. As Gohan descends, Vegeta propels a disc toward him, successfully slicing off Gohan's tail. Gohan, reverting to his normal state, falls toward Vegeta, who suddenly realizes he's about to be crushed under the weight of the Great Ape. Gohan then collapses onto Vegeta, and both warriors crash to the ground. While Gohan lies unconscious, Vegeta, regaining consciousness, struggles to retrieve a remote control from his chest armor. Utilizing the remote, Vegeta calls for his ship, prompting Krillin's disbelief in his resilience. Simultaneously, in the remnants of East City, scientists uncover one of the two space pods that the Saiyans arrived in. Unexpectedly, the pod launches into the sky and takes off, leaving Vegeta in disbelief that he's being forced to run away. Meanwhile, Boma navigates an aircraft with Master Roshi, Chi Chi, and Korin aboard. Korin provides guidance, pinpointing Goku and the others are below the light emanating by Vegeta's artificial moon. Concerned about Gohan's fate, Chi Chi anxiously interrogates Korin, who speculates that Gohan is probably alive. Master Roshi expresses unease about the faintness of the five key sensed from earlier, including the Saiyan, who Korin notes is on the brink of death. On the battlefield, Vegeta's space pod descends, landing a short distance from the Saiyan. Despite his weakened state, Vegeta crawls toward the ship. Nearby, Krillin recognizes the spaceship and says that he can't let Vegeta get away, as the Saiyan talks aloud, ashamed that he's being forced to retreat. Krillin notices and retrieves Yajirobe's sword, stealthily approaching Vegeta, who weakly draws closer to his ship. At the same time, King Kai, pleased with the unfolding events, notes that Krillin and the others did well against the Saiyan, but cryptically hints at a deeper evil within the universe. As Vegeta reaches his ship, Krillin catches up, ready to strike. Vegeta notices Krillin and panics as the Earthling declares he'll be getting revenge for his fallen allies, as he lifts Yajirobe's sword above his head and screams for Vegeta to die. However, Goku, communicating directly to Krillin telepathically, intervenes and tells him to wait. Krillin realizes the voice is coming from Goku, and Batter, the Saiyan pleads with Krillin to spare Vegeta. Krillin questions the unexpected request, stating that Vegeta was the one responsible for killing their friends and needs to answer for that. He goes on to say that if they don't take care of this problem now, Vegeta will recover and attempt to destroy the Earth again, and Goku concurs. Krillin says that if Goku's expecting Vegeta to have a change of heart like Piccolo, he's wasting his time and suggests they kill him now, but Goku, resolute, tells his friend that killing Vegeta would be nothing more than a waste. Goku goes on to say that even after finishing his training with King Kai, Vegeta surpassed his strength in every way imaginable. He notes that he hadn't felt excitement like this since he battled Piccolo a few years back, and deduces that it may be his Saiyan blood driving him to test his limits. As Vegeta continues to inch his way into his pod, Goku tells Krillin he wants to prove himself against the Saiyan, to know that he can defeat him using his own power, and pleads with Krillin one last last time to let him go. Despite Krillin's reservations, challenging as it is to let someone like Vegeta escape, Krillin drops Yajirobe's sword, convinced to let Vegeta go. Krillin tells Goku he's earned the right to have things go his way, but makes him promise that the next time Vegeta returns to Earth, Goku will be much stronger, and he agrees. Vegeta, now inside his ship, insults Krillin as trash, and warns him to be prepared for their next encounter, as he'll slaughter them all and blast off into space. Soon after, Krillin Krillin retrieves the unconscious Gohan, and Yajirobe injured, criticizes Krillin for not finishing off Vegeta. Goku apologizes to Krillin, who brushes it off, suggesting he may know a way to bring their friends back to life, and at the same time, Bulma and her companions arrive in their plane, preparing to land after the battle's end. A small airplane touches down, and Chi Chi immediately rushes out, vaulting over Goku to get to Gohan. As she takes her son from Krillin's arms in a panic, Krillin reassures her that Gohan is fine, but it's Goku who's in critical shape. Chi Chi, however, ignores him and vows to never leave Gohan unattended again to prevent further harm, while Krillin continues to express concern about Goku. Krillin approaches where Goku, Bulma, Korin, and Master Roshi are standing. Goku informs them that the Saiyan Vegeta has escaped, and Krillin relays to Bulma that all but four of the Dragon Team members were killed. Bulma isn't worried though, asserting that they'll use the Dragon Balls to resurrect everyone in a year. However, Goku clarifies that with
with Piccolo's death, Kami is also dead, and the Dragon Balls are no more. Bulma rejects this, convinced that since she only sees Gohan, Goku, and Krillin, the fourth survivor must be Piccolo. Yajirobe, however, sneaks up from behind and announces that he's the fourth survivor. Stunned, Bulma begins to sob over Yamcha's death and the realization that she won't be able to see him ever again. Master Roshi can't believe that Yajirobe outlived Piccolo, and Yajirobe argues that without him, the others wouldn't be alive. Korin, however, intervenes, suggesting that they focus on getting the wounded to a hospital, given there are no more sensu beans. As night falls, everyone is back on the plane, with Master Roshi at the controls and Bulma still weeping. Krillin directs him to where their friend's bodies are, advising Bulma to hold back her tears as he has some shocking news, as there might be a way to revive those killed by the Saiyans. Goku recalls Krillin mentioning something like this earlier and questions his thought process. However, Krillin defers for a moment, pointing out that they've reached the location of their friends' bodies and instructs Master Roshi to land. Once gathered, they note the absence of Chaozu, who Krillin explains self-destructed, leaving no remains. Anger bubbles in Master Roshi as he examines the corpses and cooling units, and Bulma offers to pilot, claiming she's the most composed at the moment. Eventually, Gohan wakes up, puzzled about why he's in his mother's lap, and inquires about the Saiyan, although Krillin assures him that the threat has passed. When Gohan questions where his dad is, Goku tells him he's right behind him and that if it weren't for the group, he probably would have died. Yajirobe questions Chi-Chi on why she seems more concerned for her son than her own husband who's in critical condition. Chi-Chi retorts that Goku is to blame for Gohan's injuries, which Gohan denies. She prioritizes Gohan's future over the Earth's well-being, leading Yajirobe to ask Goku if it's okay to hit her. Bulma then prompts Krillin to revisit his earlier point. Krillin explains that the two Saiyans apparently found out about the Dragon Balls from Goku's brother Scouter and came to Earth looking for them. He also explains that when they saw Piccolo, they mentioned he was a Namekian and that he and Kami are aliens. They then mentioned a crucial factor that Namekians not only have high power levels, but some have magic abilities as well. And if they went to a planet called Namek, they might be able to find Dragon Balls more powerful than ones on Earth. This news shocks everyone and Gohan agrees, stating that he too heard that the Namekians Namekians created these magical orbs. Krillin suggests that if they could somehow journey to planet Namek, they might be able to resurrect everyone. Gohan is thrilled at the prospect of Piccolo returning, and Krillin excitedly adds that it would also revive Kami, thereby restoring Earth's Dragon Balls. However, Bulma bursts his bubble, questioning how he plans to locate this distant planet. Goku proposes contacting King Kai for the coordinates, confident that he would know where to find it. Goku questions King Kai on if he's aware of planet Namek's location, and King King Kai confirms that he knows. Master Roshi is amazed that they can all hear King Kai speaking, and the Kai expresses his congratulations to the team for defeating Vegeta. Goku then expresses his surprise that his Kaioken technique wasn't effective against the Saiyan. King Kai says he underestimated the Saiyan's power, and Goku states maybe he was wrong to allow him to escape, prompting Master Roshi to inquire about this, to which Krillin promises to fill him in later. King Kai then consults a book to find Planet Namek's exact coordinates and reveals them to the Dragon Team. Bulma panics when she hears this and tells Master Roshi to take over the plane while she crunches some numbers. King Kai informs them that Planet Namek was once a thriving world until strange weather caused its inhabitants to die off, though some may still be alive. Krillin finds this information hard to believe, while Yajirobe thinks it's a lost cause. As King Kai searches for inhabitants of the planet, Korin suggests that Kami must have been one of the last survivors who escaped Namek and came to Earth, losing his memory in the process. King Kai then interrupts with news that there are indeed some Namekians still living on the planet, which renews everyone's hope. King Kai explains that the Namekians are peaceful, much like Kami, and speculates that his evil alter ego, Demon King Piccolo, emerged after interacting with evil Earthlings for so many years. Master Roshi ponders the increased chances of reviving their friends, but Bulma dampers their enthusiasm, asking how they intend to get to planet Namek. Krillin suggests using a spaceship, but Bulma dismisses that idea as naive, saying that even with her father's best engine, it would take over 4,000 years years for them to arrive. Everyone draws a blank on what to do next, but Krillin proposes using a Saiyan spaceship, stating that Nappa's must still be around. Goku adds that his deceased older brother Raditz also left a ship on Earth, although it was destroyed thanks to Gohan. Bulma begins to get excited over the prospect of just one ship remaining, and Master Roshi recalls that it might be found in East City, which the Saiyans destroyed first. Krillin then reveals that he has the remote control Vegeta used for his ship, and feeling hopeful, everyone starts to celebrate. The next day at West City Hospital, Goku is wrapped in bandages and anticipates being healed in four months according to doctors, but Korin assures him that the new sensu beans will only take a month to grow
grow before he can eat one. Krillin and Gohan have a shorter hospital stay, and Yajirobe complains about not getting to be a patient, although Korin points out he just wanted the hospital food. Krillin then teases Yajirobe for attempting to get on Vegeta's good side in the face of death, but Yajirobe says he only did it to drop Vegeta's guard. Suddenly, Bulma bursts into the room, urging everyone to watch a TV news report about a round object found amid the ruins of East City. Master Roshi mentions that the object has already been discovered by scientists, but Bulma decides to use the remote control Krillin gave her to bring it to them. However, as they watch on TV, a click of a button destroys the Saiyan spaceship, surprising everyone, including those in the newsroom. Bulma blames Krillin for providing her a faulty remote control, but Krillin retorts, stating that it was her fault for hitting the wrong button. Just then, Mr. Popo appears outside the hospital window, startling Bulma. Krillin recognizes him, and Mr. Popo announces for someone to come with him, as there's another spaceship. Krillin questions if another spaceship really exists, and Mr. Popo replies that it's likely. Roshi wonders who this person is, and Goku clarifies that Mr. Popo lives with Kami, but has been around far longer than him, knowing a lot of ancient gods that were around long ago as well. Puzzled by the word probably from Mr. Popo, Krillin questions him for a clearer answer. Mr. Popo says he's unsure, but suggests that someone accompany him to check it out. Krillin looks to Bulma, who hesitates but eventually agrees to go with Mr. Popo on his magic carpet, cautioning him to be gentle as she's delicate. They vanish, leaving the others wondering about the mysterious spaceship. The carpet reappears in a chilly, windy canyon. Mr. Popo instructs Bulma to disembark, and she questions their location, to which he replies the Yunzibit Highlands, shocking Bulma as she reveals they traveled to the other side of the world in an instant. Following Mr. Popo through the canyon, Bulma nervously wonders about his intentions before they finally stumble upon a large, spherical object supported by spiky legs. Mr. Popo questions whether it's a spaceship, and Bulma goes to investigate its surface, asking about its origin and purpose. Mr. Popo then shares a story from about a hundred years ago. Kami told him that as a child, he lived in the Yunzibit Highlands and was puzzled as to why no one else lived there. Kami had lost his memory due to a head injury and was left with a mysterious note saying someone would come for him later. Mr. Popo goes on to explain that although Kami remained certain that his parents would one day come back for him, he never saw them again, no matter how long he waited for them in Yunzibit. Kami waited between 20 and 30 years before giving up and moving on, leaving behind his strange insect-like house with a door that only opened through spoken words. The magic word to open the door that Mr. Popo reveals is Piccolo, and upon uttering it, a section of the object lowers like a platform, and he and Bulma climb aboard and say Piccolo again to enter. Inside, they find a futuristic room featuring a large seat behind a control panel. Bulma realizes that this must have been Kami's house, and theorizes he must have been sent to Earth to escape the cataclysmic weather change on his home planet. Considering why Kami's parents never joined him, Bulma surmises that they must have died shortly after sending him to Earth on his own. She then examines the control panel to figure out how to activate the spaceship, eventually realizing that it might be voice controlled. When the word Piccolo fails to work, Bulma theorizes the ship must only respond to its native language Namekian and recalls she heard Kami and Piccolo speaking it during the Tenkaichi Budokai. Mr. Popo states that he knows how to speak Namekian himself and confirms that Piccolo means different world in their language. Bulma instructs Mr. Popo to tell the ship to fly somewhere around Jupiter as a test, and upon command, the ship immediately takes off. Almost instantly, the two arrive at Jupiter, leading to celebrations and Mr. Popo shedding a tear at the thought of Kami being resurrected. Back at the hospital, Bulma announces the group can reach planet Namek in just a month, and with a few modifications to the spaceship, they'll be ready to launch in five days. Krillin is thrilled, and Corrin notes that Hope is still alive. When Bulma questions if Mr. Popo will be the one going to planet Namek, he declines, explaining that he can't leave Kami's lookout unattended for two months, and offers to teach her the Namekian language instead. Krillin insists Bulma has to go due to her technical expertise, to which she agrees, but adds that she'll need to install amenities like a shower, bed, and stereo for the journey. Bulma, however, states that she doesn't want to go alone. Yajirobe quickly declines to join, and Korin jokes that no one was expecting him to go anyway. Master Roshi considers a two-month round trip and offers to go, but Bulma shoots down the idea, saying that him going would only make it worse. With Goku unable to go, she turns to Krillin, who's hesitant about leaving Earth in case the Saiyan returns, but agrees anyway. Gohan then volunteers, and the room falls silent, leaving Chi-Chi in disbelief. Gohan stands his ground, saying Piccolo died to protect him, and that he wants to be the one who brings him back to life. Chi-Chi, however, protests, thinking only of herself, 
herself and not wanting to worry about her son for another two months, concerned about his education falling behind. As Goku's frustration rises, Gohan shouts at his mother to shut up, asserting that he has to go and help, as everyone who died trying to protect the Earth needs to be brought back to life. Both his father and the Ox King commend Gohan's newfound strength, and Bulma concludes that the matter is settled. Time passes as Bulma, her father, and the Capsule Corps employees work on the spaceship, and finally, the day of departure arrives. At Kame House, Krillin, now packed and ready, marvels at the spaceship alongside Master Roshi, although Bulma seems irate given she's overdressed for the occasion. Suddenly, they all notice Gohan's arrival along with Chi-Chi and the Ox King. Dressed in a formal suit and sporting a new bowl haircut, Gohan is hardly recognizable, prompting Krillin to joke him around. Gohan states his dad laughed at him too, and Chi-Chi explains his attire, stating that this is the first time mankind is going into space, and Gohan needs to look presentable. Exhausted but ready, Bulma says it's time to leave. Goodbyes are exchanged, and once on board, an irate Bulma initiates the launch sequence. The spaceship takes off at an incredible speed, leaving Gohan and Krillin unable to fasten themselves in. Now in space, Bulma tells the two that they can move around, and heads to another room to change. Krillin thinks she's going to wear pajamas, and suddenly remembers he forgot to bring his own. Gohan also changes, but into an outfit secretly made to resemble Piccolo's. Bulma returns, not in pajamas though, but in gear suited for adventure, and thus begins the group's journey to Planet Namek. As the journey progresses, Bulma wakes up from a nap surrounded by junk food wrappers and magazines. It's been a week, and she's already dreading the remaining 20 days of travel as she's bored. She regrets not creating a long-term sleeping device, and observes Krillin and Gohan engaged in image training shortly after. When Krillin finally pauses to catch his breath, he praises Gohan's strength as Goku's son and a student of Piccolo. Gohan, in turn, admires Krillin's range of techniques. Bulma then insists the two clean up, citing her status as a lady. Krillin, however, retorts that she's responsible for the mess and that he and Gohan have been cleaning up after themselves. Moreover, she's the one who complained about boredom. Annoyed, Bulma demands they treat her delicately as she stretches and leaves, prompting Krillin to point out that a lady wouldn't walk around in her underwear. At the main console, Bulma wonders where Vegeta could be, recalling how Saiyans purged planets to sell them. She suspects he might be seeking help from other aliens to heal up. And meanwhile, Vegeta's pod is nearing planet Frieza number 79. Two aliens in similar armor and scouters notice the incoming ship. Initially wondering if it's Frieza, they soon realize it's Vegeta and are puzzled by his unannounced return. They radio others to prepare for his arrival, and upon landing, they find Vegeta badly injured and hooked up to life support, so they rush him to medical care. For a while, Vegeta rests in a healing chamber. Once healed, he emerges from the pod, informed that his tail couldn't be restored, though he's unconcerned. Dressing, he questions Frieza's whereabouts and discovers that he recently left the planet. The alien responsible for healing Vegeta suggests reporting to the training room on the planet to speak to someone named Kui, although Vegeta ignores this and states that he has nothing to say to him. Told he's forgotten his scouter, Vegeta dismissively tells the attendant to keep it as he has no use for it anymore. As he walks through the base, Vegeta plots revenge on the Earthlings. He's soon interrupted by Kui, who mocks the recent failures of the Saiyans and comments on the deaths of Raditz and Nappa. Irritated, Vegeta attempts to ignore Kui, but learns that Frieza eavesdropped on their plans for eternal life via the scouters. Kui then informs Vegeta that Frieza plans to achieve eternal life and youth for himself via the Dragon Balls on planet Namek, much to the Saiyan's shock. Fuming over the prospect of being a slave to Frieza for the rest of his life, Vegeta rushes past Kui to take off in his pod for Namek. Meanwhile back on the spaceship, on day 34, Bulma, Krillin, and Gohan finally arrive at their intended destination, planet Namek. As the spaceship nears Namek, Gohan and Krillin buckle their seatbelts for atmospheric entry. Despite a semi-rough landing, they touch down successfully. Bulma starts to examine the atmosphere using the sensors from the ship, but Krillin and Gohan are already outside breathing normally. They discuss the fact that this is Piccolo's homeworld, prompting Bulma to scold them for recklessly leaving the ship. She then pulls out the dragon radar, and much to her delight, detects the presence of dragon balls on the planet. Krillin and Bulma celebrate with a dance, but Gohan interrupts them. He senses multiple strong energy signals nearby, and Krillin senses it too. Bulma dismisses their concerns though, asserting that it's probably just the Namekians. However, Krillin states the key they're sensing feels evil, but Bulma remains certain that they 
they have nothing to worry about, as the Namekians are peaceful by nature, according to King Kai. The radar shows four Dragon Balls located elsewhere, and the group consider introducing themselves to the Namekians. Suddenly, a Saiyan spaceship flies across the sky and lands, much to the surprise of Krillin and Bulma. Gohan finds this hard to believe, and Krillin tells him to mask his energy, otherwise they'll be discovered. Krillin theorizes that the one who just landed was Vegeta, and asserts that he must be here for the Dragon Balls as well. Gohan wonders how he was able to heal so fast, and panicking, Bulma suggests returning to Earth. Recognizing the peril of Vegeta acquiring the Dragon Balls for himself, Krillin advises Bulma to go back to Earth alone, as he and Gohan need to stay and collect the Dragon Balls themselves. Bulma agrees and plans to inform Master Roshi in addition to returning in two months with Goku, a timeline neither Gohan or Krillin are thrilled about. Meanwhile, Vegeta disembarks from his ship, determined to prevent Frieza from obtaining the Dragon Balls. He suspects Frieza knows of his insubordination and wants him dead, and though skeptical of his chances against Frieza, Vegeta believes the Dragon Balls will grant him the edge he needs. Reluctantly using a scouter, he locates Frieza and his henchmen Zarbon and Dodoria and flies off. Back on Earth, Master Roshi answers a call from Bulma, who briefs him on the situation and tells him to inform everyone except Chi-Chi. Suddenly, a second Saiyan space pod crashes nearby, much to the surprise of Gohan, Bulma, and Krillin, who wonder who this mysterious person is. Elsewhere on Namek, a village lies in ruins, its inhabitants dead. Various aliens in Saiyan-like armor are present, and one emerges holding a three-star Dragon Ball. Appearing before them is a small, effeminate individual floating in a pod known as Frieza, elated that there are only three more Dragon Balls to collect, as his group are in possession of the four the Dragon Team picked up on their radar earlier. Frieza tells the large, pink alien standing next to him known as Dodoria to hold the Dragon Balls with care, as Vegeta is likely pursuing them. A handsome, long-haired man holding the other two Dragon Balls known as Zarbon then speaks, alerting Frieza that Kui has arrived on Namek and is tailing Vegeta. Zarbon goes on to state that two strong energy signatures had appeared and then vanished, but Frieza asserts that their primary concern is dealing with Vegeta. Meanwhile, Kui, having landed near Vegeta's pod, checks his scouter and notes that he's found the Saiyan, then states it's time to clean up his mess. Back at the Dragon Team's location, Bulma believes the situation is terrible, and Krillin argues that there shouldn't be any more Saiyans around. At the same time, Kui locates Vegeta using his scouter. As he heads out, Kui informs Vegeta via his scouter that Frieza has authorized him to eliminate him. Vegeta, however, is simply standing on a cliff, amused at the idea of Kui defeating him, although his adversary tells him to check his scouter to determine who the victor will be, to which Vegeta just smirks. Back at the spacecraft, Bulma bids farewell to Krillin and Gohan, assuring them that she'll return with Goku. Krillin, however, tells her to hold on and suggests to Gohan they should leave too. Krillin is skeptical about the unfolding events on Namek, and states that even if Vegeta were to make a wish on the Dragon Balls, they could always come back and make theirs. However, Bulma mentions that this is assuming Vegeta doesn't kill Shenron like Demon King Piccolo did in the past, which leaves Krillin worrying. Suddenly, Gohan senses an approaching presence, and Krillin notes that its energy is too weak to be Vegeta's. Two of Frieza's henchmen are close by, discussing that the energy readings they had earlier have now vanished. One wonders if they're merely Namekians, and Krillin initially wonders the same on his end. However, both groups spot one another, and Bulma shrieks that the strangers aren't Namekians after all. The two scouts are unsure where the dragon team came from, but decide to carry out their orders to exterminate everyone on the planet anyway. Krillin notes that the two are wearing outfits similar to Saiyans, but clearly aren't Saiyans themselves. Confused, Krillin expresses his unease, and Bulma adds that their appearances don't indicate friendly intentions either. The scouts rise into the air, and as Krillin advises Gohan to concentrate his energy, the scouts mock the two for their supposedly weak battle powers. One of the scouts decides to destroy their spaceship first and fires a powerful beam from a handheld weapon, hitting the ship. Both scouts laugh, but Krillin assures Gohan that these foes are no match for them. The scouts overhear and mock the two some more, but Krillin and Gohan power up, causing the scouts to get nervous. Both suddenly teleport in front of the scouts, with Gohan landing a punch and Krillin delivering a kick. Both scouts are sent flying into a body of water, and Krillin praises Gohan's skills, but Bulma eagerly disregards this. Elsewhere, Zarbon detects something on his scouter, and Frieza inquires what's amiss. Zarbon reports that the individuals they were monitoring not only reappeared, but after defeating their scouts, their readings disappeared again. Frieza wonders if it might be Vegeta, but Zarbon clarifies that Vegeta
is being tracked separately and their power levels were around 1500 each. Frieza states that these individuals pose no threat to him, but asserts that next time they make an appearance, Zarbon or Dordoria shall eliminate them. Meanwhile, Boma mourns the ruined spaceship and her inability to return to Earth, and Krillin suggests moving to a different location as stronger enemies might be on their way. Gohan concurs, stating that they're not Namekians and appear to be allies of Vegeta. Gohan also believes the Namekians will assist them in repairing the ship, so Boma gives in. Elsewhere, Vegeta and Kui face off. Kui declares Vegeta's life will end here, and the Saiyan promises to show him a useful skill he acquired on Earth. Kui mockingly questions if it's the ability to flee, but Vegeta retorts that it's the ability to control his power level at will. Vegeta starts to power up and tells Kui to check his scouter again. Kui is alarmed and protests that they should be on equal footing, but Vegeta counters saying that unlike Kui, who stays comfortably by Frieza's side and never improves, he's been continuously training and engaging in combat, including the battle on Earth that nearly took his life. Vegeta amps up his power level further, causing Kui's scouter to shatter when it reaches 22,000. Elsewhere, Zarbon's scouter also crashes. He informs Dodoria that it's because Vegeta's power exceeded 22,000, but Dodoria dismisses it, attributing the failure to an outdated scouter and plans to use his more modern one for an accurate reading. Even with his newer device though, Dodoria finds that his reading has climbed up to 24,000. Meanwhile, Kui proposes a new plan. He suggests he and Vegeta team up against Frieza, claiming they could likely defeat Zarbon and Dodoria together. However, Vegeta calls him a liar and states that he's tired of his nonsense. As Kui insists he's telling the truth, he tricks Vegeta into thinking Frieza's appeared. Seizing the moment, Kui blasts Vegeta with all his might, then unleashes a flurry of additional blasts following that. When the smoke clears, the area in front of Kui is destroyed and Vegeta is nowhere to be found. Kui gloats over his supposed victory, but Vegeta reappears behind Kui and mocks him for his poor strategy. Vegeta states that in addition to his power increase, his speed has gotten a boost as well. Panicked, Kui attempts to flee, but Vegeta swiftly catches up to him, lands a devastating punch to his stomach, and sends him airborne. With a mere flick of two fingers, Vegeta then causes Kui to explode, eliminating yet another one of his enemies. Landing back on the ground, Vegeta speculates that due to the scouters, Frieza and his minions have probably noticed he disposed of Kui. He states that if the transmissions he picked up on his own are correct, the Dragon Balls only work if you gather all seven. Vegeta then formulates his plan. He'll aim to find one Dragon Ball himself and steal the remaining six from Frieza's men later when they drop their guard. He asserts that gaining immortality will soon be within his reach, and with Frieza defeated, his goal of reigning supreme over the universe will be achievable. Meanwhile, Dodoria concludes that Vegeta's power must genuinely be at 24,000, given the elimination of Kui. Unimpressed though, Frieza states that this isn't anything to be concerned about, and decides to go after the fifth Dragon Ball. One of the henchmen notes that about 10 Namekians are in another direction, prompting Frieza to infer that the Dragon Ball must be there. He advises caution due to the presence of mysterious individuals besides Vegeta, and the group take off. Further out on Namek, Krillin and Gohan are walking, with Bulma trailing behind them. She suggests they should fly and carry her, but Gohan explains that flying would consume a lot of energy and attract the attention of their enemies. The group reach a cave, and Krillin suggests taking shelter there, a suggestion Bulma isn't keen on. Gohan questions Krillin on if he senses anyone else nearby, and he confirms, as this time the energies they sense are different, and they're confident they must be Namekians. Suddenly, Krillin yells for Bulma and Gohan to hide, as there's someone else approaching from the direction they sense the Namekians in. The trio quickly take cover in the cave, and Krillin wonders if they've been discovered. As they huddle against the cave walls, the flying group zooms past them. Bulma's relieved that they weren't the target of the group, and wonders about their mission, while Krillin and Gohan suddenly sit in horror. Krillin tells Bulma to check the dragon radar, and he suspects the group that just passed are in possession of the four Dragon Balls. Bulma does so and confirms Krillin's suspicions, prompting discouragement in him. Krillin inquires if Gohan felt the immense power emanating from the second individual in the formation, who turns out to be Frieza. Gohan confirms, stating that the power he felt was staggering, and Krillin adds that Frieza's aura is far stronger than Vegeta's, and that he was on an entirely different level. Bulma finds it hard to believe that there are stronger beings than Vegeta, and Krillin speculates they must be Vegeta's friends, given their similar attire. Bulma then observes on the radar that the group is headed directly for another Dragon Ball, surmising that they must have a tracking device as well. Noting that the location is about 14 kilometers away, where Krillin had sent Namekians earlier, Krillin decides to go there, and Gohan insists 
on following him. Bulma protests being left alone, but Krillin tells her it's better than going with them. Bulma agrees and decides to construct a house capsule while they're gone. Krillin tells her to contact Master Roshi and she wishes them luck as they set off, conserving as much key as possible. Meanwhile, back on Earth in the hospital, Goku is training despite his injuries. The doctor enters, scolding him for overexerting himself and reminding him that he's not yet fit to leave. As the doctor helps him back into bed, Master Roshi enters, bearing food and news from Bulma. During the conversation, Master Roshi inappropriately touches a nurse who screams, leading him to state his ignorance due to his old age. Roshi then updates Goku about Bulma and the others' arrival to planet Namek, along with Vegeta, much to Goku's shock. Roshi then states a group of powerful beings are also on the planet as well, and that Bulma and the others are stranded as their spaceship is damaged. He then says to make matters worse, one individual among the powerful beings has a key significantly higher than Vegeta's, leaving Goku in disbelief. At that moment, Yajirobe enters with a bag of seven sensu beans from Korin. Goku eagerly consumes one despite the doctor's disapproval, and revitalized, Goku leaps from his bed and shatters his bandages as he changes into his usual outfit, declaring he's heading to planet Namek. He tells Master Roshi that Bulma's father offered to build him a spaceship using the space pod he came into Earth in as a baby, and states that once it's all finished, he'll be able to reach Namek in just six days. Jumping out the window, Goku summons his flying Nimbus and takes off to Bulma's house. Yajirobe questions his intent, and Master Roshi elaborates on the situation. Yajirobe questions Goku's optimism in such a terrible situation, but Roshi explains that it must be a Saiyan blood driving him to battle another strong opponent. As Goku takes to the sky, he can't seem to shake the thought of someone even mightier than Vegeta. Goku arrives at Capsule Core, dismounts from his flying Nimbus, and wanders outside, wondering where to go. He sees Bulma's mom tending to her garden, and she inquires about his well-being. When Goku questions her on where Bulma's dad is, she informs him that he's still working on the spaceship, surprising Goku, who thought it'd be done by now. Taking Goku by the arm, Bulma's mom walks with him, commenting on how handsome he's gotten, and suggests they go on a date now that the Saiyans are gone. Eventually, they reach the spaceship, and Dr. Brief is surprised to see Goku's already healed. Curious, Goku questions if the ship is finished, observing that it seems ready. Dr. Brief emerges and says he needs a bit more time and invites Goku inside. Bulma's mom departs, mentioning that she'll grab a drink or something for Goku, and entering the ship, Goku is amazed by its size. Dr. Brief confirms that it was designed to Goku's specifications and praises the advanced technology of the Saiyan race. When Goku inquires about the artificial gravity system, Dr. Brief confirms its completion and shows him the control panel, warning that it can only go up to 100 times normal gravity, which would make Goku weigh 6 tons if set at maximum. However, Goku is unfazed, stating that it's necessary to defeat Vegeta. When he questions if the ship can fly, Dr. Brief assures him that all data has been programmed and all Goku has to do is press the button to head to planet Namek. Dr. Brief then shows him additional amenities downstairs, including a bathroom, a kitchen, and a bedroom. This prompts Goku to inquire what the holdup is, to which Dr. Brief says he hasn't decided where to place the stereo speakers. Alarmed, Goku insists that he doesn't care about that and that they need to leave immediately, revealing that he received a message from Bulma about encountering trouble on planet Namek. Concerned, Dr. Brief allows Goku to take the spaceship, and he sits in the pilot seat, hits the button, and the ship soars into the sky. Watching from below, Dr. Brief marvels at the successful launch. Poir and Oolong arrive, wondering about the commotion, and are informed that Goku just left. While Oolong finds Goku's abrupt departure a bit rude, Poir is anxious that something serious must have happened. Meanwhile in space, Goku notes how dark it is and considers it to be nighttime. However, he decides to start his training immediately, recalling that King Kai's place had 10 times normal gravity, so he opts to begin at 20 times normal gravity. Goku starts his workout with some push-ups and sit-ups, stating that he'll need to retrain himself starting from the basics, otherwise he won't be able to withstand higher levels of the Kaioken technique. Back on Namek, Krillin and Gohan hurry toward their objective. Krillin mentions they're close and need to mask their energy levels as they approach on foot, and Gohan agrees. They climb a small cliff, crouch, and observe a settlement with houses resembling their own spaceship. They particularly notice Frieza, Zarbon, and Dodoria, as Krillin points out they have incredible and terrifying energy. He then points out the large Dragon Balls in Zarbon and Dodoria's possession, and Dodoria briefly detects a signal on his scouter, but dismisses it as an animal or insect when questioned by Frieza. As Gohan and Krillin remain hidden, one of Frieza's henchmen force a group of Namekians from their home, as Krillin notes they resemble Piccolo and Kami. The group of five Namekians consist of three
three elders and two children. Krillin is puzzled about what the strangers want with the Namekians, and Gohan questions if they're Saiyans, but Krillin clarifies that they just dress similarly, and only Gohan, Goku, and Vegeta are the remaining Saiyans. Krillin recalls what Goku's older brother had mentioned about clearing planets of life and selling them, and speculates that these individuals must be in the same line of work. He then wonders why Vegeta isn't present, guessing that he might be searching for the Dragon Balls elsewhere. The senior Namekians observe that Zarbon and Dodoria each hold two Dragon Balls and are shocked. Frieza introduces himself and states his intention to acquire their Dragon Balls. He questions them about the whereabouts of the other Namekians, and witnessing the group before him falling silent, he threatens to kill them if they don't talk. Finally, one of the elders speaks, but in the Namekian language. Frieza insists that he knows how to communicate in a language he understands, and the elder explains that the others are out working in the fields, which leads Frieza to demand further cooperation. When Frieza inquires about the location of the Dragon Ball, the Namekian leader denies having one. Frieza then laughs, calling on Dodoria to share what he's learned about the Dragon Balls on the planet. Dodoria states that the Dragon Balls are only to be turned over to those who Namekians judge to be men of valor, and Frieza cuts in, stating that the Namekian who informed them of this was stubborn as well. That is, until he killed one of his companions to serve as a lesson. This shocks the elders, and Frieza goes on to say that he learned the Dragon Balls were created by the Grand Elder of Namek. Each is held by an elder who evaluates the Seeker's wisdom, strength, and motives before handing it over, but he cared nothing of that, and was left with no choice but to kill the first elder. Unbeknownst to Frieza and his group, Vegeta listens to the conversation via his scouter, hearing the tyrant mention how the next three elders he encountered were in a much more accommodating mood to hand over the Dragon Balls. The Namekians are skeptical that the other elders would willingly surrender the Dragon Balls, and Frieza then commands Zarbon to show the elders what convinced the others. Zarbon appears behind one of the men and delivers a deadly kick to his neck, instantly killing him. Another elder attempts to attack Zarbon, who evades him, causing the resulting blast to hit one of Frieza's henchmen. Zarbon retaliates with a blast of his own, killing the elder and gracefully retrieving his Dragon Ball that he'd thrown into the air. Only the leader and two children remain, and Frieza questions if they're ready to cooperate now. The remaining elder questions what Frieza wants with the Dragon Balls, to which the tyrant states he wants eternal life. Krillin hears this and realizes that Vegeta has the same wish, prompting Gohan to contemplate that the two may not be allies after all. The Namekian leader defiantly tells Frieza he'd rather die than give up the Dragon Ball, and Frieza decides that such stubbornness warrants death for all, including the children, which infuriates both Gohan and Krillin. At that moment, Dodoria's scouter detects strong power levels approaching, and they turn to see three young Namekians flying toward the village, much to the elders' relief. The trio of furious Namekians arrive in the village and see that two of the older members have been killed. One of the newcomers admits that he had a bad feeling about this, to which Frieza mockingly responds that they've merely taken a work break to meet their deaths. Another villager mentions he'd heard rumors of someone raiding villages to steal Dragon Balls, confirming that it must be true. The third is visibly angered by the invaders' disruption of Namek's tranquility and vows to stop them. The elder cautions the trio, but urges them to fight. Frieza tells Dodoria to gauge their battle powers, and he does so, announcing that they're each around a thousand, thus no match for them. The elder figures that these devices are how Frieza's men have been locating remote villages and people on the planet, and Frieza's henchmen scoffs at the trio's weaker battle power of a thousand. Krillin and Gohan notice that the Namekians are actually suppressing their true strength, and when the henchmen attack, the Namekians begin to unleash their power. One kicks a henchman into a mountain, another delivers a powerful punch to the face of another, and the third sends a henchman flying towards Zarbon with a key blast. Zarbon redirects him into the ocean, perplexed, and questioning Dodoria on if their power levels are really just 1,000. Dodoria rechecks and reports they've somehow increased to 3,000, and the Namekians continue to defeat the henchmen, while Krillin and Gohan silently root for them from their cliffside vantage point. Frieza observes that the Namekians have control over their power levels, and the Elder, pondering again on the scouter devices, tells the children to move to a safer distance. Dodoria sets his Dragon Balls down and points out he'll have to deal with the Namekians, but unexpectedly, the Elder shoots a small key blast, targeting Dodoria's scouter and destroying it. Dodoria chuckles, stating that such an attack won't beat him, but the Elder leaps into the air and launches more key blasts, aiming to destroy the scouters of all the fallen henchmen as well. Zarbon quickly catches on that the scouters are the target, while Dodoria bellows in fury, vowing to eliminate them all. Gohan points 
points out that the scouters are used for detecting an opponent's strength and location, prompting Krillin to understand that the enemy wasn't using the scouters to locate the Dragon Balls, rather they were using them to track down the Namekians themselves. Dodoria becomes enraged and soars into the air to chase the Elder. However, Frieza orders him to halt and focus on the younger Namekians first. Dodoria returns to the ground and confronts the young warriors, asserting that it'll take him just 10 seconds to finish them off. One of the Namekians retorts that they believe they can hold their own against him, but Dodoria scoffs at the remark, suddenly teleporting behind one of them and impales him through the chest with his arm. He withdraws his arm and unleashes a massive energy blast from his mouth at the second Namekian, killing him on impact, much to the surprise of everyone watching. The last Namekian narrowly evades Dodoria's attack and backs up, attempting to flee. As Dodoria pursues him, the fleeing Namekian turns and launches a dual-handed key blast, hitting Dodoria head on. Following a massive explosion, he believes he succeeded, but when the smoke dissipates, Dodoria emerges unscathed. Dodoria then propels himself toward the Namekian and rams his head into him, sending him crashing into a hillside and killing him. As the Elder watches in horror, Frieza tells him it's futile to continue resisting and tells him to descend. The Elder hesitates, but ultimately complies, and Frieza appreciates his newfound compliance. Frieza then states that as an apology for destroying their scouters, the Elder must hand hand over his Dragon Ball, otherwise he'll die along with the children. After a bit of hesitation, the Elder reluctantly agrees, as long as they promise to spare the children. Meanwhile, Krillin comments on the ferocity of the assailants, while Gohan boils in anger, prompting Krillin to discourage him from fighting, as they wouldn't stand a chance. The Elder hands over the four-star ball to one of Frieza's minions, and is asked to reveal the location of the remaining two Dragon Balls. However, he refuses to betray his fellow Namekians, and Frieza co- states that he and the children will just have to die. Just as the Elder begins to panic at this revelation, Dodoria lunges at him with an attack. The Elder is sent reeling, but sustains minimal damage. He confronts Frieza, stating how this wasn't what they agreed on, and how he said he would leave after he handed the Dragon Ball over. However, Frieza states the Dragon Balls are useless without all seven, and because the Elder destroyed his scouters, he'll need to give up the location of the remaining two. The Elder states again that he would rather die than betray his own people, to which Frieza responds that he'll gladly fulfill that wish. Zarbon questions whether they can realistically find the remaining Dragon Balls without scouters, and Frieza assures him that they'll undoubtedly locate more if they search other villages or find other Namekians. For now, he orders the death of the remaining three, and Dodoria prepares for action. Krillin becomes infuriated, and the Elder instructs the children to flee. Rising to his feet, the Elder shouts, exclaiming he'll show the assailants the pride of the Namekian people. However, Frieza launches a minor energy blast, which deliberately misses the Elder and fatally hits one of the Namekian children. The Elder stands in disbelief, and Gohan becomes increasingly enraged. Dodoria then grabs the Elder, places him in a headlock, and snaps his neck. He laughs as he lets the Elder's lifeless body fall to the ground, and Krillin urges Gohan to restrain himself, arguing that they're powerless to intervene. The surviving young Namekian begins to cry and tries to escape, prompting Dodoria to pursue an inner him. But just as Dodoria readies his attack, Gohan rises to his feet and shouts for him to stop. He takes flight, capturing the attention of both Frieza and Zarbon. Confused, Dodoria looks around for the source of the disturbance, only to be blindsided by a powerful kick to the face from Gohan, smashing him through a nearby Namekian home. Thinking Gohan acted recklessly, Krillin swoops in to assist, and as Dodoria regains his bearings, he wonders who the attackers are. Gohan retorts that he's the one who's gonna take him down, and as Dodoria Dodoria rises to his feet, Krillin lands another kick to his face. Krillin grabs the surviving child and tells Gohan to make a break for it, and the trio soar away. Frieza orders him to chase the three, and Dodoria follows close behind, fueled by his increasing rage. Krillin advises Gohan to fly as fast as he can, and as Dodoria is quickly gaining on them, Frieza ponders the identity of their unexpected adversaries. Dodoria rapidly closes in, and Gohan suggests they should touch down and confront him. Krillin, however, exclaims that they stand no chance in a fight and need to continue flying. Clearly frustrated, Krillin contemplates how they can lose Dodoria, when suddenly he devises a plan. As Dodoria draws ever closer, Krillin tosses the child toward Gohan and shouts at him to shut his eyes and not look back. He places his fingers on his forehead, spins around to face Dodoria, and unleashes a solar flare. Dodoria is momentarily blinded, allowing Krillin to speed up and rejoin Gohan and the young Namekian. He advises them to take the opportunity to hide, and they descend to the base of a nearby hill, just as Dodoria begins 
to recover his vision. Unable to locate them, he grows increasingly angry and starts flying erratically around the vicinity, demanding they reveal themselves. Krillin reassures Gohan and the young Namekian that they're safe, as Dodoria can't locate them since all the scouters have been destroyed. However, frustrated by his inability to find the trio in such expansive terrain, Dodoria decides to obliterate the area. He soars skyward, leading Gohan to mistakenly believe he's given up. However, from a high vantage point, Dodoria bids a farewell and unleashes a massive energy blast downward, annihilating nearby islands and leaving only open water. Believing he's eliminated the trio, Dodoria revels in his victory, but thinks to himself how Frieza may have wanted him to bring them back to him. However, he states destroying them was better than letting them escape, but wonders once more who they were. Unbeknownst to him, the trio has survived, floating in the air behind him as he flies away. Relieved, Krillin suggests returning to where Bulma is hiding. He questions the young Namekian on if he's capable of flying, to which the child responds affirmatively and thanks Krillin for the rescue. Krillin, however, deflects the gratitude toward Gohan, claiming he initially thought the situation was too dangerous to act. Gohan, however, counters that without Krillin's intervention, they'd both be dead. Agreeing to head back, Krillin wonders where they left Bulma, and Gohan leads he and the Namekian boy in the cave's direction. Meanwhile, Dodoria contemplates the challenge of finding the Dragon Balls without scouters as he continues to fly away, but is suddenly plunged into the water below. Emerging, he finds himself face to face with Vegeta, much to his surprise. Climbing ashore, Dodoria is infuriated to discover that it's Vegeta who ambushed him. Vegeta remarks that he's been waiting for an opportunity when Dodoria and Zarbon would be separated from Frieza, and Dodoria retorts, telling Vegeta to hand over his scouter and leave. Realizing all the scouters have been destroyed, Vegeta finds this to be great news, as Frieza and his men are now unable to detect him. He mentions Dodoria and the others wouldn't attempt retrieving more either, as the trip from Namek to planet Frieza would take several days. He then removes the remaining scouter from his face and drops it to the ground. Dodoria suggests that Vegeta must be frightened and offers to spare him if he's lucky. However, Vegeta smiles and crushes the scouter with his foot. Startled, Dodoria questions why Vegeta would do such a thing, prompting the Saiyan to state that he no longer needs it. Dodoria argues that Vegeta would still need the scouter to locate the Dragon Balls, the Namekians, or Frieza, but Vegeta counters that his time on Earth taught him how to sense enemy locations and power levels without technological aid. He adds that scouters are useless for determining the true strength of beings like Frieza, and mentions a Saiyan on Earth had the ability to sense power levels as well. Dodoria concludes that the small fighters from earlier must be Earthlings and allies of Vegeta, but skeptical, Vegeta dismisses the point, stating there's no way the Earthlings would be on Namek, but even if they were, he'd kill them for sure. Dodoria threatens Vegeta again, and realizing Dodoria must have noticed how much stronger he became after his battle with Hui, Vegeta asserts he must be afraid of him. Dodoria then becomes furious, dismissing his power as a scouter malfunction, and unleashes a large energy blast, with a volley of larger energy blasts following suit. However, Vegeta reappears unscathed behind him, catching Dodoria's fist when he attempts to strike. Dodoria kicks out, but Vegeta spins and immobilizes both of his arms. Declaring that Dodoria is no match for a Saiyan, Vegeta explains that his near-death experience on Earth greatly amplified his strength, embodying the combat prowess of the Saiyan race. He accuses Dodoria of overlooking this fact and advises him to prepare for death, but Dodoria, in a last-ditch effort, offers to reveal a secret about Vegeta's homeworld, planet Vegeta. Intrigued, Vegeta releases him and demands to hear the secret. Dodoria then reveals that Frieza himself destroyed planet Vegeta, fearing the Saiyans were becoming too powerful and disobedient. He goes on to state that Vegeta's life was spared because Frieza saw potential to use him, so he did, and Vegeta remains silent at this revelation. Dodoria believes Vegeta to be shaken up by the news and begins to take his leave to Frieza, but Vegeta clarifies that he doesn't care about his planet, his friends, or parents, only that he's been manipulated his entire life. Panicked, Dodoria tries to flee, but is instantly obliterated by an energy blast from Vegeta, who declares Frieza fears the endless potential of the Saiyan race, as Goku continues his training exercises aboard his ship. Vegeta is astounded by his newfound strength, as it were enough to take down Dodoria without breaking a sweat. He reflects on his time on Earth, and feels it wasn't in vain after all. However, Dodoria's mention of the Earthlings catches his attention, and he recalls sensing two significant power levels moving further away. Determined to investigate and eliminate any interference, Vegeta takes off. Concurrently, Gohan, Krillin, and the young Namekian boy 
boy are flying toward Boma's cave when they sense a high speed entity approaching. They quickly descend to an island to take cover, and Krillin is puzzled, thinking to himself that the Doria found them again. However, Vegeta arrives nearby, puzzled that the power levels he sensed earlier have disappeared. Gohan alerts Krillin that Vegeta is in the vicinity, causing him to crouch and panic. As Vegeta leaves their line of sight, they breathe a sigh of relief, and Krillin wonders how Vegeta could have tracked them without a scouter. Frustrated, Vegeta internally admits that he may not have yet mastered the art of sensing power levels and regrets destroying his scouter. However, he picks up something nearby, and Krillin realizes the Saiyan must be sensing their key and worries that even if he and Gohan conceal theirs, the boy's faint key would still be detectable. Vegeta confirms his suspicion by sensing a minor power level and heads toward it, prompting Krillin to believe they're doomed. However, a large fish leaps from the water, diverting Vegeta's attention. Convinced it was just the fish he sensed, he resolves to just finding one of the remaining Dragon Balls to prevent Frieza from collecting all seven. With this thought, he departs, allowing Krillin and Gohan to relax and catch their breath. Krillin suggests they head back to Bulma's location, eager for some rest despite not engaging in combat. The group make their way to another island, Krillin thinking to himself they may end up getting themselves killed on Namek. They eventually locate Bulma's cave, and entering, they discover a sizable capsule house at the back. Bulma reveals herself and scolds them for leaving her alone while they were out, and notices the young boy who resembles Piccolo. She inquires if he's a Namekian, but Krillin proposes they discuss it inside. Bulma then shares some fantastic news, stating that Goku will be arriving on Namek in six days. She details how he acquired the spaceship and mentioned that he's undergoing intense training en route. Excited, they all celebrate as hope remains in sight, while Goku continues his training on the spacecraft. As Vegeta soars through the sky, he senses about 20 energy signatures, unmistakably coming from a Namekian village. Confident that a Dragon Ball must be there, he accelerates, smirking at the thought of Frieza and his forces lacking scouters, remaining oblivious to his actions. Arriving at the village, he notes that the villagers are still alive and therefore, Frieza hasn't reached this area. He lands in the village center, attracting the attention of the locals. Vegeta demands that the village elder hand over the Dragon Ball, and an elderly man reveals himself, questioning why he should comply. Vegeta dismisses his question and insists on getting the Dragon Ball, but the elder refuses, sensing Vegeta's evil intentions, and the Saiyan prepares to kill him. Back at the capsule house situated in the cave, everyone is unwinding after sharing their experiences with Bulma. While Krillin and Gohan eat, the young Namekian boy abstains. Bulma advises them to give him some space, suggesting he's upset about his village's destruction. The boy states Namekians don't need to eat as they can survive on water alone, and Krillin is puzzled, mentioning he saw a field of crops. The boy clarifies those were young Ajisa trees, explaining that Namek once flourished with these trees until an environmental catastrophe nearly wiped them all out. Now, the planet's inhabitants aim to restore the planet's Ajisa trees to make Namek beautiful once more. Gohan then questions if the boy can tell them his name, and he introduces himself as Dende. Interrupted by a sudden shift in energy, Krillin and Gohan rush out of the cave, and Bulma questions what's going on. The two sense multiple key levels vanishing, and Gohan concludes that more Namekians are being slaughtered. Krillin identifies the ominous key as Vegeta's, who's attacking a nearby village. Krillin is enraged, acknowledging Vegeta can definitely sense key, and that they now have no choice but to cautiously move until Goku arrives, lest Vegeta or Frieza gain immortality through the Dragon Balls. Bulma suggests securing just one ball to prevent the villains from getting all seven, but Gohan argues that this wouldn't stop them from killing the Namekians. As they discuss Goku's potential to defeat Vegeta and the others, Dende interrupts, urgently inquiring who Gohan and the others are, and pleading for them to help to save Namek. Meanwhile, Vegeta ruthlessly eliminates the Namekian villagers, leaving only the stubborn Elder alive. Unwilling to hand over the Dragon Ball, the Elder is killed as Vegeta opts to find it himself. Back in the cave, Krillin tells Dende that they're from Earth and need the Namek's Dragon Balls to resurrect their fallen friends. Bulma adds that fulfilling their wish would also reactivate Earth's Dragon Balls, and now understanding the circumstances, Dende states that the group should follow him to meet their Grand Elder at once. At this point, Vegeta's located the coveted four-star ball amidst the destroyed Namekian village. Vegeta hides his Dragon Ball in a nearby lake to keep it concealed, knowing only he will be able to locate it later. He then takes to the sky to ponder his next moves, aware that Frieza currently holds five Dragon Balls and is searching for the last one. Meanwhile, Frieza, Zarbon, and the last remaining henchmen are awaiting Dodoria's return. Growing impatient, Frieza deems Dodoria useless and decides they should continue their search for the remaining Dragon Balls. 
Dragon Balls without him. Zarbon and the henchmen leave their Dragon Balls behind by Frieza's command and take flight, agreeing to regroup at their ship in three hours. Zarbon instructs the henchmen to report any findings, especially if he encounters stronger Namekians, and they both disperse. Frieza speculates that Vegeta is likely on a similar quest and will eventually target their collected Dragon Balls. When that happens, Frieza plans to seize the two he believes that Vegeta possesses and complete the set of seven. Frieza then uses his telekinesis to lift his five Dragon Balls and departs in his pod. Back in the cave, Bulma questions Dende about the Grand Elder. Dende reveals that he's the creator of all current Namekians, having been the sole survivor of the past environmental calamity. He accomplished this by giving birth through egg laying via his mouth, intriguing Bulma who wonders if the Elder is a female, prompting Dende to inquire what a woman is. Bulma is surprised that Namek doesn't have gender distinctions, declaring it a dull planet in that regard. Changing the topic, Krillin wants to understand why they need to meet the Grand Elder, and Dende reveals that he holds the final Dragon Ball. Given that Frieza's forces have five and Vegeta presumably has one, Krillin stresses the urgency of reaching the Grand Elder before Vegeta, who can sense Ki and would likely target the last Dragon Ball. Both agree they must act swiftly to prevent Vegeta or Frieza from attaining immortality, and Krillin decides to go himself, suggesting that Gohan remain with Bulma for safety. He questions Dende on how long it would take to reach the Grand Elder by foot to avoid detection. Learning it would take about 30 days, Krillin resolves to fly instead, vowing to hide if they sense Vegeta's presence. The two take off, warning Bulma and Gohan to stay vigilant. As Krillin and Dende fly, Krillin muses on the strength of Frieza and Vegeta, considering that their best strategy may be to hide with the Grand Elder's Dragon Ball until Goku arrives in five and a half days. Meanwhile, Goku is in his spaceship, training in 20 times gravity and opting to move to 30 times gravity soon. Suddenly, King Kai contacts him, initially confused on why Goku is in outer space, but then remembering that he's en route to Namek to grab the Dragon Balls. King Kai then shares some good news, as he has four guests who have traveled Snake Way much faster than Goku. These familiar faces are revealed to be Tien, Chiaotzu, Piccolo, and Yamcha, who have arrived for rigorous training, just as Goku did in the past. Goku is thrilled to hear that his friends have reached King Kai's realm for training, and Yamcha puts his hand on King Kai's shoulder to speak with Goku telepathically. He informs Goku that they're planning to train to prepare for their resurrection on Namek, and while Goku initially wonders if Piccolo is among them, he confirms his presence, admitting that he's only there because he refuses to be surpassed by everyone. Goku inquires who the fourth person is training among them, and Yamcha reveals it's Chiaotzu, as Kami was able to reconstruct his body in the afterlife. He then states that they're struggling with the intense gravity during training, and Goku sympathizes and shares that he's also undergoing high gravity training en route to Namek, which will be essential for the battles ahead. At this point, King Kai prompts Goku to spill the bad news he alluded to earlier, and Goku explains the situation on Namek. Krillin, Bulma, and Gohan are searching for Dragon Balls, as is Vegeta, who managed to make his way to the planet as well. Moreover, there are other powerful beings on the planet, including one with an energy level surpassing Vegeta's. Both Yamcha and King Kai are shocked by this revelation, and King Kai probes further to see if this mysterious person might be a being named Frieza. When Goku can't confirm, King Kai decides to check for himself, using his powers to search the planet. To his surprise, he witnesses Frieza soaring through the sky with five Dragon Balls, leaving him deeply alarmed. He wants Goku to steer clear of Frieza, stating that the tyrant's power is too much for him to handle. Goku questions what the Kai means by this, and he retorts by telling the Saiyan that any attack towards Frieza would get him angry, prompting him to unleash his wrath not only on him, but everyone he loves. This information intrigues Goku as he ponders what the enemy looks like, but King Kai exclaims once more to avoid him at all costs. Piccolo then interjects, encouraging Goku to gather the Dragon Balls to resurrect them so they can help in the fight. King Kai thinks this is a foolish decision given Frieza's immense strength, and despite the Kai's reluctance to train the group unless they promise not to go to Namek, Piccolo mentally resolves to break such a promise. Tien internally concludes that merely mimicking Goku's training won't help him surpass the Saiyan, so he'll need to adapt and refine what he learns. King Kai then announces that the group must pass a humor test to earn his training, a challenge that seems particularly daunting for Piccolo and Tien. Meanwhile, Goku, unfazed by King Kai's stern warning, contemplates training harder and cranking up his training to 50 times normal gravity. On Namek, as Dende and Krillin fly toward the Grand Elder's location, Krillin worries about expending too much energy as the journey will take another five hours. Elsewhere, Vegeta 
Vegeta grows irritated as he can't locate the remaining Dragon Ball, but senses new energy levels and halts. He identifies one of them as neither Namekian nor a member of Frieza's forces and decides to investigate. Sensing Vegeta's rapid approach, Krillin urgently instructs Dende to descend with him to a nearby island for cover. However, they realize Vegeta has shifted direction, now headed toward another energy signature. It turns out to be Zarbon, whom Vegeta rushes toward, aiming to deal with him as he did to Doria. As Zarbon in the distance notices someone flying toward him, he recognizes Vegeta as the Saiyan confronts him, saying he's eliminated Dodoria and now it's Zarbon's turn. Zarbon is in disbelief that Vegeta could have defeated Dodoria, but Vegeta insists he'll make him a believer. When Zarbon questions why he insists on opposing Frieza, Vegeta makes it clear that he hates him as well as taking orders. He aspires to gain immortality to improve his odds against Frieza, and Zarbon deduces that Vegeta is after the Dragon Balls. Zarbon scoffs at the idea of Vegeta defeating Frieza, saying that even with eternal life, he wouldn't stand a chance. Vegeta, however, retorts that if Zarbon had a scouter, he'd know just how much his power has escalated. He also challenges Zarbon's assertions of Frieza's overwhelming power, stating Dodoria revealed that Frieza fears the Saiyan race. Zarbon, however, clarifies that Frieza fears the Saiyans as a collective force, not just an individual, but Vegeta merely smirks. In a flash, he's next to Zarbon, effortlessly catching his punch and hurling him into the air. Zarbon recovers and fires a powerful blast at Vegeta, who deflects it, causing a distant explosion. Krillin and Dende, not far from the explosion's location, feel the combatants' immense energy levels. Recognizing that one of the fighters is allied with Frieza, Krillin feels frustrated that he's outmatched. Seizing the opportunity while Vegeta is preoccupied, Krillin takes Dende and speeds toward the Grand Elder's location. Back at the fray, Vegeta lands a solid elbow on Zarbon's face. In response, Zarbon attempts a flurry of kicks, but Vegeta avoids them, mocking the fighter as he does so. Executing a mid-air backflip, Vegeta sends Zarbon flying with a kick and pursues him. Upon landing, Vegeta appears behind Zarbon, kicking him in the back as he skids across Namek's terrain. Vegeta mocks Zarbon once more, but he laughs as he begins to rise to his feet, commending Vegeta's progress, but warns that he's awakened a long, dormant power within him. Vegeta finds Zarbon's warning about his hidden power amusing, but the alien elaborates, explaining that although he loathes changing his attractive form, he'll make an exception to avoid dying. Vegeta, however, scoffs, mocking the idea of Zarbon transforming like Saiyans do. Undeterred, Zarbon asserts his strength once more, morphs into a grotesque, powerful form, and lunges at Vegeta. He grabs Vegeta's head and delivers a brutal headbutt before flinging him skyward. However, Vegeta regains control and dives back down to face Zarbon. The two collide in mid-air, Zarbon's fist connecting with Vegeta's face. He then sends Vegeta flying with a powerful kick, and the two stop in mid-air. Gasping for air, Vegeta is noticeably rattled, surprised at how strong Zarbon's become. Seizing the moment, Zarbon mocks Vegeta for his arrogance and reveals another shocking fact, as Frieza too is from a race capable of transformation. Vegeta is visibly unnerved, and Zarbon adds that if Vegeta can't beat him, he has no chance against Frieza, and releases a massive key blast. Vegeta narrowly evades the attack, but Zarbon quickly grabs him from behind and plunges downward, smashing Vegeta head first into the ground as Namek's ocean waves crash into the crater he lies in. Confident that Vegeta is either dead or drowning, Zarbon reverts to his original handsome form and flies off to update Frieza on the situation. After he departs, a battered Vegeta slowly resurfaces. Struggling to pull himself onto land, he vows not to die and to become stronger. Meanwhile, another one of Frieza's henchmen, a pool, wonders why an unvisited village has already been decimated and deduces it's the work of Vegeta. Deciding he must inform Frieza, he flies off. Back at their spaceship, Frieza is gazing out of a large window when Zarbon appears. Frieza inquires if Zarbon has found a village, to which Zarbon replies that he hasn't, but states he's dealt with Vegeta. When asked if Vegeta is dead, Zarbon admits that while he didn't confirm, the severity of Vegeta's injuries makes survival unlikely. Frieza questions why he didn't confirm Vegeta's death, and Zarbon explains that Vegeta was underwater when he was defeated, prompting Frieza to angrily state that Zarbon avoided confirmation because he didn't want to get wet. Acknowledging his oversight, Zarbon vows to confirm immediately. Just then, a pool arrives to report a destroyed village. Suspecting Vegeta, but puzzled that he wasn't carrying a Dragon Ball, Frieza orders Zarbon to fetch Vegeta, now threatening his life if Vegeta is dead after all. Frieza also tells a pool to summon the Ginyu Force to arrive and 
five days. Surprised, Zarbon inquires why Frieza needs the Ginyu Force. Frieza states he has an unsettling feeling about a strong Saiyan. Although he's sure it's not Vegeta, he believes there's someone out there who's destined to be his enemy. Zarbon speculates that if it's not Vegeta, it must be someone from Earth, but points out that they're likely weaker. Unamused, Frieza tells Zarbon to hasten and retrieve Vegeta. After Zarbon leaves, Frieza ponders the Saiyan's limitless fighting potential. He states to himself that although they're no match for him, their continuous emergence could be problematic, especially if a Super Saiyan appears. Elsewhere, Vegeta drags himself along the ground and eventually passes out. Zarbon returns, spots him, and decides that Vegeta will require medical attention in order to get the Dragon Ball's location out of him. Roughly one day has passed on Namek, and Goku continues his non stop training before eventually collapsing to the floor, declaring he's now mastered 50 times Earth's gravity. Meanwhile, Krillin and Dende are resting on an island. Krillin wakes up, urges Dende to lead them to the Grand Elder's location, and they take off flying. Dende directs Krillin, and they arrive at a house atop of a tall rock. Here, they're greeted by a young Namekian named Nail, who looks similar to Piccolo. Nail reveals that the Grand Elder is already aware of the situation. When questioned by Dende why they haven't left, Nail explains it's his duty to stay as the Elder is nearing the end of his life. Inside, they find the Elder, a hefty, old Namekian seated in a large chair. He thanks Krillin for saving Dende, to which Krillin modestly responds it was no big deal. The Grand Elder mourns over the loss of his Namekian children to the hands of the villains, as he states he's aware of their pursuit of the Dragon Balls. To obtain the Dragon Balls on planet Namek, one must demonstrate wisdom and strength, and he finds it disheartening that these sacred artifacts might be misused. Krillin straightforwardly expresses his desire to take the Dragon Ball above the Grand Elder's chair, the One Star Ball, to ensure it doesn't fall into the wrong hands. Dende agrees, thinking that Krillin should also have it to resurrect their Earth's Dragon Balls. The Grand Elder expresses amazement upon learning that Earth also possesses Dragon Balls, and inquires if there are Namekians there. Krillin elaborates that long ago, a Namekian sought refuge on Earth during their planet's crisis. Realizing that it was Kami, the Grand Elder marvels at the young child's survival, describing him as a prodigy of the Dragon Clan capable of creating Dragon Balls. The Grand Elder speculates that the genius must have met his end or was killed, and Krillin confirms that he was killed by Vegeta, the Saiyan who had come to Namek. The Grand Elder inquires if the Saiyan who eliminated the Dragon Clan genius was a Super Saiyan, and Krillin is puzzled by the term, but complies when asked to come closer, allowing the Grand Elder to delve into his memories. During the mental probe, the Grand Elder realizes that Kami split himself in half, effectively halving his power. He assures Krillin that his wish is valid and hands him the One Star Ball. However, he warns that the Dragon Balls will become inaccessible once he passes away in a few days, preventing their misuse by the villains. Krillin swears to protect the Dragon Ball with his life, ensuring that the villains won't attain eternal life. The Grand Elder, immobilized and helpless, doubts even Nail could protect him if Frieza were to arrive. The Grand Elder then offers to awaken more of Krillin's latent power placing his hand on Krillin's head. The process ensues, and Krillin is thrilled that he had so much power within him all along. He thanks the Grand Elder and wonders if the same can be done for a child without affecting his lifespan. The Grand Elder assures him there won't be any negative consequences, and agrees to awaken the child's power as well. Krillin then requests permission to bring another friend, and the Grand Elder agrees, believing that more strong allies are always welcome. Krillin announces his immediate departure and inquires about the Dragon Ball's fate. The Grand Elder advises him to hold on to it as the future rests in his hands. Krillin tells Dende to remain and departs, heading back to the cave. At the cave, Gohan and Bulma are outside, and Bulma examines the dragon radar. She calls Gohan over and reports that a dragon ball is on the move and approaching them, indicating Krillin is returning with it. They then spot another dragon ball nearby, distinct from Krillin's and Frieza's set of five. Gohan gazes in that direction, but senses no trace of Vegeta's energy. Bulma assumes that Vegeta attacked the village, failed to locate the Dragon Ball and subsequently left. Aiming to confirm, Gohan requests the radar and sets off to find the missing Dragon Ball. Meanwhile, aboard Frieza's spaceship, Vegeta is recuperating inside a healing chamber. Zarbon and Apul are monitoring him, and Zarbon leaves to update Frieza. Apul takes the opportunity to taunt Vegeta, and suddenly, Vegeta awakens and blasts through the chamber's glass, killing Apul. Startled, Zarbon and Frieza rush back to the room, finding a hole in the ship's wall and believing Vegeta has escaped. However, it's a diversion as Vegeta secretly traverses the ship, eventually locating the chamber housing the Dragon Balls. In another location, Gohan soars through the sky, clutching the
the dragon radar, eventually reaching the village and landing. He affirms that Vegeta has indeed eradicated the village and sets out on a quest to locate the dragon ball that eluded Vegeta's grasp. The radar directs him to the water, surprising him as he thought the dragon ball would be in one of the houses. Gohan dives underwater, retrieves the dragon ball and resurfaces, convinced the villagers concealed it there. Meanwhile, outside of Frieza's spaceship, Zarbon scours the area for Vegeta and becomes increasingly frustrated by his evasive tactics. Frieza remains inside the ship, shouting orders through the damage Vegeta created and demanding that Zarbon apprehend the Saiyan. Unbeknownst to them, Vegeta hatches a clever plan as he realizes he can't simply remove the Dragon Balls without being caught. He then screams to his enemies, telling them that he's still aboard their ship. Both Zarbon and Frieza hear his taunt, and Vegeta fires a powerful energy blast down the hallway, destroying another part of the ship. Zarbon hastily re-enters the ship, and Vegeta proceeds to the chamber containing the Dragon Balls, piercing through the glass to escape. As Zarbon and Frieza attempt to reach him, they encounter a thick cloud of smoke and debris created by Vegeta's blast. Seizing the opportunity, Vegeta tosses each of the Dragon Balls, one after another, out through the shattered glass and flees soon after. Realizing Vegeta's objective too late, Frieza orders Zarbon to search the outside of the ship while he searches the inside. Frieza expresses skepticism that Vegeta could have fled far with five Dragon Balls and threatens Zarbon with death if they don't find Vegeta within an hour. Meanwhile, Vegeta lands on a distant shore where he expects the Dragon Balls to have landed. Sure enough, all five Dragon Balls are scattered before him, prompting him to gloat over his victory. He relocates them to a concealed spot amongst the rocks and expects to do the same for the one he left in the waters of the destroyed Namekian village. Suddenly, he detects a significant power level approaching but notes it's not as strong as Zarbon's. Surprisingly, it's Krillin excitedly flying through the sky with the one star ball in his possession. Krillin is oblivious to Vegeta's presence and Vegeta ponders the Earthling's unexpected appearance before deciding to pursue him, knowing that he holds the final Dragon Ball. Krillin's excitement mounts as he nears his destination, closely followed by Vegeta. Vegeta suspects Krillin is also in pursuit of the Dragon Balls, but states it won't matter because soon Vegeta will possess all seven. Meanwhile, Zarbon is in a frantic search for Vegeta, regretting the absence of his scouter. Suddenly, he spots someone soaring through the sky. To his disappointment, it's not Vegeta, but the individual who rescued the young Namekian from Dodoria. He notices this person possesses a Dragon Ball, and then Zarbon notices Vegeta chasing after him. Without hesitation, Zarbon follows suit and pursues both of them. Vegeta detects a formidable power behind him and realizes Zarbon has located him. However, he sees this as an opportunity to eliminate Zarbon and believes he'll become overconfident. Meanwhile, Bulma is seated outside the cave, engrossed in her reading, when Krillin arrives and startles her. She expresses amazement about the immense size of the Namekian Dragon Balls, and Krillin inquires about Gohan, hoping to take him to see the Grand Elder as well. However, Bulma informs him that Gohan has gone to the village attacked by Vegeta to search for another Dragon Ball using the radar. Suddenly, Krillin senses a nearby power approaching, and Bulma assumes it's Gohan returning swiftly. Krillin corrects her though, revealing that it's not Gohan, but Vegeta who's now landed. Krillin is shocked by this unexpected turn of events, angry with himself for not noticing Vegeta tailing him. Vegeta explains that he and Krillin appear to share the same goal, and then looks behind him, hinting at an impending issue. Vegeta asserts that he needs to handle something before taking the Dragon Ball, and warns that if anyone tries to escape, he'll kill them. Just then, Zarbon arrives. Bulma surmises that the newcomer must be a champion of justice based on his appearance, but Krillin thinks otherwise. Zarbon is furious and states that Frieza's trust in him has waned due to Vegeta's actions. He speculates that the person with the Dragon Ball must be working with Vegeta and demands they reveal the location of the remaining Dragon Balls, threatening to inflict severe harm if they don't cooperate. Vegeta dares him to try, and Zarbon, confident in his abilities, reveals his monstrous transformation once more. Krillin and Bulma become alarmed, convinced that Zarbon is evil after all. Zarbon advances toward Vegeta, but the Saiyan drops to the ground to evade his attack. He seizes a clump of dirt, flies into the air, and releases it into Zarbon's eyes, temporarily blinding him. As Zarbon grapples with his impaired vision, Vegeta swoops down behind him and delivers a powerful punch to his back. The forceful punch shatters Zarbon's armor, propelling him forward, and Vegeta swiftly follows suit, knocking Zarbon down into the water. Vegeta proceeds to unleash a barrage of energy blasts into the water, creating a chaotic display. Krillin suggests that it's an opportune moment to escape, but Bulma reminds him of Vegeta's deadly threat. Despite the risk, Krillin seizes Bulma's arm and takes flight, emphasizing that they'll meet their demise anyway if they stay. Observing their attempt to flee, Vegeta intercepts them with a few well-aimed blasts. Subsequently, Zarbon emerges from the water, 
Fire, prompting Vegeta to return to solid ground. Zarbon, battered and furious, faces Vegeta's taunts, as the Saiyan asserts that Zarbon's impending death is undeniable. Zarbon, however, disputes this claim, citing his higher battle power, prompting Vegeta to explain the Saiyan's resilience, emphasizing that when a Saiyan recovers from near death, their battle power experiences a rapid surge. Zarbon panics, realizing the implications, while Krillin notes the similarity to Goku's experiences, stating it's no wonder Vegeta got such a crazy boost in strength. Despite his increased power, Zarbon insists that Vegeta can't defeat him in his transformed state and charges at him, as Vegeta exclaims that the might of the Saiyan race should never be underestimated. Vegeta skillfully fends off Zarbon's assault, ultimately piercing through Zarbon's armor and thrusting his fist through his stomach. Zarbon, in desperation, pleads for forgiveness, citing his compliance with Frieza's orders. Unmoved, Vegeta dismisses his plea, prompting Zarbon to propose an alliance against Frieza. However, Vegeta with his hands still inside Zarbon, releases a blast, piercing through Zarbon's back and propelling his lifeless body into the water. Vegeta dismisses the idea of collaboration, stating that even together, they couldn't defeat Frieza. Turning his attention to Krillin, Vegeta acknowledges Krillin's improved strength since their earthly encounter. Krillin offers to surrender the Dragon Ball in exchange for he and Bulma's safety, and Vegeta agrees, recognizing that toying with them is no longer necessary. Now in possession of the One Star Ball, Vegeta joyfully declares that with all seven, he'll surpass Frieza and become the strongest in the universe. With that, he departs, leaving Bulma relieved and Krillin expressing hope for Gohan's well-being. Bulma is astonished at how Krillin handed over the Dragon Ball after the considerable trouble he faced to get it, fearing the consequences if Vegeta obtains the last one. Krillin justifies his decision though, emphasizing the threat of being killed otherwise and expresses hope since Gohan went to find another Dragon Ball. Bulma realizes Gohan is likely on his way back and Krillin hopes Vegeta doesn't find him. Meanwhile, Gohan flies with the four-star ball, feeling Vegeta approaching. Gohan lands on an island, hiding behind a small rock with the Dragon Ball, and Vegeta notices him before Gohan can conceal his key. Approaching the location and growing frustrated at the fleeting power level, Vegeta yells for the stranger to show himself before he destroys the area. Realizing he has no other choice, Gohan pleads for him to wait, places the Dragon Ball down, and climbs on top of the rock, revealing himself. Vegeta hadn't expected to encounter Kakarot's son in such a place, and Gohan panics upon seeing Vegeta with a Dragon Ball, assuming he killed Krillin. However, Vegeta denies it and suggests he can go back and do so if Gohan desires. Vegeta advises Gohan to be thankful he's in a good mood after obtaining all the Dragon Balls. Landing on the rock in front of Gohan, Vegeta inquires about the object in his hand. Nervously, Gohan claims it's a clock, and Vegeta laughs at the Earthling's technology. Vegeta inquires if Kakarot is on Namek, and Gohan replies negatively, explaining their lack of awareness of Vegeta and other evil men being there. Vegeta then mentions their Saiyan lineage and tells Gohan to deliver a message to his father as he knees the boy in his stomach and expresses he'll be destroying Earth soon as he flies off laughing. As Gohan struggles to his feet, he acknowledges the pain he's received but is relieved that the Dragon Ball wasn't found. At the cave, Bulma informs Krillin that she's turned the house back into a capsule and questions if Gohan has returned. Planning to change locations due to Vegeta's knowledge, Gohan arrives safely and the group is thrilled about the Dragon Ball he holds. Krillin plans to brief Gohan later, but Gohan says he already knows and explains the encounter with Vegeta. Krillin mentions Gohan's luck in safeguarding the Dragon Ball, and meanwhile, Vegeta, swimming in the lake near the attacked village, laughs about universal dominance once his wish is granted. However, he soon realizes the Dragon Ball he hid is missing. Vegeta recalls the spot where he met Gohan and deduces that the boy's possession was no clock after all, but a device to find the Dragon Balls. Infuriated, Vegeta flies out of the water, exclaiming that he'll make the Earthlings pay as he returns to the cave, but finds Gohan and company gone. Unable to detect their key, he vows to deal with them when they pursue his six Dragon Balls. The group, now on an island between two rock formations, faces limited space for Bulma's capsule house. Despite Bulma's concerns about amenities, Krillin assures her they'll manage and decides to bring Gohan to the Grand Elder's place, hoping it will enhance his strength enough to rival even Vegeta. As Krillin and Gohan make their way toward the Grand Elder's location, Krillin notes it'll take them a considerable amount of time to reach their destination, but their deliberate pace ensures they remain undetected by Vegeta. Krillin expresses doubt about their current ability to defeat Vegeta as a duo, and Gohan contemplates his potential to rival him, but Krillin suggests that Gohan's Saiyan blood may grant him latent power. Meanwhile, Vegeta arrives at the spot with the five Dragon Balls he took from Frieza and drops the sixth one into the collection. Annoyed by the Earthling's Dragon Ball detection device, 
Vegeta plans to wait until they start moving. He calculates that Frieza, with his damaged spaceship, likely contacted someone to bring more scouters, estimating a three to four day wait. Vegeta sees an opportunity to obtain eternal life before Frieza gets his new scouters, allowing him to surpass Frieza while he's vulnerable. Elsewhere in space, Goku continues his intense training at 100 times Earth's gravity. After firing a Kamehameha and pushing himself to the brink of death, Goku eats a sensu bean and restores his health. With just two days left until his arrival on Namek, Goku continues his routine, oblivious that his near-death experiences are increasing his strength each time. Another day passes, and Goku, unfazed by the training, decides to spend the last day resting and adjusting to regular gravity. Excited about his progress, Goku believes that he can endure a 10 times Kaioken. With one day left until reaching planet Namek, Goku bathes and goes to sleep, unaware that he'd gained power greater than the limitations of a normal Saiyan. Meanwhile, Frieza grows impatient, assuming Zarbon has either run away or been killed after four days. Anticipating the arrival of the Ginyu Force with scouters, Frieza plans to reclaim the Dragon Balls from Vegeta. The scene shifts to Gohan and Krillin taking a break after four days of travel. Krillin worries about the Grand Elder's impending death and suggests picking up the pace as the two take flight at light speed. Unbeknownst to them, Vegeta, concentrating intensely, detects their presence from a distance. Vegeta senses the key of two individuals, Kakarot's son and the little bald guy, but notices they're not heading in his direction. To be cautious, he decides to pursue them, taking the one-star Dragon Ball with him in case the woman with the Dragon Ball tracking device attempts to locate his stash, and swiftly, he zooms off. As Krillin informs Gohan that they're almost there, he envisions Gohan rivaling Vegeta once his latent power is awakened. However, Krillin states the best plan might be to wait for Goku to arrive so they can fight together. As the two approach the Grand Elder's location, their journey takes a tense turn as Krillin senses a powerful energy behind them, revealed to be Vegeta. Urging Gohan to visit the Grand Elder while he confronts Vegeta, Gohan reluctantly complies. Vegeta catches up to Krillin, shocking the Earthling with his speed as he demands the return of the four-star ball. Krillin remains silent, prompting Vegeta to decide on more forceful measures. Observing Gohan headed toward the direction of the mountain though, Vegeta assumes it's the hiding place for the Dragon Balls, though Krillin protests. Unfazed, Vegeta takes off toward the location, with Krillin following close behind. Inside the Grand Elder's house, Gohan undergoes a power-up while Nail confronts Vegeta outside. As Gohan's power surges, both Krillin and Vegeta feel the change. Vegeta, thinking it might be Kakarot, yells for him to reveal himself. When Gohan steps outside, Vegeta is shocked by the sudden increase in his power. Suddenly, the Grand Elder instructs Dende to alert everyone about a great unknown power approaching Namek. Gohan and Krillin become aware of the approaching presence, with Krillin initially thinking it might be Goku. However, Vegeta panics, declaring that it's the Ginyu Force, five powerful individuals. Grabbing Gohan, Vegeta demands the Dragon Balls, promising not to harm them once he attains immortality. Krillin remains skeptical, but Vegeta insists that their only chance to survive is for him to defeat Frieza and his men after becoming immortal. Nail confirms the truth behind the approaching evil powers, and Krillin questions why Gohan can't be granted immortality instead. Vegeta argues that Gohan lacks the necessary skill and experience, and Krillin raises concerns about reviving their friends. Nail explains that the Dragon Balls grant three wishes, and urging them not to waste time, Vegeta leads Gohan and Krillin to fly off, leaving the Grand Elder to tell Nail to go with them. Meanwhile, five space pods rapidly approach planet Namek. The five ships touch down directly in front of Frieza's spaceship, much to his satisfaction. At the same time, Vegeta, Krillin, and Gohan reach the location where Bulma is concealed. They swiftly grab the four-star ball and take off again, much to Bulma's confusion as she witnessed their unexpected alliance with Vegeta. Meanwhile, Frieza, now back on the roof of his ship with his hover pod, observes the Ginyu Force members emerging from their ships. Flying to the top of Frieza's ship, they strike dramatic poses and introduce themselves. Raccoon, a tall, human-looking man. Birder, a tall, blue man. Jace, a medium-sized, long-haired, pretty boy. Guldo, a short, fat, and ugly four-eyed alien. And Ginyu, a medium-sized, purple alien with horns on his head. In unison, they declare themselves the Ginyu Force, prompting an awkward silence from Frieza. Ginyu, the group's leader, then requests Frieza to brief them on their mission. Frieza explains that Vegeta has seized the Dragon Balls he'd gathered, tasking the Ginyu Force with locating Vegeta, subduing him, and delivering him to Frieza so he can persuade him to reveal the hiding place of the remaining Dragon Balls. Ginyu confidently responds that it's no problem and mentions 
mentions that their scouters have already detected him. Vegeta, accompanied by two individuals with fairly high battle powers, is moving at high speed not far from their location. Frieza orders Ginyu to kill the two with Vegeta on sight, and Jace hands Frieza the case of scouters as requested. Ginyu announces their departure, and the group fly off. Nearby, observing their movement, Vegeta realizes they don't have much longer to act. Meanwhile, Goku's ship is set to land on planet Namek in 20 minutes. As Goku wakes up and dons his new clothes, there are only 10 minutes left. He urges everyone to stay alive until then, and his ship approaches the planet. Vegeta, Gohan, and Krillin arrive at the location of Vegeta's Dragon Balls, only to be confronted by the Ginyu Force, landing right in front of them. Ginyu greets Vegeta and questions the objects they're holding, while Raccoon notes the presence of five more behind them. Ginyu remarks that with the five behind them and the two in their possession, they now have all seven Dragon Balls. Vegeta refuses to surrender them, prompting Ginyu to state that he'll have to take them forcefully. Krillin privately acknowledges Vegeta's earlier assessment of the Ginyu Force's incredible abilities. However, as he glances at Guldo, he finds him less impressive and wonders why he's a part of the group. Ginyu tells Vegeta to hand over his Dragon Ball once more, but points out they'll kill him no matter what he plans to do. Vegeta points out that despite their scouters being capable of locating people, they can't use them to find the Dragon Balls. In response, he tosses the one star ball into the distance, but Birder swiftly catches it and brings it back, leaving Vegeta astonished. Ginyu explains that Birder is the fastest in the universe, much to everyone's shock. Ginyu then states that there's one more Dragon Ball left, and Vegeta instructs Krillin to break it. Krillin raises his fist to shatter the four star ball, but Guldo intervenes, making the ball disappear from Krillin's hand and reappear in Guldo's grasp. Gohan and Krillin are bewildered by this display, and Vegeta speculates that the rumors about Guldo's ability to control and stop time are true. Ginyu announces that with all seven Dragon Balls now in their possession, all that remains is for the Earthlings and Vegeta to be killed. Krillin questions if fighting is the only option, and Vegeta warns Krillin that running is futile. Ginyu decides to take on Vegeta himself, while the others decide who will take on the remaining two through rock, paper, scissors. However, the group complains, and Ginyu instead allows them to decide who will kill the three amongst themselves, while he takes the Dragon Balls back to Frieza. The group begin their game of rock, paper, scissors, and Gohan contemplates the possibility of fleeing. Raccoon and Guldo end up in the final round of the game, and Raccoon wins, revealing that he'll take on Vegeta, and Guldo, who comes in second, gets Krillin and Gohan. Ginyu uses telekinesis to lift all seven Dragon Balls into the air and flies off to deliver them to Frieza. Gohan considers intervening, but Vegeta urges him to save his energy, while also informing Krillin about Guldo's low battle power and his ability to use supernatural powers. Vegeta expresses the need for Kakarot to arrive soon, as they could use another ally, and Gohan is displeased with the situation, thinking that if they die, the trip to Namek will have been for nothing. Raccoon grows impatient, and Gohan, Krillin, and Vegeta ready themselves for battle. Raccoon advises Guldo to eliminate the two smaller opponents first, as they'd likely get in his way. Vegeta criticizes their nonchalant attitude, likening their approach to a game. Krillin reminds Gohan of their image training from the spaceship, and Guldo declares that it's time to end them. Krillin urges Gohan to release his key as the two explode in fury, and both of them ascend into the air in opposite directions, launching a key blast down at Guldo. Guldo yells stop, and time freezes as he moves out of the way of the two blasts. He prepares to use his psychic attack on Krillin and Gohan, but when he looks up into the air, they've moved quite a ways away. Time then unfreezes as Guldo can't hold his breath to maintain the effect, and the two blasts hit the ground. Gohan and Krillin start moving again, and notice Guldo has moved. They head towards him and then vanish, so Guldo freezes time once more. They're both stopped mid-air, diving toward Guldo from opposite sides, and Guldo thinks if he attacks them while time is stopped, it'll use too much energy. In response, Guldo runs over to hide behind a rock, believing the two won't be able to find him. He unfreezes time, and Krillin and Gohan know where he is right away. Guldo freaks out and says he can't stop time anymore as they fly toward him, and he uses a paralysis technique to hold them in place. He wonders how they knew his location without using scouters, and jokes about his plans to kill them. Meanwhile, the other three Ginyu Force members have moved to another spot, and Jace expresses his surprise, as their enemies have battle powers over 10,000. Birder states they're an unusual race that can alter their battle powers without transforming, and Raccoon says as Vegeta has good allies. Vegeta expresses his disappointment, stating how Gohan and Krillin were stupid for attacking from the front after he told them to be careful of Guldo's psychic attack. Guldo telekinesis
telekinetically rips a little tree out of the ground and cuts off the tip, sharpening it. He decides he'll first kill Krillin with it and then use a different type of psychic attack to kill Gohan. The two attempt to remove themselves from harm, but it's no use as their nerves are paralyzed. In a final move, Guldo throws the tree toward Krillin, but Vegeta suddenly chops off Guldo's head, which frees Gohan and Krillin from the psychic attack. A decapitated Guldo tells Vegeta he fought dirty, as this was just supposed to be a fight between him and the runts. Vegeta, however, responds that nothing is dirty in war, and Guldo utters a final remark about the Saiyans being vulgar monkeys. Vegeta finally gets fed up with him talking and blasts his head away, prompting Krillin and Gohan to thank Vegeta, but he says he wasn't doing it for them. It was just the perfect chance to defeat Guldo. Vegeta states this is the end of their good luck though, as Jace and Birder on the sidelines can't believe Guldo's been killed. Raccoon says their special fighting pose won't be pretty anymore, and they'll have to think up a new pose for only four members now. Jace and Birder then do rock, paper, scissors to decide who'll take on the two little guys now, as Vegeta says from here on out, the real hell begins. Raccoon advances toward Vegeta, stating it's their time to fight. He tells Gohan and Krillin to feel free and jump in at any time, and then strikes some ridiculous poses. Vegeta suddenly starts to power up, and Jace says his battle power has shot up close to 30,000. Vegeta flies over toward Raccoon and punches him in the face, then flies behind him and pounds him into the ground. Vegeta then stomps down on Raccoon's chest, then tosses him into a rock formation. Vegeta then charges his hands up and fires a huge blast over toward Raccoon, causing a massive explosion that Gohan and Krillin barely managed to avoid. Vegeta stops, and Krillin comments on how awesome Vegeta is, but suddenly, they all feel Raccoon's key again. The smoke clears, and Raccoon stands before the group in a goofy pose, surprising them as he hadn't taken any damage at all. He states it's been a good warm-up and plans to get serious as he unleashes his Raccoon kick and flies toward Vegeta, kneeing him hard in the face. Vegeta is sent flying backward, but he catches himself and bounces off the ground, then flies toward Raccoon with a punch, but Raccoon blocks it. Vegeta then throws a series of punches, but Raccoon skillfully blocks them all. Raccoon elbows Vegeta on the head, knocking him down. Raccoon comes down to hit him again, but Vegeta jumps up backward, prompting Raccoon to pursue him. Vegeta changes his direction and throws a blast down toward Raccoon. However, Raccoon speeds up to dodge it, then ends up in the air right behind Vegeta as he kicks him down into the water. Vegeta swims underwater for a while, then darts up, delivering a powerful punch to Raccoon in the stomach. It momentarily stuns Raccoon, but he recovers, grabbing Vegeta by the waist, pulling him over his head, and driving him head first into the ground. Raccoon pulls Vegeta up, holding him by his leg, and questions if he's already dead. However, Vegeta suddenly extends his hands and blasts Raccoon in the face, knocking him backward. The Saiyan Prince slowly stands up injured, and Raccoon hops back up as well. He appears battered, but far from injured, much to everyone's shock. Vegeta, however, looks severely injured and struggles for breath as Raccoon makes fun of him. Vegeta is furious about the situation, realizing he's been toyed with the entire time and believes he'll be killed. Krillin expresses concern, stating that if Vegeta is killed, they're next. He doubts they could prevail even with Goku and suggests to Gohan that they should intervene to help. Meanwhile, there are two minutes until Goku arrives on planet Namek. Raccoon declares his next move as the finale, and Krillin informs Gohan they need to attack now, given Vegeta's current lack of strength to evade a swift assault. Raccoon then unleashes an enormous eraser gun from his mouth towards Vegeta. Gohan and Krillin take off, with Vegeta weakly attempting to dodge. Krillin lands knee first on top of Raccoon's head, sealing his mouth and halting the rest of the blast. Gohan grabs Vegeta and moves him away from the blast trajectory, and the impact with an island causes a massive explosion. Vegeta urges Gohan to get off of him, criticizing their decision to aid him instead of attacking Raccoon together. Krillin observes the altered planet shape due to the attack, and Raccoon rises, smoke emanating from his mouth, stating his teeth are messed up now. He calls for Jason Birder, asking if he can also eliminate the two little guys. They agree, but tell him that he'll be treating them to lunch. Raccoon is pleased and kicks Krillin hard, sending him flying. Gohan flies over, shocked to see Krillin immobile. Krillin states his bones are broken and admits he's too weak, even with the power up from the Grand Elder, and believes it's the end. Raccoon is disappointed that Krillin can't continue playing, and Gohan realizes the responsibility of defeating this enemy falls on him. Meanwhile, Nail, who was supposed to be aiding the Earthlings, has decided to turn back to see the Grand Elder instead, 
did, as he feared an evildoer would endanger him. Gohan gets hit, landing on his feet, and fires what resembles a Masenko at Raccoon. Raccoon deflects it back toward Gohan with only his breath, and Gohan narrowly avoids it. Raccoon then attacks Gohan from behind, striking him in his neck. Elsewhere, Frieza praises the Ginyu Force's speed in gathering all seven Dragon Balls, anticipating the realization of his desire for eternal life. Ginyu suggests a victory dance, but Frieza defers it for another time. Frieza stands over the Dragon Balls, ready to commence as Gohan coughs up blood, wondering where his father is. Frieza proclaims the commencement of the eternal ruler of the universe and calls out for the Dragon Balls to grant him eternal life and youth. However, nothing happens. Ginyu wonders if Frieza now possesses immortality, but Frieza dismisses the notion. Recalling an elder's warning that even with all the Dragon Balls, he couldn't make a wish, Frieza speculates there must be some secret only the Namekians know for a wish to be granted. Despite nearly wiping out the Namekians, Frieza realizes he just needs one to reveal the information. Checking his scouter, he first locates Vegeta and the others, contemplating if they hold the knowledge. Ginyu prepares to instruct his subordinates to cease their assault, but Frieza detects two Namekians at the Grand Elder's location, with one more moving toward them. Instructing Ginyu to guard the Dragon Balls, Frieza boards his hover chair and departs for the location. Back at the battlefield, Raccoon launches numerous blasts at Gohan, who narrowly evades them. Subsequently, Raccoon delivers a powerful swipe, sending Gohan flying. Struggling to stand, Krillin weakly advises Gohan to stay down. Gohan, however, declares he's the son of Goku, but Raccoon continues to make fun of him. Charging at Raccoon, determined to win the battle, Gohan is met with laughter. As Gohan attempts an attack, Raccoon executes a flip, delivering a kick to Gohan's neck and breaks it. Gohan collapses, and Jason Burter observe his diminished battle power. Raccoon expresses disappointment in the three he's battled and says he'll end them, but suddenly, the Ginyu Force notice a ship landing nearby as Goku's finally arrived on Namek. Raccoon, Jace, Burter, Vegeta, and Krillin all turn their attention toward the spaceship, with Raccoon pondering its origin. Krillin exclaims that Goku has finally arrived and the spaceship door opens, Goku expressing the need to quickly locate Krillin, Gohan, and Bulma. Noticing individuals in different locations and sensing a tremendously large key nearby, Goku concludes that Krillin and Gohan are on the brink of death. He declares his intention to demonstrate the results of his 100 times gravity training and flies off, zooming past Jace and Birder to land next to Gohan. Goku waves at Krillin and then gives Gohan a sensu. Raccoon and inquires about Goku's identity, but Goku pays no attention. Jace wonders if Goku is faster than Birder, but Birder dismisses him, stating Goku's battle power is low. Gohan awakens, startling Raccoon and the others. As Goku approaches Krillin, he notices even Vegeta is significantly damaged. Krillin, while consuming his sensu, expresses mixed feelings of happiness and concern. Goku questions the reason, and Krillin doubts Goku's ability to defeat their opponents, noting that even Vegeta couldn't handle them. Goku, surprised that Vegeta was on their side, instructs Krillin to stop talking and allows him to probe his mind. Placing his hand on Krillin's head, Goku gains knowledge about power-ups, Bulma's safety, the theft of the Dragon Balls, and details about Frieza, Vegeta, and the others. Goku is aware that Vegeta saved their lives, leading Krillin to wonder about Goku's newfound ability. Goku mentions having only one sensu left, tossing it to Vegeta and instructs him to consume it. Despite Krillin's skepticism, Goku explains that he wants to settle the score with Vegeta and declares his intention to handle the remaining foes alone. Raccoon finds this intriguing and queries the others about Goku's battle power, learning that it's only around 5,000. Vegeta, perplexed by Goku's behavior, suddenly becomes anxious, wondering if Goku has indeed become the warrior of legend. Raccoon finds it strange that Goku is smiling when facing imminent defeat, but Goku asserts that Raccoon can't emerge victorious. Raccoon finds this amusing and Krillin is confused insisting that Goku isn't the type to bluff like this. In his thoughts, Vegeta contemplates the possibility of Goku becoming a Super Saiyan, deeming it impossible. He dismisses the notion, believing it as just a stupid legend, and asserts that if it were true, he should be the only one capable of attaining such power. Raccoon declares it's time to silence Goku and initiates the Raccoon Mac attack. Raccoon charges at Goku, but at the last moment, Goku vanishes and Raccoon strikes empty air. Baffled by Goku's disappearance, everyone looks around and Vegeta looks in the direction of Jason Birder, who now realize Goku is standing behind them. Goku advises the two to retreat and then returns near Raccoon, as Krillin observes that Vegeta was the only one who noticed
to Goku's swift movements. Raccoon shows a lack of concern and states that the next move will send all four of his enemies to the next world. As Raccoon powers up his final attack, Goku intervenes and elbows him in the stomach. Appearing to be in extreme pain, Raccoon collapses, leaving Krillin, Gohan, Jace, and Birder astonished. However, Vegeta acknowledges the severity of the attack, recognizing it as no ordinary strike. He realizes that Goku has surpassed the normal limitations of a Saiyan and is a different person than the one he faced on Earth. Intrigued and somewhat skeptical, Vegeta questions whether the legend of the Super Saiyan is true and ponders the kind of training Goku underwent. Goku looks over to Jason Birder and questions if they'll go back to their own planet or end up like Raccoon. They're not worried though, stating that this stranger only got a leg up on Raccoon because he dropped his guard. As the two ready themselves to charge toward Goku, Vegeta remains on the sidelines, insisting that Goku's already won. They fly over to Goku, Jace stops in front of him and Birder behind him. Jace starts to talk about what happens when you mess with the Ginyu Force, but Goku punches him in the face before he can finish, busting his nose. Goku mocks the two as their team leave themselves open too much, and Jace gets pissed and kicks at Goku and Birder elbows at him, but Goku holds off both with ease. He knees Jace away and sweep kicks Birder, then unleashes a shockwave, sending them both flying off even further. Krillin can't believe he blew them away with just a push, and Gohan wonders if the Ginyu Force is truly as strong as they thought. Krillin says they are though, as even Vegeta was no match for them, and Raccoon was around the same level of power as Jason Birder. He hypothesizes that Goku must be so powerful now that it's making the others look weak in comparison. Jace wonders what's going on, as Goku's battle power is unmistakably only 5,000. However, Vegeta asserts that Kakarot's battle power briefly raises at the moment of attack and figures he's doing this to conserve energy. Birder tells Jace via Scouter to use his Crusher Ball, explaining that since he's the fastest in the universe, he'll attack Goku when he tries to run away. Jace agrees and creates a big ball of ki and swats it like a volleyball toward Goku. Goku, however, doesn't move until the last second when he knocks it away and it nearly hits Birder. Jace can't believe he deflected it as Goku suddenly appears mid-air behind Birder. Jace yells out to Birder, alerting him of Goku's presence. Birder turns around and he can't believe Goku is there as he's supposed to be the fastest in the universe. Goku says maybe he's the second fastest now and Jace becomes anxious as not only did this stranger brush aside his crusher ball, but he's also running circles around Birder. Birder questions Goku on who the heck he is and Goku states that he's a Saiyan raised on Earth. Birder tells him to cut the crap as Saiyans shouldn't be that fast and Goku says it must be from his intense training. Birder asserts Goku can't win with speed alone and moves into attack, but Goku dodges. Goku effortlessly dodges more of Birder's attacks and Jace joins in as well. Goku soon decides to show that he has more than just speed and appears behind Birder and kicks him off into the distance. He then flies above Birder and elbows him down toward the ground. However, Goku gets to the ground first and catches Birder, then tosses his unconscious body aside. Goku yells out to Jace to stop this pointless fight and exclaims that both of his friends are still alive, so he should quickly take them and leave planet Namek. Vegeta questions Kakarot on what he's doing and urges him to finish the Ginyu Force. Goku, however, responds that they can't even move, so there's no point in killing them. Jace can't believe of what's become of the Ginyu Force, five of the most super elite warriors in the universe. He starts freaking out and flies off, but Goku isn't concerned. Krillin questions if this is really the Goku they know, and suddenly, Vegeta lands knee first on Birder's neck and kills him. He then sends a key blast toward Raccoon and kills him too. Goku can't believe Vegeta killed them, but Vegeta just tells him he's naive and scolds him for letting one of them get away. He tells Goku that perhaps he wasn't able to become a Super Saiyan after all, which confuses him. Vegeta then exclaims that no matter how strong Kakarot is, he absolutely can't win against a terrifying monster like Frieza unless he retorts to lethal measures. Meanwhile, Frieza approaches the Grand Elder's home. Goku questions if he really stands no chance against Frieza, and Vegeta says it's true. The only way he'll be able to best Frieza is if he's prepared. Krillin goes on about how easily Goku just defeated the Ginyu Force, but Vegeta asserts that Frieza is an entirely different beast. He also says that Frieza's probably received immortality from the Dragon Balls by now, and thinks they should just pray they don't run into him. Krillin doubts that though, and explains that if Namekian Dragon Balls are anything like the ones on Earth, the sky should turn dark when Shenron appears. Vegeta questions what Shenron is, and if that's what comes out when the Dragon Balls are gathered, 
gathered. And Goku realizes Frieza probably doesn't know the password, so there's still a chance for them to have their wish granted. Meanwhile, Jace has made it back to Frieza's ship, and Ginyu can't believe that Guldo, Raccoon, and Birder have all been killed. Jace wonders if they should contact Frieza, but Ginyu says he wants to handle this personally. He tells Jace to hide the Dragon Balls, as Frieza would be pissed if they were stolen. So, he buries them right next to the ship, confident that no one will find them. They then prepare to leave and do their fighting pose, but Ginyu realizes their special fighting pose is no good with only two of them, and gets really angry as the two fly off. Back at the battlefield, Vegeta questions if Goku plans on defeating Frieza, and Goku says maybe, but first he needs to return everyone to life that Vegeta killed on Earth. Vegeta tells him it's pointless to waste a wish on that, and should give him immortality instead. Krillin, however, protests, stating that it would be no better than if Frieza had immortality, and Vegeta notices there are two battle powers coming their way. Jace has returned and brought Captain Ginyu with him, and Vegeta says this time it'll be difficult even for Kakarot, and Krillin grows worried. Vegeta then wonders where Frieza is, since he's not at the spaceship where Ginyu took the Dragon Balls. Goku says he feels a strong key over in the opposite direction, and figures it must be Frieza. Suddenly, Krillin and Gohan freak out, as that's the direction where the Grand Elder lives. Krillin realizes Frieza must have gone to a Namekian to find out how to get his wish granted, and Goku questions if the Grand Elder is the creator of the Dragon Balls. Gohan realizes Frieza will probably kill the Grand Elder if and when he tells Frieza how to get his wish, and states that Frieza doesn't know that once the Grand Elder dies, the Dragon Balls will be lost forever. Vegeta is surprised to hear this, as Jace and Ginyu come flying in. Krillin wonders if Goku can win this time, and Goku says he won't know until he tries. Goku then assesses Ginyu's power, and states he's much stronger than the others. Ginyu notes Goku's battle power is about 5,000, and Jace says it's really strange. However, Ginyu calls him an idiot, and explains how foolish it is to rely on a scouter's figure. He figures this guy must be the type that can instantly raise their battle power, and guesses his actual battle power must be around 60,000. Jace can't believe a Saiyan would be that strong, but Ginyu says he might be a naturally gifted fighter like they are. Goku says he'll hold off Ginyu while Krillin and Gohan get the Dragon Radar and search for the Dragon Balls. Goku tells Vegeta to focus on Jace, going on to say that Vegeta must have gotten a lot stronger after recovering from near death, surprising Vegeta as Goku knows more about Saiyan biology than he realized. Krillin and Gohan take off, and Jace notes they're getting away, but Ginyu says they're just small fry. Goku readies himself for battle, but Vegeta suddenly takes off and leaves Goku by himself as Ginyu rushes in. Ginyu elbows Goku in the face and sends him flying, but Goku lands on his feet. Ginyu appears behind him and swipes at Goku, but Goku ducks it, then kicks back at Ginyu. The two of them trade punches and break, landing far from one another. Goku is pissed at Vegeta for bailing on him, and says he'll need to wrap things up quickly, otherwise Vegeta will claim the Dragon Balls for himself. Meanwhile, Vegeta says to himself that Kakarot and Ginyu are about the same strength, and hopes they finish each other off to give him the advantage of getting his wish granted. In the meantime, he'll get Gohan and Krillin to tell him the password for making a wish on the Dragon Balls, then be granted immortality to fight Frieza. Back at the battlefield, Ginyu tells Goku that they're quite alike, as he's also the type that can freely alter his battle power. On the sidelines, Jace thinks to himself that even if Goku's power is 60,000, Captain Ginyu still has a much greater battle power himself. Ginyu charges up and unleashes a huge blast, but Goku jumps into the air and out of the way. Goku comes down behind Ginyu and tries to kick him in the back of the head, but Ginyu evades it. Ginyu swipes at Goku, but Goku disappears and reappears at Ginyu's side, and Ginyu blocks a kick. The two then exchange a few punches until Ginyu flies up into the air. Goku does the same, much quicker and much higher, and Ginyu is astonished at his speed. A blast then comes up at Goku, which he just barely avoids, and Ginyu comes up from behind and locks Goku in a full Nelson position. It was Jace who'd fired the blast, and he yells up, telling Ginyu to snap Goku in two. Struggling to break free, Goku feels he has no choice but to use the Kaioken, but Ginyu suddenly releases him. Jace is shocked, and Ginyu yells that he didn't ask for help, and says if Jace interferes again, he'll kill him. Ginyu then says he noticed Goku hasn't been using his true power, and figures he's saving that for Frieza. Goku says he'll show him his real power, and tells him to watch on his scouter to see how strong he really is. Goku then starts to power up using the Kaioken, and Ginyu freaks out, as his battle power goes from 90,000 to 100,000 to 110,000 and continues to rise. 120,000, 130,000, 140,000, Goku's power level 
continues to rise, but then he stops at 180,000, leaving Ginyu in disbelief. Jace thinks there's no way they can win since Captain Ginyu's highest power level is only 120,000, and Goku states the power he has is nothing compared to what he can put out in short bursts. Ginyu wonders if Goku is actually a Super Saiyan, and Goku recalls Vegeta mentioning something about that, but he remains uncertain of what he means. Jace panics at the idea of a Super Saiyan, the all-powerful warrior of legend, and the one thing Frieza fears most. Goku asserts that the Ginyu Force can't defeat him, and insists they leave the planet, as he doesn't want to waste time fighting them. Ginyu can't believe what he's hearing, and questions if Goku is serious. Goku affirms that he is, considering Ginyu's belief in a fair fight, and expresses reluctance to kill him. Ginyu contemplates that a Super Saiyan, the strongest warrior in the entire universe, would relish blood in battle, prompting him to conclude that Goku must not be a Super Saiyan yet. However, Ginyu acknowledges Goku's strength and states that he's been waiting for someone like him to come along. Meanwhile, Frieza approaches the Grand Elder's house and notices that there are only three Namekians there. Nail realizes Frieza is approaching and the Grand Elder finishes powering up Dende. He instructs Dende to hurry and assist the Earthlings and reluctantly, Dende leaves, urging the Grand Elder not to die. Dende flies past Frieza on his way out, but Frieza pays no attention. Frieza then lands and exits his pod. Soon after, Nail comes out of the house and questions what Frieza wants. Frieza explains that he's gathered all seven of the Namekian Dragon Balls but can't make a wish, so he demands Nail to tell him how to do so. Nail refuses, stating that he would never aid an evil person like Frieza. Frieza suggests that Nail should be more obedient, threatening to kill him since there are two Namekians present. Nail accepts, but states before they engage in combat, he insists on explaining something. The other person with in the house is the Grand Elder, creator of the Namekian Dragon Balls. He says if Frieza were to kill the Elder, the Dragon Balls would cease to exist. Frieza questions who the Grand Elder is and fires his eye lasers at the top of the house. He then flies up to inspect the inside. Frieza looks at the Elder and questions if he'll give him the information he requires, suggesting that he'll kill Nail if he doesn't comply. The Elder informs Frieza that Nail is the only fighting Titan Namekian on the planet and that he's different from the ones Frieza had killed before. Frieza takes his response as a no, and the Grand Elder telepathically requests Nail to at least buy some time, and Nail agrees. Frieza decides that if the Elder is going to be stubborn, he'll have to demonstrate the terrifying power of the greatest warrior in the entire universe. Frieza contemplates that it might be beneficial to fight where they are, as it may convince the Grand Elder to divulge information. However, Nail suggests changing location since the Grand Elder's life is near its end. They both fly off, and the the Grand Elder apologizes to Nail, stating they need time for Dende to reach the Earthlings. Frieza believes they've gone far enough and they land on an island. Nail removes his shirt and the ground starts shaking as he begins to power up. Frieza is quite impressed to see Nail's battle power reach 42,000 and acknowledges that he is significantly different from other Namekians. Frieza decides to reveal his own battle power of 530,000 but states that he won't be fighting at full strength. Nail appears surprised and Frieza decides it'll be more enjoyable to fight with only his left arm. Enraged, Nail charges at Frieza and attempts to chop at his neck. However, it has no effect and Frieza grabs Nail's arm, tearing it off from the forearm down. Nail screams in pain as blood spurts out and Frieza elbows him in the stomach, causing Nail to fall over. Despite the injuries, Nail slowly gets back up as Frieza talks down to him. The Namekian regenerates his arm and catches his breath and Frieza expresses surprise but claims it makes no difference, asserting that Nail's battle power is dropping. Meanwhile, Goku questions why Ginyu is laughing, and Ginyu explains that Goku has a much greater battle power than he does. Goku questions why he would laugh at that, and Jace suspects what Ginyu is planning. Ginyu laughs more and throws his scouter down at Jace, who's certain he knows Ginyu's intentions. Ginyu then surprisingly pierces his own chest, breaking through his armor and leaving a large bloody hole. Struggling through his injuries, he states that Goku may may not be a Super Saiyan, but expresses he's taken a liking to his body. He then yells, change, and a bright flash of light occurs between Goku and Ginyu. Soon after, Goku evilly laughs as Ginyu stands clutching the wound in his chest. Much to his satisfaction, Ginyu has successfully switched bodies with Goku. Goku, in Ginyu's body, questions why he can see himself in front of him, and Ginyu, in Goku's body, says it's because they've switched bodies, and Goku sits in shock as Jace gives Ginyu back his 
scouter. Ginyu suggests heading back to the spaceship, expressing admiration for the newfound speed of his borrowed body. Struggling to move, Goku fears the repercussions, particularly the prospect of encountering Krillin and Gohan in his current state. Despite weak attempts to fly away, Goku worries about alarming Chi-Chi with his unfamiliar appearance upon returning to Earth. Meanwhile, Krillin and Gohan, having reached Bulma's hideout, awaken her and request the Dragon Radar. Before complying, Bulma scolds them for leaving her alone, teaming up with Vegeta and leaving her in the dark through all of it. Krillin urges Bulma to hurry up, but Bulma continues her rant, wondering what's taking them so long to have their wish granted. Gohan locates the Dragon Ball's direction on the radar, prompting them to leave. Despite Bulma's insistence on an explanation, Gohan insists they'll clarify later, emphasizing the urgency and tells her Goku's arrived on Namek. As they depart, Bulma reflects on Goku's growth and her relationship with Yamcha, contemplating whether she made the right choice in choosing a boyfriend. Meanwhile, Vegeta arrives at Frieza's spaceship, finding it empty. Inside, he searches for the Dragon Balls, speculating on their location. Unfazed, he assumes the Earthlings can use their device to find them. While changing into his new armor, he ponders the mysterious medicine Goku gave him, healing his injuries and restoring his strength. Noticing Gohan and Krillin approaching, Vegeta strategizes to eliminate them after they summon Shenron. The two arrive and locate the Dragon Balls underground, thanks to the Dragon Radar. The two start digging up the Dragon Balls, and Vegeta hides in silence, thinking to himself that he'll dispose of Gohan and Krillin soon enough and gain eternal life. Krillin attempts to summon Shenron, only to be met with silence. Perplexed, Vegeta wonders what's going on, and Gohan considers that the summon may be different on Namek. Suddenly, they detect two approaching evil energy signatures, suspecting Ginyu and wonder what happened to Goku. Krillin and Gohan hide to avoid detection, and the two cautiously observe Ginyu and Jace landing near the spaceship, much to their surprise. Witnessing the Dragon Balls unearthed, Ginyu and Jace express confusion. Krillin then emerges from hiding, assuming that Goku has defeated Ginyu and that Jace has switched allegiances. Ginyu questions how they located the Dragon Balls, and Krillin explains the use of the Dragon Radar. Despite Ginyu assuming they've made a wish, Krillin reveals that Shenron didn't appear. Krillin questions why Goku is acting so strange, and Gohan interrupts, shouting that the person standing before them isn't his father, but it's too late. Ginyu strikes Krillin, shocking Vegeta as he flies backward, bewildered as Ginyu notes Gohan's position on the battlefield as well. Krillin still remains confused on why Goku would hit him, but Gohan insists once again that this man isn't Goku. Ginyu confirms this theory, stating that he and Goku switched bodies and that he's truly the leader of the Ginyu Force, Captain Ginyu. Ginyu, surprising Gohan, Krillin, and Vegeta. Ginyu states that he'll be giving his new body a test run and charges toward Gohan and Krillin. Meanwhile, Goku, headed toward his friends and struggling to adapt to Ginyu's body, realizes that Ginyu must be grappling with the same issue. Simultaneously, Ginyu engages Krillin and Gohan in combat, displaying what he believes to be Goku's true power. Vegeta remains in hiding, believing that Kakarot's power truly belongs to Ginyu now, and not long after, Goku arrives at the battle battlefield, still grappling with Ginyu's unfamiliar body. Eventually, Goku unveils the truth, stating that he has indeed had his body stolen. Krillin and Gohan, finally coming to grips with the situation, are instructed by Goku that they should be able to defeat him while Ginyu possesses his body. Ginyu asserts his invincibility in the new body, but Goku warns him that he can't unleash his full power due to unfamiliarity with Goku's techniques like the Kaioken. Ginyu, however, dismisses this, begins powering up, and queries Jason about his battle power, learning it's only 23,000 as opposed to Goku's 180,000. In disbelief, Ginyu is knocked down by Krillin, confirming Goku's statement that they can likely defeat the imposter. Just as Ginyu orders Jace to assist, Vegeta intervenes, declaring that he'll have to get through him first. Thrown back toward the ship, Ginyu recovers and hurls a key blast at Gohan, who effortlessly blocks, teasing its inefficiency. Bewildered, Ginyu receives a reminder from Krillin about Goku's earlier statement regarding the challenges of using the unfamiliar body. Krillin advises surrender, but Ginyu, infuriated, launches a series of punches, all effortlessly blocked by Krillin. Simultaneously, Vegeta and Jace engage in combat, with Jace puzzled by Vegeta's absence on his scouter. Vegeta dismisses the reliance on the scouter and challenges Jace to gauge his power level now, as it's grown exponentially. Jace's mocking of Vegeta quickly turns to fear, as he realizes what the Saiyan speaks is true. To Jace Jace's disbelief, Vegeta claims to be surpassing Saiyan limitations, rapidly approaching the status of a Super Saiyan. Mocking Vegeta's assertion, Jace receives
receives a powerful kick to the face and a devastating chop to his rib cage, shattering his armor. Upside down and coughing blood, Jace faces Vegeta's palm near his face, followed by a devastating blast that obliterates him completely. Everyone notices this, and Goku fears Vegeta overdid it. Vegeta, however, confident in his own power, insists Kakarot's naivety prevents him from becoming a Super Saiyan. Ginyu, shocked by Jace's demise, witnesses Vegeta deciding to finish off Ginyu himself. Vegeta flies in and delivers a harsh blow to Ginyu's gut, followed by a punch to his face, sending him flying. Vegeta follows, kicking Ginyu into the air and pummeling him down to the ground. Struggling to move, Ginyu appears defeated, shocking Gohan and Krillin. Goku pleads with Vegeta not to kill Ginyu in his body, but Vegeta prepares for the final blow. As Vegeta speeds toward Ginyu, Ginyu smirks and Goku realizes his intentions, prompting Ginyu to suddenly attempt to change bodies with Vegeta. However, Goku realizes he can return to his original body and intercepts the flash of light shooting toward Vegeta just in time. The exchange occurs and Goku is restored to his own body while Ginyu reverts to his original form. Angry at Goku's interference, Ginyu is determined to switch bodies with Vegeta without further disruptions. Goku, feeling the effects of the battle, remains immobile and Gohan confirms that his dad is back in his own body. As Ginyu tells Goku he'll be moving forward with his plan, Goku expresses concern about what might happen happen if Ginyu manages to take Vegeta's body this time. Vegeta, unable to discern between Goku and Ginyu, watches as Ginyu prepares for another body change. However, spotting a frog, Goku seizes an opportunity. As Ginyu begins the body swapping technique, Goku throws the frog into the light, resulting in a switch between Ginyu and the frog. As the light dissipates, the frog, now in Ginyu form, starts hopping away, much to everyone's shock. Gohan and Krillin approach Goku, helping him up and inquiring about his well-being. Goku mentions the beating his body took from Vegeta, and when Vegeta demands an explanation, Goku reveals that the frog hopping away is actually Ginyu. Vegeta contemplates squashing the frog, but Goku urges him to let Ginyu go since he's harmless in that form. Acknowledging this, Vegeta decides not to pursue Ginyu. The group discusses the lack of sensu beans, and Vegeta taunts them for their current state, saying it'd be easy to wipe them all out right now. Goku reassures Krillin that Vegeta won't kill them though, especially since they're needed to fight against Frieza. Vegeta emphasizes the importance of Kakarot and instructs them to bring Goku into Frieza's ship for medical treatment. As Goku sits in a medical machine, Krillin expresses concern about him drowning, but Goku is seen enjoying the treatment. Vegeta then suggests Gohan and Krillin get proper battle gear, confusing Krillin and causing Gohan to worry about their image. Observing the advanced technology aboard the ship, Krillin contemplates the strength of Frieza, expressing his fear while Gohan concurs. Vegeta tosses them undersuits before providing providing them with small sized battle jackets. Puzzled about wearing the jackets, Krillin and Gohan receive guidance from Vegeta, who assures them of the material's stretchiness and resistance to impact. Impressed with the lightweight feel, Krillin questions the design of Vegeta's shoulderless battle jacket, but Gohan assures him of its flexibility. When asked about Goku's healing time, Vegeta estimates 40 to 50 minutes. Krillin decides to retrieve the password to summon Shenron from the Grand Elder and instructs Gohan to wait with Vegeta as it could get dangerous and Frieza may be there too. Flying toward the Elder's house, Krillin leaves Gohan behind. Meanwhile, Nail is exhausted from battling Frieza, who, unscathed, insists on Nail divulging the information of the Dragon Balls. Nail attempts a massive blast, but Frieza emerges undamaged. Puzzled by Nail's determination, Frieza punches him to the ground and demands the wish-granting password. However, Nail, anticipating Dende's success in delivering the password to the Earthlings, believes there's no point in revealing it. Frieza, now enraged, realizes that Nail was just buying time to prevent him from getting his wish granted. Frieza then flies off and checks his scouter, shocked that Vegeta and the Earthlings apparently defeated the Ginyu Force. Furious, Frieza vows to be the one granted the wish from Shenron and continues to fly off in Dende's direction. Dende, flying toward one of Namek's districts, recalls the Grand Elder's instructions to deliver the password. The Grand Elder, pondering on recent events, states he should have told the Earthlings the password while they were in his presence, and thinking of Nail's struggles, wishes for Dende's haste as his life nears its end. Meanwhile, Krillin, headed in the direction of the Grand Elder, senses another key, flies over and discovers Dende. Reuniting with joy, Krillin and Dende share their happiness at seeing each other again. Krillin elaborates on his journey to meet the Grand Elder, sharing the challenge of making a wish, even with all the Dragon Balls. Dende reveals that the Elder anticipated this and sent him with the knowledge to summon the dragon, emphasizing the need to express the wish in Namekian
Ian for it to be granted. Worried about the time constraints due to the elders declining health and Frieza's imminent arrival, Dende urges them to hasten. At the spaceship, Vegeta's asleep and Gohan senses two approaching key, recognizing one as Krillin and the other Dende. The three greet each other and Krillin updates Gohan on their plan to summon the dragon by using the Namekian language. Krillin suggests moving the Dragon Ball so they don't wake Vegeta, and even if they somehow managed to do so, they'd have enough time to make a wish before he caught up to them. As the three collect the Dragon Balls and prepare to summon Shenron, Gohan and Krillin detect Frieza approaching rapidly. Dende begins the summoning chant, and a massive light emanates from the Dragon Balls, turning the sky dark. Frieza, bewildered by the sudden nightfall, pauses mid-air, and back on King Kai's planet, King Kai tells the Z Fighters that their wishes are about to be granted. Back on Namek, the giant colossal dragon emerges, surpassing Earth's Shenron in size and form. Gohan questions if this is Shenron, and Dende introduces Porunga, otherwise known as the God of Dreams, to the Namekians. Porunga states he'll grant three wishes, surprising Krillin, who marvels at the news. However, Dende urges the two to hurry with their wishes before Frieza and Vegeta arrive. Krillin's initial wish, to revive all those killed by the Saiyans on Earth, is met with the revelation that only one person can be revived at a time. Shocked, King Kai relays this to the Z Fighters on his planet, where Piccolo urgently requests to speak with Gohan. Urged by Dende to hasten, Krillin, uncertain about just using one wish, considers Namek's dragon stingy for allowing only three revivals. The dilemma of choosing whom to revive arises among Krillin, Gohan, and the others. On King Kai's planet, Piccolo tells the Kai once more to allow him to speak to Gohan. Placing his hand on King Kai's shoulder, Piccolo communicates with Gohan, explaining that he's speaking from King Kai's place and emphasizing the constraints of a single wish. Piccolo's strategy then unfolds, as he tells Gohan to use the first wish to revive him, which will in turn revive Kami and bring Earth's Dragon Balls back, allowing subsequent revivals. Gohan comprehends, and Piccolo outlines the second wish, to be transported to planet Namek for a showdown with Frieza. Piccolo states he's become much stronger during his time on King Kai's planet, and intends to deal with the monster who slaughtered his people. As Krillin conveys the first wish to Dende, he speaks to Purunga in Namekian, and the dragon comprehends. At the same time, Vegeta awakens and senses Frieza approaching. Confused by the sudden nightfall and the absence of Kakarot's son, Vegeta spots the massive dragon and realizes he's been tricked. Furious, he heads toward the group, realizing Frieza is nearly there. Meanwhile, Piccolo's halo vanishes, and Kami returns to life at the lookout above Earth. Gohan relays the second wish to Dende, and Krillin urges the Namekian to hurry as he spots Vegeta rapidly approaching on their location. Dende wishes for Piccolo to be transported to planet Namek, and the Namekian vanishes from King Kai's planet. As Purunga inquires about the group's final wish, Gohan and Krillin search for Piccolo, only to be surprised to learn that Dende didn't specify for Piccolo to appear at their location, but only to the planet itself. At the same time, Vegeta arrives, furious that the trio have destroyed his one and only chance of becoming immortal. As Vegeta advances, Gohan assures him that they still have one wish left, prompting Krillin to call him an idiot for revealing that information. Vegeta is relieved, and Frieza, approaching the Pillar of Light, detects life readings and speculates they must be making their wish. At the same time, Vegeta insists on the immortality wish, and despite Krillin's reluctance, Gohan acknowledges the necessity due to Goku's injuries. Meanwhile, Piccolo arrives on planet Namek. Piccolo takes in his surroundings, feeling an odd connection to the planet. However, he decides this is no time for sentiment and opts to finding Gohan and the others. They don't seem to be within Piccolo's range, but he suddenly picks up on Frieza's key along with three others and takes off toward it. Meanwhile, the third and final wish remains unspoken. Vegeta seizes Dende, urging him to quickly make him immortal, threatening consequences from Frieza. Left with no other options, Krillin implores Dende to fulfill Vegeta's wish, emphasizing Frieza's greater threat. Dende reluctantly agrees, and Vegeta envisions his aspirations of universal domination. However, just before Dende can vocalize the wish, Purunga disappears, the sky reverts to normal, and the Dragon Balls transform to stone. Bewildered, Vegeta demands an explanation, and Dende sadly reveals that the Grand Elder has passed away. Livid, Vegeta directs his anger at the others for deceiving him, 
them, but the group halts as they notice Frieza standing above them in anger. Frieza says the group have successfully crushed his dreams of eternal life and youth, and inquires what happened to the Ginyu Force as the readings are absent from his scouter. Frieza goes on to say that the Dragon Ball's returning to stone in an instant is unfortunate for Vegeta, but even more so for himself, descends and states never before has he been so disrespected. Unable to contain his anger any longer, Frieza expresses his fury, threatening to kill each and every one of them and savor every last second of it. Gohan and Krillin break away, and Vegeta challenges Frieza, stating that he won't be beaten easily. Fearing that Vegeta has somehow forgotten how terrifying he can be, Frieza decides to refresh his memory and begins powering up. As Frieza's energy explodes, Gohan, Krillin, and Vegeta grow nervous, and Piccolo senses the escalating key. However, pausing on his way to the battle, Piccolo detects a faint key nearby and stands next to the defeated Nail. Observing Nail, Piccolo remarks that he looks just like him and deduces he must be Namekian. Piccolo acknowledges Nail's critical condition, and Nail realizes that Piccolo must be the Namekian the Earthlings referred to. Nail expresses his gratitude for having their wish granted, but Piccolo says he's in a hurry, preparing himself to take off and leave Nail to die. However, Nail compliments Piccolo's strength and suggests that if Piccolo had returned to his original state, also known as his fusion with Kami, he could potentially defeat Frieza. Intrigued, Piccolo questions if assimilating with Kami would surpass Frieza in strength, and Nail confirms, citing his knowledge of Frieza's power. Despite this fact, Piccolo states that it doesn't matter now and refuses to join with Kami anyway. Nail, sensing the urgency, proposes Piccolo assimilate with him instead, emphasizing the exponential increase in power. Despite Piccolo's initial refusal, Nail insists there's no time and urges Piccolo to place his hand on his body. Reluctantly agreeing, Piccolo warns Nail not to alter his personality. Nail reassures him and starts flashing, eventually being absorbed into Piccolo. Now experiencing an overwhelming surge of power, Piccolo is exhilarated, stating no matter who his enemy may be, he can't possibly lose. With newfound confidence, Piccolo flies off, reveling in his delight. Meanwhile, as Frieza continues to power up, he mocks the trio's chances against a dinosaur such as himself. However, Vegeta confidently asserts that he can win with Krillin and Gohan's help, as their powers have grown exponentially and Gohan has a hidden strength greater than he could imagine. Vegeta then goes on to state his additional hidden power and proximity to becoming a Super Saiyan. Though initially amused, assuming Vegeta to be bluffing, Frieza gets angry and charges at him. Vegeta manages to catch Frieza's fists, holding him off until his scouter explodes, forcing them to break apart. Recognizing the need to get serious, Frieza states that there was some truth to Vegeta's claim. In response, Vegeta challenges Frieza to transform and reveal his true form, citing information obtained from Zarbon. Ready for the challenge, Frieza agrees to unveil his true power, much to Gohan and Krillin's surprise. Puzzled by the concept of transformation, Gohan and Krillin seek clarification from Vegeta. Vegeta then explains that some aliens conceal their true forms to conserve energy. However, Frieza asserts his difference, claiming that he has too much power and can't control himself when transformed. Dismissing it as a bluff, Vegeta remains skeptical, but Frieza insists otherwise. To demonstrate his immense power, Frieza recounts attacking the Saiyan's homeworld and defeating the King of Planet Vegeta, also known as Vegeta's father, without the need to transform. Unfazed, Vegeta shrugs off the comment, confident that he surpassed his father in strength as a child. Frieza then initiates a power-up, casually discarding his battle jacket. Vegeta then mocks the act, considering it a mere removal of clothes. However, as Frieza intensifies his transformation, his body expands and his horns elongate. To everyone's shock, Frieza now dons a taller, muscular form. Cautioning the group to beware, Frieza warns that he won't be as merciful as before now that he's transformed, and states that his battle power has now reached 1 million. In a display of power, Frieza raises his hand, causing the entire island beneath them to explode. However, Vegeta, Gohan, and Krillin manage to escape unharmed. Krillin, holding Dende, sustains a minor injury from a rock fragment, and commending their evasion, Frieza mocks Vegeta for the look on his face, stating that the Saiyan underestimated his strength. Quickly deciding on his first victim, Frieza soars through the air and impales Krillin through the stomach with his horn, determined to send one of the three to hell. Gohan urgently calls out to Krillin, while Vegeta berates him for being distracted by the Namekian. Frieza mocks Krillin as he sits impaled, and violently hurdles him into the sea. Gohan attempts to fly down to rescue Krillin, but Frieza obstructs his path. Dismissing Gohan's efforts, Frieza insists it's futile, telling the boy to worry about himself 
himself instead. Enraged, Gohan screams at Frieza to move aside. With sudden ferocity, Gohan kicks Frieza in the face, delivers an uppercut and powerful blows to Frieza's stomach. Gohan then kicks Frieza away and unleashes a massive blast, sending Frieza crashing to the ground. The Saiyan relentlessly continues his assault, launching a barrage of energy blasts at Frieza, leaving Vegeta in disbelief. As Gohan pauses to catch his breath, Vegeta contemplates the immense power Gohan unleashes in his fury, considering the possibility that Gohan might be the closest to achieving Super Saiyan status. Concerned for Krillin, Gohan looks down and spots Dende in the water holding him, and miraculously, he's still breathing. Vegeta urges Gohan to focus on the immediate threat, believing Frieza to still be alive. Gohan observes as Frieza stands up and realizes that their efforts weren't enough. Frieza commends Gohan's attempt, stating that there's more to him than meets the eye. However, Frieza deems his assault insufficient and Vegeta acknowledges their naivety. Meanwhile, Goku, still in the medical machine, hopes that everyone can hold on a little longer while he completes his healing process. In another location, Piccolo continues flying, noticing Frieza's increased strength. Determined, he declares that he'll be there soon. Gohan notices that Frieza is increasing his power, and Vegeta claims that Frieza can manipulate his battle strength. Frieza declares his intent to repay the damage he received exponentially, while Dende pulls Krillin's body to safety. Gohan sits in fear as Frieza ascends toward him, and Vegeta urgently tells him to retreat. However, Frieza forcefully smashes Gohan into the ground, expressing his desire to enjoy some amusement before delivering the fatal blow. Reacting quickly, Vegeta launches a massive energy blast at Frieza from behind, hoping for success. As the smoke dissipates though, it becomes apparent that Frieza remains unharmed. With a nonchalant tone, Frieza informs Vegeta that they can engage in their little game once he disposes of the young Saiyan, and Vegeta despairs, believing their situation to be hopeless. As Frieza descends next to Gohan on the ground, he mocks him, asking how he'd like to be killed. Despite Gohan's attempts to resist with kicks and punches, Frieza effortlessly evades his attacks. Seizing Gohan by the hair, Frieza delivers a knee to his abdomen and throws him to the ground. As Gohan struggles to rise, Frieza prepares to crush him under his foot, but Gohan counters by blasting the ground and propelling himself into the air. In a swift move, Frieza appears behind Gohan and strikes him down with his tail. Gohan tries to stand again, but this time, Frieza surprises him by attacking him from a different angle, elbowing him in the back of the head and knocking him down once more. With Gohan on the ground, Frieza places his foot on the child's head, causing the young Saiyan to scream in pain as Frieza applies pressure, seemingly intent on crushing him like a grape. Continuing to press his foot on Gohan's head, Frieza taunts Vegeta, questioning if he has any intention on saving the young Saiyan. Despite Vegeta's internal dismissal of concern for Gohan, he acknowledges that Frieza's power surpasses his expectations. Meanwhile, inside the medical machine, Goku observes Gohan's rapidly declining energy and realizes he may have to interrupt his healing process to save him. Suddenly, Frieza declares Gohan's imminent demise, but abruptly halts as he notices something. Frieza jumps off Gohan as a destructo disc launched in rapidly cuts off half of his tail. To everyone's surprise, Krillin is fully healed with only a hole in his battle jacket as evidence of his previous injury. In response, Krillin bombards Frieza with a barrage of destructo disc attacks, prompting Goku to notice Krillin's restored energy. Frieza manages to dodge the discs, and Krillin mocks Frieza, leading him on a chase, displaying remarkable agility. Eventually, Frieza confronts Krillin, confused on how he made it back to the battle, but vowing to obliterate him for his audacity. Suddenly, Krillin employs the solar flare technique, blinding Frieza temporarily. Seizing the opportunity, Krillin urges Vegeta to attack, but Vegeta is preoccupied observing Dende's healing abilities. Vegeta expresses anger at not being informed about Dende's powers, and Krillin explains that they only discovered it recently, expressing that had they known about it sooner, they'd have utilized it to heal Goku. Gohan, now healed, joins Vegeta and Krillin in the air and powers up. Vegeta marvels at the increase in Gohan's power due to his Saiyan blood, and states that luck may finally be in their favor. Meanwhile, Frieza is furious that both Gohan and Krillin have been healed, and suddenly, everyone's attention is drawn to a new arrival, the Namekian Piccolo. Witnessing Piccolo's arrival, Gohan expresses relief while Piccolo identifies Frieza as the adversary. Vegeta recognizes Piccolo as one of the foes he vanquished on Earth, connecting the dots that the Earthlings used the wishes on the Dragon Balls to revive Piccolo and bring him to Namek. Piccolo asserts that once he deals with Frieza, Vegeta is next, but Vegeta dismisses the idea, asserting that Piccolo's threats are nothing but jokes. Frieza, surprised by the surviving Namekian, acknowledges Piccolo's distinctiveness, but believes he's still no match for his might. Meanwhile, Goku 
Goku is puzzled about the unfamiliar key and questions if it's really Piccolo. He also notices Gohan's restored power and remains confused on what's going on. Declaring his intent to eliminate Frieza alone, Piccolo instructs the others not to intervene. Dende, recognizing Piccolo as the person mentioned before, is greeted by the Namekian thanks to Nail's memories and tells him to flee to safety. Piccolo and Frieza land, exchanging intense glares. Although Krillin frets about Piccolo underestimating Frieza, Vegeta advises letting him face the reality soon. Gohan, however, remains optimistic about Piccolo's chances. Taking the initiative, Piccolo charges at Frieza, delivering a powerful punch to his face, which sends Frieza flying. Pursuing him, Piccolo readies himself to slam Frieza into the ground, but Frieza deftly evades and retaliates with a kick to Piccolo's face. Recovering swiftly, Piccolo propels himself off the ground, executing a headbutt to Frieza's chin. In response, Frieza uses his tail to strike Piccolo away and releases a blast towards him. Undeterred, Piccolo deflects the attack, leaving Frieza astonished. Piccolo retaliates with a massive blast of his own, leaving Frieza visibly damaged and infuriated, eliciting shocked reactions from the onlookers. Krillin admires Piccolo's ability to hold his own against Frieza, and Vegeta contends that Piccolo's strength surpasses the tyrant's power. Gohan expresses his relief at Piccolo's formidable prowess, while Vegeta, bewildered, questions how Piccolo achieved such strength since their last encounter on Earth. Frieza gracefully lands in front of Piccolo, wearing a smirk. In a swift move, Frieza elbows Piccolo in the face, sending him crashing to the ground. Attempting to strike Piccolo with punches, Frieza finds Piccolo soaring into the air, prompting Frieza to follow suit. As Frieza positions himself above Piccolo, he forcefully drives Piccolo back into the ground, resulting in a powerful explosion. Touching down, Frieza revels in laughter as Piccolo, battered but determined, rises once more. Vegeta, in disbelief, regrets intending to challenge Frieza, and Piccolo, shredding his cloak and turban, decides it's time for him to fight seriously. Krillin is surprised at the weight Piccolo carried all along, and infuriated, Piccolo gears up for a serious confrontation. However, Frieza contends that he too has yet to reveal his true strength. Frieza clarifies that he never showed Piccolo his transformations and aims to instill the same terror and despair that Vegeta and the others experienced. Explaining that each transformation significantly boosts his power, Frieza reveals that he has two more transformations to come, sending shockwaves through everyone present. With an air of pride, Frieza announces his intent to showcase his next transformation, framing it as an honor for his foes to witness. Frieza initiates a power-up that causes spikes to protrude from his back, shoulders to expand, and head to elongate. The transformation ends with Frieza, now in an arguably bigger form, appearing more like a demon this time. Apologizing for the delay, Frieza proposes the start of the second round of their confrontation. While Krillin perceives minimal external changes, Vegeta insists that Frieza has undergone a complete transformation. Vegeta also states that somehow, Frieza is able to exercise more control over his power, and Gohan observes that all the damage previously inflicted by Piccolo has mysteriously vanished. Meanwhile, Goku senses the intensified strength of Frieza's key and contemplates whether he could emerge victorious once healed. Frieza then mocks Piccolo as he seemed so confident in his speed before and says he wants to see it in action. Seizing the opportunity, Frieza charges at Piccolo, prompting the Namekian to ascend into the air. However, Frieza effortlessly surpasses Piccolo, debunking the notion that he possesses superior speed. Initiating a rapid barrage of shots, Frieza targets various parts of Piccolo's body, including the knee, head, and chest. Concerned for Piccolo's well-being, Gohan prepares to intervene, and as Krillin charges in after him, Vegeta restrains Krillin, asserting the futility of his interference. Instead, Vegeta instructs Krillin to blast him to the brink of death, contemplating the potential transformation into a Super Saiyan with one more recovery. As Frieza persists in firing shots at Piccolo, Gohan intervenes with a flying kick. Evading the attack, Frieza is taken by surprise as Gohan ascends above him, launching a powerful blast downward. The blast significantly impacts Frieza, who retaliates by redirecting it toward Gohan. Swiftly reacting, Piccolo deflects the blast, saving Gohan's life. Frieza, perplexed by the drastic increase in Gohan's power, speculates he must be a Saiyan and contemplates whose son he might be. While Piccolo recognizes Gohan's strength, stating he's proud of him for his growth as a fighter, Gohan himself admits he's still no match for Frieza. Meanwhile, Frieza states Gohan couldn't be the son of Vegeta or Nappa and speculates he must be the son of Raditz. As Frieza expresses his intent to eliminate all with Saiyan blood, he remains skeptical 
skeptical of the Super Saiyan legend, sensing an unsettling power within Gohan and Vegeta. At the same time, Vegeta urges Krillin to hasten the process of bringing him to the brink of death, emphasizing the significance of near-death recoveries for Saiyan strength enhancement. Despite Krillin's initial hesitation and mention of Goku's imminent restoration, Vegeta insists the urgency of the situation. Suddenly, Frieza, announcing his impending transformation once more, motivates Krillin to comply. Closing his eyes and screaming, Krillin unleashes a powerful blast through Vegeta's chest, who, satisfied with the result, plummets to the ground. As Frieza undergoes his final transformation, the anticipation for the revelation of his true form intensifies. Gohan is puzzled by Krillin's attack on Vegeta, while Piccolo urges them to flee. Assisting Piccolo in escaping, Gohan suggests that Dende can heal his injuries. Meanwhile, Dende, still harboring resentment toward Vegeta for the atrocities committed against his people, refuses to heal him. Despite Vegeta's weak plea for help, Dende remains resolute and departs, leaving Vegeta on the ground. Krillin and Gohan set out to find Dende, with Krillin explaining to Gohan the saying significant power-ups through near-death recoveries. Spotting Dende heading to the opposite direction and realizing Vegeta remains unhealed, the two pursue him. At the same time, Frieza continues his power-up, observing as Dende heals Piccolo, revealing the source of the group's recovery method. Piccolo inquires if he possesses the same ability, but Dende clarifies that his fighting-type nature prevents him from doing so. Krillin pleads with Dende to heal Vegeta, but Dende hesitates due to Vegeta's resemblance to Frieza. Piccolo then implores Dende, acknowledging his inability to defeat Frieza in his current state. Just then, Frieza completes his transformation, and the group acknowledge his extreme power boost. Gohan's final plea to Dende motivates him to heal Vegeta, and as the young Namekian goes to do so, Frieza's final form begins to come into view. Dende heals Vegeta, and the Saiyan kicks him aside, upset that he didn't heal him sooner. However, Vegeta insists that he's finally become a Super Saiyan, and relishes the chance to battle Frieza. As the smoke dissipates, Frieza appears in a smaller and sleeker form. Though Krillin underestimates the threat based on Frieza's features, Piccolo warns against judging him solely by outward appearances. Suddenly, Frieza unleashes a small blast, bypassing Piccolo, Krillin, Gohan, and even Vegeta, creating an explosion. When they turn around, they discover Dende lying lifeless. Gohan and Piccolo express shock at the sudden turn of events, and Frieza concludes that the death of Dende means no more revivals for his enemies. Gohan can't believe Dende's been killed, as Piccolo realizes Frieza must have seen Dende healing them. At Frieza's spaceship, Goku notices someone died and that Frieza's gotten even stronger. Frieza then suddenly disappears and reappears right next to Piccolo, Gohan, and Krillin, reminding them of his promise to show them a nightmare worse than hell. Gohan charges in and punches at Frieza. Krillin kicks at him and Piccolo swipes at him, but Frieza easily dodges them all. Gohan and Krillin keep attempting punches and kicks as Piccolo takes into the air and fires a blast down, but Frieza jumps over it. Krillin and Gohan then fire blast up at him, but Frieza disappears. Vegeta yells over that Frieza's behind them, and Frieza shoots two finger blasts at Gohan, nearly killing him, but Vegeta kicks Gohan out of the line of fire. There's suddenly a huge explosion as the blast hits a nearby island. The group can't believe what they're seeing, with Krillin saying once again he couldn't see Frieza's movements or attack before the detonation. Piccolo, however, thinks to himself that Vegeta could see through the attack, and wonders how he powered up so much. Gohan thanks Vegeta for saving him, but Vegeta dismisses his gratitude, stating he just wanted to show off his new abilities. Piccolo questions if he thinks he can beat Frieza, and Vegeta confirms. Vegeta tells the group that they're in the way and should get back and watch, as Frieza tells the Saiyan that his self-confidence must be nothing more than delusion. Vegeta then tells Frieza to laugh all he likes, but asserts that he's finally become a Super Saiyan. Frieza pauses for a moment, but laughs and mocks Vegeta as usual. The others wonder about this Super Saiyan stuff as Vegeta flies at Frieza, exclaiming that Kakarot won't even get a turn. Frieza suddenly disappears as Vegeta strikes him, and from a distance away, Frieza laughs and taunts Vegeta for not being able to keep up with him, debunking the illusion of achieving Super Saiyan status. Vegeta starts to get angry and screams that he is a Super Saiyan, following up with a huge blast down at Frieza. Piccolo yells at Vegeta, questioning if he means to destroy the planet, but Frieza kicks the blast away into the air, much to Vegeta's shock. Piccolo is also amazed at Frieza's effortless deflection, and Krillin asserts Vegeta had put his full power into that attack. As Frieza prepares his assault on Vegeta, the Saiyan Prince, for the first time in his life, experiences
experiences genuine fear and sheds tears at his inability to stand up to Frieza as he loses the will to fight. Frieza flies up and headbutts Vegeta, then kicks him down to the ground. Frieza touches down and picks Vegeta up with his tail around his neck, then begins punching Vegeta in the back. Frieza looks over at the others and tells them they're free to come and help him whenever they like, and as he continues to pummel Vegeta, the trio stand helpless, unable to move themselves to intervene. Meanwhile, Goku notices Vegeta's key is rapidly decreasing and he can't believe how strong Frieza has become. Suddenly, the medical machine beeps, indicating Goku's done healing and he jumps straight through the ceiling onto the roof on Frieza's ship, marveling at his own power. Goku notes he's gotten a lot stronger, but recognizing the urgency of the situation, readies himself for battle and yells for the others to hold on just a little longer. Goku senses that everyone is nearby and meanwhile, Frieza continues beating Vegeta and finally tosses him into a nearby mountain. Vegeta lies on the ground, covered in rubble. Frieza states how bored he is that Vegeta didn't put up more of a fight and says it's finally time to finish him off. At the same time, Goku then zooms off and arrives just as Frieza is about to land the killing blow. Goku walks past Piccolo, noting that he really was the one with the mysterious huge key. He also walks past Krillin and Gohan, apologizing for being so late. The two wonder if this is really Goku, as his power feels a lot different than before. Goku then greets Frieza and tells him he's a lot smaller than he thought he'd be. Frieza sees Goku merely as scum, but believes he's seen him somewhere before. Vegeta mumbles Kakarot noticing he's shown up, and Frieza notes that's a Saiyan name. He suddenly remembers that Goku looks just like the Saiyan who opposed him to the very end when he destroyed planet Vegeta, but it remains unknown to both Frieza and Goku that the Saiyan was none other than Goku's father, Bardock. Vegeta takes note of Goku's newfound power, thinking that once again he's overcome his previous limitations. This prompts him to believe that Goku is in fact a Super Saiyan. Frieza states that he can't allow any Saiyans to live and try charges at Goku, but Goku simply kicks him in the face and sends him flying. Frieza catches himself and lands, then laughs. He points his finger at Goku to fire a finger beam again, and the others quickly scatter and tell Goku to do the same. Frieza unleashes a bunch of finger beams, but Goku stands still and swats them all away with one hand. Frieza can't believe this, and Vegeta starts to laugh, stating that Kakarot is definitely the thing that Frieza fears the most, a Super Saiyan. Frieza's eyes widen, and the Saiyan Prince goes on to say that Frieza will finally get what he deserves. However, Frieza suddenly shoots Vegeta through the heart, shocking everyone as he reminds Vegeta that he despises unfunny jokes. Goku berates Frieza, mentioning that Vegeta could barely move, so finishing him off was unnecessary. Frieza dismisses Vegeta's obsession with the Super Saiyan and expresses his disdain for rambling individuals. Vegeta then turns his attention to Goku, telling him that mercy won't get him anywhere with Frieza, and had he were to truly harden his heart, he'd surely become a Super Saiyan. Goku, however, rejects the idea of being heartless like Vegeta and admits he doesn't understand much about the Super Saiyan concept anyway. Vegeta attempts to explain, but Goku urges him to stop talking to avoid a quicker death. Vegeta, however, continues and tells Goku of his planet's fate long ago and how the death of their race wasn't because of a giant meteor, but because of Frieza. He explains that despite the Saiyan race serving him loyally for years, following every Every last one of his commands, Frieza murdered them all, including Goku's parents and Vegeta's father. He goes on to say that Frieza was afraid of a Super Saiyan rising among their race, but Frieza dismisses the notion. With his final breath, Vegeta cries, begging Goku to avenge their race as Frieza must die by a Saiyan's hands. Vegeta then succumbs to his injury and passes away as Frieza mocks him one last time. Goku reflects on the gravity of Vegeta's plea and decides to bury him. Him, acknowledging the regret Vegeta felt for the fallen Saiyans. Goku states that Vegeta wasn't just upset for the downfall of his race though, but the fact that he was Frieza's puppet for so long. Goku says he may not have liked Vegeta, but acknowledges his Saiyan pride. Goku then turns to Frieza and declares that on behalf of the Saiyans he's killed, as well as the people of Namek, he'll be sure to defeat.
defeat him. Frieza dismisses Goku's words as foolish, and the two ready themselves for battle, as Piccolo instructs Gohan and Krillin to move, exclaiming they'd only get in the way. Gohan wishes his dad good luck and flies away, noting the serious gaze on his father's face. The stage is set, and Goku suddenly charges at Frieza, who blocks his punch. They exchange blows, with Goku dodging Frieza's attacks and vice versa. Shortly after, Goku is pushed through a mountain by one of Frieza's blasts and manages to deflect it, expressing pain in his hands as Frieza stands looking irritated. On King Kai's planet, Yamcha inquires about the situation on planet Namek. King Kai reveals that Vegeta has just been killed by Frieza, leaving Yamcha and Tien in disbelief. Tien inquires about Goku, and King Kai informs him that Goku has just initiated the fight. Although Yamcha becomes upset, King Kai anticipates an exciting match. He mentions the mysterious nature of Saiyans, particularly Goku, and notes that Goku's strength seems boundless, contrasting with his time training on King Kai's planet. Meanwhile, Frieza and Goku face each other. Frieza acknowledges Goku's strength, expressing surprise that someone stronger than Captain Ginyu exists. However, Frieza remains unconcerned, and Goku expresses they should continue. Frieza then triggers an explosive shockwave, causing the mountain Goku is on to erupt. Goku reappears above Frieza in midair, announcing his counterattack. He propels Frieza downward with his own shockwave, but there's no splash when Frieza hits the water. Frieza suddenly re-emerges behind Goku, kicking him down into the water. Frieza urges Goku to resurface quickly, but Goku, submerged, contemplates the situation. He thinks to himself how strong Frieza is, but realizes that Frieza's unable to sense his opponent's energy and decides to play on his weakness. Krillin wonders why Goku hasn't resurfaced, but Gohan reassures them, noting that Goku's ki hasn't decreased at all. Goku releases two small Kamehameha balls and swims away from them as Frieza above water waits for the Saiyan to make his move. Goku maneuvers one of the blasts to shoot towards Frieza from underwater. Frieza, realizing it's not Goku, evades both attacks. However, Goku descends from above with a kick, sending Frieza crashing into an island. Goku initially believes the attack to be a success, but Frieza emerges from the rubble, cracking his neck and surprising Goku as he doesn't appear to be hurt at all. Frieza acknowledges that Goku is the first person, aside from his parents, to ever damage his pride. He reflects on how excited he is for the first time since birth, and contemplates how he should deal with Goku. Goku, concerned that Frieza was unaffected by his attack, watches as Frieza telekinetically moves rocks and sends them toward him. Annoyed by Frieza's use of supernatural powers, Goku avoids and breaks the rocks. The attacks stop, but suddenly, Frieza appears above Goku, trapping him in a large energy ball and sending him crashing down into an island causing a massive explosion. When the smoke clears, the entire island has been obliterated. Krillin and Piccolo are amazed at how much Frieza held back, while Piccolo remarks that Frieza is still just playing around and has the power to destroy the planet if he wishes. Despite Gohan's worry for his father, Piccolo reassures him that Goku isn't taking the battle seriously either. He then directs the group's attention behind them, and Goku lands, narrowly escaping the destruction. He then flies back over, surprising Frieza with his presence. Goku casually remarks that Frieza should be careful with people's planets, and Krillin wonders how Goku managed to avoid the detonation. Piccolo explains that he escaped the paralysis with super speed at the same instant as the explosion, and considers both Goku and Frieza as freaks of nature. Frieza tells Goku that this was just a warm-up and that he'll be fighting seriously now, and Goku reassures him not to worry, since it was the same for him. Frieza questions whether Goku prefers a battle in mid-air or on the ground, and Goku chooses the ground. Frieza selects an island for their confrontation, and they fly over to it. Goku jokingly appreciates this added service, casually removing his gear, and wonders if Frieza is just confident he'll win. Frieza jokingly claims to be kind, and decides to offer Goku one more significant service, and says he won't use either of his hands. Goku finds this gesture generous, as he stretches and offers to make the first move. Frieza gives Goku the freedom to choose, and the Saiyan charges at Frieza, throwing punches, but Frieza skillfully evades and counterattacks with a kick. Goku dodges subsequent kicks and retaliates with a series of his own, but Frieza maneuvers and strikes Goku with his tail, sending him flying. However, Goku swiftly recovers, grabs Frieza by the tail, and swings him around before letting go, sending Frieza crashing into a mountain. Emerging from the rubble, Frieza attempts to strike Goku, but Goku adeptly blocks every attack and narrowly lands a punch on Frieza's face. Goku successfully blocks a kick, and Frieza tries to defend against Goku's additional kicks. Goku manages to block a another kick until Frieza wraps his tail around Goku's neck. 
things begin to look bleak, but Goku responds by biting Frieza's tail and follows up with a barrage of kicks and punches. Eventually, feeling a bit overwhelmed, Frieza punches Goku in the face. Rising to his feet, Goku reminds Frieza of his earlier promise not to use his hands, and Frieza acknowledges the end of the service period. Goku then decides to offer Frieza some advice as a service, stating he puts too much confidence in his own strength and leaves himself wide open. Frieza acknowledges Goku's strength, but expresses weariness with the ongoing fight. Before concluding the battle, Frieza proposes that Goku work under him, recognizing Goku's potential as a formidable force greater than even Captain Ginyu. Goku, however, dismisses the offer, questioning Frieza's belief that he would even accept. Frieza considers the Saiyans foolish and states that the only option remaining for Goku then is death. Goku asserts that it won't be easy and Frieza contemplates that Goku is quite self-confident. Frieza realizes that despite Goku's serious fighting, he still has considerable power left. Frieza then speculates that if he were to use 50% of his maximum power, he could turn Goku into space dust. Goku thinks Frieza is exaggerating and Frieza bids Goku a farewell, stating it's been a long time since he's had a good exercise. Over in the distance, Piccolo observes that both Goku and Frieza are waiting for the right moment to attack, and as Gohan questions if his dad can win, Piccolo states that the strength of both he and Frieza are far beyond their comprehension. The two opponents stare each other down, and Goku suddenly recognizes that Frieza isn't bluffing. Frieza then charges at Goku, delivering a series of swift attacks, including elbowing him in the face, executing a swift kick, grabbing Goku's neck with his tail, elbowing him in the stomach, and finally dropping him. Goku, clutching his stomach, attempts to kick Frieza, but Frieza effortlessly evades. Goku charges after him, utilizing the Kaioken, but Frieza kicks him in the face, sending him flying. When Goku gets back on his feet, Frieza notes his heavy breathing, marveling at his resilience. Piccolo believes the difference in their hidden strengths is too vast, and meanwhile, King Kai assumes it's all over, considering Frieza's overwhelming strength. Yamcha questions if Goku is still wearing his heavy clothing, but King Kai reveals that Goku has been in regular clothes the entire time. Tien assures the others that there's nothing to worry about though, as Goku still has the Kaioken and should be able to multiply its power by 10. Yamcha agrees, but King Kai interjects with unfortunate news, as Goku's already been using the Kaioken. Frieza delivers a powerful elbow to Goku's face, propelling him through the air. Pursuing him, Frieza observes as Goku regains control mid-air and heads toward a nearby mountain. Frieza halts, swiftly charging up his index and middle fingers. With a sweeping motion, he cuts through the mountain Goku is standing on, along with a large portion of the planet, leaving Goku astonished. Frieza reiterates his ability to destroy the entire planet if he wanted, revealing his responsibility for annihilating planet Vegeta. Goku then grows concerned about his chances of victory, stating that he doesn't think he can win. Krillin notices Frieza's ability to slice through the planet and believes Goku might be strategizing. Piccolo, however, clarifies that Goku isn't formulating a plan, but is simply realizing that Frieza's true strength surpasses their previous estimations. Frieza expresses his growing impatience and declares his intention to conclude the battle soon. Meanwhile on King Kai's planet, Tien is shocked to learn that Goku is already using the times 10 Kaioken and fears for Goku's fate. King Kai adds that Frieza is only utilizing half of his true strength as well and reflects on his earlier warning to Goku to stay away from Frieza no matter what. Back on Namek, Goku contemplates pushing his limits further with a times 20 Kaioken. Aware of the strain on his body, Goku reasons that if Frieza is only at 50%, he's at a loss anyway. Taking the risk, Goku unleashes a tremendous surge of power, surprising Frieza. Goku charges at Frieza and lands a punch on his face, sending him flying. Goku follows in pursuit, and preparing a Kamehameha, Goku catches up to Frieza, but Frieza deftly dodges his attack. Goku finds himself in midair and releases the full force Kamehameha, but Frieza retaliates by stopping it with his hand, thus creating a massive explosion of light. When the smoke clears, Goku observes, and Frieza, though bruised, is not yet defeated. Goku is astonished that Frieza wasn't affected, and contemplates the possibility that Frieza is indeed telling the truth about only using half of his power. Meanwhile, Bulma speculates about the ground shaking, fearing the worst for Gohan and the others. Back on the battlefield, Krillin expresses disbelief at the minimal damage inflicted by Goku's 
powerful Kamehameha. Gohan notes that Goku's energy is rapidly decreasing, and Piccolo believes it's the end, recalling King Kai's warning to stay away from Frieza. Frieza looks down at the exhausted Goku, realizing the close call with the attack. Examining his scratched up body, Frieza becomes enraged and lands near Goku. Yelling that the attack actually hurt him, Frieza flies at Goku, headbutting him and sending him flying. Frieza walks over, kicking Goku into the air and then knocking him back to the ground. Approaching Goku, Frieza questions the disappearance of his strength, suggesting that Goku may have depleted all of his power. Goku privately acknowledges the depletion of his power and the futility of the times 20 Kaioken. His thoughts are interrupted though as Frieza swipes his hand, creating a massive crater between them. Gohan expresses his desire to help his father, but Piccolo reassures him that Goku is planning something. Frieza then wears a surprised expression as Goku raises his hands into the air. Krillin explains to Piccolo that it's the Spirit Bomb, an attack Goku learned from King Kai that gathers all energy from living things to create a powerful energy ball. Piccolo expresses frustration at King Kai's lack of information while training with him, and Gohan and Krillin points out that there isn't much life on Namek, but it's their only option. Goku expresses his concern for Namek, as an attack as powerful as the Spirit Bomb could crush the planet itself. However, he decides he has no other choice, as if Frieza defeats him, the entire universe will be in trouble. Goku then pleads for not just Namek, but all nearby planets to lend him their energy, and Frieza wonders about Goku's actions as the trio notice the enormous spirit bomb forming in the sky. Krillin marvels at the colossal size of the spirit bomb, estimating its diameter to be 50 meters. Krillin deduces that Goku must be gathering energy from other planets to make it that enormous, and Piccolo questions why Goku hasn't launched it yet. Krillin speculates that Goku believes he needs much more energy to defeat Frieza, as if he launches the spirit bomb now, it won't be enough. Frieza inquires if Goku is planning something or merely signaling surrender with his raised hands. Goku, thinking about the spirit bomb's weakness in the time that it takes to gather energy, pleads for his plan not to be revealed a little longer. Frieza demands to know how long Goku plans to continue this, but Goku brushes it off with a laugh. In frustration, Frieza kicks Goku in the face, sending him flying. Krillin assumes Frieza's figured out Goku's plan, but Piccolo correctly deduces that he doesn't know yet. Piccolo then tells Gohan and Krillin to give him what's left of their energy, urging them to hurry up. As Goku rises to his feet, he jokingly tells Frieza not to be in a rush to end things, but the tyrant blows Goku into the water with a shockwave. Krillin and Gohan contribute some of their energy to Piccolo, being told to take their focus off of the battlefield for now, as Goku resurfaces at the shore. Frieza stands over Goku, expressing his lack of understanding of the Saiyan thought process. He declares his desire to end the fight, destroy the planet, and kill Gohan shortly after Goku, thus eliminating what remains of the Saiyan race. As he dismisses the Super Saiyan as a myth and aims his final attack at Goku, Frieza notices a reflection in the water behind the Saiyan. Looking up, he spots a massive ball of energy in the sky, realizing Goku had been creating it this entire time. Just then, Piccolo decides to jump in, instructing Krillin and Gohan to stay put while he deals with the situation. Goku curses the discovery of the spirit bomb as Frieza criticizes him for his last resort being in vain. Goku attempts to punch Frieza, but Frieza easily catches his fist. As the tyrant prepares to finish Goku, Piccolo surprises him with a kick to the back of the head, sending Frieza plummeting into the sea. Piccolo urges Goku to complete the spirit bomb as fast as he can, having used all his remaining power in the surprise attack. Frieza then emerges from the water, infuriated at the Namekian's interference. Piccolo inquires if Goku is finished yet, and Goku responds that he needs just a little more time. Frieza, now infuriated, suddenly gets blasted by Krillin and Gohan, who use the last remnants of their energy. Frieza expresses disbelief that there are still more opponents left, but declares that it all ends now. Goku announces that the attack is finally ready, just as Frieza begins creating a ball of energy to destroy Namek along with everyone else. On Piccolo's command, Goku launches the massive spirit bomb and it descends with overwhelming size. Frieza attempts to resist with his strength alone, but the sheer magnitude of the spirit bomb forces him down into the ground, creating a massive explosion that engulfs a portion of Namek. At the same time, King Kai notices the events and ecstatically dances, stating that Frieza has finally been defeated. Back on Namek, the massive hole created by the spirit bomb, surrounded by 
provide nothing but ocean, witnesses water cascading into its depths. Gohan and Krillin emerge from the ocean, climbing onto a rock, and anxiously wonder about the whereabouts of Goku and Piccolo. Gohan speculates if Goku and Piccolo were engulfed along with Frieza since he can't sense their ki, but Krillin explains they can't feel them because they're too weak from giving their energy. Just then, Gohan notices something on another nearby island, Piccolo emerging from the water with Goku. Excited, Krillin and Gohan fly over to reunite with them, but their depleted ki limits their speed. The group then celebrate together, overjoyed that everyone's okay. The joyous reunion is interrupted when Goku suggests they could be home in five days using the spaceship he arrived in, and suddenly, Krillin panics, realizing they forgot about Bulma. Goku teases him, thinking Frieza had appeared again, and Krillin jokes that Bulma is scarier than Frieza when she's mad. Amid their laughter, Piccolo expresses gratitude that the Grand Elder and Planet Namek can finally find peace, and suddenly, Krillin, surprised at how Piccolo knows about the Grand Elder, turns fearful. Much to everyone's shock, Frieza, battered and with one eye closed, survived the spirit bomb and sits perched on a nearby cliff. A blast suddenly shoots through Piccolo's chest, rendering him immobile, and Gohan panics while Goku grows angry. Frieza mocks the group's belief in his defeat, although for a second there, he himself thought he wouldn't make it either. Realizing what's to come, Goku tells Gohan and Krillin to escape Namek on his ship, but the two hesitate to leave him. Frieza, however, has no intention of letting any of the group escape, as he grabs a hold of Krillin telekinetically and lifts him up into the air. Goku urgently begs Frieza to stop, but the tyrant sadistically clenches his hand and completely disintegrates Krillin, resulting in a massive explosion. As Goku and Gohan stand in awe at the unfolding events, Frieza laughs and considers Gohan as his next target. Goku's anger then intensifies as he exclaims he won't let Frieza get away with killing his best friend. The Saiyan's anger peaks as his hair suddenly becomes blonde and his entire body glows, surprising both Gohan and Frieza. Goku instructs Gohan to take the barely alive Piccolo back to Earth, though Gohan hesitates, prompting Goku to sternly command him to leave before he completely loses control. Following Goku's orders, Gohan prepares to leave with Piccolo, leaving a furious Goku to face Frieza alone. Frieza expresses surprise at Goku's different form, questioning the Saiyan's ability to transform beyond the Great Eight. Goku urgently instructs Gohan to hasten Piccolo's departure, emphasizing that if Piccolo dies, Kami will also perish. He assures Gohan that he'll return to Earth later, but when his son questions how, Goku snaps and tells him to leave. Gohan, carrying Piccolo over his shoulders, flies away and expresses gratitude to his father for saving them, hoping to see him back home safe and sound. As Frieza prepares to blow the two out of the sky, Goku instantly appears in front of the tyrant, grabbing his wrist. Goku tells Frieza he's getting sick of him, accusing the tyrant of relentlessly targeting innocent lives, highlighting even Krillin's death and innocence. Frieza breaks free and steps back, bewildered by Goku's newfound power. Meanwhile, Gohan, comprehending the situation, acknowledges Vegeta's earlier claim about his father achieving the status of a Super Saiyan. Goku, now infuriated, flies toward Frieza, delivering a powerful punch to his face, sending him flying. Goku follows, relentlessly pummeling Frieza into the ground. Despite emerging from the rubble, Frieza regains his composure in midair, questioning if the Saiyans were truly innocent. Goku confirms that they weren't, which is why they perished, and Frieza confidently states that he was the reason for their demise. Goku tells Frieza that it's his turn to join those he's killed, and Frieza laughs off Goku's determination, asserting that even as a Super Saiyan, victory is impossible. Frieza then launches a series of powerful blasts, but when the smoke clears, Goku remains unscathed, his clothes slightly more tattered. With a stern expression, Goku declares that forgiveness is out of the question, hitting Frieza with a powerful shockwave. As Frieza struggles to catch his breath, Goku smirks confidently. Frieza is surprised as Goku swiftly maneuvers, delivering an elbow to his face, followed by an uppercut and a headbutt. Despite Frieza's attempts to retaliate with kicks and punches, Goku adeptly blocks each move. 
Frustrated, Frieza resorts to shooting a finger blast, but Goku effortlessly dodges it, shocking Frieza. Frieza attempts additional blasts, but Goku continues to evade. Enraged, Frieza expresses his frustration, wishing at least one blast would hit him. In response, Goku deliberately stops moving and tells Frieza to take his best shot, angering the villain. Frieza shoots another blast and hits Goku on the chin, but he leans forward with a smirk, taunting Frieza for failing to destroy him. In a moment of realization, Frieza questions Goku's identity, and Goku proudly declares himself as a Saiyan who came from Earth, a warrior of legend, possessing a pure heart and awakened by rage, the one and only Super Saiyan. Frieza, shocked, acknowledges the truth and contemplates the significance of the legend, stating it's no wonder Vegeta couldn't become a Super Saiyan himself. Infuriated by the prospect of being defeated by a Saiyan, Frieza curses the situation, and Goku declares the end to Frieza's reign of terror. Meanwhile, Gohan arrives at Goku's spaceship, placing the unconscious Piccolo inside before embarking on a mission to find Bulma. Back on the battlefield, Goku initiates a Kamehameha, while Frieza expresses his refusal to be defeated by a Saiyan, stating he'd rather die by his own hand. Frieza, however, declares that Goku will be the one to die, and Desperate decides to destroy the planet himself, creating an energy ball and launching it down, declaring his intent to exterminate the entire planet. Planet. The energy sphere collides with the planet, resulting in a resounding explosion. King Kai observes the catastrophic impact and acknowledges Son Goku's commendable efforts, noting that Goku could have triumphed in a one-on-one -on -one battle. However, Frieza's decision to destroy planet Namek indicated his intent to survive its destruction. King Kai asserts that planet Namek is now lost, along with all who remained on it except Frieza. Suddenly, a voice interrupts, identifying himself as Kami, the god of Earth. Earth. King Kai responds despondently, acknowledging the communication. Kami, conveying a message of hope, informs King Kai that Mr. Popo is gathering all the Earth's Dragon Balls to revive those at King Kai's place. The Kai, initially disheartened, then becomes elated upon realizing that Kami's survival implies Piccolo's survival and that planet Namek is still intact. Goku and Frieza hover over a colossal hole in the planet, sparks emanating from its depths. Frieza, recognizing his miscalculation and not using enough power, just about Goku narrowly avoiding death. He then reveals the impending cataclysmic explosion that will reduce planet Namek to space dust in about five minutes. In the face of this revelation, Goku remains determined, asserting that five minutes is more than enough time to defeat Frieza, rescue his friends, and escape to Earth on his spaceship. However, Frieza counters, claiming his hope is far greater than Goku's, as he's about to unveil his full power for the first time. Goku speculates that Frieza had never used his full power before due to its strain on his body and refuses to let him stall for time. Despite the urgency though, Frieza launches a shockwave, sending Goku plummeting into the water. Goku emerges relatively unharmed, though his shirt now bears the scars of battle. Undeterred, Frieza declares that he's only used 70% of his power and prepares to unleash his long-awaited 100%. As Goku charges in, Frieza believes he'll eliminate Goku with his full power and no more than 30 seconds. Frieza then starts bulking up, and Goku halts, mentioning that Frieza's key is approaching fullness, and soon, his 100% power will manifest. Meanwhile, King Kai insists that now is the opportunity for Goku to attack Frieza while he's powering up, and questions if Goku can hear him since he isn't taking any action. Goku acknowledges that he hears, but he doesn't think he'll ever get another chance like this, the chance to witness the strongest opponent in the universe at full power. King Kai is shocked at Goku's mindset, emphasizing that this isn't a game, but Goku explodes, exclaiming that he will avenge Krillin's death, as he died twice already and he can never be brought back to life with the Dragon Balls ever again. Even so, King Kai urges Goku not to wait for Frieza to reach his full power and considers the well-being of Gohan and the others. Goku reassures King Kai that they'll be fine, and at the same time, Frieza's power reaches 85%, then 90%. Goku tells Frieza he'll allow him to reach his full power and defeat him at his best, and he speculates that Frieza also desired to witness it for himself. The others on King Kai's planet wonder what's going on, and the Kai remarks that Goku is no longer himself, but a warrior consumed by rage. Elsewhere, Gohan flies through the air, wondering about the planet's situation and increasing intensity of Frieza's key. He arrives at Bulma's location just in time to rescue her from a massive boulder, and Bulma complains about being left there alone 
alone and wonders what's going on. Gohan insists on explaining everything later, emphasizing the need to hurry, and Bulma questions their destination. Meanwhile, Frieza completes his power-up, apologizing for the delay. Goku, however, realizes that their time is running out and says they need to hurry and finish the battle. At the same time, Kami calls King Kai again and relays information from Mr. Popo that all Dragon Balls have been found. Kami states that Tien and Yamcha will be brought back to life immediately, but there's nothing more that can be done for Chaozu. Chaozu becomes sad, but Tien reassures him that he'll stay behind as well. Suddenly, King Kai interrupts, asking if the Dragon Balls can revive two people at once. Upon confirmation, assuming the ones who died share a common circumstance, the Kai wonders if Earth's Dragon Balls can grant wishes on a faraway world. Kami affirms that it's possible and wonders if King Kai intends to resurrect everyone in the universe killed by Vegeta. However, the Kai proposes a different wish, to return to life those killed by Frieza and his men. He explains the urgency and the possibility of reviving the Grand Elder on Namek. This would in turn revive Purunga as one of his wishes were unused, so if the Elder is revived, one wish remains. King Kai states they could use Purunga's wish to teleport everyone on planet Namek to Earth except Frieza, and Yamcha, Shaozu, and Tien agree to forfeit their revival for a year to go along with the plan. King Kai instructs Kami to hurry as planet Namek is fading away, and meanwhile, Frieza attacks Goku with a series of punches and kicks, claiming it's just a warm-up for his final attack. Goku expresses relief as he thought that was the best Frieza could do, and Frieza, initially angered, smirks and acknowledges the amazing strength of the Super Saiyan. Back on Earth, Mr. Popo has summoned Shenron. Frieza mentions that Namek's lifespan is about two to three minutes away from its end and questions Goku on his thoughts. Goku remains silent and Frieza realizes he must be stalling for Gohan and the others to escape. However, Frieza says it's no use and decides to make Earth his next target after killing Goku. Goku clarifies that he's not stalling though and that Frieza's going to die right here, right now. Irritated, Frieza declares that he'll silence Goku for good and readying himself for the next round, Goku privately wishes for Gohan and the others to hurry as they're still on the planet. Frieza charges at Goku, but then abruptly stops and appears above him, delivering a shockwave hit. Attempting to strike Goku from behind, Frieza finds his arm grabbed and Goku headbutts him in the face. Goku proceeds to bend Frieza's arm, spins him around, and releases him, sending Frieza flying. Frieza manages to stop himself high up in the air and grows more irate, and Goku readies a Kamehameha to shoot up at Frieza, who begins powering up. As Frieza descends, intent to kill, Goku unleashes his attack. Meanwhile, Shenron tells Mr. Popo to state his wish. Popo requests the revival of those killed by Frieza and his henchmen, and inquires if a wish such as this can be made on a distant planet. Shenron expresses uncertainty, but agrees to try his best, and back on Namek, Goku tells Frieza he'll see him in hell as the Kamehameha approaches his enemy. Frieza is encased in an energy barrier and directly faces the Kamehameha. Goku intensifies the attack, but Frieza manages to maneuver out of the blast trajectory. Descending, Frieza strikes Goku from the side, sending him crashing into an underwater mountain. Meanwhile, on Namek, the Namekians begin to revive, sensing the ground trembling and the darkening sky as they question what's happening. Frieza revels in the success of his assault and believes Goku to be dead, then speculating that the darkened sky must indicate the planet is on the verge of exploding. Back on Earth, Shenron informs Popo that his wish has been granted and bids him a farewell. King Kai is elated that his plan is succeeded and realizes that the Grand Elder and Namekian Shenron must be alive again due to the darkened sky. Indeed, the Elder wonders why he's alive and Purunga is also revived. However, King Kai urgently needs to contact them. As the Kai manages to get in contact with the Grand Elder, Frieza continues pondering the fate of the planet until he notices Goku emerging from the water. Irritated, he vows to blow away Goku like he did the Earthling, and Goku retorts in a furious rage, deducing Frieza was mocking Krillin. Meanwhile, King Kai has informed the Grand Elder of the situation, and they decide to contact the nearest Namekian to make their wish. However, Goku interrupts, insisting on changing the wish to teleporting everyone to Earth except Frieza and himself. 
Although King Kai understands Goku's sentiments, he tries to reason with him, but Goku asserts that he'll resent the Kai forever if he pulls him out of the fight. The nearest Namekian, Dende, who was also revived, receives the message from the Grand Elder, urging him to hurry and promising to explain everything later. Reluctantly agreeing to Goku's wish, King Kai says he won't stop him, and the Elder conveys to Dende that the third wish is to move everyone except Frieza and the Saiyan Goku to Earth. Meanwhile, Gohan and Bulma continue to fly together, puzzled by the changing sky, and Vegeta has been brought back as well, wondering about his unexpected resurrection. As Dende approaches Purunga, who is growing impatient about the final wish, King Kai urges Goku to return alive. Frieza then notices that Purunga is now alive as well, much to his shock. Goku also notices Purunga's presence, prompting Frieza to fly toward him with Goku in pursuit. Dende begins to express his wish in Namekian, but Frieza interrupts him, shouting his desire for immortality. However, Dende swiftly concludes his wish in Namekian, and Purunga confirms, stating he'll transport everyone to Earth with the exception of Goku and Frieza. Subsequently, Dende, the Namekians, the Grand Elder, Vegeta, Piccolo, Gohan, Bulma, and the Dragon Balls all warp to Earth, much to Frieza's disappointment. Goku informs Frieza that he didn't get his wish granted because he doesn't speak the planet's language, and Frieza turns to him in anger. Frieza recalls killing the child who made the wish, prompting Goku to clarify that Earth's Dragon Balls were used to revive everyone he killed. Subsequently, Namek's Dragon Balls were utilized to wish for the relocation of everyone except Frieza and Goku to Earth. Goku says he's been waiting for this moment, and with approximately two minutes remaining, Frieza declares that Goku will meet his end either by Frieza's hands or the planet's explosion. Despite this, Frieza acknowledges Goku's determination to conclude the fight, and both land on the ground, poised for the final round. Meanwhile, on Earth, the Namekian inhabitants find themselves in a field, bewildered by the recent events. Dende heals Piccolo, and the Grand Elder informs everyone that they're on planet Earth. He promises to provide an explanation before his lifespan expires, and back on planet Namek, Frieza elbows Goku, and Goku retaliates with a knee strike. As Namek hurtles toward destruction, Goku skillfully evades a punch from Frieza, countering with a powerful gut punch. Frieza coughs up blood, retaliates with a strike, and sends Goku flying with a kick. Goku regains control, propelling himself off of a mountain, and returns toward Frieza with a kick. However, he overshoots Frieza, executing a back kick that sends Frieza scraping across the ground. Despite Frieza attempting to rise, Goku quickly moves behind him and delivers a series of blows, causing Frieza to scrape along the ground once more. Frieza attempts to catch his breath, and silence between the two falls on the battlefield until Goku declares that he quits. Confused, Frieza questions Goku's statement, prompting Goku to explain that at 100% full power, Frieza's key is rapidly decreasing, making any further fighting pointless. Goku believes Frieza's pride has suffered enough, having been surpassed by a Saiyan. Goku announces his intention to return to Earth, powers down, and reverts to his normal black-haired form, telling Frieza not to cause trouble anymore, and that he never wants to see his face again. Frieza sits in awe, and Goku begins to fly away, but Frieza, infuriated, launches a Destructo Disc-like attack at Goku. Although Goku narrowly evades it, the attack grazes his cheek. Angered, Goku, considering Frieza foolish in blowing his last chance to live, transforms back into a Super Saiyan. Frieza guides the disc to chase Goku through the air, boasting that it can track him anywhere and cut through anything. Goku, unimpressed, flies toward Frieza with the disc in pursuit, and Frieza assumes Goku intends to redirect the attack, dismissing it as a foolish plan. Goku proceeds toward Frieza, but abruptly shoots straight up. Frieza launches the disc after him, seemingly hitting its target, but it turns out only to be an after image. The real Goku emerges behind Frieza, as Frieza recalls the disc. Goku criticizes the technique as pathetic, advising Frieza to refine his abilities. Enraged, Frieza retaliates, creating a second disc in his other hand, and launches both at Goku. Goku evades, and both attacks pursue him. Goku, approaching Frieza again, hears Frieza comment on the repetition of his moves. However, Goku counters by firing a small blast, creating a dense cloud of dust. Frieza narrowly escapes one of the discs, but Goku elbows him back to the ground. As Frieza attempts to stand, the second disc swiftly follows suit. Goku urgently warns Frieza not to stand up, but it 
it's too late. The disc slices through Frieza, cutting through his tail, stomach, and left arm, leaving him in pieces on the ground. Goku remarks that such a miserable end doesn't suit Frieza, but walks away confidently, announcing his return to Earth and leaving Frieza to share the fate of the planet he destroyed. Frieza, however, in pieces on the ground, suddenly pleads for help, causing Goku to stop. King Kai notices Goku's hesitation and yells for him to retreat from Namek, but Frieza's cry for help supersedes this as Goku turns around, questioning how many of the people he killed begged for their lives. Frieza continues to beg, and Goku gives him a small amount of his own energy, enough to allow him to move again and instructs him to make use of it. Back on Earth, the Grand Elder finishes informing everyone on how they were resurrected and transported to Earth. However, one of the Namekians observes the absence of anyone from Elder Suno's village. Vegeta then deduces it was the village he annihilated, and the wish was only for those killed by Frieza and his men, which excluded him. Some Namekians express anger toward Vegeta, until everyone notices large stones falling to the ground. The Grand Elder explains that the Dragon Balls have followed them to Earth, and that his life is nearly over again. He appoints Mori, the elder from Dende's village, as the new Grand Elder, instructing his children to use the Dragon Balls well when they regain their radiance. The Grand Elder then passes away and disappears as Piccolo bids him a farewell, and Dende realizes Piccolo must have united with Nail after hearing this. Bulma then inquires about Goku and Krillin's whereabouts. Gohan explains that Krillin was killed by Frieza, and Goku stayed behind to fight, but should be returning. Piccolo questions Goku's decision to stay and fight Frieza, but Gohan explains that it was Goku's choice on Krillin's behalf. Bulma wonders why Krillin wasn't revived with everyone else, and Gohan clarifies that a person can't be brought back twice, surprising Dende about the Earth's Dragon Ball's limitations. Dende explains that the Namekian Dragon Balls can restore life many times excluding a natural death, and Gohan grows excited about using the Namekian Dragon Balls to revive Krillin, Shoutsu, and everyone else. However, Piccolo expresses anger at Goku's recklessness and believes he has zero chance of winning against Frieza. Gohan disagrees though, confident that his father can win as he witnessed him become a Super Saiyan, much to Vegeta's surprise. Back on Namek, Frieza can't believe Goku shared his energy with him. Goku suggests Frieza escape since he can survive in space and be thankful for his life. Frieza claims the planet is about to explode and states that there's only death waiting for Goku. Realizing there's no time to reach his own spaceship, Goku plans to take Frieza's. Frieza, however, laughs, revealing that Vegeta destroyed his ship, questioning if he can even fly. Goku, however, intends to live and flies off, angering Frieza, who thinks to himself that Goku must die by his hand. Frieza then screams and fires a blast at Goku. Goku notices, turns around, and calls Frieza a fool as he retaliates with a larger blast, completely blowing Frieza away and leaving another massive crater on Namek. A look of regret washes over Goku's face before flying off, as he preferred not to have made such a drastic move. Back on King Kai's planet, the Kai informs Yamcha and the others that Frieza is dead. He explains that son Goku shared some of his own energy with Frieza, who then used it against him. Reluctantly, Goku had to finish Frieza off and won the battle. Yamcha expresses excitement, and Tien speculates that Goku must now be the strongest in the universe. However, King Kai tempers their enthusiasm, explaining that Goku's momentary strength is irrelevant because planet Namek is on the verge of exploding. With no time to reach his own ship, Goku heads toward Frieza's ship, which is unfortunately broken. Upon reaching the ship, Goku runs through it to the control room. Frustrated, he presses the launch button, but nothing happens. The ship then starts to sink into the ground, prompting Goku to exit to take to the air again. King Kai informs the group that Frieza's spaceship is inoperable, and Goku is unable to use it to escape. Realizing the imminent destruction of planet Namek, Goku screams in frustration, and King Kai averts his gaze as planet Namek explodes, leaving nothing but emptiness in the vacuum of space. King Kai asserts that all hope is lost as Goku didn't make it, and Yamcha mourns, then shortly volunteers to break the news to Bulma and the others. Placing his hand on King Kai's shoulder, Yamcha communicates with Bulma through her mind. Yamcha explains that Goku managed to defeat Frieza, but before he can finish, Bulma interrupts, sharing the news with the others, and Vegeta is shocked at the idea of Kakarot defeating Frieza. Yamcha grabs Bulma's attention again though, revealing that Goku didn't escape before Planet Namek's destruction and died in the explosion. In response, Bulma casually relays this news to the others, and 
Yamcha scolds Bulma for her blunt delivery, urging her to consider Gohan's feelings. Bulma, however, mentions that the Namekian Dragon Balls, which have been transported to Earth, can revive Goku, Krillin, and Chaozu. King Kai, however, tells Bulma that she's misinformed and points out that Chaozu can be revived on Earth, but Goku and Krillin would return to life on planet Namek, which no longer exists. In the face of this shocking revelation, Bulma stands silent. Gohan is surprised that his father and Krillin can't be brought back to life, and Bulma explains the reasons to him. Vegeta then suggests a solution, proposing that the group transfer their souls to Earth and then bring them back to life. Bulma approves of the idea, and Gohan expresses gratitude, offering to shake Vegeta's hand. However, Vegeta dismisses the gesture, warning against getting carried away. Privately, Vegeta states that he only wishes to see the Super Saiyan transformation with his own eyes, and says that Goku will one day know defeat by his own hands. At the same time, Mori expresses gratitude to the Earthlings, but requests a place to stay until the Dragon Balls rejuvenate so they can find a new home. Bulma invites them to live at her house, extending the offer to Vegeta as well. She playfully mentions feeding Vegeta generously, claiming he eats as much as Goku, and tells him not to get flirty with her, as she can be pretty hard to resist. Despite her charm though, Vegeta considers her a vulgar woman with a big mouth. Bulma heads to a nearby house to borrow a phone, intending to have her dad pick them up in a spaceship. Before leaving, Gohan questions if he can stay at Bulma's house as well, as he forgot to do his homework and fears the impending scolding from his mother. Thus, Vegeta and the Namekians stay at Bulma's house in West City. After 130 days, the Namekian Dragon Balls are restored and they summon Purunga at Capsule Corporation. Mori politely advises the Earthlings to use all three wishes this time and states they'll use their wishes next time. Bulma then tells Purunga to bring the souls of Goku and Krillin to Earth. Dende repeats the wish in Namekian, and Purunga states he's brought Krillin's soul, but reveals he couldn't summon Goku's because he's alive. Although relieved that Goku is alive, everyone wonders why he hasn't returned home. Gohan suggests that Goku's spaceship may be broken, and Bulma's second wish is to revive Krillin, who appears in front of them. Purunga mentions he provided a special service of restoring Krillin's body and clothing, and Bulma comments on his scary face, but acknowledges his good work. Bulma's final wish is to bring Goku to Earth, but Purunga, after a pause, informs them that Goku refused, wanting to return home on his own. Gohan questions why, and Master Roshi jokingly suggests it's because of Goku's scary wife, referring to Chi-Chi. Chi-Chi then pulls out a sword, prompting Roshi to backtrack, claiming it was just a joke. Piccolo proposes bringing someone from King Kai's planet back to life instead, and Yamcha is the first to be brought back to life. After another 130 days, Chaozu and Tien are revived, and the Namekians use the final wish to relocate themselves, along with the Dragon Balls, to a new planet. All ends well, but approximately one year passes, and Son Goku has yet to return home. The Cell Saga takes place after the events of the battle on Namek. A year had passed since Goku's mysterious disappearance post-planet Namek's destruction, and he hadn't returned home yet as he said he would. As a young Gohan sits at his desk pondering his father's return, suddenly he feels something strange and gets a phone call from Krillin. They both sensed an incredible energy rapidly approaching and suspect it to be Frieza. King Kai and Piccolo sensed it as well, along with Vegeta, infuriated that Goku apparently spared Frieza's life. Tien and Chaozu, situated somewhere off in the mountains, pick up an incredible power as well, along with another one approaching with it. As predicted, we cut to a spaceship resembling Frieza's and witness the tyrant on board, endowed with robotic enhancements and telling his father that they're due to arrive on Earth before Goku. Frieza's father, a large individual resembling Frieza's second form suggests obliterating the planet with a single attack. However, Frieza disagrees as he wants to face Goku once more and prove himself to be the strongest in the universe. As Frieza states he detected Goku approaching Earth same as him, Gohan quickly gears up and flies out of his house, leaving Chi Chi curious as to where he's going. As Gohan soars through the sky, bewildered by the unfolding events, he eventually catches up with Krillin. Anxious to comprehend the situation, Gohan questions if Krillin also sensed the presence of another formidable key similar to that of Frieza's and Krillin confirms, then stating how nobody could overlook such an overwhelming power. Meanwhile in space, Frieza's ship prepares to land on Earth. Vegeta, accompanied by Yamcha, stands in a desolate desert, pointing out Frieza and his father will land near them soon. They then notice a small jet copter heading their way, as Bulma and Poir arrive on the scene. Curious about the notorious tyrant Frieza, Bulma, who had missed encountering him during their time on planet Namek, expresses her desire to meet him despite the danger. Tien and Chaozu then arrive at the scene. Tien still upset with Vegeta for being responsible for
for his death when he invaded Earth. Yamcha intervenes though, aiming to limit the confrontation. Tien questions the powerful energy approaching Earth, and Vegeta urges the group to suppress their battle power to avoid detection from Frieza's army. He also points out that Piccolo is already doing so, and everyone notices him nearby. Gohan and Krillin show up not long after, and Piccolo alerts everyone that their enemies have finally arrived. Frieza's spaceship lands at a distance, and Vegeta tells everyone not to fly to evade detection from Frieza's scouters. Tien and Yamcha fall silent, Yamcha apprehensive due to the overwhelming strength of Frieza and his father, and Tien experiencing firsthand the sheer power of them both. Yamcha believes there's nothing they can do against such powerful foes, but Piccolo questions if fighting is better than standing idle and waiting to die. Vegeta then points out that the situation not only remains hopeless for them, but this will likely be the end of the Earth. Over in the distance, tensions rise as Frieza, accompanied by his father and their henchmen, step out of the spaceship. King Cold informs Frieza that they have three hours until the Super Saiyan Goku returns and questions if they should wait. Frieza, of course, confident in his abilities, insists on waiting and eliminating the Earthlings before Goku arrives. King Code goes along with his son's plan, but states no matter what, the Super Saiyan must be eliminated to solidify their ranks as the strongest in the cosmos. Frieza then directs his subordinates to kill as many Earthlings as they can, while he himself prepares for the confrontation with Goku. Yamcha, infuriated by the prospect of facing death again so soon, is overwhelmed by emotions, but suddenly, an unknown figure lands before Frieza as the battle for Earth's fate is about to commence. Frieza questions the intentions of the unexpected warrior, a teenage boy sporting a jean jacket adorned with a capsule core patch and a sword secured on his back. The boy fearlessly stands up to the tyrants and declares that he's come to take them down. While Frieza assumes the boy doesn't realize the gravity of the situation, he knows exactly who Frieza is. Surprised, Frieza expresses his honor at being known even on a remote planet in the galaxy. However, the tyrant is determined to maintain the perception that he's the strongest in the universe and commands one of its henchmen to dispose of the boy while the rest deal with the earthlings. The henchman confidently draws his weapon and dismisses the boy, considering him nothing but scum with only a battle power of five. However, to everyone's surprise, the boy effortlessly swats away the henchman's blast and swiftly takes him down with an elbow strike. The other henchmen rush forward, but the boy grabs his sword and in an instant slices them all down. Meanwhile, Vegeta, Krillin, and the others sense a significant shift in energy, prompting Bulma to inquire about it. Krillin observes that a massive key has suddenly emerged, while numerous other key have vanished beyond the mountains. Back at the battlefield, King Cold acknowledges the boy's power, and Frieza, somewhat begrudgingly, concedes that the Earthling performed admirably. The boy then asserts that it's their turn to be killed, stating that it'll only take a few seconds. He then tells Frieza he'd better fight him with everything he has, as he's no pushover like Goku. At the mention of the Super Saiyan's name, Frieza assumes the boy is on Goku's side. However, the boy clarifies he's never met Goku, but knows of him. He then drops a bombshell, telling Frieza he's miscalculated and revealing that he too is a Super Saiyan. Frieza and his father are shocked as the boy starts powering up, his hair transforming into a golden spiky mane similar to Goku's. Gohan in the distance recognizes the familiar key and deduces that it must be his father, and we cut back to Frieza who launches a massive blast, creating an explosive mushroom cloud as he and his father believe the warrior has been eliminated. The boy, however, evaded the attack and counters with his own, shooting a blast from above and slicing Frieza in half with his sword as the tyrant attempted to dodge. Frieza is split down the middle and the commotion catches the attention of Gohan and the rest of the group. The boy swiftly wields his sword, slicing Frieza into pieces and with a final blast, the tyrant is utterly obliterated, leaving everyone astounded. Bulma acknowledges the keen perception of the group, but also notices how strong Goku has become. Yamcha, however, speculates that the kid is definitely a Super Saiyan, but isn't Goku at all. As Vegeta suddenly takes off in the kid's direction, the others follow, except for Yamcha, Bulma, and Poir. Meanwhile, the kid lands on the ground along with King Cold. The tyrant praises the kid's victory over his own son and extends an offer for the two of them to rule the universe together. However, the boy declines, showing no interest. Cold then becomes curious about the boy's sword, asking to see it. Hesitant at first, Cold assumes he's afraid to hand it over, but the boy eventually tosses the sword to him. Cold examines the well-crafted weapon, believing it was the key to the boy's triumph against Frieza. He assumes he won't stand a chance without it and tries to strike him down, but the boy effortlessly catches the attack. To everyone's surprise, the boy then blasts a hole through King Cold's chest, and as the others arrive at the scene, the kid finishes Cold by blasting his body along with his spaceship, creating a massive explosion and eliminating the threat. He puts his sword away and returns to his regular form, inviting the others to join him in meeting son Goku. Gohan wonders how the boy knows his father, and he invites them once 
wants more to come along, explaining that it's not far. Vegeta, meanwhile, is furious and questions the kid's identity, thinking that there are no Saiyans left besides himself, Goku, and Gohan. The kid takes off into the air, and Gohan decides to go with him. Krillin is suspicious, but Tien decides to join as well, figuring since the boy defeated Frieza and knows about son Goku, he can't be a bad person. Yamcha and Bulma are curious about how he knows about Goku's arrival as well, and Vegeta, wanting to find out more about the boy, decides to go too. The boy looks at his watch and confirms the spot he's looking for, landing on the ground. Soon after, everyone else lands as well. The kid takes out a case of capsules and opens one, revealing a refrigerator. He mentions that son Goku will arrive in about three hours and offers them drinks, to which Bulma, Gohan, and Krillin gladly accept. Bulma questions the boy if they've met before, but he denies it. Gohan questions his knowledge of his father, but the boy claims he's only heard of him, but never met him. Krillin wonders how the boy knows about Goku's arrival time, but he simply apologizes, saying he can't reveal the reason. Vegeta demands answers about the boy's identity and power, but he remains silent. Gohan suggests that the boy may have been a Super Saiyan before, which Vegeta dismisses, asserting that only he, Kakarot, and the half Saiyan Gohan are Saiyans. Despite Vegeta's doubts though, Gohan remains certain that the boy was indeed a Super Saiyan. Vegeta points out that all Saiyans have black hair, questioning the boy's claim. Bulma then notices the capsule core mark on the boy's jacket and questions if he's an employee, but he evades the question. She also questions his name and age, to which he replies that he can't disclose his name, but reveals he's 17 years old. Tien finds it peculiar that the boy won't share his name, and Yamcha suspects he's hiding something. Bulma then suggests that they stop interrogating the boy since he saved them in the earth, and everyone continues to wait for Goku's arrival. As they wait, Gohan questions Piccolo on why he didn't leave with the other Namekians after the battle on Namek, to which he simply replies that it would have been boring and that he's training fiercely every day. Bulma quietly tells Krillin that Vegeta is never around during the day either, likely engaging in special training somewhere. Krillin believes Vegeta still wants to defeat Goku due to his pride, and Bulma then notices that the mysterious kid somewhat resembles Vegeta, though their personalities are completely different. When the boy glances at Vegeta, the Saiyan expresses his disapproval of him, stating that if he's actually a Saiyan, he shouldn't be an unusual sight. After some time, the boy checks his watch, indicating that it's about time for Goku to show up. Gohan confirms it as he senses his father's key, and shortly after, a space pod crashes nearby. Everyone rushes to the crash site, where Goku emerges in an unusual outfit, and his friends and family are happy to see him. He wonders how they knew he was coming, and they excitedly inform him that the mysterious boy told them about his arrival, leading Goku to ask about the kid's identity. Goku acknowledges that he doesn't know the newcomer, but Bulma asserts that the stranger knew precisely when and where to find him. This puzzles Goku, who mentions how Frieza spotted his spaceship and anticipated his arrival on Earth, but isn't sure how this stranger could know. Curious about Frieza's defeat, Goku wonders whether it was the work of Piccolo or perhaps Vegeta. To his surprise, Piccolo reveals that it was the boy who defeated Frieza, and he's even capable of becoming a Super Saiyan. Goku is amazed by the kid's power at such a young age, and admits that he didn't even know there were other Saiyans out there. However, Vegeta denies the existence of other Saiyans, but Goku says it doesn't matter. The boy then tells Goku he wants to speak with him alone, and they walk a distance away from everyone else. Goku expresses gratitude to the boy for defeating Frieza, and admits he was too soft on him during their battle on planet Namek. The boy explains that Goku was originally supposed to defeat Frieza, but was prevented by a time discrepancy, leading him to intervene. Goku believes he would have beaten Frieza if not for the boy's intervention, but he disagrees, explaining that he was about three hours away at the time and couldn't have made it. However, Goku reveals that he might have been able to with his new technique, Instant Transmission, learned from the inhabitants of a planet called Yardrat, which surprises the boy as he realizes he unnecessarily altered history and met everyone in the process. Curious, the boy questions if Goku can transform into a Super Saiyan at will, to which Goku responds that he can. The kid questions if Goku could demonstrate it, and Goku does so, transforming into a Super Saiyan. The others watch in awe as Gohan announces Goku's transformation, and Vegeta sits back furious, but noting it's no surprise he beat Frieza. In response, the boy also transforms into a Super Saiyan, confirming the similarities between them. The boy then apologizes and rushes Goku with his sword, but the Saiyan remains unfazed, trusting that the kid doesn't intend to kill him. The boy smiles and insists on attacking again, this time with Goku transferring his energy to his finger. The boy charges once more at Goku with light speed sword slashes blocked by the Saiyan's finger, and eventually ceases the assault, acknowledging Goku's skill and sheathing his sword. The boy then reveals his true identity as Trunks, a time traveler from about 20 years in the future. He then reveals that his Saiyan blood is directly linked to Vegeta, as he's his son. Goku is taken aback by the revelation of Trunks' lineage, prompting him to yell as he surprised Vegeta would ever have a kid. Although Goku states that he can't see Vegeta as a father, he admits that future Trunks does indeed resemble Vegeta.
Vegeta. Trunks tells Goku that he'll be born in two and a half years, but that he's come to discuss more serious business. He informs Goku that in three years, on May 12th, a pair of powerful monsters will appear on an island near South City. Goku, considering his most recent battles, questions if they're aliens. However, Trunks says that the duo are really androids created on Earth by Dr. Jiro, the chief scientist for the Red Ribbon Army, the organization Goku defeated as a child. Goku, shocked to learn that they've resurfaced, wonders if they're attempting world conquest again, and Trunks suspects as much. He then says that the two androids called Mechanical Men numbers 19 and 20 killed Dr. Jiro, so all that remain are the androids who enjoy slaughter and destruction. Goku is surprised that someone who defeated Frieza so easily could be frightened, realizing that these androids are stronger than the tyrant himself. He questions if Trunks has any other allies, but Trunks informs Goku that he's the only Z fighter left on Earth in his time. As the dire situation unfolds, shifting the focus to the distant future, we witness a young Trunks as a Super Saiyan, honing his skills in combat alongside a battle-hardened one-armed Gohan. Encouraged by Gohan's praise, they pause their sparring session and settle on a cliff overlooking the city. Gohan expresses that Trunks may surpass him in a few months, leading to a discussion about the irretrievable loss of Gohan's arm due to the depletion of sensu beans. Gohan imparts the wisdom that what's lost cannot be regained, and Trunks mentions his mother's remark about his resemblance to his father Goku when he dons the orange gi, which surprises her every time. Gohan explains that he wears the outfit in hopes of one day becoming as strong as his father was, though it's not as easy as it seems. Suddenly, an explosion rips through the nearby city, a result of the androids' havoc. Gohan transforms into a Super Saiyan and instructs Trunks to remain while he confronts the threat. Eager to prove his strength, Trunks insists on joining, but Gohan distracts him momentarily and swiftly incapacitates him to protect Earth's last potential defender against the androids. Much later, Trunks regains consciousness and searches for Gohan, only to discover him lying lifeless in a pool of his own blood after his battle with the androids. Amidst his overwhelming grief, Trunks finds the strength to convey to Goku that all the other Z Fighters will be killed shortly after the androids appear. He also tells him that when Piccolo dies, the Dragon Balls will disappear forever and nobody can be revived again. Goku wonders what will happen to him, and Future Trunks tells him that he never got killed by the androids, but not long from now, he'll grow ill from a disease that attacks the heart and he'll die before the androids appear. Goku's disappointed that he won't get the chance to fight the androids, which shocks Trunks as he thought he'd be nervous at the prospect of dying. He then tells Goku that he's a true Super Saiyan just like his mother told him, and gives him heart medicine, telling him that there's a cure for the illness 20 years into the future. Goku is overjoyed, and Trunks tells him that he has faith in him to fix things, and that his mother worked on the time machine so that Goku could help. Goku, upon hearing that future Trunks' mother knows him and made the time machine, quickly deduces that it must be Bulma. The Saiyan is stunned, figuring Bulma would end up with Yamcha, but future Trunks explains that Yamcha was unfaithful to Bulma, which led to their breakup, and Bulma shortly after fell in love with Vegeta. He also says that his parents were never married, and this was the first time he's gotten to see his father as he was too young to remember him in his time. Trunks then makes Goku promise not to reveal his parentage, as it could jeopardize his existence, and the Saiyan agrees. Trunks then decides to return to the future to reassure his mother of his safety, and Goku thanks him for pretty much saving his life. Goku wonders if they'll meet again, and Trunks says he's unsure, as it takes a while to build up power in the time machine. However, he'll return to fight with everyone if he's still alive in three years their time. Goku promises to train hard, and future Trunks flies off, much to the surprise of the remaining Z Fighters. Goku's unsure how to deliver the news to everyone, but is relieved of having to do so due to Piccolo's exceptional hearing. And so, Piccolo tells the group of everything except for future Trunks' parentage. Yamcha and Bulma seem skeptical of the story, but Piccolo says he'll train to prepare, as he doesn't want to die. Just then, future Trunks' time machine rises into the air and disappears, convincing Krillin, Tien, and Vegeta of the story's credibility, and they decide to train for the battle as well. With the Z Fighters having made up their minds, Vegeta questions Goku on how he escaped from Namek. Yamcha recalls King Kai stating that Goku wasn't going to make it as Frieza's spaceship was destroyed, but Goku says he found five space pods nearby, which Vegeta realized belonged to the Ginyu Force. Goku says that the pod took him to Yardrat, which Vegeta states the Ginyu Force were set to conquer next. Goku tells the group that the people of Yardrat were really friendly, and they gave him an outfit identical to the ones they wear, since he got them torn up from his battle with Frieza. Vegeta then says that the people of Yardrat have strange techniques, and that there's no way Goku would have left without learning one, prompting the Saiyan to state that he's learned a new technique called Instant Transmission, much to everyone's surprise. Goku explains the concept of the technique, and proves his mastery of it by teleporting to Kame House 
and returning with Master Roshi's glasses. Although Vegeta initially believes the technique to be nothing more than super speed, Yamcha confirms that Goku actually traveled over 10,000 miles in an instant, amazing the rest of the group but infuriating Vegeta. Tien questions where and when they should reconvene in three years, and Piccolo informs the group but states that they should meet an hour early. The Namekian then says that anyone who doesn't think they stand a chance should stay home, but Vegeta puts Piccolo in that category, which prompts the Namekian to challenge him to a fight, although Goku defuses the confrontation. Bulma then suggests everyone attack Dr. Jiro right away. She states they can ask Shenron for his location and do away with him, thus preemptively ending the coming threat in three years. Krillin likes the idea, but Vegeta threatens to kill anyone that does so. Bulma leans on Goku to support her idea, but Goku says he wants to fight as well, and so does Tien. Even Krillin agrees, stating that a common enemy will keep Vegeta from trying to kill them all again. Bulma still remains skeptical, but the group decide to begin their training. Goku, Piccolo, and Gohan decide to train together, as do Tien and Chaozu, while Krillin and Yamcha opt to train with Master Roshi. Vegeta claims that he'll beat Goku sooner or later before flying off, and Goku mistakenly tells Bulma to take care of her baby, which Yamcha interprets as Goku hinting that the two of them should get married and start a family. Later at Capsule Core, Vegeta tells Dr. Brief to build him a 300 times gravity training room. Goku, meanwhile, tries to convince Chi-Chi to let Gohan train instead of study. Vegeta inside his training room vows to surpass even the Super Saiyan level, and as three years pass and May 12th arrives, Goku, Gohan, and Piccolo fly off to meet the androids that Future Chunks claimed would appear. As they soar through the sky, Goku advises Gohan to conserve his energy for the upcoming battle. Piccolo questions Goku about their chances of winning, to which Goku admits uncertainty until they confront the enemy themselves. Piccolo finds Goku carefree and expresses his unease about the situation, and Goku reminds Piccolo not to overexert himself, as his death would mean the loss of the Dragon Balls. The group then catch up to Krillin, who comments on Gohan's growth, but when questioned about his mood, states he's not happy about running into battle with a gang of androids. Eventually, the group of four reach a massive island with a city full of people, and Gohan suggests leading the androids away to fight elsewhere to avoid hurting the island's people. The group move toward a mountain plateau, where they encounter Yamcha and Tien, accompanied by Bulma holding a baby. Goku questions Bulma's presence as it could get dangerous, but she states that she wants to see the androids first, and then she'll leave. Krillin is surprised to see Bulma holding a child, and Gohan assumes that she and Yamcha finally got married. However, Yamcha says he and Bulma broke up a long time ago, and how the group won't believe who the father is. Goku approaches the child and correctly deduces he's Vegeta's, which surprises Bulma as she hasn't shared that information with anyone. Goku brushes it off as a lucky guess, and Piccolo wonders where Vegeta is, as the fight is about to begin. Bulma is unsure of Vegeta's location as they haven't been living together, but she's sure he'll show up, as is Goku, as he's been training hard for this fight. Tien states he decided to leave Chaozu behind as he wouldn't be able to keep up, and Goku agrees as the team check their time for the android's arrival. More time passes, and Krillin questions the absence of Baby Trunks' tail, while Gohan plays around with him. Piccolo then senses someone coming, but says they aren't evil. A little air car then flies in, and Goku notices it's Yajirobe, and wonders if he came to fight. However, he only stops to deliver some sensu beans from Korin and flies off as he wants no part of what's coming. Tien thinks it's strange that it's past 10, but he feels no sign of the enemy at all. Yamcha assumes the story of the androids was all a lie, but Bulma says he said about 10 a.m., and it's just 10.17 right now. Yamcha, however, states that if there were anyone around, the group would have been able to feel their key and spot them, no matter where they were on Earth. But just then, an explosion occurs in the air, and Yajirobe's car goes down. Piccolo directs everyone's attention to the sky, and the group noticed two figures from afar going into the city, but nobody got a good look at them. Goku says he couldn't feel their key at all and wonders why, but Gohan says they're androids, so they likely don't have key. In the city, an old man with a mustache and long white hair and a short, fat, pale individual stand in the middle of the road, each one wearing a hat donning the red ribbon logo. Piccolo suggests that if the group can't sense their key, they should use their eyes to search for them. Goku agrees with the idea and advises everyone to stay cautious and inform the group if they find anything, but tells Gohan to check on Yajirobe as they all fly down to the city to begin the search. Goku lands on a building and wishes he had a photograph of the enemies from Trunks. Krillin landing on the sidewalk wonders about the identities of the androids while a bystander is shocked to see he was flying. Meanwhile, Piccolo and Tien also arrive in the city and Gohan helps Yajirobe, who crash landed in the ocean while Yamcha runs through an alley. As the androids walk through the city, two individuals approach them asking if they saw the car explosion. The older android known as number 20 remains silent while the fat, 
pale one number 19 attacks the men. A car approaches and the driver confronts them for blocking the road. Number 20 punches through the car's hood, then grabs the driver by the neck and kills him. This horrifying scene is witnessed by a woman who screams, prompting Yamcha to rush toward it. As the old man senses energy approaching, he figures it must be a sensor malfunction. However, number 19 confirms that it's not and that they found son Goku. Meanwhile, Yamcha arrives at the scene of the attack, questioning the people in a nearby window about the culprits, but they mention that the assailants suddenly disappeared. Above, the androids float in the air and identify Yamcha as the human they were detecting earlier. Although it wasn't their desired target, number 20 says that he'll still be a good source of power. The two land behind Yamcha, who soon realizes their true identity and backs away. However, before he could call for the help of his allies, number 20 grabs him by the face and lifts him while draining his energy. It's not long before the android ends Yamcha's resistance by driving his arm through his chest, much to the warrior's surprise. Number 20 eventually withdraws his arm from Yamcha, and Goku detects something amiss, while Tien and Krillin observe a significant key rapidly diminishing and figure it's Yamcha. Piccolo takes flight to join the others, and they all arrive on the scene in front of number 19 and 20. As Goku yells out to an unconscious Yamcha, number 20 releases his grip and drops him to the ground. Goku tells Krillin that Yamcha's still alive and to get him to safety and feed him a sensu bean. Krillin agrees and flies off with Yamcha, as Piccolo deduces they're facing the androids now and is relieved they finally revealed themselves. Number 20 finds it peculiar that they know they're androids and wonders how they knew where to find them. Piccolo suggests that they force the answer out of them and number 20 agrees to this approach. Goku proposes moving to a location devoid of people, but number 20 replies that there's no need to go elsewhere as he unexpectedly begins using his eye lasers to destroy a significant portion of the city. Goku shouts at him to stop and rushes in to deliver a punch, knocking off number 20's hat. Meanwhile, Yamcha's been healed on the plateau by Krillin as the group of he, Gohan, Bulma, Baby Trunks, and Yajirobe then witness the devastation in the city from afar. Number 20 puts his hat back on and remarks that he only aimed to fulfill Goku's wish of a deserted area. Enraged, Goku challenges them to come with him and the others to face defeat. However, Number 19 retorts, stating that the group have no hope of defeating them. Number 20 confidently offers to follow Goku and invites him to choose his place of death. Everyone wonders how the androids know Goku's name, and he reveals that he also also knows the names of Piccolo and Tien. Goku then notices other residents of the city nearby and suggests they discuss later, urging everyone to leave immediately. Goku takes off, followed by 20 and 19, with Piccolo and Tien close behind. On the plateau, the others realize the group is changing locations and Yamcha exclaims that they'll need to tell them that the androids are capable of stealing energy. As Goku, Piccolo, Tien, and the androids search for a suitable battleground, Yamcha informs the group that Android 20 was able to drain his energy by grabbing him. Boma praises Dr. Jiro's remarkable scientific abilities, while Gohan suggests informing the others and takes off to pursue the androids. Yamcha feels too powerless to join, but Krillin volunteers to deliver sensu beans to the team. Eventually, Yamcha decides to follow along, but only as an observer. As the group with the androids flies over a desolate plane, number 20 chooses it as the battlefield, dismissing Goku's objections. They land, and Piccolo notices the rocky mountains surrounding the plane, noting the androids plan to hide there if needed. Goku questions again how the androids know about them, and Tien observes that Goku is breathing heavily after flying. Number 20 reveals they've been observing Goku's battle since he defeated the Red Ribbon Army, seeking a weakness in order to determine what sort of android could defeat him. He clarifies that only Dr. Jiro remained after the army's fall, although Piccolo remarks that Android 20 speaks as though he's Dr. Jiro himself. Number 20 denies this though, and insists that Dr. Jiro is no more. Goku then questions if they observed his battles on Namek, to which Number 20 responds that they had enough data by that point and didn't need to. Meanwhile, Go Gohan, Krillin, and Yamcha search in vain for the battle site, stating that nobody was fighting yet so they couldn't sense their key. Goku points out that the androids overlooked a significant portion of his life, surprising number 19 and 20. Piccolo notes that it was a fatal mistake not to be aware of Super Saiyan, and Goku transforms as the energy released alerts the others to the battle's location. Tien and Piccolo are amazed by Goku's power, and Android 20 admits that the Saiyan has far surpassed their calculated limits. However, he remains confident that both he and 19 can still handle Goku. Goku then declares that he'll find out for himself soon enough and charges in to engage in battle. Goku rushes toward 19, suddenly vanishing when the android tries to strike him. In a swift move, Goku reappears behind 19 and delivers an elbow strike to his back, sending him flying. The sight surprises Android 20, but 19 quickly recovers and launches himself at Goku. With ease, Goku stops him with just one hand and kicks him high into the air. While number 20 watches in shock, Goku ascends and appears behind 19 once more. Despite 19's multiple attacks, Goku dodges and lands a knee to the android's stomach, following an elbow to the face. Tien
Ian is amazed at Goku's Super Saiyan power, suggesting that he seems to exist in a completely different dimension compared to the others. Piccolo agrees, but appears to be concerned about the ongoing battle. As Goku continues to pummel Android 19, Android 20 worries that his companion may run out of energy before being able to absorb Goku's power. At that moment, Gohan, Yamcha, and Krillin arrive at the scene. Although Gohan shows concern for his father, Tien reassures them, stating that the androids are no match for Goku's Super Saiyan strength. Goku relentlessly attacks 19, making Yamcha wonder if the energy absorption notion was just his imagination. Gohan, however, appears perplexed about something, and Piccolo questions if he noticed it too. Gohan confirms, and Piccolo expresses that Goku seems rushed and weakened. This surprises Tien, who believes that Goku is overpowering the android. Piccolo then states that Goku's strength should be much higher, and Gohan brings up Yamcha's theory about energy absorption, which surprises Piccolo. Yamcha recounts his experience with Android 20, and just then, Goku kicks 19, sending him crashing down to the ground. 19 gets up and stares at Goku, Yamcha then noting that he doesn't seem bothered by the beating he's taking. Visibly exhausted, Goku decides to finish off 19 with a Kamehameha. Upon seeing the attack, 19 and 20 become ecstatic, and 19 absorbs the blast effortlessly with his right hand. The Z fighters are left in shock, and Yamcha points out that he was right about the absorption ability. Piccolo urgently warns Goku against using Ki Blast since the androids can absorb them, all the while, the Saiyan appears to be weaker than before. Krillin notices Goku's unusual behavior and speculates that he might have lost a lot of his Ki already, but Piccolo observes that 19 hasn't grabbed Goku yet. Gohan seems to have a realization, while Android 20 notices that 19's power has increased while Goku's has dramatically decreased. Fueled by the newfound energy, Android 19 charges head first at Goku once more. Goku manages to evade 19's initial punch and tries to counter with an elbow strike, but the android evades the attack. 19 retaliates by kneeing Goku in the stomach, prompting Goku to respond with an elbow strike to 19's face. Surprisingly, 19 seems unfazed by the attack and retaliates by smacking Goku in the face and slamming him down. However, Goku prevents himself from hitting the ground and readies himself to launch a powerful Kamehameha attack at 19. Just as Goku is about to unleash the attack, Piccolo intervenes, urging him to stop. Concerned about Goku's condition, Yamcha notices signs of weakness in him and wonders if he somehow had his energy drained. However, Gohan notices his father clutching at his chest and deduces he's suffering from the heart virus Future Trunks warned them about. To counter the virus's effects, Krillin throws Goku a sensu bean to restore his strength. Android 20, watching from a distance, identifies the bean as the fabled sensu and gains insight into its power. However, despite the temporary boost, Goku's condition doesn't improve and he struggles in the fight. The Z fighters are puzzled as to why the medicine Trunks gave didn't help Goku, but Gohan explains he never took it as he hadn't fallen ill to the virus until now. The situation worsens as 19 gains the upper hand, knocking Goku back and causing him to revert to his base form. As 19 lands on top of Goku and grabs him by the neck, the remaining Z fighters rush to aid him but are intercepted by Android 20, who blocks their path. Piccolo attempts to move him out the way, but is shot down by number 20's eye lasers. Meanwhile, 19 continues to drain Goku's energy until he's suddenly struck by a powerful kick from an unknown figure. It was revealed to be Vegeta, who appeared determined to keep anyone from killing Goku unless it was him. The sudden appearance of Vegeta leaves both the Z fighters and the androids in shock. Piccolo, who is lying on the ground, surprises everyone by getting up, admitting he was only pretending to be defeated to create an opening to save Goku. He then tells Gohan that it would take more than a puny attack like that to take him down. Vegeta berates Goku for transforming into a Super Saiyan despite being aware of the anomaly in his body. He tells Goku that he'll be the one to defeat him no matter what and kicks him into the air. Piccolo catches Goku, and Vegeta suggests taking him home and giving him the heart medicine. Gohan offers to do it, but Yamcha insists on taking Goku instead, considering himself less useful than anyone else on the battlefield. Piccolo advises Yamcha to take some medicine too, as the virus could be contagious and he doesn't want to take any chances. As Yamcha flies off, Android 19 readies himself to pursue him, but Android 20 tells him not to, finding it more entertaining to save the best fighter for later. Number 20 believes they can handle the other Z fighters now that Vegeta has joined them, and Krillin proposes a temporary retreat, referring to Future Trunks' account of everyone except for Gohan dying. Gohan, however, argues that if they retreat, the androids will continue to wreak havoc, and Piccolo points out that history has already diverged from Trunks' timeline. He states that Trunks' presence may have caused subtle changes like the timing of Goku's heart virus, but Krillin thinks to himself that no matter what's changed, the androids still remain a terrifying threat. Android 19 questions Android 20 if he can kill Vegeta, and after some insult, 20 agrees, claiming the other four fighters for himself. Vegeta remarks that the androids aren't nearly as strong as rumored, mentioning how the only thing he needs to be concerned about is their energy absorption ability. Number 19 retorts
asserts that he's aware of Vegeta's abilities too, but the Saiyan Prince asserts that Saiyans can't be reduced to mere calculations. Vegeta then questions if androids can feel fear, and transforms into a Super Saiyan, surprising the Z Fighters and the androids. Krillin expresses his belief that a Super Saiyan had to be pure of heart, but Vegeta explains that while his heart is pure, it's pure evil. He describes how he pushed himself through intense training to become a Super Saiyan, fueled by rage against himself, and now the time has finally come for him to surpass Goku and reclaim his place as the Prince of All Saiyans. Android 20 tries to convince Vegeta that he's still no match for them, but Vegeta remains undeterred. 19 charges at the Saiyan, landing a punch on his face, but Vegeta shows no sign of pain. He explains that in addition to his power, his ferocity has increased in his Super Saiyan state as well. He then proceeds to counterattack, delivering a powerful kick to the android's chest, followed by an elbow and a kick to the face, sending the android flying backward. With a calm demeanor, Vegeta approaches Android 19 while 20 watches in horror. Vegeta insults the androids, inquiring if they screwed up their calculations. In response, Android 19 swiftly springs to his feet and lunges at Vegeta, who dodges the attack and counterattacks, propelling 19 into the air with a powerful kick. Unfazed, Vegeta pursues his airborne opponent and catches up to him quickly, catching him off guard. Dodging a grab from the android, Vegeta delivers a solid blow to his face. Noticing that Android 19 is bleeding, Vegeta sarcastically questions the nature of the liquid, whether it's blood or oil. The android tries to retaliate by attacking Vegeta with his laser eyes, but the Saiyan evades skillfully and slams him into the ground, nearly hitting the other Z fighters. The impact creates a substantial crater where 19 lies motionless and Vegeta lands nearby. Just as he thinks the fight is over, 19 springs into action, grasping Vegeta's wrist firmly and announcing his intent to drain all of the Saiyan's power, insisting that escape is futile. Undeterred, Vegeta experiments by pushing against Android 19's face with his feet and stretching his body. He confirms that 19 indeed absorbs energy through his hands, but Vegeta takes it a step further by fully exerting his body, severing 19's hands at the wrists while they remain stubbornly attached to him. 19 is sent flying backward, shocked by the unexpected outcome, and Android 20 is equally surprised. After removing 19's hands from his wrists, Vegeta examines them, noting the energy absorption areas on the palms. He tosses the severed hands to the ground and taunts a scared Android 19, noting that fear is something the android can experience. In a desperate attempt to escape, 19 scrambles out of the crater to make a run for it. However, Vegeta ascends into the air and prepares to destroy the android, with number 20 attempting to intervene verbally, although Vegeta dismisses him, stating that he'll deal with him later. After amassing enough energy, Vegeta unleashes a mighty Big Bang attack, creating an immense explosion that astonishes everyone watching. When the smoke clears, only Android 19's head remains, and Android 20 suggests they may have underestimated Vegeta, but he still remains convinced that the Saiyan still cannot win, a notion that Vegeta scoffs at. Vegeta approaches Android 20 and reverts to his base form, mentioning he's exhausted a significant amount of energy and offers for the android to challenge him. However, 20 is suspicious of Vegeta's intentions. Vegeta playfully accuses him of being a sore loser, prompting the android to flee towards the rocks as previously deduced by Piccolo. Vegeta demands Krillin to hand over a sensu bean to recover his strength, to which Krillin hesitates to provide it. Piccolo urges Krillin to give it to him, and Vegeta, now transforming into a Super Saiyan again, warns the Z Fighters to stay out of his way as he pursues Android 20. Piccolo explains that Vegeta had indeed lost a significant amount of power fighting Android 19, and had bluffed against Android 20. He states that had 20 called his bluff, Vegeta certainly would have lost the battle. The Namekian admires Vegeta's strength and combat prowess, suggesting that he might have even surpassed Goku, much to the surprise of the Z Fighters. Tien decides to follow Vegeta, eager to witness Android 20's defeat. Krillin and Gohan join in as well, but Piccolo advises them not to engage in a fight and to inform him or Vegeta if they locate Android 20. The Z Fighters then set off after Vegeta, and meanwhile, the Saiyan struggles to locate Android 20, calling out for him. In an attempt to flush him out, Vegeta fires a blast toward the ground, but Krillin warns him that the rest of them are nearby. Suddenly, Android 20 takes advantage of the situation, stepping in front of the blast and absorbing it with his palms, gaining a minor boost in his power. Observing this, Vegeta becomes furious and charges toward the android, but he quickly disappears, outpacing the Saiyan. As he watches Vegeta from above, number 20 notes that the Z Fighters rely too much on tracking Ki and have overlooked their observation skills. He's however impressed by Vegeta's power and realizes he'll need to return to his lab in order to stand a chance against him. Number 20 then spots Gohan, Tien, Piccolo, and Krillin searching for him amongst the Rocky Mountains and begins devising a plan to drain their energy to strengthen himself before taking on Vegeta. The Z Fighters continue their search for Android 20 
20 in the mountains. Before confronting Vegeta though, 20 selects Piccolo as his first target since he's stated to be the strongest after the Saiyan. Sneaking up from behind, number 20 covers Piccolo's mouth to prevent him from calling for help. However, Piccolo telepathically contacts Gohan, who senses the change in Piccolo's energy and rushes to assist him. Android 20 continues to drain Piccolo's energy, but Gohan arrives just in time to strike him from behind, freeing Piccolo and alerting the rest of the group of their location. Piccolo thanks Gohan for saving his life, and the group surrounds Android 20, outnumbering him as Vegeta smiles after locating his target. Gohan instructs Krillin to give Piccolo a sensu bean to restore his energy, and he does so. Piccolo then removes his weighted clothing and insists on taking on Android 20 alone. Vegeta shows little concern for Piccolo's well-being and tells him to go ahead, although at his current power level, he might just be giving the android the energy he's looking for. As 20 agrees and sees this as an opportunity to gather more energy, Piccolo swiftly attacks with a knee to the face, displaying remarkable speed and surprising the other Z fighters aside from Vegeta. Android 20 charges in again, but after being knocked to the ground, he immediately finds himself at a disadvantage, unable to believe that Piccolo is still stronger than him since absorbing both he and Vegeta's energy. Meanwhile, Future Trunks returns to aid the Z fighters against the androids. Unable to locate anyone on the island he told them about, he senses the ongoing battle and heads in the direction of the new location. Meanwhile, Piccolo continues to overpower Android 20 in the mountains, impressing Krillin with his newfound strength. Bulma and Yajirobe, on their way to the battlefield as well, discuss whether they should approach the explosion site in the airplane. Recognizing future Trunks as he flies past them though, Bulma feels reassured that they're going in the right direction and continues on. At the battle scene, Piccolo cuts off Android 20's right hand and taunts him about the insignificant energy he stole earlier. Future Trunks then arrives at the battle site alongside Android 19, completely bewildered about the android he's witnessing. Just then, Trunks witnesses an explosion further out and rushes toward it. During his flight, he states that Android 19 isn't one of the androids he's familiar with and wonders if there are now three of them total. Meanwhile, at the battlefield, Piccolo continues to effortlessly handle Android 20, who's surprised by the Namekian strength exceeding their calculations. Piccolo explains that the changes in the android's power levels and the Z Fighter's growth have altered the future, making their enemies out to be way weaker than they were led to believe. Tien acknowledges that while he's uneasy about Piccolo and Vegeta's immense power, it's beneficial for the current situation, and Vegeta instructs Piccolo to finish off 20, otherwise he'll step in. Piccolo confidently states that he'll handle it himself, as he's nowhere near as soft as Goku, and suddenly, everyone senses a powerful energy approaching, and future Trunks arrives on the scene. Piccolo calls him by name, and Vegeta realizes that this version of Trunks is his son from the future. Trunks thinks to himself that he doesn't recognize Android 20 either, who is equally curious about Trunks' identity. Feeling that he's made major miscalculations today, 20 figures that he now has no choice but to retreat to his laboratory. Amidst the confusion about the android's identity, Bulma, Yajirobe, and Baby Trunks approach the battlefield. Yajirobe threatens to toss Baby Trunks out the window if they get any closer, to which Bulma clarifies that Vegeta is the father, causing him to reconsider. As the discussion concerning the android's identity unfolds, Krillin suggests that they may be different due to the alterations in history. Meanwhile, Android 20 devises a plan to escape by hiding amongst the rocks, and Bulma and Yajirobe arrive just in time. As Future Trunks warns his mother of the past to stay away, Android 20 exclaims that Androids 17 and 18 will come for them all soon, then launching an energy wave at Bulma's airplane, causing it to explode and temporarily blind the Z Fighters. As the smoke clears, Android 20 vanishes and Piccolo gets upset. Future Trunks manages to rescue Bulma and his younger self, and Vegeta floats above the rubble, preparing to go after Android 20. However, Future Trunks intervenes, questioning why Vegeta didn't attempt to save Bulma and his son. Vegeta, however, dismisses the notion of sentimentality and flies away, much to Future Trunks' shock. Bulma then questions Android 20's appearance, revealing that she believes that he is in fact Dr. Jiro, as she'd seen his picture in an academic journal. This leads her to wonder if he modified his own body, as Yajirobe lays covered in rubble, asking for anyone to help him. Krillin informs the group that Bulma suspects Android 20 is actually Dr. Jiro. Vegeta seeks clarification, and Bulma explains that she's seen Jiro's picture before. Although he was a renowned scientist, he was not well liked by his peers, and a transformation into an android was likely to extend his life. Vegeta then gets annoyed with future Trunks, as the androids are different from what he had described, and he had previously mentioned that they killed Dr. Jiro. Future Trunks speculates that his time travel may have altered history, but Piccolo suggests that androids 17 and 18 referred to by Jiro could be the ones future Trunks knows. The Namekian inquires for a description of the pair as they can't afford to lose any more time, and Future Trunks provides one. The question then arises whether androids 17 and 18 can absorb energy 
energy through their hands, but Future Trunks is knowledgeable about them, stating that they have an infinite energy supply. Curious on Goku's whereabouts, Future Trunks learns that the heart virus he warned them about has taken effect, but long after the given time frame. He questions Bulma about Jiro's lab location, and she reveals that it's rumored to be in a cave near North City. Piccolo proposes a plan to reach the lab before Jiro and destroy the androids before their activation, but Vegeta disagrees, dismissing it as a cowardly approach. Future Trunks cautions against underestimating the androids and suggests waiting for Goku to recover if they can't beat Jiro to the lab. However, Vegeta asserts that he doesn't need anyone, including Goku, and flies away, confident in his power as a Super Saiyan. Piccolo believes Vegeta might have a chance of winning, but Future Trunks disagrees as he himself is a Super Saiyan and was no match for the androids in his time. He then vows not to let his father die again and chases after Vegeta, leaving the rest of the group. This unexpected reference to Vegeta as his father surprises Bulma, Krillin, and Gohan, leading Piccolo to reveal Future Trunks' true identity as the grown-up version of her baby. Piccolo tells Tien, Krillin, and Gohan that he'll need their help to locate Jiro's laboratory, as it'll be easier to destroy 17 and 18 before they're reactivated. Gohan inquires if Bulma can relay their newfound information to Goku, but without a ship, she can't exactly get to him. Piccolo then instructs Gohan to take Bulma and baby Trunks to Goku, while he, Tien, and Krillin try to find the lab before Vegeta does. As they set off, Yajirobe appears and joins Gohan, Bulma, and baby Trunks, telling Gohan to hurry up so they can all leave together. Meanwhile, as Dr. Jiro approaches his lab, his sensors pick up someone's energy and he hides among the rocks. He then spots Vegeta and Future Trunks flying toward his lab, initially thinking it's a coincidence, but recalls Bulma's connection to Capsule Corporation and realizes that they're indeed heading for it. He then spots Piccolo, Krillin, and Tien and realizes they must be planning to destroy Android 17 and 18 before he can activate them. Jiro, confident that the Z Fighters will need to do a bit of searching to find the precise location, he decides to take a different route, hoping he'll have enough time before they discover his lab. Meanwhile, during their flight, Future Trunks ponders Future Bulma's belief that there's some good deep down in Vegeta, but he remains skeptical, as only a monster would abandon the mother of his child and son as they face imminent death. Realizing his son intends to keep following him, Vegeta attempts to outpace Future Trunks, but he matches his speed by transforming into a Super Saiyan, which doesn't surprise Vegeta, given Future Trunks is his son. Meanwhile, Gohan carries Yajirobe, Bulma, and Baby Trunks slowly on the way to Goku. Tien, Piccolo, and Krillin arrive near North City in the mountains and decide to split up in search of Dr. Jiro's lab. Krillin proposes dividing the remaining six sensu beans among themselves, and everyone agrees. Meanwhile, Vegeta tells Future Trunks to stop following him, but Trunks insists on helping his father to fight the androids. Trunks also vows to fight Vegeta if he tries to activate the androids himself. Vegeta scoffs at the remark though, believing that a true Saiyan would be eager to face the androids upon hearing of their power. Down below, Dr. Jiro choosing a discreet approach is confident that the Z Fighters will struggle to locate his lab. Not long after, Jiro finally reaches his lab and enters the cave where it's hidden. Just before entering though, he notices Krillin watching him, though the doctor underestimates his abilities and proceeds to unlock the lab's door, claiming that even if Krillin calls for help, it'll be too late. Krillin then releases his energy, catching the attention of Piccolo, Tien, Vegeta, and Trunks. Inside the lab, Dr. Jiro expresses his reluctance to activate Android 17 and 18, but he feels compelled to do so now, hoping he's resolved the issues they previously had. Jiro activates 17 while holding his shutdown remote switch, which the android keeps an eye on, as he politely greets his master. Jiro is relieved to see that 17 appears to be functioning correctly and proceeds to activate 18 as well. To his surprise, she also displays politeness towards Jiro, but eyes the remote as well, courtesy of Android 17. 18 notices that Jiro has turned himself into an android, and the doctor briefly points out his pursuit of eternal life. Jiro then states that his creation's demeanors are a relief, as he'd been too preoccupied with their infinite energy reactor, leading to their disobedience in the past. He then informs the two that the Z Fighters are approaching and orders them to kill them all, to which they agree. As the Z Fighters attempt to breach the lab door, Android 17 seizes the opportunity to snatch the remote from Jiro, crushing it to ensure they won't be put to sleep again. Piccolo, outside the lab, hears Jiro giving orders to 17, and the group realizes with horror that the androids have now been activated. Impatient, Vegeta insists on breaking down the door. Future Trunks advises against it and suggests waiting until Goku recovers, but Vegeta disregards the warning, blasting the door and destroying it. The androids observe the Z Fighters, and Vegeta questions Future Trunks on if these are the ones they're looking for. Future Trunks confirms their identity, and as Krillin begins to wonder why they're considered a threat, Trunks warns everyone not to underestimate them. Dr. Jiro instructs Android 17 and 18 
19 to eliminate the Z Fighters, revealing that they've previously destroyed Android 19 and nearly killed him in the process. 17 questions Android 19's energy absorption abilities, and Jiro confirms it. 18 then questions if Jiro reverted to energy absorption because she and Android 17 were too powerful to control. Jiro, however, dismisses the topic and yet again orders the androids to kill the Z Fighters. 17, however, surprises Jiro by asserting that they'll kill the Z Fighters on their own terms. Jiro is shocked, and his agitation increases as Android 18 begins investigating a chamber labeled 16. She inquires about the android inside, and Jiro tells her to back off. Future Trunks is unfamiliar with Android 16, and Android 17 insists on activating him, which Jiro opposes, considering 16 a failure that could destroy the entire planet. As the androids argue amongst themselves, Krillin suggests escaping, and Vegeta tells him to leave, believing he's the only one capable of destroying the androids anyway. Android 17 boasts of having a higher power level than 16, and urges Android 18 to activate him, resulting in Jiro threatening to deactivate them all, although he's reminded that his remote was destroyed. 18 begins to flip the switch to activate Android 16, and as Dr. Jiro screams in frustration at his disobedient creations, Android 17 punches him through the chest from behind, shocking Piccolo and Krillin. As 17 rips his arm from Jiro, the doctor tries to talk to his creation, but the android decapitates him with a kick to the neck. Jiro's head rolls toward the Z Fighters, and he insults 17 as a worthless piece of junk. The android wastes no time though, as he then destroys Jiro's head, and the Z Fighters witness this gruesome scene. Android 17 insists on activating Android 16, but unwilling to give another android a chance to surface, Trunks desperately unleashes a powerful blast as a Super Saiyan, surprising the Z Fighters and destroying Jiro's lab. Amidst the destruction, Vegeta tells his son from the future that his efforts were a complete waste, as Android 17, 18, and the chamber containing Android 16 survived the blast, much to everyone's shock. 17 suggests immediately opening the chamber, and with horror, the Z Fighters watch as Android 18 kicks open the chamber, activating Android 16. 16 emerges from his chamber, appearing much taller than the other androids. Krillin expresses concern about the current situation, while future Trunks admits he's never encountered Android 16 before, and can't estimate how strong he truly is. Android 17 questions 16's feelings after being free for the first time in years, mentioning Dr. Jiro's warning that 16 would be a threat to them. Android 18 wants an explanation, but 16 remains silent. 17 playfully wonders if 16 is just a strong silent type, and then questions if his sole purpose is to kill Goku, to which 16 confirms. Although 17 and 18 hate the idea of taking orders from Dr. Jiro, they feel the need to preoccupy themselves for the time being, and decide killing Goku will be sufficient enough. They then take off into the air, leaving the Z Fighters puzzled. Although initially relieved, Krillin realizes that Goku's house is the next target for the androids. However, Vegeta is more so focused on the fact that his new enemies ignored him and took off. He then transforms into a Super Saiyan, intending to take on the androids all by himself. Trunks intervenes and tries to reason with Vegeta, urging him to wait until Goku's fully recovered, but Vegeta is stern in his decision, despite his son's warning. Vegeta explains that Goku will be his next target after he's dealt with the androids, and as Future Trunks attempts to discourage him from charging headfirst to his death, Vegeta gut punches him and takes off. Meanwhile, as the androids land on a mountain road, 17 suggests they enjoy the journey to get to Goku's house by car. 18 teases 17's human-like love for amusement, noting that he too was created from a human male. 17 attempts to relate to 16 on the matter, but the android reveals that he was made robotic from the ground up, which surprises 17. Meanwhile, Vegeta arrives in front of the trio and demands to know the android destination. 18 discloses their plan to kill Goku at his house, but Vegeta is determined to end them where they stand, although 17 and 18 are especially unfazed. 17 then states that Saiyans think too highly of themselves, and that Vegeta's pride could lead him to an early death if he's not careful. An enraged Vegeta then challenges the androids to face him, and 18 suggests 16 to fight, but he refuses. As a result, 18 herself prepares to battle Vegeta, who dismissively refers to her as a machine rather than a woman, and states he won't be going easy on 18 initiates the battle by charging at Vegeta and unleashing a fury of blows, but Vegeta manages to block them all. One of 18's punches narrowly misses Vegeta, and he grabs her arm and throws her into a nearby rock wall. Vegeta charges after her and attacks, missing a punch. 18 then blocks a knee from Vegeta, but he follows up with a punch to the face, sending her flying backwards. Meanwhile, 17 states that Vegeta is much stronger than Dr. Jiro's data indicated and is impressed with his fighting abilities. 18 and Vegeta land on the road below, and Vegeta states it's difficult to tell whether androids have taken damage or not. He then extends his arm and says that he'll just blow them to bits so he won't have to see their smiles
files again. Just then, a truck drives up behind Android 18, and the driver tells her and Vegeta to get out of the road. Vegeta then fires a key blast at 18, who jumps in the air, resulting in the blast hitting the truck, completely obliterating it along with the driver inside. Vegeta tells 18 she's quicker than he thought, but she replies that he just wasn't using his full power. Vegeta, however, retorts to say that if he did, the Earth wouldn't be able to handle it, and 18 says that she's been holding back as well. The Saiyan Prince urges her to go all out, and she agrees, then charging at Vegeta, headbutting him in the face and drawing blood. Vegeta charges at the android and punches her in the stomach. However, 18 is unaffected and knees Vegeta in the chest before knocking him into a nearby wall. Shortly after, future Trunks, Piccolo, Tien, and Krillin arrive, and Trunks inquires if Vegeta is okay. Vegeta then climbs out of the hole created by his impact and calls the four of them pests, rhetorically asking if they believe they actually stand a chance against 18. From a distance, Android 17 notices the group arrive and states that 18 can't take them all on by herself, so he'll have to lend a hand. He then inquires of 16 if he'll help, but the android says he won't. 17 playfully teases him and wonders why he was created, to which 16 states once again it's to kill Goku. 17 begins to walk toward the Z Fighters, and Future Trunks tells Vegeta that they need to run, stating his pride is no good if he dies, although Vegeta refuses once again. 18 mockingly tells Vegeta he can leave, but the Saiyan Prince states that he's about to finish her off, and that he would rather die alone than accept help from any of the Z Fighters. 17 mockingly claps at Vegeta's speech and says he's a true Saiyan Prince, but Vegeta states he doesn't need a puppet's praise. 17 then tells the other Z Fighters not to interfere with the fight between 18 and Vegeta, otherwise he'll have to step in as well. The fight resumes as 18 charges toward Vegeta, punching him in the face and sending him flying. 18 pursues, but Vegeta kicks off of a nearby rock wall and hits 18, sending her flying backwards into another one. Vegeta then quickly fires a big bang attack, and as 18 begins to emerge from the rubble, she's unable to dodge it. Vegeta then flies toward the explosion, and when the smoke clears, 18 is still standing, although her clothes appear to be damaged from the attack. Vegeta lands in front of her and notes she isn't phased at all. 18 then removes her jacket and states she didn't think any organic being could fight like Vegeta, and questions if Goku is even stronger. Vegeta of course replies that he's not, prompting 18 to state she doesn't have to worry about either of them then, infuriating Vegeta. The Saiyan attempts to attack 18 from the side, but she blocks it, as well as a fury of additional attacks from him. Tien on the sidelines roots for Vegeta, while the rest of the Z Fighters watch silently, impressed. Android 17 seems amused by the battle, and Future Trunks is surprised at his father's strength, noting that he can hold his own against Android 18. However, Piccolo doesn't share Trunks' optimism, and says that Vegeta will be killed, which surprises Trunks and Krillin. Piccolo says that Vegeta is losing stamina, while 18's power remains seemingly infinite, and just then, 18 manages to sweep Vegeta's legs and punches him in the face as he attempts to get up, angering Trunks in the distance. She then follows this up with a kick to Vegeta's left arm and breaks it in the process. Seeing this, Trunks is enraged and turns Super Saiyan, attempting to fly toward the battle to help his father. Piccolo angrily calls him an idiot, and 17 chases after him, just as he had promised to those who intervened. Seeing this, Piccolo and Tien fly toward the battle as well. 18 notices future Trunks approaching and blocks his sword strike. Trunks is then hit in the back by Android 17 and collapses to the ground. Krillin, watching the battle from afar, is stunned that a Super Saiyan was defeated in one shot. Android 17 then notices Piccolo coming toward him and kicks the Namekian in midair, then flies up to Tien and puts him in a headlock. Having gotten back up, Vegeta attempts to fly toward 17 and Tien, but 18 grabs his foot. As 17 chokes Tien, Trunks gets up and runs toward 18, who swings Vegeta into him, sending them both to the ground. Piccolo gets up and is surprised to see two Super Saiyans down, and then notices 17 still choking Tien. The Namekia dashes towards 17, who lets Tien fall, dodges Piccolo's punch, then delivers a strong blow to his chest. Still standing frozen, Krillin watches in horror as 17 lets Piccolo fall. Vegeta attempts a sneak attack by firing a key blast at 18 with his good arm, but she dodges the blast and flies over to Vegeta. She punches him in the face, sending him to the ground again, and Vegeta tries to get back up, only to be kicked by Android 18 in the stomach, rolling him on his back. 18 then states as extra insurance, she'll break Vegeta's other arm too. She puts the heel of her boot on Vegeta's good arm and pushes down, breaking it as the Saiyan yells in pain and loses consciousness. 17 notes that Vegeta's hair has changed and his glow is gone, and 18 notes the same of Future Trunks. 17 then wonders who Future Trunks is as they have no data on him, but he quickly says it doesn't matter. He and 18 then fly back to the road and land near Krillin, frightening him. 17 tells him that the others are still alive and that he should feed them
them some sensu beans right away. He then tells a speechless Krillin that they'll fight the Z Fighters again whenever they feel up to it. 17 turns to leave, and 18 wonders if he'll inquire about Goku's location, although 17 states it'll be more fun to find him on their own, and says that maybe even Goku will look for them. The pair then meet up with Android 16, who's still nearby, looking off into the distance. 17 wonders what he's looking at, and 16 simply states that the birds flew away because they were too noisy. 17 seems confused by this, and 18 suggests they fly to somewhere where more cars will pass by. Krillin in the distance watches all of this, still stunned at all he recently witnessed. The androids decide to head to the nearest town or village, but before they leave, Krillin rushes to catch up with them, asking them to wait. 17 questions his intentions, and Krillin questions whether they only want to kill Goku or take over the world. 17 clarifies that their current goal is to eliminate Goku, and that they'll decide what to do afterward. Krillin wonders why they want to kill Goku, pointing out that it was Dr. Jiro who held the grudge against him in the first place. However, 17 explains that Goku is the Earth's strongest being, and their actions are merely a game, which is why they didn't bother asking Krillin about Goku's whereabouts. Krillin then questions if they would spare Goku if he begged for his life, but Android 16 responds that their purpose is to kill Goku, so they wouldn't be swayed even if he pleaded. 17 again tells Krillin to get the sensu beans to his friends before they die, but before leaving, 18 surprises Krillin with a kiss on his cheek, and the androids depart. Krillin snaps out of it and provides sensu beans to Piccolo, Tien, Future Trunks, and Vegeta. Piccolo is amazed that the androids knew about sensu beans, and Tien wonders why the androids spared them instead of finishing them off. Piccolo speculates that the androids didn't see them as a significant threat and acknowledges their strength, while Vegeta is visibly upset and flies off without explanation. Piccolo advises the others not to follow him, understanding that it'd be more of a blow to his pride. Krillin apologizes for not being much help during the fight, but Piccolo cuts him some slack, believing that it wouldn't have made a difference anyway. Tien then adds that even with Goku, they don't stand much of a chance as he isn't much stronger than Trunks and Vegeta. Trunks then reveals that the androids in this timeline are stronger than the ones in his timeline, stating that they had such devastating physical strength, it was hard for him to stand up to them. As the group plan to move Goku to a safer location, Krillin questions Piccolo about his intentions and urges him to share his plan as their friends. However, Piccolo angrily responds that he doesn't consider them friends and that he still harbors his sinister intentions to take over the world. He then unexpectedly flies off, surprising Tien, who thought Piccolo had changed. Krillin, however, calls Piccolo's bluff and figures the Namekian is secretly strategizing. Tien inquires for clarification, and Krillin suggests that Piccolo may be heading to the lookout to fuse with Kami, a move that he wouldn't make unless he truly had no other choice, given his hatred for Kami. Tien notes that the Dragon Balls would likely vanish if either Piccolo or Kami dies, but Krillin points out that they would disappear anyway if the androids succeed in their plans. Trunks questions Vegeta's intentions, nearly calling him dad, prompting Krillin to reveal that everyone except Vegeta knows Trunks' true identity. Tien speculates that Vegeta isn't the type to run from battle and will likely devise a new powerful attack to take on the androids, and meanwhile, Vegeta flies through the mountains, vowing to take the androids on himself. As Krillin, Tien, and Trunks head to Goku's house, Krillin questions the expected recovery time for Goku, and Trunks estimates it could be as little as 10 days. Krillin believes they can remain hidden during that period, and feels relief that the androids don't have some sort of tracker to locate Goku. Meanwhile at Goku's house, Chi Chi frantically searches for the heart medicine to aid her husband and eventually finds it. Yamcha administers the medicine to Goku, and he shows signs of improvement, much to their relief. Chi Chi then questions Gohan's whereabouts, and Yamcha nervously claims that he must be out playing somewhere. Meanwhile, Piccolo reaches Korin's tower and ascends, observed by Korin. Above, Kami and Mr. Popo sense Piccolo's energy and witness him arrive, donning a new cape and turban before landing. Upon landing at the lookout, Piccolo glares angrily at Kami, who returns the same intense gaze while Mr. Popo watches anxiously. Piccolo hints that Kami probably knows why he's here, and Kami acknowledges that his thoughts are easy to discern, given he and Piccolo's father were once a merged being long ago. Kami states he never imagined a day would come when they would be reunited, to which Piccolo retorts that this fusion won't result in equality. He explains that it's merely a means to make him stronger, and Kami's only purpose as of now is making sure the Dragon Balls stay active. Mr. Popo attempts to intervene, but Kami stops him, admitting that Piccolo is right, as he feels powerless against the androids, even so with Goku's eventual recovery. Reluctantly, Kami agrees to fuse with Piccolo, but insists on waiting for some time to see how events play out. This angers Piccolo, as he demands to know the reason for the delay. Kami explains that he wants to be sure if the androids pose a threat to the Earth. Piccolo argues that the recent battle is evidence enough, but Kami counters, blaming the Z Fighters for starting it. Piccolo reminds him of the androids' destruction in Future Trunks' timeline, but Kami believes these androids are different. Piccolo calls Kami a coward and declares 
he'll remain at the lookout until he changes his mind, but the damage done to Earth may be irreversible upon his final decision. Meanwhile in the northern mountains, the androids spot a Lucky Foods van on the road. When the van stops, the androids approach and the workers become frightened as Android 16 lifts and empties the entire van. The androids then leave, with 17 planning to head to Goku's house. However, 18 insists on getting new clothes first, and 17 agrees to accommodate her request. Tien decides to check in with Chaozu first, but promises to return before things escalate with the androids, although he doubts he'll be much help. Krillin suggests moving Goku to Kame House to avoid approaching the androids, and Future Trunks wonders why history has changed so drastically. They arrive at Goku's house, and Krillin questions if the androids are really as bad as they're made out to be, as he thinks about his kiss from Android 18 on the road. Chi Chi opens the door, curious about Future Trunks' identity, but Yamcha comes around the corner, happy to see his friends alive. Krillin then questions Goku's condition, and Yamcha reveals that he's administered the medicine to the Saiyan and that he's asleep. Krillin then tells Yamcha and Chi Chi that they need to move Goku to safety, as there are three additional androids who are coming this way, and are even stronger than numbers 19 and 20. The group then decides to transport Goku in a capsule plane and wait for Gohan. When Gohan arrives, he questions the situation, and Krillin promises to explain everything during the flight. While traveling on the airplane to Kame House, Krillin informs Yamcha, Gohan, and Chi Chi about the immense power of the new androids, stating that they consider killing Goku a mere game to them. Concerned, Yamcha inquires of a plan of action, but Krillin admits he's uncertain. Trunks proposes going further back in time to destroy the androids before their activation, as they now know the location of Dr. Jiro's lab. Yamcha finds this plan reasonable, but Krillin worries that Trunks may not have enough energy to return to his own timeline afterward. Gohan wonders if the current androids will disappear if the past is altered, but Future Trunks clarifies that only the timeline he travels to would be affected, creating new futures. Krillin and Yamcha then question Trunks' trip to their timeline, and he explains that he was settling for seeking the android's weakness to use in his own time, or trying to bring Goku to his timeline to finish the androids himself. He acknowledges that this timeline is different from his own, and Gohan questions why things have changed so much. Future Trunks admits he doesn't know, but Chi Chi reassures him that his journey has saved Goku's life, and they all believe that things will work out for the best. Meanwhile, Vegeta, still fuming over his defeat at the hands of 18, stands alone in the mountains. Transforming into a Super Saiyan, he unleashes his power and destroys nearby rock formations, questioning how he, a Super Saiyan, could be defeated by the likes of androids so casually. After a moment of reflection though, Vegeta snaps out of his self-loathing and vows to surpass each and every one of the androids and defeat Goku once they're taken care of. In another scene, the androids continue driving in the Lucky Foods van. 18 questions 17 if he knows the location of Goku's house, and he replies that they'll find it eventually. 16 chimes in with coordinates, suggesting that they can get there quickly by flying, and while 18 agrees with this approach, 17 insists on taking the scenic route, finding joy in the lack of productivity. Back on the capsule airplane, Krillin is tasked with calling Balma to update her on the situation. Krillin expresses reluctance, mentioning the future Trunks that his mother tends to be harsh with people. Trunks confirms that she's the same way in the future, and Krillin calls Bulma, who immediately reprimands him for not calling sooner. Bulma then questions if Future Trunks is present, to which Krillin confirms, and Bulma requests to speak with him. She informs Trunks that a farmer discovered a peculiar capsule corporation vehicle in the wilderness, seeking help to operate it. The company couldn't identify the vehicle based on the farmer's description, so they asked for a photo. To Future Trunks' shock, the photo was described to be his time machine, damaged and covered in moss. He recounts that there was only one time machine made in the future though, and his Bulma barely managed to construct that. Present Bulma then decides to fax the picture to Future Trunks for further examination, and he's shocked to see it's as she says, his exact time machine, duplicated, damaged, and in the middle of nowhere. Trunks inquires for the machine's exact location, and Bulma states she doesn't know the precise area, but she provides the approximate coordinates. Eager to witness it himself, Future Trunks decides to go, with Bulma agreeing to meet him there since it's near Capsule Corp. Yamcha questions if there's really only one time machine, and Future Trunks confirms there is. Gohan offers to accompany Trunks as well, and he happily accepts. During their flight to meet Bulma, Gohan questions the devastation in Future Trunks' world. Trunks explains the dire situation, with a decimated population, destroyed West City, and people forced to live in underground shelters. Gohan hopes they can discover the android's weakness, and Future Trunks speculates that Dr. Jiro might have a way to control them using an emergency shutoff switch. Upon arriving at the specified location, Gohan scouts the area and finds the time machine. Bulma then arrives, and Future Trunks presents presents his time machine to her and reveals that she had only made one of them in the future. He then uncovers a message his Bulma left on the second time machine reading Hope, and he and Gohan inspect the machine and notice a melted cockpit window, suggesting something powerful was inside. The group then finds some sort of eggshell in the time machine, and Trunks falls silent as
as Gohan deduces whatever made the hole could have potentially came out of the egg. Future Trunks then turns the time machine on and learns whatever traveled here came from age 788, three years after he left. The machine had been present for four years, meaning when Future Trunks arrived to meet Goku and the others, it had already been around for a full year, leading him to wonder if this event was the cause of the significant changes in history. Meanwhile, Kami becomes agitated while observing from the lookout, and Piccolo mocks him for spying, mentioning they'll be fusing soon. Kami expresses concern about what came from the time machine, hinting at a powerful creature on Earth that surpasses even the androids. Piccolo demands an explanation, and Kami states that fusing may be the only hope for the upcoming crisis. Meanwhile, Future Trunks explains that they can't leave the second time machine in its current state, so he compresses it into a capsule and does the same with his own time machine. Bulma takes the eggshell they found in the time machine, and Gohan informs her that they're headed to Kame House because the androids are after Goku, who's still recovering. Bulma wonders why they don't just gang up to defeat the androids, but Future Trunks reveals that the androids already defeated them. Bulma questions if Vegeta came out alright, and Trunks informs her that he's okay thanks to the Sensu, but went out on his own, unwilling to work with anyone else. Suddenly, Gohan notices something strange in the distance and calls Bulma and Future Trunks over. Upon arriving at Gohan's location, they find a giant husk resembling a molting insect. Future Trunks speculates that the insect hatched from the egg in the time machine, and the gooey husk indicates that it molted recently. This discovery makes the group uneasy, and they decide to leave to investigate elsewhere. Although Bulma decides to head home, Trunks then asking himself what's going on, as none of the events taking place make any sense. Meanwhile, the androids stop at a town, where 18 tries on some clothes and leaves without paying. The androids get noticed by the police and engage in a high-speed chase, but 18 rips the engine out of the police car, sending the occupants crashing down a plateau. Meanwhile at the lookout, Kami becomes nervous and Piccolo questions the connection between this event and the time machine Kami mentioned earlier. At the same time, Bulma hears a news report about Ginger Town, where all contact has been lost and the residents have mysteriously disappeared. Bulma realizes that Ginger Town is close to where they found the second time machine, adding to the Z Fighter's growing concerns. Concerned about the alarming news broadcast she's witnessing, Bulma contacts Kame House from her airplane. Krillin answers and informs her that Gohan and Trunks haven't returned yet, and Bulma instructs Krillin to turn their television to channel 872. Krillin, Yamcha, and Master Roshi follow her instructions and watch a report about the people of Ginger Town, whose clothes were found abandoned. The report indicates that the entire population has vanished, apparently after a struggle with something. Krillin suspects the androids are responsible, but Bulma disagrees, deciding to wait for Gohan and Trunks to provide more information upon their return. Soon after, Gohan and Trunks come back and join the group and notice they're laser focused on the news broadcast. They witness police officers shooting at an unseen threat in the background. However, the shooting stops abruptly as the cameraman appears terrified, desperately calling for help between channels before the signal cuts out. At the lookout, Piccolo questions Kami about what he sees on Earth. Kami responds cryptically, suggesting that Piccolo will understand once they merge. Surprised by Kami's willingness, Piccolo is eager to fuse, but emphasizes that he'll become the dominant mind in their merger. Kami agrees and offers to grant Piccolo his power and knowledge, although Mr. Popo is hesitant, unwilling to lose his friend of many years. Kami asserts that the Earth isn't in need of a god at this point, but a strong warrior, and Piccolo has changed drastically over the years, casting out the evil from his heart. Kami thanks Mr. Popo for all he's done for him, and he and Piccolo fuse, creating a magnificent explosion of light. Now a new being, the fused Namekian declares that he is neither Piccolo nor Kami, but a Namekian who's forgotten his original name. Back at Kame House, Future Trunks believes that the creature hatched from the egg they found is responsible for the problems in Ginger Town, and decides to go and investigate. Gohan insists on joining him, leading to objections from Chi-Chi. However, Future Trunks persuades them to stay behind and protect Goku from the androids, assuring them that he can handle the situation. Meanwhile, Piccolo arrives in an empty Ginger Town and quickly spots the mysterious creature, which he refers to as the monster he's been wondering about. However, the bug-like monster's initial key emanates a power that surprises Piccolo. While the monster has the richest man in Ginger Town captive, the man pleads for Piccolo's assistance, offering him anything in return. Piccolo refuses to be swayed by the man's offer, but stands firm, stating that every life holds value, even if it's as worthless as his. He commands the monster to release the man, and it seemingly obeys by letting him go. However, the monster suddenly impales the man with his tail and absorbs him, leaving Piccolo shocked and disturbed. In the aftermath, the monster makes a chilling revelation, speaking Piccolo's name and surprising the Namekian. The monster then powers up immensely and claims to be Piccolo's brother. Meanwhile at Kame House, Future Trunks, Gohan, Yamcha, and Krillin sense the monster's energy 
energy and are taken aback. They recognize elements of various familiar energies, including Frieza, King Cold, Goku, Piccolo, and even Vegeta. Despite the confusion, Trunks still decides to head to Ginger Town to investigate, as he's curious about what kind of villain they're dealing with. Elsewhere, Vegeta, Tien, and Chaozu also sense the monster's presence and wonder about the situation. Back at Ginger Town, Piccolo demands answers from the creature about his identity and intentions, although it states he doesn't need to know such things. As tensions rise, Piccolo asserts that he will defeat the monster, even if he remains ignorant of his foe's past. However, the creature remains undeterred, and Piccolo tells him that he's got the wrong person, as the two engage in a confrontation with their powers on full display. The creature questions if he's actually got the wrong person, and Piccolo tells him he's catching on. As Krillin and Trunks fly toward Ginger Town, Trunks senses another powerful key, but doesn't know who it belongs to. Krillin quickly recognizes it as Piccolo's, and state that he must have finally merged with Kami. Trunks is surprised, then noting the difference made by the fusion and thinking to himself how he never dreamed Piccolo would become so powerful. Back in Ginger Town, Piccolo says it's convenient that the monster killed all of the residents already, as now he doesn't have to hold back. He then hits the monster with a massive key blast and creates an explosion within the city, shocking future Trunks and Krillin who feel the shockwave in the distance. Trunks wonders what happened, and Krillin notes that the battle must have begun. Meanwhile, the androids are out driving when 17 suddenly stops the car. He and 18 get out, and 17 wonders if she felt a huge shudder in the air. 18 says that she did, and 16 says it came from the outskirts of West City. He then says that two powerful key are fighting, prompting 17 to ask why 16 never told them he was equipped it with sensors. 16, however, replies that he never asked. 17 questions who's fighting, but 16 states he doesn't know, as neither of them are in his databanks. He goes on to say, though, that one of them rivals 17 and 18 in power, which shocks the two. Unwilling to accept the statement, 17 says that 16 sensors are malfunctioning, as no one rivals him in power, and the androids decide to continue onward. Back at Ginger Town, Piccolo charges at the monster. The creature swipes at Piccolo and misses, and Piccolo kicks him in the back. The creature lands and regains his composure, but Piccolo quickly kicks him into the air once again. When the creature lands, Piccolo questions if that's all he's got, and he says that Piccolo isn't a bad fighter, but he hasn't yet reached his perfect form. Piccolo wonders if that's why the creature's been attacking people, and the monster confirms that he's been extracting their lives for energy. Piccolo then angrily demands to know who sent him in the time machine, and the monster reveals that he sent himself after reverting to his egg form due to the machine's small size. He then states his surprise that Piccolo knew about the time machine, but says that he won't be able to anticipate his next move. The monster then begins to do a Kamehameha, shocking Piccolo when he recognizes the stance. As the creature readies itself to unleash a Kamehameha attack, Piccolo is taken aback, puzzled by how it's familiar with the technique. Without warning, the creature releases the energy blast, catching Piccolo off guard as he witnesses the authentic attack. Piccolo evades the attack by leaping into the air, but unexpectedly, the creature surprises Piccolo with an ambush, ensnaring him from behind and immobilizing his limbs. With a sinister tone, the creature claims victory and thrusts its tail towards Piccolo's chest, but he manages to move slightly and the tail pierces the Namekian's arm, sapping his energy. Before the situation worsens, Piccolo headbutts the creature and breaks free. However, his left arm is now withered and useless, much to the creature's satisfaction. The creature taunts Piccolo, asserting that a single arm won't be sufficient enough to defeat it, and Piccolo agrees, admitting his inability to win in his current state, and acknowledges the creature's victory. The creature then announces that it'll soon complete its evolution by absorbing Piccolo's life force, but seeking closure, Piccolo implores the creature to reveal its origins, more specifically how it possesses Goku and Frieza's abilities and the Kamehameha technique. Yielding to Piccolo's final wish, the creature discloses its identity as Cell, an artificial life form created by Dr. Jiro's computer. Cell's creation involved the fusion of cells from renowned fighters, including Goku, Piccolo, and Vegeta, obtained three years prior. Cell explains the gaps in his power, attributing them to the age of Goku's cells used. He elaborates on his composition, mentioning samples taken from Frieza and King Cold, but excluding future trunks due to an ample supply of Saiyan cells already. Piccolo questions how the cells were collected, and Cell recounts the method through small spy robots, pointing out one in real time that Piccolo angrily destroys. Unfazed, Cell states that destroying the spy robot meant nothing, as the research is well underway, but won't be completed for another 24 years in the future. Piccolo states it's impossible, as Jiro's lab was destroyed, but Cell reveals the computer compiling the data resides in an underground bunker beneath the lab itself. Piccolo questions why Cell waited three years after arriving to go from an egg to his current state, and he clarifies it was essential for his mutation. Just about ready to absorb 
of the Namekian, Piccolo inquires on one last thing concerning Cell's motive for traveling through time. Cell then reveals his pursuit of Androids 17 and 18 for assimilation into his perfect form, a quest interrupted by future Trunks in his timeline as the Saiyan had defeated 17 and 18. In Cell's timeline, he killed future Trunks and stole his time machine to journey to the past where Trunks had already set coordinates, answering Piccolo's question on why Cell chose to come to their era. Piccolo, grasping the situation, theorizes that Trunks intended to return and let everyone know that he defeated the androids, but he was killed before he could do so. Cell then discloses his ambition for unparalleled power upon completion, emphasizing his role as the most powerful entity in the universe. Piccolo expresses gratitude for the revelations, then suddenly rips off his arm, swiftly regenerating a fresh one, leaving Cell astounded. Cell realizes that the questions were a ruse to stall him, to which Piccolo reminds the monster of his regenerative abilities and states that he won't allow him to reach his perfect form. Cell, while impressed by Piccolo's tactics, realizes he fell for the Namekian's clever ploy. Piccolo reveals that the idea came from Kami's mind, indicating that Kami and Piccolo have fused once again, explaining Piccolo's enhanced power. Additionally, Cell deduces that the fusion has turned the Dragon Balls to stone, rendering them useless for revival purposes. Suddenly, Krillin and future Trunks arrive at the scene, observing the monstrous Cell with shock. Trunks recalls the egg he discovered earlier, which must have hatched into Cell. Cell realizes that Trunks must have used the time machine to travel to this era as well. However, he vows to kill him again, just as he did once in the future. As Krillin and Trunks get a closer look at Cell's face, they're shocked. Krillin questions if Cell was responsible for the massacre in Gingertown, a fact confirmed by Piccolo. Krillin questions the familiarity of Goku's energy in Cell, which Piccolo states he'll explain later, as killing Cell is all that matters right now. Although Cell states that defeating him won't be so easy, Piccolo asserts that the monster doesn't stand a chance of beating them, especially with his weaker version of Goku's Kamehameha. Krillin's shocked to learn that Cell can perform the technique, and the monster confirms, calling Krillin by name and stating he could probably create a spirit bomb as well. Surprised, Krillin wonders how Cell knows his name and states Goku will be surprised when he hears about this, piquing the monster's interest as he wasn't aware Goku was still alive in this timeline. Cell then exclaims that he'll do whatever it takes to absorb Android 17 and 18, and if Piccolo's the best chance Earth has for survival, they have no hope of winning. Cell then unexpectedly triggers a solar flare, blinding his opponents and making his getaway. Confused, Piccolo says he thought the solar flare was Tien's technique, but Krillin tells him it's not hard to pull off and that he and Goku can do it too. Although Piccolo pursues, Cell reduces his key to avoid detection. As Cell moves through the woodland area, he states his plans to absorb more humans for their bio energy, thus giving him enough power to defeat 17 and 18 and force them to merge with him. Additionally, Cell expresses his past concerns with Dr. Giro's shutdown switch, but states that he doesn't need to worry about it anymore as the switch no longer exists. Soon after, he notices Vegeta flying toward the location he just left and hides. Surprised that the Saiyan hasn't been killed by 17 and 18, Cell figures he should hasten his plans to absorb civilians, especially considering Vegeta was stronger than he expected. Vegeta, who had noticed the rising key in the distance, decided to check out the situation. He notes that one of the two high battle powers he sent had suddenly disappeared, but one of them were still on the scene. He questions whether the power could belong to one of the androids, but then says it couldn't be, as they didn't have a presence at all. Meanwhile, Piccolo powers up in anger as Cell managed to slip through his fingers. Krillin and Trunks marvel at Piccolo's amazing power, and Vegeta then appears, shocked as well, and powers down to his base form. As Vegeta descends to meet the group, he demands an answer to what happened moments ago. Piccolo offers to explain to everyone once Tien arrives, and while they wait, Vegeta questions how Piccolo increased his battle power so drastically in such a short amount of time. Trunks reveals he merged with Kami to become stronger, and Vegeta thinks to himself, stating how Piccolo's power surpassed his own, even as a Super Saiyan. Piccolo, meanwhile, tries to think of a strategy, as he knows the combined power of Android 16, 17, and 18 will be too much for him to handle alone. As Tien lands, Piccolo then explains everything he knows about the situation at hand and about Cell himself, shocking the group. Meanwhile, Cell arrives in a town, declaring to surpass the strength of 17 and 18 in a few days and absorb them both. Piccolo concludes his explanation to the group, then states that their options are to find Cell and kill him or track down 17 and 18 and kill them instead. As the group sit in shock given everything they've just heard, Vegeta thinks to himself that the strength of the Super Saiyans are being left in the dust, referencing Goku, who's still shown to be in recovery. Cell's escape prompts Krillin to wonder how they'll be able to defeat him, while Trunks raises concerns about Cell attacking innocents while suppressing his key. Tien emphasizes the need to stop Cell's fusion with Android 17 
17 and 18. And Piccolo points out that if Cell were to become perfect, it would mean the destruction of other worlds as well, given he's got Frieza and King Cold's DNA in him. Vegeta then suggests a controversial plan, allowing Cell to merge with the androids to save him the trouble of tracking them all down. Piccolo counters Vegeta's arrogance by reminding him of his past failure against the androids. This angers the Saiyan though, leading him to declare his intent to surpass the level of a Super Saiyan and threatening Piccolo. Vegeta departs, leaving Piccolo pondering whether going beyond Super Saiyan is really possible. Krillin questions future Trunks about altering the timeline by eliminating the androids in the past, but Trunks states that it'd be ineffective as it would help the future of that era, but it wouldn't affect them here. However, he proposes destroying Dr. Jiro's lab in the present to prevent a new Cell from emerging. Piccolo assigns this task to Krillin and Trunks while he and Tien hunt down Cell, and the two take off, Trunks thinking to himself if going beyond Super Saiyan is actually possible. The pair locate the lab's basement, discovering Dr. Jiro's supercomputer and Cell in a larval state. Just as Krillin prepares to destroy the basement, Future Trunks stumbles upon blueprints for Android 17. He keeps the blueprints for his mother with the hope that she'll be able to find a weakness in the androids and destroys the lab with Krillin. Future Trunks tells Krillin to deliver the blueprints to Bulma, explaining his plan to train with Vegeta despite expecting refusal. Trunks believes Vegeta will realize the benefits of collaborative training over training alone, and although Krillin's skeptical, he wishes Trunks the best of luck as he flies off to deliver the blueprints. Meanwhile, Tien senses a minor energy disturbance, prompting him and Piccolo to investigate a nearby town. They find a deserted city with abandoned clothes, indicating Cell's recent attack. Cell, concealed on a nearby rooftop, deems their pursuit futile, and at Capsule Corporation, Bulma and Dr. Brief analyze the blueprints provided by Krillin. Bulma explains that the androids are primarily bioorganic, with minimal cybernetic components, a fact Cell believes makes fusion feasible. She suggests that the cybernetic parts may hold the key to the android's vulnerability, and she and Dr. Brief get to work as quickly as possible. Three days pass before Cell strikes the South District. Learning of the attack, Yamcha, Gohan, Krillin, Tien, and Piccolo opt for inconspicuous travel by plane to avoid arousing suspicion by Cell. Meanwhile, Chi-Chi walks in on Goku, who's now fully recovered and starts to get dressed, preparing for battle and up to date on the current situation thanks to the collective discussions he heard in his dreams. Despite Chi-Chi's protests, Goku reassures her that he won't immediately engage in battle, reserving his strength to push himself even further to a level beyond Super Saiyan. Master Roshi questions Goku on whether surpassing the Super Saiyan threshold is actually possible. In response, Goku confesses his uncertainty, revealing his intention to train for a whole year in order to power up. This idea prompts Master Roshi to question the availability of a year's time, and Goku discloses his knowledge of a location where a year's training can be condensed into a single day, then seeking Chi-Chi's permission to bring Gohan along. Chi-Chi conveys her initial thought to decline, but concedes that Goku would just do it anyway. Goku departs via instant transmission and joins the other Z fighters on the aircraft. It's a happy reunion, yet Goku conveys his realization that at his current power level, he isn't strong enough to defeat the androids or Cell. He announces his plan to train with Gohan for a year within a single day, referencing the hyperbolic time chamber. Piccolo recognizes the challenge this presents, considering Goku's struggle as a kid to last even a month in the chamber. Nonetheless, Goku decides to include Vegeta and future Trunks in the training as well, figuring they can handle it too. When questioned about his emotions regarding foes stronger than Frieza, Goku admits to being both scared and excited for the fight. He and Gohan then teleport away, leaving Krillin and Tien optimistic considering Goku's demeanor. Goku and Gohan then appear where Vegeta and future Trunks are training. Arriving at the scene, they find Trunks sitting while Vegeta stands alone on a ledge. Trunks reveals his father's refusal to train with him, perceiving him as nothing but a nuisance. He reveals that Vegeta's been doing nothing but standing still for the past three days, prompting Goku to state that he's thinking over his battle strategy. Goku introduces the concept of the hyperbolic time chamber to Vegeta, who agrees to answer with future Trunks on the condition that he gets to use it first, and Goku readily accepts. Meanwhile, the androids search for Goku at his house, but find no one's there. Seventeen consults Sixteen for potential locations, and narrows it down to Capsule Corporation or Kame House. Opting for the closer option, 16 states it would be Kame House, and the group decides to head there. At the lookout, Mr. Popo guides the Z Fighters to the hyperbolic time chamber. Vegeta questions Goku's motive for introducing him to this place, given Vegeta's long-term plan to kill him. Goku, however, justifies the necessity of teamwork against their current foes, and Vegeta expresses he might come to regret this decision, but enters the time chamber with Trunks. Inside, Trunks notes the environment is hot, with thin air and high gravity gravity, while Vegeta views the conditions as the perfect setting for their training. Trunks questions whether he'll be able to spend an entire year under these conditions with Vegeta, and meanwhile, Piccolo, Yamcha, 
Tien, and Krillin continue their search for Cell, who's masked his energy once more, proving their aircraft method to be useless. Piccolo acknowledges that Cell's strength has probably grown much higher in the past few days, and states the need for the Saiyans to transcend their Super Saiyan forms in order to defeat the androids. A day passes, and Piccolo monitors news of Cell's attacks on TV, growing increasingly agitated. Suddenly, he hears something outside, and is surprised to see the androids standing outside of Kame House. 16 confirms Goku's absence, and Piccolo wakes the others, leading 17 to demand Goku's whereabouts. Undeterred, Piccolo states he won't give up that information, and challenges 17, suggesting an uninhabited island as their battleground. As Piccolo and the androids depart, Krillin hopes that Piccolo can hold out until the Saiyans return, and meanwhile, 17 asserts to killing Piccolo this time if he doesn't give him answers, while the Namekian assures 17 he won't be so easy to defeat this time around. 17 ponders the reason behind Piccolo's actions, speculating that it might be a tactic to stall for time. He then challenges Piccolo, goading him to bring on his best effort. Piccolo is taken aback by 17's willingness to fight alone, and 17 asserts that Piccolo is no match for him in any case. Despite this, Piccolo sees an opportunity in this situation. Even defeating one of the androids would hinder Cell's progression into perfection. With determination, Piccolo intensifies his energy, prompting a surprised reaction from number 16, who remarks that this transformation isn't characteristic of Piccolo at all. Capitalizing on the element of surprise, Piccolo swiftly maneuvers to strike 17 from behind with an elbow, sending him hurtling through the air. Piccolo pursues and delivers a forceful kick, driving the android into the ground. As 17 begins to rise, Piccolo without hesitation readies and fires a powerful blast, detonating a substantial portion of the island. Unfortunately, 17 manages to evade the attack, taking refuge high in the sky. Piccolo spots his opponent and grins deviously, then prepares another offensive move. At the lookout, Goku notices Piccolo's fight and Gohan questions if he's facing Cell. Goku responds that he can't sense their energy, implying that Piccolo's adversary is one of the androids. Gohan expresses concern for Piccolo's safety and intends to rush to his aid, but Goku advises against it, citing the impending arrival of Vegeta and Trunks, who are undergoing training. Goku attests to Piccolo's newfound strength, and meanwhile, Piccolo shoots a bunch of key blasts, surrounding 17 with small energy orbs, directing them all at once toward his target, resulting in a massive detonation. In the distance, Krillin, Tien, Chi Chi, and Master Roshi witness the explosion. However, when the smoke dissipates, it becomes evident that 17 used a protective barrier to shield himself. Piccolo displays mild frustration at this outcome, and 17 suggests relocating due to the island's destruction. Simultaneously, Cell wreaks havoc on an office building, detecting a potent key signature, Piccolo's. He deduces that Piccolo must be battling one of the androids, as he's using a lot of energy. Cell then declares his intention to reach them promptly, confident that his strength has already surpassed theirs. 17 acknowledges Piccolo's impressive strength, despite not being an android, stating he really isn't the same Piccolo he fought before. However, 17 states his primary concern is locating Goku, and he still wants his location. Piccolo, however, remains silent about Goku's whereabouts, prompting 17 to declare his intent to keep fighting until Piccolo changes his mind. He emphasizes getting serious, and as 17 approaches, Piccolo readies himself with a brief surge of energy. 17 strikes Piccolo's face, and Piccolo counters with a swipe, which 17 evades by ducking and subsequently landing a forceful blow to Piccolo's stomach. A swift elbow to Piccolo's neck sends him to the ground, but Piccolo swiftly rises and backflips to evade a sweeping kick from 17. Piccolo cracks his neck and states 17's speed is pretty good, but critiques his punches, stating they have no power. This declaration surprises 17, who finds it hard to believe that a comment like this is directed at him, who's regarded as the mightiest in history. 17 charges at Piccolo, who attempts a chop, but the android leaps over it, positioning himself behind Piccolo. An aerial assault follows, culminating in a blow to Piccolo's back. In response, Piccolo executes a forceful back kick. 17's punch propels Piccolo backward, but he promptly performs a flip to headbutt 17. The impact sends the android airborne, though he manages to stabilize himself, leading to a momentary break in the combat. Android 18 states the two are evenly matched, and both fighters exchange several blows. Meanwhile, Cell approaches in flight, proclaiming that the awaited day for him to attain his perfect form has finally arrived. At Kame House, Krillin, Master Roshi, and Tien observe the ongoing battle from outside. Krillin expresses admiration for Piccolo's performance, while Tien feels frustrated that they can't help him. Suddenly, Krillin senses an approaching presence, which Tien identifies as Cell. Chi-Chi joins them outside and informs Krillin that Bulma is on the phone, revealing that she's identified a weakness in the androids. Bulma informs Krillin that both 17 and 18 were designed with an emergency shutoff switch. If their movement can be halted, they can become vulnerable 
vulnerable to destruction, and luckily enough, Bulma was able to replicate the device. Krillin urges Bulma to bring the controller immediately, considering Piccolo's ongoing battle. Bulma agrees, and Tien sees potential in the situation, although Krillin remains uncertain about the prospect of destroying the androids. Meanwhile at the lookout, Gohan informs his father about Cell's movement, though Goku is already aware. Goku privately hopes for Vegeta's swift progress, believing that Vegeta should have already surpassed the Super Saiyan barrier. Meanwhile, Seventeen kicks Piccolo in the face, prompting Piccolo to retaliate with a blast, and they briefly disengage. As Piccolo catches his breath, Seventeen acknowledges their equal power, but states the difference in their endurance is becoming apparent. Seventeen asserts his inexhaustible energy, but suddenly, Piccolo is overcome with distress, as Cell has arrived on the scene. Piccolo gets upset as he realizes Cell's presence, which had gone unnoticed due to his intense focus on the fight with Seventeen. Seventeen expresses curiosity about the unfamiliar figure, prompting Piccolo surprise at the android's lack of knowledge regarding Cell. Cell asserts that this is the day he will finally merge with number 17 and 18, achieving his coveted perfect form. He gazes at the androids, recognizing 17 and 18. Although unfamiliar with the third individual, Cell identifies him as one of Dr. Giro's other creations due to the red ribbon army emblem on his chest. However, Cell dismisses the older model as inconsequential, deeming him irrelevant. Descending from his perch on the rocks, Cell commences a power-up, resulting in a destructive explosion that engulfs the surroundings. Stunned, Piccolo remains motionless, unable to intervene as Cell walks past him, brimming with the energy of his victims. Piccolo finally questions the toll of lives sacrificed for Cell's formidable power, to which Cell retorts that they should feel honored to contribute to his strength. Amid the chaos, Krillin notes Cell's significant power increase, leading Tien to fear the worst. Master Roshi acknowledges that even with Bulma's controller, it will still take her 20 minutes to arrive, prompting Krillin to decide to retrieve the controller himself himself, utilizing his superior flying speed. Tien decides to join the battle alongside Piccolo, driven by a sense of duty to assist despite being weaker, disregarding Master Roshi's objections. Back on the battlefield, Seventeen demands that Cell leave, accusing him of disrupting his battle with Piccolo. Suddenly, Piccolo raises his voice, urgently warning Seventeen about Cell's sinister intentions to absorb and kill him. Before Seventeen can react, Cell strikes swiftly with his tail, narrowly missing Seventeen's evasion. Cell persists with tail strikes, while Seventeen Seventeen narrowly evades. Seizing Seventeen's wrist, Cell hurls him to the ground and attempts a tail strike, which Piccolo intercepts with a kick to Cell's face. As Seventeen rises, he questions why Cell seeks to absorb him. Piccolo provides a brief explanation, stating Cell is a creation of Dr. Giro's computer, still incomplete, and he requires assimilation with Seventeen and Eighteen to attain his perfected form. Cell interjects, exclaiming the greatness of being a part of his ultimate superpower, a pinnacle of achievement of Dr. Giro's extensive efforts. However, Seventeen adamantly refuses to be absorbed, asserting his status as the ultimate warrior. Cell counters, asserting that his absorption is inevitable, regardless of his intentions. Unyielding, Number 17 vows to silence Cell, but amidst the tension, Number 16 urgently tells Seventeen to flee due to the overwhelming power of their adversary. Sixteen states his determination to prevent Cell from reaching his perfect form, noting that the monster's objective appears to extend beyond Son Goku's demise and to encompass the destruction of the entire universe. However, unwilling to run away, Seventeen charges at Cell, only to be forcefully slammed to the ground. Piccolo intervenes, rushing to Seventeen's aid and musters all of his strength into a powerful punch towards Cell, but Cell effortlessly blocks it. Cell lands a punch on Piccolo's face, causing him to skid across the ground. Cell then approaches Piccolo, propelling him to the opposite direction with a powerful kick. Witnessing the struggle, Eighteen wonders if Piccolo and Seventeen are holding back. However, Sixteen explains that the overwhelming strength of Cell renders them powerless. He urges 18 to flee, emphasizing the urgency of the situation. Absorption of both 17 and 18 would render Cell unstoppable and spell doom for the world. 18 questions 16's plans, and Piccolo amasses enough energy for an attack while Cell advances. 17 recognizes the impending danger as Piccolo releases a lightning grenade, resulting in a massive explosion that decimates a significant portion of the island. Emerging from the dissipating smoke, 18 initially rejoices at Piccolo's success, yet 16 shatters the optimism by revealing Cell's minimal damage. Cell's emergence from the water evokes panic in Piccolo, who watches as Cell reappears amongst the remnants of the island. Observing the scene from a nearby mountain, Tien remarks on the vast disparity between their powers. As Cell closes in on Piccolo once more, Piccolo urgently implores 17 to flee. Cell swiftly strikes Piccolo's face, sending him crashing to the ground. Lifting Piccolo, Tien notices his neck is broken, and Cell claims that he's outgrown the need for energy from humans, demonstrating
demonstrating by blasting a hole through Piccolo's chest before discarding his lifeless body into the water. At the lookout, Goku perceives the sudden absence of Piccolo's key. Gohan reacts emotionally to Piccolo's fate, while Goku wonders what's taking Vegeta so long. Unyielding, 17 defiantly informs Cell that he won't be beaten easily. 18 states that it's time to flee, with 16 concurring and advising her to escape on her own. She questions 16's plan, to which he declares his intent to obliterate Cell, proclaiming that the time for battle has arrived even before encountering Son Goku. 18 objects, fearing for 16's life, but 16 responds with a serene smile, stating how both 17 and 18 never needlessly took a human or animal life and he enjoyed traveling with them. Tien watches in the distance, wondering if 16 actually plans to fight Cell all alone. In a swift sequence of movement, Cell lands a punch to 17's midsection, followed by an elbow strike that drives him to the ground. Asserting his intent to absorb 17 given his perceived futile resistance, Cell seizes the android by the back of his shirt. 17 demands the monster to let him go, but Cell refuses. Cell's tail then morphs, expanding like a suction cup, poised to engulf 17 entirely. Just as his tail appears to go over 17's head, 16 intervenes, placing his hand on Cell's shoulder. Cell turns to face 16, only to be met with a forceful punch to the face that propels him backwards. Cell, interpreting 16's actions as another reckless sacrifice, contemplates the appearance of yet another individual willing to disregard their own life. 17 questions whether 16 intends to engage in combat, to which 16 affirms his intention. Although 17 foresees his impending demise, 16 asserts that a calculated evaluation suggests he and Cell possess roughly equal power. Without further hesitation, 16 and Cell charge toward each other and a powerful collision happen as they headbutt. Cell punches 16 and stabs him in the neck with his tail to absorb his energy, yet 16 responds with a confident smirk. Cell's frustration mounts as he realizes 16 is fully mechanical and capitalizing on the moment, 16 seizes Cell's tail, forcefully slamming him to the ground. He then steps on Cell and forcibly rips his tail from his body, thereby preventing him from absorbing anyone further. Cell, however, claims to possess cells from Piccolo and utilizes them to regenerate his severed tail with ease. Unfazed, 16 states that the only way to kill Cell would be to crush the life from him, but Cell dismisses the possibility. 16 remains undeterred, asserting his determination to attempt the feat and demonstrating his resolve. Cell amplifies his power slightly. 16 propels himself towards Cell with a forceful kick, yet Cell evades by leaping over the attack and responds with a swift kick that sends 16 hurtling through the air. Closing the gap, Cell lands a punch to 16's face, launching him across the battlefield. However, as Cell advances once more, 16 employs an unexpected tactic as he propels his fist like a rocket, striking Cell squarely in the face. Cell is sent hurtling through the air, prompting 16 to retrieve and reattach his fist. Swiftly and forcefully, 16 drives Cell down to the ground, then lifts him once more, forcefully slamming him into the earth to create a substantial crater. Acting swiftly, 16 crosses his arms before withdrawing them, leaving his fist nestled within his armpits. Extending the arm stumps into the hole, he unleashes a hell flash attack, the resulting blast being so strong that it erupts from beneath the ground in various parts of the island. Feeling this as he flies toward Boma's direction, Krillin is puzzled by the source of the immense explosion, but knows for sure it wasn't Piccolo, as he noticed his key vanished not too long ago. As things calm down a bit, 16 proceeds to reattach his fist, leaving Tien, 17, and 18 in awe by his astounding power. Casting his gaze upon number 18, 16 questions her continued presence, to which she reassures him that Cell has been defeated. 16, however, states it'll take more than that to defeat Cell, although the attack should have inflicted some harm. In an urgent call, 16 implores 17, who happens to be near one of the open craters, to retreat. Defying the plea, 17 confidently asserts his intention to get some payback on Cell and finish him off. However, Cell emerges from a hole behind him, his tail extended and ready, while 17 remains unaware of the imminent threat. Tien witnesses Cell emerge and urgently warns 17 about his presence. However, neither 17 or 16 have sufficient time to react, and without hesitation, Cell proclaims his emergence, his tail enclosing around 17, fully devouring him up to his waist before 16 can intervene. 17 is completely absorbed into Cell's body, initiating a transformative sequence that showcases the monster's escalating power. Realizing it's too late, 16 implores 18 to flee, noting Tien should do the same. Even Goku perceives Cell's surging energy, realizing that one of the androids have fallen victim to absorption. As the transformation comes to an end, Cell attains a state of partial completion, marking a significant step towards his ultimate goal. Cell's second form adopts a more human-like appearance, sporting more muscle. His feet now possess a sleek, boot-like contour, 
before, and his hands exhibit a closer resemblance to human appendages. Most notably, his facial features have undergone a change, assuming a more human shape with lips, human-like eyes, and an absence of a nose. Casting a smug glance toward the remaining androids, Cell's demeanor exudes confidence. Swiftly, 16 seizes 18 by the arm, taking to the skies in an attempt to evade. However, Cell proves his newfound agility by swiftly intercepting them, leaving 16 astonished by his speed. Tien, witnessing the turn of events, recognizes the dire situation and resolves to take action, even if it means a possible sacrifice. He conveys his apologies to his friend Chaozu, acknowledging the potential risk involved in his decision. Cell dismisses any possibility of 18's escape and attributes his newfound speed to the absorption of number 17. 16 launches a powerful punch at Cell's face, but Cell remains undeterred, smirking in the face of the attack's impact. Exhibiting his might, Cell retaliates by directing an energy blast at point-blank range towards 16, leaving him severely incapacitated and emitting smoke from his damaged head. Cell's power surge is evident as he turns his attention toward 18, prompting her to threaten self-destruction to deter him from coming any closer. Adopting 17's voice, Cell entices 18 to embrace absorption, explaining the benefits of becoming part of his ultimate life form. As 18 hears the voice, she hesitates, but a gravely injured 16 cautions against trusting Cell's words, noting that he's trying to manipulate her using 17's voice. Cell dismisses 16's input, belittling his ability to understand emotions, and urges 18 and 17's voice to join him in fulfilling Dr. Jiro's wishes to defeat Son Goku and conquer the world. However, this catches 18's attention, as she and 17 hated Jiro for converting them to androids and would never want to fulfill his wishes. Growing impatient, Cell exclaims that he'll absorb 18 by force if he has to. He says that he could potentially reach her in time to prevent her self-destruction, as it would take her a brief moment to power up enough energy to kill herself. An apprehensive number 18 gazes nervously at Cell, who chuckles and derides her chances of success. However, Cell's attention shifts, catching sight of Tien above him, who emanates a huge surge of power. Forming his hands into a triangular shape, Tien declares his tri-beam technique and hurls it at Cell. This amplified version of the tri-beam creates a colossal pit in the earth upon impact, and Tien urgently implores 18 to leave as Cell begins to rise from the pit and he's hit with another tri-beam. Responding to Tien's warnings, 18 rushes to 16, inquiring about his ability to fly. As Tien hits Cell repeatedly with tri-beam attacks, Goku's voice rings out, exclaiming to stop what he's doing, as any more exposure to the technique could kill him. Tien continues launching the tri-beam down at Cell, while number 18 helps 16 to his feet and they fly off. Back at the lookout, Goku keeps yelling for Tien to stop, and Tien uses one final tri-beam before he finally runs out of energy and drops to the ground. Goku feels this, and Cell begins to emerge from the pit. Cell gets pissed that 18 has gone, and is surprised that Tien of all people was the one who slowed him down. Cell decides to eliminate Tien, but Goku suddenly teleports to the battle, and Cell is shocked to see him in person. Goku tells Cell that as he is now, he has no hope of defeating him, but exclaims for him to just wait one day and he'll be strong enough to take him down. Cell laughs and questions if Goku's serious, and the Saiyan confirms. Cell questions what progress Goku could possibly make in one day, but Goku ignores him and begins looking around. He says Piccolo's still alive and grabs Tien's hand, warping over to the edge of the island where Piccolo is washed ashore. Cell wonders how Goku moved in an instant like that, and the Saiyan picks Piccolo up over his shoulders and says they'll go to the lookout and get some sensu beams from Korin. Cell says he won't let them get away and rushes at the trio, but Goku teleports away with Piccolo and Tien before Cell gets to them. Cell wonders about the strange technique of Son Goku's, but decides he doesn't matter right now, as finding number 18 is his top priority, and he flies off to find her. Meanwhile, Krillin reaches Bulma's plane and explains that he thought it'd be faster to fly to meet her. She hands him the controller and says it won't work unless he's within 10 meters of the androids. She then offers to give him some battle gear like the one Vegeta has, but Krillin says Goku and the others need those more than he does. He tells Bulma they're at the lookout, and Bulma says she'll take it to them there. Meanwhile, Goku, Gohan, and a healed Piccolo and Tien speak at the lookout, as Piccolo expresses his belief that nobody can beat Cell. Mr. Popo then yells out that Vegeta and Trunks are coming out of the hyperbolic time chamber, surprising Goku, who plans to go in next. Their attire hangs in tatters, and Trunks' hair has grown notably longer. Trunks offers an apology for the delay, explaining that his father had already pushed beyond the limits of Super Saiyan within two months, but he deliberately took his time. Vegeta swiftly dismisses the conversation, while Goku assumes that the training must have been successful. Vegeta asserts that Goku no longer needs to continue training, as he's now confident in his ability to handle Cell and the androids. Goku shares his observation of Cell's transformation after absorbing 17, but Vegeta remains undeterred. At this moment, Bulma arrives, taken aback by Trunks, 
Trunks' altered appearance and growth. He elaborates on his year in the hyperbolic time chamber, prompting Bulma to wonder why Vegeta's hair hasn't changed. Vegeta clarifies that a pure-blooded Saiyan's hair remains the same from birth, a realization that dawns upon Goku as well. However, Vegeta refocuses the discussion, inquiring about Bulma's purpose for coming. She reveals a collection of battle attire stored in a capsule case, surprising Goku with its lightness. Gohan finds the attire reminiscent of what he wore on planet Namek, and Trunks promptly changes into one too. Bulma extends the offer to Tien and Piccolo, but Piccolo declines, stating his aversion to wearing the same clothing as Saiyans and Frieza. Seizing the moment, Vegeta tells Goku that he doesn't need to put on the suit as he won't get the chance to fight. However, Goku asserts he wouldn't complain if Vegeta defeated Cell and the androids on his own. Declining Goku's offer of instant transmission to Cell, Vegeta takes to the sky and departs. Trunks voices his intention to follow, and Goku hands him two sensu beans before his departure, coupled with Bulma's statement that neither of them better die. With Trunks gone, Goku now turns his attention to Gohan, indicating that it's their turn to engage in training. Meanwhile, Cell soars above the ocean, pondering the android's elusive speed that kept him from finding them. Lacking any trace of their whereabouts, Cell concludes that they must be hidden on one of the many islands below. In a burst of frustration, Cell bellows for 18 to reveal herself, as failure to comply will result in the destruction of the islands below. He states that while it's true destroying her would hinder his perfected form, there's nobody on Earth that could stop him from doing as he pleases anyway. Hidden on an island with 16, 18 states that Cell will probably do as he says. However, 16 urges her to remain still, reasoning that Cell is desperate to attain his perfect form and wouldn't risk destroying her. Meanwhile, Vegeta makes his way towards his destination, appearing confident in his mysterious newfound power. Cell yells for 18 to show herself, but realizes she won't be coming out. Determined, the monster decides to begin the destruction. Extending his hand, he unleashes a blast that propels an entire island into the air with an explosion before plummeting into the water. Acknowledging her absence in that one, Cell shifts his focus to the next island, determined to continue the search. 18 gets nervous as she witnesses Cell's relentless destruction, but 16 tells her that his attacks willingly lack the strength to eliminate her. However, she still remains worried over 16's safety. 16 wonders why Cell is so obsessed with the prospect of becoming perfect, given he's already the most powerful being there is. He speculates that Cell's pursuit may really just be the desire for ultimate power, and that he won't stop until he succeeds. Meanwhile, Cell proceeds to obliterate a couple more islands. In parallel, Vegeta soars through the sky, transforming into a Super Saiyan to speed up to reach his destination. The detonation of the island sends a strong shockwave, rocking number 18 in 16's island, as one of the islands destroyed was right next to theirs. 16 advises 18 to remain motionless, as Cell closely watches for any signs of movement. 16 states that if they ride out the explosions, at the very least, she'll survive the encounter. Cell primes himself to eradicate yet another island, this time the one harboring 18 and 16, when an unexpected arrival interrupts his actions. Vegeta's sudden appearance takes Cell aback, and Vegeta commands him to land. Both land upon the island where the androids sought refuge among the trees, and Cell assumes Vegeta's foolishly come to try to defeat him. Vegeta, however, states that he plans to pulverize Cell until there's nothing left, prompting the monster to find his comment amusing. 18 in the distance doesn't believe Vegeta either, given he was unable to defeat her just a few days ago. Trunks then arrives, prompting Cell's suspicion of a couple friends Vegeta may have on the way. However, Vegeta asserts that Trunks is merely an observer, firmly proclaiming that alone, he'll be more than enough to send Cell to an early grave. Cell questions Vegeta in disbelief if he really believes he'll be able to defeat him. Vegeta confidently confirms his assertion, while Cell dismissively deems his words as nonsense. Echoing Cell's statement, 18 voices agreement, asserting that Vegeta's chances of winning are slim. She discreetly advises 16 that this would be a good opportunity to escape, but 16 tells her to wait until they're occupied with fighting each other. Intrigued by the sudden surge in Vegeta's power since their prior encounters, 16 finds this development peculiar. Undeterred, Vegeta vows to wipe the smug grin off Cell's face, prompting Trunks to speculate that his father is aiming to surpass Cell's form. Vegeta initiates his power-up, and at the lookout, Piccolo anticipates the unfolding spectacle. With his turban and mantle reappearing, Piccolo predicts that Vegeta will unveil his power beyond that of a Super Saiyan. Meanwhile, Goku and Gohan reside within the hyperbolic time chamber. Gohan states that it's hot and hard to breathe, and Goku says that once the door is closed, everything on the outside is shut out, including the presence of Ki, as they can no longer sense Cell or Vegeta's. Goku familiarizes Gohan with the room's layout, including the expansive training space ahead. Gohan marvels at the vastness, noting the absence of any discernible features. Goku reveals that the space mirrors Earth's dimensions, yet venturing too far could lead one to getting lost and dying. The climate fluctuates from negative 40 to 120 degrees, the atmosphere is a quarter of Earth's, and the gravity is maximized 
happiness tenfold. Goku initiates their training, emphasizing his desire to transform Gohan into a Super Saiyan. Gohan worries he might impede on his father's solo training, but Goku counters that Gohan's participation as a strong opponent would be invaluable. Goku expresses his aspiration to surpass the Super Saiyan level, with his ultimate goal of becoming stronger than anyone. However, he also states he wants Gohan to be even more powerful than him. Gohan references Trunks' future, where he achieved Super Saiyan status but still fell to the androids. Goku reminds Gohan of the differences between their current situation and Trunks' timeline, highlighting Gohan's lack of training in that future. Meanwhile, Vegeta's power escalation leaves everyone in awe as he culminates a transformation. The Saiyan's physique visibly increases in size as his hair thickens and spikes as well. The astonishing display leaves Cell surprised as Vegeta charges forward, landing a powerful blow to Cell's stomach, shocking androids 16 and 18. As Cell clutches his stomach in pain, Vegeta knocks him away, watching as he lands on his back. Cell rises and points out that Vegeta may not be so weak after all, and he retaliates by throwing a punch at the Saiyan, but Vegeta expertly grabs his arm and forcefully flips Cell to the ground. Rising to his feet, Cell turns around only to be met with a powerful kick from Vegeta, propelling him through the nearby mountain. Krillin, carrying the remote controller in the distance, observes Vegeta's overwhelming energy, surpassing even that of Cell, and hastens toward the scene to investigate. In the aftermath of the clash, Cell sits amongst the rubble, numbers 18 and 16 in awe at Vegeta's change in strength in such a short period of time. Vegeta approaches the recovering Cell, who now vows to get serious, although Vegeta dryly remarks that he believes Cell was already doing so. A faint chuckle escapes from Cell before he begins to power up. Meanwhile, Gohan's endeavor to transform into a Super Saiyan encounters an obstacle as Goku clarifies that he's merely elevating his energy. Goku instructs Gohan to tap into his anger, envisioning himself falling victim to Cell. Gohan, however, admits his unfamiliarity with Cell, prompting Goku to suggest visualizing Frieza instead. Despite his best efforts, Gohan attempts to transform, but falls short. Goku shares that both he and Vegeta encounter similar difficulties, emphasizing the need for patience. While Cell completes his power-up, Vegeta acknowledges it's not enough. While in the distance, Trunks states that his father has won the battle. Krillin, monitoring the situation from above the island, identifies the combatants as Vegeta and Cell. In a swift move, Cell flies toward Vegeta, delivering a punch that jolts the Saiyan but doesn't topple him. Rising from the impact, Vegeta dons a confident smirk and astutely acknowledges that Cell has reached his limit. Challenging Cell's skepticism, the Saiyan declares he isn't merely Vegeta anymore, rather, he's Super Vegeta. Puzzled by the concept of Super Vegeta, Cell contemplates what it means, to which Vegeta remarks that explaining it fully would be a pointless task. He advises Cell to worry about his own safety, but confirms it won't make a difference anyway. Hovering above the island, Krillin observes Cell's transformation and wonders if he's already become perfect. He then looks down at the remote Bulma created and states it may prove to be useless. Fueled by anger, Cell strikes out with his tail in an attempt to assault Vegeta, yet the Saiyan quickly vaults over the appendage and delivers a swift kick. Following up, Vegeta launches another powerful kick to Cell's stomach and hits him in the back of the head, sending him crashing down to the water below. Krillin is left in awe by the extent of Vegeta's newfound power, and his gaze shifts to Trunks, who's noticeably grown stronger as well. Krillin then notices the two androids nearby, surprised that they remain unnoticed by Cell, Vegeta, and even Trunks. Recalling Bulma's instructions about the proximity, Krillin discreetly lands on the island. He nervously approaches the location of the androids and becomes aware of Cell's incomplete transformation into his perfect form, deducing that number 17 must have been absorbed. As Cell emerges from the water, Vegeta decides to deliver an even more startling revelation. He proclaims that Trunks possesses a true strength nearly comparable to his own, letting Cell know that even if he managed to slip by him, his son would stop him anyway. Cell's gaze then fixates on Trunks as he sits in awe. Irritated by the realization that Cell's power isn't as exceptional as he believed, Vegeta states that ending Cell's life feels like a waste of time. A sudden eruption of frustration from Cell comes out as he reflects on his inability to attain his perfect form, realizing if he had, he wouldn't have possibly lost to anyone. Observing Cell's reaction with a hint of intrigue, Vegeta's attention is momentarily diverted, while Krillin, meanwhile, stealthily approaches the androids. Vegeta flies over to Cell, inquiring whether he genuinely believes he could secure victory by attaining his perfect form. Cell confirms, stating his power, speed, skill, and mental capacity would all be improved, making him invincible as the computer told him. In a swift motion, Vegeta delivers a kick that propels Cell through the air. 18 wonders if Vegeta pretended to be weak when they fought, but 16 states he had no reason to do so, speculating that something drastic occurred in the last few days. As Krillin draws closer to the scene, his anxiety 
anxiety grows, causing him to crouch behind a boulder and observe number 18. His uneasiness grows larger as he gazes at her, thus forcing his hesitation to push the remote's button. Vegeta strides purposely towards Cell once more, reiterating his question on whether he can defeat him once he's complete. Cell expresses slight irritation at the repetition, confirming his confidence in emerging victorious if allowed to reach his perfect form. Intrigued by Cell's conviction, Vegeta's interest is piqued, prompting concern from Trunks regarding his father's intentions. Meanwhile, Krillin thinks to himself, realizing he needs to push the button in order to incapacitate and eliminate 18 to prevent Cell's evolution. Memories of 18's earlier gesture of kissing him on the cheek flood his mind though, as he inadvertently drops the controller. The sound of its impact draws 18's attention. She states that she remembers Krillin, but is shocked to see he's in possession of the emergency shutdown switch. Meanwhile, Cell capitalizes on his conversation with Vegeta, highlighting the Saiyan's inclination for battle and their enthusiasm for challenging adversaries. He asserts that the happier a Saiyan is with the strength of their opponent, the more motivated they become. Seizing upon Cell's assumption, Vegeta concedes, urging him to proceed with his absorption. In response, Cell takes flight, only to be intercepted by Trunks as a Super Saiyan. Amidst the turmoil, Krillin expresses remorse to Bulma as he crushes the controller beneath his foot, shattering it. He implores 18 to flee and evade absorption, but she questions Krillin on why he ruined his only chance to stop Cell, to which his nervousness makes him unable to answer. Cell directs his frustration toward Vegeta due to Trunks' interference, though his focus abruptly shifts as he spots 18's presence on the island. Trunks diverts his attention toward the same point that captured Cell's gaze, spotting number 18 alongside Krillin. Realizing the obliviousness to 18, 16, and Krillin to Cell's discovery, Trunks lets out a sharp cry to let them know they've been spotted. In response, the group are taken aback while Cell swiftly advances toward them. Determined to stop Cell's path to perfection, Trunks undergoes a transformation similar to Vegeta's, his physique expanding as he follows in pursuit of Cell. Vegeta perceives the presence of the androids as an advantageous twist of fate, and he swiftly intervenes to prevent Trunks' interference. Trunks, propelled by his resolve, approaches Cell only to be halted by Vegeta's forceful kick that propels him into a nearby mountain. Cell touches down in front of his intended targets, who embrace themselves for the impending confrontation. Cell urges 16 to exercise restraint given his critical condition, and implies that Vegeta desires his evolution toward perfection as well. Krillin expresses frustration toward Vegeta for making such a foolish decision, and emerging from the debris, Trunks addresses his father, asserting that they must prevent Cell from achieving his perfect form. He emphasizes the potential escalation of Cell's power beyond their own, raising concerns about the challenges that might arise. In response to Trunks' concerns, Vegeta calls him a coward and wonders if he truly doesn't want to see how strong Cell can get. However, Trunks denies any such desire, having already borne witness to how catastrophic a future such as that can be. He expresses his willingness to kill his own father if it means thwarting Cell's plans, but Vegeta tries to call his bluff. Suddenly, Trunks unleashes a massive two-handed energy blast toward Vegeta before setting his sights on Cell. Swiftly, Cell unleashes the solar flare technique, temporarily blinding Trunks, Krillin, 16, and 18. Seizing the opportunity, Cell uses his tail to ensnare 18, eliciting shocked reactions from Trunks and Krillin upon regaining their sight. Vegeta, surprised by Trunks' resolve, notices the transformation unfolding within Cell. Observing the opportune moment, Trunks decides to intervene, aiming an attack at Cell during his metamorphosis. However, a protective barrier surrounds Cell, stopping Trunks' assault. Faced with an insurmountable obstacle, Trunks abandons his efforts, and a brilliant detonation engulfs the scene. As the smoke dissipates, it unveils the outcome of Cell's transformation, symbolizing the monster's completion. High above at the lookout, Piccolo relays to Tien and Bulma that Cell has successfully achieved his perfect form. Bulma questions the controller she crafted, only to learn from Piccolo that Krillin had deliberately destroyed it, shifting the blame toward Vegeta. Within the confines of the hyperbolic time chamber, Gohan completes his transformation into a Super Saiyan, earning praise from Goku for his achievement. Gohan reverts into his regular state and takes a moment to catch his breath, admitting to the strain. Goku proposes a break and suggests helping Gohan with a much needed haircut. Meanwhile, Cell's perfected form exhibits a sleeker and more refined appearance compared to his previous state. He possesses a less bulky physique, with his tail significantly reduced, wings more distant, and his facial features bear a striking resemblance to that of a human. Vegeta regards the transformation negatively, while Krillin's anger simmers over the harm inflicted on Android 18. Krillin furiously launches in to attack, striking Cell's head and delivering a few kicks. However, Cell remains unfazed, surprising Krillin and Trunks. Demonstrating his newly acquired power, Cell extends his arms, testing his capabilities, before executing a swift kick that 
sends Krillin hurtling through the air after connecting with the side of his head. Trunks, concerned for Krillin's well-being, swiftly takes flight towards his injured comrade, administering a sensu bean to aid his recovery. Vegeta touches down near Cell, remarking on Cell's apparent contentment with his newly acquired form, while personally deeming the perfect form to be unremarkable. Cell turns his attention to Vegeta, challenging him to assist in warming up for their battle, to which Vegeta consents, asserting that their warm-up will also mark Cell's defeat. With Krillin now in stable condition, Trunks expresses his relief at the close call, but Krillin expresses Vegeta's going to get himself killed. Acknowledging his inferiority compared to the Saiyans, Krillin possesses a keen understanding of Cell's potency and ferocity. As Cell and Vegeta assume battle stances, Krillin warns against underestimating Cell's current power, revealing that the monster is concealing a substantial amount of energy, similar to Trunks himself. Trunks is taken aback by Krillin's perceptive insight, and Krillin surmises that Vegeta likely failed to detect Trunks' restraint, while Trunks successfully overcame the barriers that held Vegeta back. Engaging in combat, Vegeta initiates a series of strikes against Cell, who expertly blocks each assault, demonstrating a power beyond what Vegeta had anticipated. Observing this, Trunks reflects that his father has transcended the limits of Super Saiyan, but also reveals that he achieved an even higher level recently. Despite this, Trunks remains determined to withhold his newfound strength from his prideful father, especially as he's determined to defeat Cell himself. Their exchange continues as Vegeta and Cell clash, each testing each other's limits. Sixteen observes Cell's increased might, yet remains convinced that Vegeta maintains a greater advantage. However, growing increasingly frustrated, Vegeta accuses Cell of not taking the battle seriously. Cell's response is dismissive, claiming that their previous interaction was merely a warm-up, eliciting a shocked reaction from Sixteen as Vegeta's anger intensifies, demanding Cell's full commitment to the battle. Cell complies, closing the distance between them with remarkable speed. A kick from Vegeta meets the side of Cell's head, but the blow proves ineffective as Cell remains unaffected, making fun of the Saiyan's Super Vegeta title. Witnessing this exchange, Krillin questions Trunks about his reluctance to intervene, to which Trunks explains that his father would rather be defeated by Cell than accept help from anyone. A look of astonishment washes over Vegeta's face as Cell provocatively urges him to display a smile. Without hesitation, Cell takes flight, delivering a forceful kick that propels Vegeta through a mountain. Despite the impact, Vegeta manages to stop his momentum in midair. Cell makes fun of their vast disparity in power, suggesting that there's almost no point in fighting as it would be too boring. Growing increasingly frustrated, Trunks boils with anger, prompting Krillin to implore him to assist Vegeta so he won't get killed. In response, Trunks resolves to intervene only when his father has been knocked unconscious, ensuring that Vegeta remains oblivious to his assistance. Krillin argues that such an approach may not work if Vegeta dies beforehand, urging Trunks to reconsider. Meanwhile, Sixteen positions himself for an attack from behind, but Cell dismisses the futile gesture, deeming Sixteen nothing more than a piece of junk. As Vegeta catches his breath, he extends his arms outward, initiating a powerful surge of energy. He gradually draws his arms inward, assuming a gripping posture that triggers intense seismic tremors in the surroundings. With forceful determination, Vegeta directs a comet towards Cell, asserting that his perfect form couldn't possibly take the attack he plans to unleash head on. Cell responds with a derisive smirk, prompting Krillin to speculate whether Vegeta's technique might inadvertently annihilate the Earth. Positioned to face the imminent attack head on, Cell maintains his stance while Trunks pleads with his father to desist. Krillin implores Trunks to retreat as Vegeta lets out a thunderous cry, unleashing a colossal energy surge in the form of a final flash attack. Cell's readiness looks as though it turns to fear as the colossal energy beam propels forward, ultimately piercing through the atmosphere and into space. With impeccable timing, Trunks and Krillin manage to vacate the island, escaping the cataclysmic blast. As the dust settles, Vegeta's energy recedes, and Cell stands amidst the aftermath, bearing a sizable portion of his body obliterated by the attack. Seemingly victorious, Vegeta taunts Cell, proclaiming the battle is already over. Amidst the chaotic scene, Vegeta begins to laugh while Krillin becomes animated, thrilled that Vegeta has seemingly succeeded. Cell's anxiety intensifies while Vegeta's laughter persists. However, Cell's smug expression emerges as he reminds Vegeta that he has Piccolo's DNA. Cell then proceeds to demonstrate his regenerative abilities, growing his lost body parts, a sight that leaves Vegeta in a state of shock. As he approaches the Saiyan, Vegeta launches a barrage of projectiles in a desperate attempt for survival. Amongst the smoke, Cell emerges unscathed, countering with a powerful punch that forces Vegeta to the ground. Struggling to rise, Vegeta finds himself kicked airborne by Cell. Cell swiftly ascends, and to everyone's shock, delivers a crushing elbow strike, propelling Vegeta back to Earth, where he impacts face first and passes out, reverting 
going from Super Saiyan form to his normal state. Cell states Vegeta's unwillingness to die, but says that he'll just have to finish the job. Recognizing the gravity of the situation, Krillin implores Trunks to intervene, prompting Trunks to comply, embarking on a formidable power-up that visibly increases his physique. Krillin gets nervous as he witnesses the immense surge in Trunks' power, and Cell readies himself to deliver a decisive blow to the weakened Vegeta. However, Cell's attention is suddenly diverted as he becomes aware of Trunks' dramatic transformation, causing his expression to shift to one of profound shock. Observing Trunks' heightened energy, Krillin remarks on the amount of ki pouring out of him. Trunks then tells Krillin his plan, instructing him to transport his father to Master Roshi's house and give him a sensu beam when the time is right. Krillin questions if Trunks will need a sensu himself, but Trunks denies it as he states he plans to win this fight. Touching down, Trunks expresses to Cell that he's going to kill him, and the two approach each other, closing the gap until they stand face to face. Cell initiates an attack, launching a kick towards Trunks, who quickly evades the blow. In response, Trunks delivers a punch, only for Cell to evade, counterattacking with a strike to Trunks' stomach, followed by a swift kick that propels Trunks away. Amidst the battle, Trunks motions Krillin to take his father to safety. He notices the gesture and Cell rushes in once more. Trunks rises to his feet and Cell hits him away again, the two then trading blows as Krillin lands next to Vegeta. Cell knocks Trunks away again and Krillin hoists Vegeta over his shoulder, signaling to Trunks with a thumbs up before departing. On his feet once more, Trunks faces Cell with a smirk. Cell, noting Vegeta's removal from the battlefield, questions whether Trunks will now engage in the fight more seriously. Trunks expresses surprise at Cell's knowledge of Vegeta's absence, prompting Cell to clarify Vegeta doesn't interest him anymore. He now directs his curiosity toward unlocking the true potential of Trunks' power, affirming his readiness to showcase the full extent of his perfected form. Unfazed, Trunks accepts the challenge, powering up and ready to fight seriously. Continuing to elevate his power, Trunks remains steadfast in his determination to unveil his true might to Cell. The impressive display of Trunks' immense strength garners the admiration of Cell, even surpassing his own capabilities. However, Cell tells Trunks that power isn't everything. Undeterred, Trunks dismisses Cell's assertion as a mere bluff and charges forward. Meanwhile at the lookout, Piccolo stands in sheer amazement at Trunks' formidable power. Boma implores Piccolo to share the unfolding events, prompting Piccolo to confirm that he's indeed referring to Trunks, much to Boma's happiness. Inside the hyperbolic time chamber, Gohan assumes the form of a Super Saiyan, soaring through the air with precision, unleashing a fury of punches and kicks. Goku, engaged in meditation nearby, marvels at Gohan's rapid progress. Curiosity gnaws at Gohan as he questions his father's prolonged inaction. Mustering a final burst of energy, Gohan descends to the ground, reverting to his base form, breathless and exhausted. A resurgence of determination courses through Goku, propelling him into the realm of Super Saiyan. Not content with his mere achievement, he delves deeper, evolving into the Super Saiyan's second grade, surprising Gohan at Goku's mastery of this state. Goku then says he can push it one more time and evolves into Super Saiyan third grade, shocking Gohan further, believing his father to be capable of effortlessly overcoming Cell. However, back at the battlefield, the limitations of the Super Saiyan third grade form become increasingly evident. Despite his overwhelming power, Trunks struggles to connect a blow against Cell, who evades all incoming attacks with remarkable ease. Simultaneously, Goku understands the predicament. He deduces that the Super Saiyan third grade form, while powerful, exacts a toll on speed and stamina. In his insight, Goku devises a new approach, shifting his and Gohan's focus toward refining the core Super Saiyan form. This will require making Super Saiyan their natural form, the benefit being they'd be able to stay in it without having to worry about fatigue. Meanwhile, Trunks finds himself perplexed by his inability to strike Cell despite his incredible power. Cell seizes the opportunity to mock Trunks, highlighting his over-reliance on brute force. In a surprising turn, Cell himself transforms into the Super Saiyan third grade form, debunking the notion that it's a unique capability held solely by Trunks. Cell calls Trunks a fool for utilizing a form that only gives him brute strength. Trunks then experiences a sudden realization, acknowledging the flaw in his approach and recognizing the wisdom behind Vegeta's decision to refrain from using the Super Saiyan third grade form. Agreeing with Cell's point, Trunks reverts to his base form, admitting defeat and urging Cell to kill him, which prompts the monster to state that he just might. Far removed on a distant island, Krillin notices that Trunks' key shrank while Cell's was still huge. Acting with haste, Krillin administers a sensu beam to Vegeta, hastening their return to the battle. Meanwhile, Cell stands poised to deliver a final blow to Trunks, fueled by his disappointment in both Trunks and Vegeta. Perched atop the lookout, Piccolo stands in awe at the sheer might of Cell, predicting Trunks' impending demise. However, Cell acknowledges the remarkable progress made by Vegeta and Trunks within a short period of time, and wonders if they could improve it further if they had more time. Trunks states he isn't sure, as he won't know until he tries, peaking Cell's interest.
interest. Inquiring about Goku's whereabouts, Cell learns from Trunks that Goku's training to defeat him, as Trunks states that Goku will succeed where he's failed. Cell finds this answer satisfying and decides to hold a tournament in 10 days. He challenges Trunks to gather his allies so they can all compete against him, stating that assuming he wins, he'll take on the next person until there's no one left. Cell states it'd be a great way to pass the time and urges Trunks to watch out for the location of the tournament on the news. Bewildered by Cell's new objectives, Trunks seeks clarity, prompting Cell to state he wants to confirm his superiority over everyone and spread fear into the world. He goes on to say he wants to have some fun, and the greatest fun of all is watching people's faces twist in fear. Cell then takes off, leaving Krillin and Vegeta to join the scene moments later. Back at the lookout, Bulma tells Piccolo to save Trunks, but the Namekian reveals that Trunks managed to survive. With an awareness of the challenges ahead, Piccolo grows nervous, opting to use the hyperbolic time chamber as well. On the islands, Trunks fills Krillin and Vegeta in on Cell's tournament idea, further annoying Vegeta, who believes the monster is just toying with them. Despite their reservations, Trunks commits to using the hyperbolic time chamber again, and Vegeta opts to do the same, stating Cell will regret giving him more time. In the midst of their discussion, the battered Android 16 emerges, expressing his desire to partake in the tournament as well. He inquires of the group to escort him to Capsule Corporation for repairs, but Trunks is unwilling, more interested in destroying Dr. Giro's creations. However, Krillin decides to take him, stating he's not a bad guy, just like the other two androids, and further explains that they'll need all the help they can get to defeat Cell. The next morning, Cell arrives at a carefully chosen location designated for the impending tournament. With precision, he clears a substantial portion of the ground, expanding the area slightly beyond the dimensions of the World Martial Arts Tournament ring. Soon after, he artfully shapes the rock into a polished, smooth stone, fashioning the foundation of the ring. While he decides to enhance its appearance with decorations later, Cell departs for the ZTV station to make his momentous announcement. At Kame House, Yamcha and Krillin occupy a space near the television, currently tuned in to a weather report. Abruptly, their attention is seized by screams emanating from the screen, revealing Cell's unanticipated presence at the TV station. Krillin alerts Master Roshi that Cell is on TV, and Chi-Chi comes over to watch too. Cell begins by announcing the interruption of the regularly scheduled programming to bring amazing news and introducing himself to the world as Cell, the monster who'd been known worldwide thus far for slaughtering people a few days ago. He states that the person responsible for the massacre was him, only now he's grown much more powerful. Cell goes on to announce that in 9 days, on the 17th at noon, he'll be hosting a martial arts tournament called the Cell Games, then revealing the coordinates of the ring. The monster states that unlike the Tenkaichi Budokai held on Earth, everyone will be fighting him one-on-one -on -one with the next person taking over after someone's lost. Cell goes on to explain that similarly to the Tenkaichi Budokai, a challenger loses if they surrender, fall out of the ring, or even die, although he'll try to go easy. Cell then vows to kill every single human being on the planet once he's won the tournament, coming relentlessly after every last one and watching their faces twist with fear. Demonstrating just a glimpse of his power, Cell then launches a devastating blast from the news station, killing hundreds of people and telling the world that they'd better come prepared to defeat him as he flies off, having made his point clear. The gravity of the situation prompts contemplation amongst the likes of Master Roshi, Krillin, and Yamcha, who speculate about who could possibly rise to the occasion posed by Cell. However, amidst the uncertainty, Vegeta asserts his intent to re-enter the hyperbolic time chamber for further training, and Trunks decides to join him. Cell's ominous transmission spreads fear throughout the world, leaving civilians lacking confidence in the Earth's military or its champions. Yet among them, a forgotten figure looms, a resilient boy who once vanquished Demon King Piccolo and more recently thwarted the Saiyans and the tyrant Frieza. In the midst of global apprehension, Goku, unseen, is tirelessly honing his skills alongside his son, Gohan. Panic has spread throughout the world since Cell's broadcast, as people try to locate places that would make them less of a target. Meanwhile at the lookout, Vegeta and Trunks, wearing new battle gear, are waiting outside the hyperbolic time chamber along with Piccolo and Tien. Trunks wonders how much longer Goku and Gohan will be, and Popo says it'll be another three hours. Vegeta states they probably won't come out on time, as their training will likely take more than 24 hours. Piccolo says there's nothing to worry about, as there are still nine days left into the tournament. He believes Trunks and Vegeta should rest while he goes in first, but Vegeta exclaims Piccolo's assistance is a waste of time, as only a Saiyan could do any good against Cell now. He states that Piccolo can do what he wants, but he'll be using the remaining eight days for himself. Piccolo calls Vegeta a fool, stating a person can't spend more than two days or 48 hours of their life in the hyperbolic
symbolic time chamber. Vegeta asserts he may do it anyway, but Mr. Popo says if he tries, the exit will disappear and he'll be stuck in there forever. Just then, everyone feels Goku and Gohan's key as they're coming out sooner than expected. The pair exit the chamber as Super Saiyans, and Goku wonders why Vegeta and Trunks are here, but he feels Cell's key, assuming that he must still be alive. Piccolo thinks to himself that he barely recognizes Gohan, and Goku inquires Trunks to fill them in on what's been going on. Amidst Trunks' explanation, Vegeta wonders what happened to Goku and Gohan, as they appear to be Super Saiyans, but he can't feel their energy. He says it's like the transformation is their natural state, and Trunks concludes his explanation. Goku thinks the tournament sounds interesting, and questions Mr. Popo on if he still has his clothes. Goku gets dressed, declining Trunks' offer to get a new set of armor, and Gohan confronts Piccolo, asking to get clothes just like his, to which the Namekian obliges. Donning their battle outfits, Vegeta inquires of Goku if he thinks he can defeat Cell. Goku states he doesn't know since he hasn't met Cell in his perfect form yet, so he decides to get a look at him using instant transmission. Goku appears behind Cell, the monster then asking if Goku likes the ring he prepared to decide the Earth's fate in nine days. Goku, however, says it's pretty lame, and the two stare each other down. Goku gets serious, inquiring if this is Cell's complete form. Cell confirms, and Goku says he'll definitely show up to fight, but tells Cell not to kill anyone else. He then leaves, saying it'll be a good match. Cell then stating how the tournament will be more fun than he expected. When Goku returns, Trunks wonders what he thought of Cell. The Saiyan then stating he didn't think the monster would grow this much power, and if he were to fight him as he is now, he probably wouldn't stand a chance. This statement shocks Vegeta and Trunks, prompting Piccolo to urge Goku and Gohan to reuse the hyperbolic time chamber after everyone else is gone. However, Goku refuses, much to the Namekian's surprise. Piccolo wonders why Goku won't go back in the hyperbolic time chamber, and Goku explains the conditions of the room are rough and that he'll be better off resting his body. Vegeta mocks Goku, assuming the time chamber was too much for him. However, Goku says that there's a point where stressing your body becomes torture rather than training. He goes on to say that the rest of the group can go in though, as they probably still have some room for improvement. Feeling patronized, Vegeta questions if Goku suggesting he's stronger than him, to which Goku confirms, stating much more so, angering Vegeta. Goku wishes everyone good luck, and he and Gohan take off, stopping at Korin's tower shortly after. Korin highlights the dire events unfolding on Earth, and as Goku explains that he's never seen anything like Cell before, Korin expresses astonishment at Goku's apparent calmness, even in the face of Cell's perfect form. Wondering if Goku's come across some revelation in the hyperbolic time chamber, Korin questions if he's made a valuable discovery. Goku brushes off the question with a chuckle, prompting Gohan to contemplate the possibility as he was alongside his father during their entire training period. Goku questions Korin on Cell's strength, and Korin states he's not sure as he hasn't shown his true powers, but he could estimate it. Goku tells him to try and compare Cell's power to his own, and he'll raise his key. Meanwhile, Tien wonders if Gohan and Goku were really Super Saiyans, since they seem so natural. Piccolo says they definitely were, but they seem to have trained themselves to maintain the state as if it were their norm. Trunks thinks that it might be so they can do an even more incredible transformation during the battle with Cell, but Vegeta berates him, stating that Goku and Gohan decided Super Saiyan was their best combat state, assuming that if they got used to it, it would minimize the strain on their bodies during battle. Suddenly, Goku begins to power up, nearly blowing Korin and Yajirobe away, although Gohan remains calm. Korin tells Goku to stop and lower his energy, otherwise he'll shatter the tower. The others at the lookout feel Goku's key and are in disbelief. As things calm down, Goku tells Korin that was about half his power, and Korin thinks it's crazy how Goku could be this strong. However, Gohan thinks to himself, wondering if that's all his father is actually capable of. Goku inquires of Korin to compare him to Cell, and the cat falls silent, then stating that Cell is is still a bit stronger. Goku realizes his own estimation was correct and thanks Korin happily. He touches Gohan on the shoulder and the two teleport away. Yajirobe in awe at how incredible Goku is, while Korin wonders why Goku is so calm given the dire situation. At the lookout, Vegeta grows frustrated at Goku for always being one step ahead of him, thinking every time he believes he's got the upper hand, he's proved wrong. Vegeta then yells at Piccolo to hurry up and get in the room, as he's eager to go in next. Goku and Gohan arrive at Kame House, and Goku says they'll get Chi Chi and go home. From there, he and Gohan will have three days of rest, three days of training, and then another three days of rest. Gohan wonders if this plan is the best course of action, but Goku tells him not to worry as they go and grab Chi Chi, who screams when she sees Gohan's hair color, thinking he's turned into a delinquent. A few days later, Goku, Gohan, and Chi Chi enjoy a leisurely picnic by the lake. Goku notices a massive fish in the water and points it out to the others, but Gohan, concerned about their carefree attitude, questions if relaxing like this is wise. Goku reassures him, suggesting that they things will probably work out in the end, which catches Gohan's attention. 
Despite his son's unease with the uncertainty though, Goku's confidence in their ability to win is evident. After a while, the three drive down the road. Goku remarks that all the shops are closed, to which Chi Chi explains that people believe they only have seven days to live due to the Cell games. Amidst this, a radio broadcast captures their attention, where a newsman announces the Royal Army's mobilization to confront the creature known as Cell. Reacting urgently, Goku intervenes, imploring them to halt their approach as it would only lead to their deaths. An array of tanks, planes, and soldiers converge upon Cell's location, brimming with misguided confidence. Cell departs and lands on a nearby mountain, stating that he doesn't want to damage his new arena. The Royal Army unleash an onslaught of missiles, gunfire, and other explosions on Cell, Goku's family following the developments through a radio broadcast, witnessing the futility of the assault. The commander eventually tells everyone to hold their fire, but despite their attempts to engage, Cell remained unharmed. As the survivors attempt to retreat, Cell dismissively eliminates them with only a glimpse of his power, leading Goku to switch off the radio in anger. Decisively, Goku instructs Chi Chi and Gohan to head home, as he intends to go see Piccolo. Exiting the vehicle, he vanishes using instant transmission. Upon his arrival at the lookout, Goku immediately wonders if Piccolo used the hyperbolic time chamber again, to which the Namekian confirms. Goku assumes that Piccolo's power has significantly increased, however, he states that he still isn't strong enough to beat Cell. The conversation shifts to Goku's request to split Piccolo and Kami once more, given the Dragon Balls were turned to stone after their merger and they need them again to bring everyone back who Cell killed. However, Piccolo states that such a thing is impossible, as once he and Kami fuse, they can never separate again. Goku acknowledges the response and proposes seeking the surviving Namekian's plan it as a solution to restore the Dragon Balls. He says that if one of them will be willing to come live on Earth, they could become a god like Kami was and the Dragon Balls will be restored. Goku declares his intent to locate the Namekians and Mr. Popo expresses his openness to having a new guardian of the Earth. Piccolo questions Goku's travel plans, considering their limited time and lack of knowledge about the Namekians' destination. Goku, however, tells Piccolo he isn't thinking, stating once again he possesses the instant transmission technique and plans to detect individuals with a key resembling Piccolo's. Goku Goku's initial attempt at finding the Namekians proves unsuccessful, prompting him to consider utilizing King Kai's planet for assistance as he teleports away. Meanwhile at Kame House, Krillin, Yamcha, and Master Roshi tune into a TV broadcast featuring King Furry. He takes responsibility for the failed army attack against Cell, and expresses hope for a savior's emergence, more specifically someone like the boy who defeated Demon King Piccolo long ago. Goku reaches King Kai's planet and greets Bubbles before conversing with the Kai, who is napping. Goku begins telling the Kai about the Earth's extraordinary events, and he helps Goku by pointing him in the direction of the Namekian's new home. Goku begins to pick up the Namekian's location, prompting King Kai to acknowledge Goku's use of instant transmission, stating how he must have learned it from Yardrat. The Saiyan then teleports away, having locked on to the planet's key signature. Upon arriving at New Namek, the Namekians are surprised by Goku's presence. He identifies himself, and the tribe immediately recognize him, stating he was the one who defeated Frieza and saved them all. Goku then explains his mission, mentioning the need for a new guardian of Earth. The Namekian leader, Mori, introduces Dende, the Namekian boy who'd ventured with Krillin and Gohan on Namek in their battle against Frieza. Mori mentions Dende's desire to visit the two again after so many years, prompting Goku to ask if he'd be able to make Dragon Balls. Mori confirms Dende's ability, stating he's a true descendant of the Dragon Clan and will be more than capable of becoming a new god of Earth. Goku expresses gratitude and welcomes Dende, bidding the Namekians a farewell before returning to King Kai's planet briefly to report the success. Goku proceeds to the lookout on Earth with Dende, where Piccolo and the others await. Dende's arrival surprises them, and Goku leaves the Namekian boy with them to grab Krillin and Gohan. Meanwhile, at Kame House, Krillin and Yamcha continue to watch TV, witnessing a broadcast on a human fighter named Hercule, who will be entering the Cell games. Hercule claims that Cell's nothing but a pushover, stating he used bombs ahead of time to get rid of Earth's military. Hercule then vows to wipe the floor with Cell, as an unimpressed Krillin watches on, saying he'll probably die soon. Goku then appears at Kame House, inviting Krillin to join him to see Dende again. Goku, Gohan, Gohan and Krillin all arrive back at the lookout, where Gohan and Krillin reunite with Dende once again. Amidst the excitement of their reunion, Trunks questions Goku on if his calm demeanor stems from discovering Cell's weak point, but Goku is uncertain if a vulnerability exists in Cell, confusing Trunks. Piccolo is curious about Dende's ability to create Dragon Balls, but Goku reassures him that the elder Namekian praised Dende's skills. Dende believes he can craft Dragon Balls within around 100 days, but Goku's surprised it'll take that long. However, Dende states a more immediate solution. He can make the Dragon Balls right away if they use the ones on Earth that had previously turned to stone. Krillin expresses his approval and wonders whether Dende could make them grant three wishes like the Namekian dragon. Dende confirms this possibility, but raises the concern that in order to revive a large group of people simultaneously, the wishes would have to be limited.
limit it to two. Piccolo finds this arrangement acceptable, prompting Dende to request the dragon's design. Mr. Popo retrieves it for him, and standing over the casing, Dende employs his magical abilities, causing light to emanate from it and descend to the earth. Dende declares that the Dragon Ball should now be restored, leading Piccolo to admire Dende's impressive talent. Goku decides to borrow the Dragon Radar from Bulma to locate the Dragon Balls and gather them. He suggests that Gohan take a break from training and spend time with Dende until the Cell Games, but this confuses him. Goku teleports away, and Trunks questions Gohan about his dad's seemingly carefree attitude, considering Cell's strength and lack of a known weakness. Gohan is equally puzzled, stating his dad just told him to look forward to the tournament, bewildering Trunks. Krillin speculates that Goku must have some sort of plan, but Piccolo states he might just be believing that forthcoming events are already predetermined, and the group falls silent. Goku arrives at Bulma's laboratory, where she and Dr. Brief are working on number 16. Goku takes the Dragon Radar and proceeds to collect the Dragon Balls, and as time goes by, Vegeta emerges from the hyperbolic time chamber, and Cell stands in his arena, wondering if 10 days of waiting was excessive. Eventually, Goku gathers all seven Dragon Balls, and the world pins its hopes on Hercule, the supposed world-fighting champion who claims he can take on Cell. Finally, the awaited day of the 17th arrives. Goku changes into his training attire and begins to depart, Chi-Chi pleading for him to be careful. She also tells him to prevent Gohan from fighting at any cost, but Goku brushes off her concerns and leaves, much to her dismay. Meanwhile, at the lookout, Goku finds Piccolo, Krillin, Gohan, Trunks, Dende, and Mr. Popo assembled. Goku questions where Vegeta is, but Piccolo states he's already departed. Goku then questions everyone's silence moments after and wonders what's wrong. Krillin explains that while the Dragon Balls can resurrect many people with a single wish, the same limitation remains. Only those who have never died before can be revived. Dende apologizes for not revealing this sooner, but Goku reassures him, expressing confidence that they won't die. Krillin is skeptical of Goku's optimism, but Goku remains undeterred, urging them to hurry up so they'll make it on time. In the arena, Cell awaits, while a reporter and cameraman observe him from a cliff, fearing for their safety. Moments later, Hercule arrives, showing off to the world and confident in his abilities. Hercule gets Cell's attention, declaring to take him down with a hand gesture, much to the excitement of the camera crew and citizens of the Earth. As Cell ponders on who this insect is, the stage is set, as there are now only 15 minutes until the Cell games begin. 12 minutes before the commencement, Hercule is already making his way into the ring. He motions for the announcer and cameraman to join him, and they oblige, with the announcer boldly declaring himself the world's most courageous. They climb into the ring as well, aiming to interview Hercule. Hercule states he feels bad for Cell as he's about to be defeated, then exposes him, claiming he used bombs in the destruction of Central City and the military. Cell pays no attention, but Hercule assumes it's because he's afraid to face the truth. In a defiant gesture, the announcer flips Cell off while Hercule moons him. Meanwhile, Master Roshi watches this on TV, stating he wouldn't mind if Hercule got killed. Suddenly, the announcer's attention shifts as a figure flies in. Cell identifies the newcomer as Vegeta, noting he never learns his lesson, but hopes he's improved a little. As the Saiyan Prince lands, the announcer questions whether Vegeta was flying, but Hercule dismisses it as a trick. The announcer approaches Vegeta, inquiring about his identity and expressing concern for his safety. However, Vegeta brushes him off, commanding him to leave him alone. Returning to Hercule's side, the announcer comments on Vegeta's peculiar behavior and says his hairstyle's weird. The countdown then continues, with only five minutes remaining until the start of the Cell games. Number 16 arrives next, sporting a capsule core patch concealing the red ribbon logo, surprising Cell as he managed to fix himself up. Vegeta deduces that only Bulma and her father could have repaired the android, then states it was a waste of effort. Soon after, Cell notices another group approaching and announces the arrival of Son Goku. Seven figures descend and land, Gohan, Krillin, Piccolo, Yamcha, Tien, Shrunks, and Goku, all standing ready for the battle that'll decide the fate of the Earth. The announcer is shocked at everyone's flying abilities, but Hercule states it must be a popular trick. Sixteen approaches Krillin, expressing gratitude for his repairs. Goku wishes Sixteen well, but the android firmly reminds him of his original purpose to kill him, stating that he'd be wise to remember that. Soon after, Goku volunteers to go first, surprising Trunks as he figured they'd save the best for last. Goku wonders if Vegeta's okay with this, and the Saiyan Prince remains indifferent, confident that he'll still be the one to defeat Cell. Amidst their conversation, Hercule interjects, asserting that they don't have the authority to determine the order. The announcer questions the group's participation, and Goku confirms their readiness, although the announcer exclaims that this isn't a game and chastises their ignorance. Krillin retorts that the ones who truly aren't aware are the announcer and Hercule, who boast about the world champion. Krillin tells Goku to just let Hercule go first, and amid the banter, Cell interrupts, signaling that it's time to begin. Cell impatiently instructs someone to enter the ring quickly, 
prompting Hercule to confidently declare that he will go first. Goku warns Hercule of the danger and advises him to reconsider, but his words fall on deaf ears as the announcer directs the cameraman to capture Goku on TV, relaying to the world the Saiyan's comments and leading many viewers to perceive Goku as foolish. At King Castle, the king observes the scene and draws parallels between the stranger and the boy who once saved the world from Demon King Piccolo long ago. However, differences in hair and eye color make him realize that it can't be the same person. Another individual amongst the group bears a striking resemblance to Demon King Piccolo as well, which the king questions. Krillin attempts to console Goku, assuring him that Hercule can be resurrected using the Dragon Balls. With a reassuring wave, Goku conveys that it's alright, and the announcer assumes that Goku now realizes Hercule's greatness. Hercule removes his cape and championship belt, locking eyes with Cell for a moment. He then brings out a capsule, opens it, and unveils a large bag containing 15 tiles. Hercule stacks and focuses his energy before executing a precise chop that obliterates 14 tiles, much to the world's excitement. However, the group, including Goku, falls into an awed silence while Cell considers Hercule a complete fool. Confident, Hercule proudly points out the shattered tiles, linking them to Cell's fate in just a minute. As the world cheers on, he believes this spectacle will boost his popularity, especially with the event being captured on TV. Assuming a fighting stance, Hercule charges at Cell, delivering a dynamite kick to Cell's face and unleashing a fury of punches. Things are looking great for the world champion until Cell eventually swats him aside, flinging him into a nearby mountain. In a hushed tone, Krillin confesses to Gohan that he was secretly hoping for Cell's victory. Despite crashing into what seemed like certain death, Hercule miraculously survives, much to Krillin and Piccolo's disappointment. The world is taken aback as Cell managed to eliminate Hercule. In response, Cell announces the immediate commencement of the Cell games, and Goku steps forward. Hercule attributes his defeat to merely losing his footing and promises to get serious next time, although Vegeta in the distance expresses disbelief at Hercule's failure to recognize how weak he truly is against Cell. Goku enters the ring, drawing the attention of everyone present. Cell lowers his previously crossed arms and comments on the impending excitement of the battle, assuming a ready stance. Trunks anticipates that everyone will finally discover the reason behind Goku's peculiar calmness, and the announcer broadcasts to the world that Hercule is currently on break, during which an unknown member of the group will step in to fight. He questions Hercule's opinion regarding this unfamiliar challenger, and Hercule dismisses the competitor's stance as that of an amateur. He asserts that Goku wouldn't last two seconds against him, and states he'll give him about five against Cell. With Cell ready to go, Goku charges forward. Cell efficiently blocks a kick and a punch from Goku, who then evades a strike by ducking. A brief exchange of blows ensues between the two, culminating in Goku executing a backflip to create distance. Cell propels himself toward Goku with a headlong rush, but Goku raises his arms in defense. As Cell prepares to strike Goku, the latter instead employs a kick to launch Cell into the air. Goku follows suit, channeling a Kamehameha wave in his pursuit, but Cell effortlessly swats the energy attack aside. Seizing an opportunity, Goku materializes behind Cell, delivering a punch to his back. Enraged, Cell retaliates by striking Goku's face and sends him flying back into the ring with an attack on the back. Goku manages to stop his descent, landing gracefully as Cell also touches down. Cell then declares that the warm-up is over, leaving both Hercule and the announcer astounded by what they've witnessed. Goku and Cell lock eyes in an intense gaze, prompting Krillin to believe that the real battle is about to commence. The announcer is impressed by the capabilities of the unknown competitor and seeks Hercule's opinion. Nervously, Hercule concedes that the performance was better than he had anticipated, but states that it might be the peak of the competitor's abilities. Goku and Cell share contemplative thoughts about each other before Goku's demeanor shifts, asking Cell if he's ready for what's coming. Trunks observes a change in Goku's eyes, while Cell perceives that Goku is tapping into his full power. With a surge of energy, Goku begins to power up, creating a forceful gust that pushes everyone away. When Goku's power-up concludes, Vegeta, Trunks, and Krillin are all astonished by his newfound strength. Gohan, however, ponders the reason behind everyone's astonishment. The announcer expresses bewilderment at the explosive display and notices an aura resembling flames surrounding the unknown competitor. Cell, in turn, also embarks on a power-up, generating an even more forceful shockwave that sends everyone further back. Now, both Cell and Goku are enveloped in radiant energy. The announcer remarks on Cell's similar action, prompting Hercule to dismiss it as a mere gimmick. Goku advances towards Cell, who encourages him to get started. Goku strikes Cell with a series of blows, a punch to the stomach, an elbow to the back, a kick, and a final punch. The impact propels Cell through the air, where he manages to stop his flight while hanging upside down. Cell relishes the situation, remarking that the true essence of a fight would be lost without utilizing their true strength. Goku agrees, affirming his willingness to engage 
change at his peak. The announcer and Hercule are shocked, and the announcer questions if the cameraman was able to capture the fight. However, the cameraman says he couldn't get something that fast. Cell, on the ground again, wipes a trickle of blood from the side of his mouth, and then starts up a Kamehameha. Goku yells at him to stop, as if he uses that wave with too much power, he'll destroy the Earth. Cell continues anyway, and so Goku heads up into the air, Cell then firing it off at him. The Kamehameha is tremendously huge, shooting way out into space, and Goku just barely manages to escape its path with instant transmission. Goku reappears behind Cell and kicks him before he can react. Cell is pissed and wants to know how the Saiyan can reappear and disappear at will. Goku says it's instant transmission, prompting Cell to state how annoying it is. Goku then questions Cell if he would have blown up the Earth if he hadn't jumped into the air, and Cell states he doesn't know, but he did know Goku was gonna try to fly to divert it. Cell states that he doesn't care about destroying the planet, but wants to have a little fun before then. The monster then charges forward before Goku can react and knocks Goku in the face. Goku tries to retaliate, but Cell hits him from behind, knocking Goku into the ground. Goku pushes himself up into the air, but Cell vanishes behind him, knocking Goku back into the ring. As Goku tries to recover, Cell vanishes behind him again, stating that even though he can't use instant transmission, he's confident in his own speed. Cell lands a forceful punch on Goku's face and attempts another, but Goku evades by ducking and counters by kicking Cell into the air. Goku swiftly teleports above Cell and delivers an aerial strike, only for it to be an illusion. The actual Cell emerges behind Goku, swiping at him, yet Goku narrowly manages to evade. Suspended in midair, they leave spectators like Hercule and the announcer puzzled about their whereabouts, while Krillin marvels at their incredible speed. Cell expresses his enjoyment of the battle and decides to eliminate the rule of ring outs as a mean of ending the fight prematurely. Realizing what he's about to do, Goku urgently shouts for everyone to move away from the ring as Cell lowers his hands toward the ground, poised to obliterate it. A massive explosion ensues, creating a gaping hole where the ring once stood. Everyone successfully escapes harm, thanks in part to number 16, who protected Hercule and the others. Despite 16's instructions for them to leave, they remain in place, confident that Hercule will get another turn to fight. Goku and Cell both touch down to the ground, and Cell remarks that their battleground is now the entire Earth. Victory will now hinge on either surrender or death as they agree to proceed. Cell launches a barrage of energy blasts, which Goku successfully evades, subsequently taking to the air. Preparing a Kamehameha attack, Goku draws Cell's attention. However, Cell warns Goku of the potential devastation if he were to unleash the attack from his current position, as it will put the Earth in jeopardy. Undeterred, Goku continues charging his blast, and as the attack nears completion, a look of surprise dawns on Cell's face, recognizing that Goku is truly preparing to unleash the blast, putting both him and the Earth at risk. Piccolo ponders whether Goku truly intends to unleash the full power Kamehameha. However, Krillin is skeptical, assuming Goku wouldn't risk destroying the Earth, a sentiment shared by Cell. Ignoring the doubts, Goku persists, and both Cell and Vegeta come to realize his determination. Unexpectedly, Goku teleports instantaneously and materializes directly in front of Cell. He unleashes the Kamehameha at full force, propelling Cell backward and blowing the top half of his body away. When the smoke dissipates, Cell's body, now devoid of its head and arms, lies on the ground. While Yamcha displays excitement, stating Goku's won, Trunks and Krillin remain silent. Goku acknowledges that Cell still possesses a significant amount of energy despite his state, prompting Krillin to shout that Cell is likely to regenerate. Remarkably, the remnants of Cell swiftly rise to its feet, undergoing a process of regeneration that culminates in the regrowth of its head and limbs. The announcer and Hercule react with astonishment, while Goku comprehends Cell's capacity for self-regeneration, just like Piccolo. Goku acknowledges his initial underestimation of the battle's intensity, though he notes that Cell's energy level has significantly diminished. Cell recognizes a similar decrease in Goku's energy and observes he looks tired. Advising Goku against spending energy needlessly, Cell cautions against jeopardizing the excitement of the fight. Goku agrees and launches a punch towards Cell, but Cell manages to evade. Goku successfully blocks a kick before succumbing to a blow to the face, and Cell is hit as well. Cell delivers a forceful punch to Goku, propelling him into a nearby mountain. Cell advances toward the Saiyan, who emerges from the rubble and launches a barrage of energy blasts. Goku pins Cell down, but Cell counters by creating a massive barrier to intercept the blast, a spectacle witnessed by the people worldwide through their televisions. At Kame House, Boma watches alongside Master Roshi, believing Goku is performing admirably. However, Roshi holds a different perspective. He doubts Goku's chances of victory, recognizing that his pupil is well aware of this predicament and suspects some hidden strategy. Back at the battlefield, the barrier dissipates, leaving Goku heavily panting. Cell remarks on Goku's apparent decrease in strength 
and offers him a sensu bean to even the odds, proposing a more exhilarating battle. Amidst the turmoil, Trunks implores Krillin to provide Goku with a sensu bean, asserting that it would ensure their victory. However, Vegeta rebukes Trunks, claiming that his suggestion lacks Saiyan pride. He believes Goku would rather die than win under such circumstances, and admits his frustration at realizing he couldn't surpass Goku, even with his specialized training. Vegeta reluctantly acknowledges Goku's innate genius, but recognizes Cell as being two steps above Goku. Trunks questions their role in the situation, and Vegeta counters that Trunks is usually the one speculating about Goku's hidden plans, urging him to have faith. Addressing Goku, Cell questions if his pride is preventing him from eating a sensu bean, suggesting that his odds of victory may increase slightly if he does. Goku maintains silence, then smirks, and his aura recedes. Everyone wonders what's going on, and suddenly, Goku admits defeat, stating that he understands how strong Cell is and that he can't beat him. Shock ripples through the Z Fighters and Cell, and the cameraman relays the surrender to Hercule in the announcer. Cell turns to Goku, emphasizing that if he indeed intends to surrender, the fate of the Earth is sealed. Goku, however, counters that there remains one more contender, and Cell dismisses the distinction, asserting that Vegeta and Trunks were both weaker than Goku. The announcer informs Hercule that he's up next, eliciting a distressed reaction from him. A sudden wave of stomach cramps hits Hercule, and he's unable to fight. Goku questions whether he can select the next fighter, leading Cell to realize that Goku is indeed contemplating surrender. Vegeta voices confusion about the situation, grappling with the realization that there appears to be no other fighters capable of defeating Cell. Goku states that the Cell games will conclude with this next fight. If the contender can't emerge victorious, nobody can. The identity of this person leaves everyone intrigued. Goku affirms his statement after battling Cell and expresses his confidence in the forthcoming combatant, entrusting the outcome entirely to this individual. Cell questions whether Goku implies that this contender is stronger than the both of them, to which Goku confirms. Eager to learn the identity, Cell questions further as everyone watches in silence. Goku then turns to his friends and calls on his own son, Gohan, to battle Cell next. The announcement stuns everyone, including Gohan himself. Piccolo deems Goku's decision foolish, seemingly willing to witness his son's demise. Goku ascends to the cliff where the others are and addresses Gohan, asking him if he thinks he can do it. Gohan's astonishment is noticeable, while Piccolo voices skepticism about Gohan's potential to fight. Goku claims that Gohan's strength is underestimated, pointing out that his son has always managed to keep pace with them, even as a little boy. He then goes on to say that even he wasn't nearly as strong as Gohan is when he was his age. Krillin expresses doubt regarding Gohan's considerable strength, but Goku reveals that within the hyperbolic time chamber, Gohan's latent powers began to manifest. Goku reminds Gohan of his previous bout with Cell, asking if at any moment he felt like Cell was too strong to handle. Gohan acknowledges that he never felt that way, but it had to be due to Goku only using partial strength. Goku, however, states that he can't speak for Cell, but he was giving the fight everything he had. Goku then questions Gohan on if it looked to him as if he was holding back, and Gohan confirms, shocking Vegeta, who struggles to fathom the extent of the young boy's power. Goku urges Gohan to take action, thereby restoring peace to the world and fulfilling his aspirations of becoming a scholar. As his father's words fuel him, Gohan agrees to fight, removing his armor and moving towards Cell. Goku then calls on Krillin for a sensu bean, which he promptly tosses to Cell, suggesting he eat it to restore his energy. Krillin and the others find this act to be completely foolish, while Goku is intent on ensuring a fair fight. Cell tells Goku that he'll regret his decision, but ingest the sensu bean anyway. Now reinvigorated, Cell powers up once again. Piccolo tells Goku his actions were reckless, and suddenly, Gohan embarks on a power-up of his own that generates a powerful shockwave, leaving everyone in awe. Astonishment dawns everyone's faces as they witness Gohan's astounding power, an exception being Goku, who seems unfazed by the display. Piccolo's surprised to see how Gohan's grown, while Vegeta questions how the young boy could have achieved such a remarkable surge in power. Cell concedes that Goku may have been telling the truth in describing Gohan's strength, yet he regards his assertion of Gohan's capability to defeat him as an exaggeration, one that will ultimately lead to his son's demise. Touching down, Cell's focus shifts to Gohan, initiating an attack with a kick that Gohan effectively blocks. Cell withdraws momentarily before launching another assault, but Gohan quickly evades each attempt. The two adversaries land back on solid ground, Cell stating that he'll need to use his full speed to catch Gohan. In a swift sequence of movements, Cell seizes Gohan by the shirt, delivering a powerful headbutt followed by a forceful blow to the face. Cell then hurls Gohan skyward, launching a shockwave to propel him through a series of mountains. Concern envelops Krillin and Trunks, while Chi-Chi, viewing from home alongside the Ox King, faints after seeing her child hurt. The announcer expresses bewilderment over the sudden 
sudden turn of events, and Piccolo lays the blame squarely on Goku for his naivety, contending that the Saiyan's actions are responsible for Gohan's death. Goku, however, tells Piccolo to calm down, assuring him that Gohan is still alive. Krillin and Trunks also detect Gohan's undiminished energy, but Cell, believing Gohan to be defeated, tells Goku to come on and continue their fight. Goku, however, redirects Cell's attention to a surprising development. Cell pivots, observing Gohan emerging from the rubble, remarkably unscathed. The sight of Gohan leaves Cell visibly astonished as he states he's tougher than he thought. Calmly, Gohan tells Cell to put an end to this fight as it's meaningless. Cell responds with laughter, asserting that the Cell games indeed possess meaning. For him, they serve as amusement, and for others, they represent Earth's salvation. Gohan then shares his perspective, disclosing that he lacks the desire to fight or to kill even someone as despicable as Cell. Cell acknowledges that he understands Gohan's aversion to fight, but doesn't understand why he wouldn't want to kill him. Gohan then tells Cell of what his father meant regarding his potential. He recalls that when consumed by anger, he harnessed an incredible and voluntary surge of power, leading to extraordinary combat abilities. Cell, however, dismisses Gohan's words as an attempt to intimidate him, countering by telling him that all he wants to do now is see the boy angry to know if he's telling the truth, then delivering a punch to Gohan's face. Cell delivers a forceful strike with his elbow to the back of Gohan's neck, promptly following it up with a kick that sends him flying. As Gohan regains his footing, Cell charges forward, launching a punch that Gohan expertly evades by leaping over it. In a swift counter, Gohan delivers a powerful kick to Cell's face, causing him to crash to the ground. Cell quickly rises, wiping a trace of blood from the corner of his mouth, determined to provoke Gohan's anger at any cost. Goku views Cell's attempt as advantageous, believing that Cell's efforts will trigger Gohan's dormant power. Suddenly, Cell launches a technique reminiscent of Frieza, a one-finger energy blast at Gohan, who narrowly evades each successive attack. Cell persists, firing a series of shots, with Gohan barely managing to avoid them all. Gohan successfully dodges one final blast, prompting Cell to close in and seize Gohan in a tight embrace, squeezing and inflicting excruciating pain on him. Cell continues to goad Gohan, pushing him to unleash his anger, but he refuses to do so. Despite Piccolo's urge to step in, Goku remains stern, asserting that Gohan's true power will only manifest if he gets angry. Goku reveals that this is the only means by which Cell can be defeated, and overhearing this conversation, the others are astounded by the potential of Gohan's power. Meanwhile, Cell maintains his grip on Gohan, persistently encouraging him to succumb to his anger. Piccolo then confronts Goku, expressing his concern and questioning if Gohan is aware of Goku's strategy. Piccolo suggests that Gohan's thoughts revolve around his father's apparent indifference to his suffering, perhaps due to prioritizing fairness in battle over Gohan's well-being. Piccolo tells Goku that despite his strength, Gohan's still a child, which prompts the Saiyan to second-guess himself. Eager to assist Gohan, Piccolo readies himself to intervene as Goku watches his son in awe. Goku then prompts Krillin to give him a sensu bean so he can help, but just as he was about to do so, Cell abruptly releases Gohan, stating he's persistent in his efforts to hide his true power. Cell guesses that if Gohan won't be enticed by his own suffering, perhaps the anguish of his friends will suffice. With determination, Cell sets a course toward Goku and the others, prompting Gohan to shout for him to stop. Cell ascends onto the cliff where the Z fighters are. Swiftly seizing the bag of Sensu from Krillin's grasp, Cell asserts that they could get in the way of his plans before returning to Gohan's side. With an air of superiority, Cell contends that individuals like Goku and the others stand no chance against his might. Gohan questions Cell's intentions, prompting Cell to reveal his scheme. He aims to instigate Gohan's anger by inflicting harm upon his friends, banking on the unleashed power that accompanies Gohan's fury. Gohan tells Cell to stop, stating that he's unable to control his anger at will. However, Cell explains that this is why he'll hurt his friends. Cell looks toward the cliff, drawing concerned warnings from Piccolo while Goku wishes he'd eaten a sensu bean when he had the chance. In a determined charge, Gohan lunges at Cell, only to be effortlessly kicked away. Cell urges Gohan to fully embrace his anger if he intends to harness its true potential, and suddenly, number 16 stealthily approaches from behind, executing an unconventional restraining hold on Cell. The unexpected move stuns everyone, and 16 reveals his plan to self-destruct, stating that Cell won't be able to survive a blast at such close range. Anticipation fills the air, yet the detonation fails to happen, perplexing 16. Krillin then yells to 16, stating that during his repair at Capsule Core, Dr. Brief found the bomb in his body and removed it as he thought it was too dangerous. Cell's sinister laughter follows as he mocks 16, culminating a fatal blast that reduces the android to mere fragments on the battlefield. The severed head of 16 lands nearby, and Cell tells him that he's always been a failed creation as he kicks him over to the nearby rock, frightening Hercules.
Eagle and the others. Cell shifts his focus back to the cliff, his attention now on the Z Fighters. He states that it's their turn next and counts seven of them all together. With what was once his tail, Cell then creates many replicas of himself, naming them Cell Juniors. Cell commands his newly spawned minions to engage their adversaries on the cliff, dispatching them with ruthless intent. Amidst Goku's urgent warnings for everyone to be careful, Vegeta and Trunks power up to Super Saiyan, and Cell remains convinced that victory is impossible for the Z Fighters, confident that the Cell Juniors will prove to be unbeatable. The Cell Juniors reach the cliff and select individual targets. One of them singles out Krillin, evading his punch and delivering a forceful kick that sends him flying to the ground. Krillin lands on his stomach, and the Cell Junior delivers a sharp knee to his back. In the midst of this chaos, Gohan thinks to himself that everyone except Trunks has been brought back to life with the Dragon Balls once already, meaning if anyone dies this time, it'll be forever. Exploiting Krillin's vulnerability, one Cell Junior kicks him while he's down, while another strikes Yamcha's face, and another inflicts a powerful kick on Tien. Gohan's frustration simmers, and Cell detects a subtle rise in his key. Cell urges Gohan to observe the ongoing battles, noting that Vegeta and Trunks are the only ones able to put up a decent fight. Cell goes on to say that Goku used up all his strength earlier, so it's only a matter of time before he falls as well. Yamcha's arm is dealt a powerful blow, and although Vegeta lands a punch, the Cell Jr. retaliates just as fiercely. Meanwhile, another Cell Jr. forcefully kicks Tien and propels him backward. Another targets Goku, delivering a knee to his midsection as the Saiyan apologizes to everyone, stating he didn't think things would turn out this way. Witnessing the ongoing carnage, Gohan realizes the incredible dormant strength within him but struggles internally, questioning how he can channel his anger effectively to defeat Cell. Amid the chaos, Hercule wonders what's going on while the announcer suggests a hasty retreat. However, 16's detached head speaks with Hercule, asking him to take him to Gohan. Hercule is of course hesitant at first, realizing the danger of the situation, but soon changes his mind, feeling he couldn't possibly run away while the no-named fighters were out there protecting them. Clutching 16's head, Hercule runs over to Gohan, getting instructions from the android to toss him over when the time is right. As the conflict escalates, a Cell Jr. flings Krillin into the side of a nearby rock, another strikes Yamcha while he's down, and Tien crashes heavily to the ground nearby. Overwhelmed by the brutality of the situation, Gohan begs for the violence to stop as tears run down his face. Observing the boy's emotional turmoil, Cell surmises that more is needed to draw out Gohan's full potential. He then commands the Cell Juniors to stop playing and kill their targets, which shocks Gohan. The boy's anger intensifies, and Cell urges the Cell Juniors to continue their assault. Amidst the chaos, Hercule throws 16's head, which lands between Cell and Gohan. 16 then imparts his words of wisdom onto Gohan, encouraging him to embrace his anger, releasing his inhibitions, and tapping into his inner strength. 16 then tells Gohan that there are those who words alone will not reach, and it's not a sin to fight for the right cause. While Cell mocks the wisdom of this advice, he remains committed to his own course of action. In his final words, 16 tells Gohan to protect the life he loved, and he's crushed beneath Cell's foot. Just then, a hush descends as Gohan's composed demeanor shatters, giving way to an immense scream that accompanies a profound surge in his power. The earth quivers beneath the force, capturing the attention of spectators who are left in awe, their focus now fixated on the newly transformed Gohan and the remarkable outpouring of energy. Gohan's transformation is evident as his hair lengthens and straightens, retaining its characteristic upright appearance while his aura radiates with lightning. With unwavering determination, Gohan strides resolutely towards Cell, stating he and the Cell Juniors will pay dearly for what they've done. Cell finds gratification in witnessing Gohan's true power. However, Gohan quickly snatches the bag of sensu beans from his grasp and takes off, much to his surprise. Gohan touches down beside a Cell Jr. standing over Krillin. Swift and relentless, he neutralizes the threat with a single powerful swipe, severing the Cell Jr.'s head. The display leaves everyone, particularly Cell, in a state of shock, but Goku responds with a knowing chuckle, having anticipated this outcome from the very beginning. The remaining Cell Jr juniors converge on Gohan, only to meet their demise in rapid succession. Gohan dispatches them effortlessly, each with a single decisive blow. As the 7th Cell Jr. attempts to flee, Gohan pursues and effortlessly disposes of it, severing its upper body with a single strike. Cell's surprise becomes evident, and the other Z Fighters stand in awe at Gohan's amazing power. Gohan then tosses the bag of sensu beans to Trunks, instructing him to take care of the others. Gohan lands alongside Cell, their gaze is locked in an intense standoff. The gravity of the situation isn't lost on Vegeta, unable to fathom the 
unfolding events. After receiving a sensu bean from Trunks, Krillin learns that Gohan had retrieved the beans from Cell. Trunks suggests retreating to a safer distance, but Krillin is captivated by Gohan's newfound transformation. Cell questions if Gohan genuinely believes he can beat him, and in response, Gohan confidently states his capability to overcome Cell. Somewhat taken aback, Cell then confidently promises to unleash his full fury on Gohan. Yamcha, now healed along with Trunks, Krillin, and Vegeta, observed from a distance as Cell begins his power surge, causing a massive dust storm. As the dust settles, Gohan remains undeterred, while Goku remarks that Cell is now using his full power. Cell announces his intent to get serious, but Gohan remains unfazed, telling him he still looks weak, leaving Cell both shocked and amused. Without warning, Cell lunges at Gohan, landing a blow to his face. Gohan staggers momentarily, but seems mostly unfazed, much to Cell's disbelief. As Cell attempts another punch, Gohan deflects it, retaliating with a forceful hit to Cell's stomach. Reeling from the impact, Cell swiftly tries to strike Gohan, who effortlessly dodges and counterattacks with a powerful uppercut, launching Cell backwards. Bloodied and battered, Cell struggles to comprehend the immense damage he sustained from merely two of Gohan's hits, while Goku stands proud and Vegeta still in awe at what he's witnessing. Cell struggles to come to terms with the unfolding situation while Gohan approaches him. Attempting a kick, Cell tries to attack Gohan, but the half Saiyan effortlessly blocks Cell's move. Seizing the opportunity, Gohan delivers a powerful kick to Cell's face, sending him skidding across the terrain. Rising, a mix of fear and disbelief are evident in Cell's eyes as Gohan comes closer. Struggling to fathom the existence of a being mightier than him, Cell's face fills with fear. However, a sly grin crosses his face as he hatches a plan, stating that he still won't lose. Ascending, Cell begins to channel all his energy into a Kamehameha directed squarely at Gohan below. The implication is clear, if Gohan dodges, the earth will be destroyed. Panic ensues amongst the Z fighters, but Gohan remains composed. As Cell releases his massive energy wave, Gohan responds in kind, beginning with a quiet Kamehame, and as the energy approaches him rapidly, he intensifies his cry, releasing his own wave. The power behind Gohan's attack repels Cell's beam, forcing it skyward and creating a shockwave that pushes everyone back. Cell is hit squarely, with his energy beam eventually venturing into the cosmos. The aftermath reveals a severely damaged Cell, missing several limbs and part of his head, while Gohan stands confidently below, wearing a triumphant smirk. Cell is in disbelief at the overwhelming power before him, while Vegeta remarks on how Gohan managed to outdo Cell's already colossal Kamehameha with an even more immense one. Gohan maintains his confident stance, eliciting urgent cries from Goku to swiftly end Cell's reign of terror. Gohan, however, playfully retorts as he figures ending Cell so soon wouldn't be fun, and he deserves to suffer more. Goku and Piccolo are taken aback by this unexpected sentiment from Gohan, and as Cell begins his regeneration process, Goku emphasizes that Gohan is the only one who can defeat him, and he should hurry before Cell does something drastic. Gasping for breath, an enraged Cell lets out a furious scream. His body enlarges in fury, showcasing his immense muscles. Landing, he reveals a deranged smile and declares he'll never lose. As he lunges at Gohan, his attacks are easily evaded. Trunks points out that Cell has taken on a form prioritizing raw strength over agility, recalling it as a tactical error he'd been warned against in the past. In an unexpected turn of events, Gohan rushes in and viciously kicks Cell in the face, contorting his already bloody demeanor with a crack now evident in his head. Cell contorts in discomfort and regurgitates number 18 from his body, much to the surprise of the Z Fighters. This causes Cell to revert to his previous form, prompting Gohan to mock the monster as his power decreases, infuriating Cell further. As Cell screams in anger, his body begins to swell and inflate dramatically, catching Gohan's attention. The scene is thick with tension as everyone tries to comprehend the situation. However, Goku senses imminent danger. With a sinister laugh, Cell reveals his plan to self-destruct within one minute, taking both Gohan and everyone else with him. He taunts Gohan who planned to intervene, claiming any assault would hasten his explosive end. As Cell continues to swell with energy, the countdown ensues and panic grips the group. Gohan is filled with regret, recalling Goku's prior warning about eliminating Cell quickly. Blaming himself, Gohan despairs at the dire predicament they're now in. As the clock ticks down, Trunks speculates they have only 10 seconds, while Piccolo grimly acknowledges the Earth's impending doom and Cell revels in their despair. Suddenly, a determined Goku looks at his companions and offers a resigned smile. He states that he only knows of one way way to save the earth and bids a farewell to everyone. In a blink, he vanishes, leaving Krillin
wanted to fearfully speculate his intention. As Cell gleefully counts down the final moments, savoring Gohan's distress, Goku re-emerges, touching Cell's grotesque form. He offers words of encouragement to Gohan and an apologetic message for Chi-Chi before teleporting once more, this time taking Cell with him. Those left behind, Gohan, Krillin, Vegeta, Piccolo, Trunks, Yamcha, and Tien watch in various states of emotion. Elsewhere, on King Kai's planet, the Kai registers shock as Goku and Cell suddenly appear. Goku hurriedly apologizes as he had nowhere else to go, but before more could be said, Cell detonates, taking the Kai, his planet, and Goku with him. Back on Earth, the group is in disbelief, especially as Piccolo notes the disappearance of Goku's life energy. Gohan lets out a heart-wrenching call to his father, slamming his fist into the ground. Meanwhile, the announcer is puzzled, questioning Cell's sudden disappearance. Approaching the devastated Gohan, Krillin confronts him, emphasizing that both he and Goku have successfully ended the threat. Gohan reflects, regretting not heeding his father's advice earlier, but Krillin, while trying to uplift Gohan's spirits, reminds him of Earth's safety. He then collects the unconscious number 18, telling Gohan that Goku died with pride, reflecting on his son's growth. Elsewhere in the afterlife, Goku, now sporting a halo with bubbles in King Kai, expresses remorse for his actions. The trio, hovering beside Snake Wei, discuss their current predicament. An irate King Kai berates Goku for sacrificing him for the Earth. Goku, however, apologizes once more, justifying his split-second decision. A curious Goku questions Cell's whereabouts, speculating if he ended up in hell. King Kai then has an alarming realization, as all souls must first face King Yama for judgment, which implies Cell might still be alive. On Earth, Vegeta confronts Krillin about his intentions with the android, urging him to end her. Krillin, however, sees good in her and refuses. Their discussion is cut short by a sudden disturbance, as a large smoke cloud appears, much to everyone's surprise. Recognizing the familiar energy signature, the group is horrified as a beam pierces Trunks through the chest, knocking him down to the ground. Emerging from the haze is Cell, now with an aura similar to Gohan's powered up state, leaving everyone in shock. Cell begins to explain how he survived thanks to the resilience of his core, a small nucleus within him. He shares that as long as this nucleus remains intact, he can regenerate no matter the damage. Despite being unsure of his recovery after the explosion, he was fortunate that his nucleus remained undamaged. He reveals that his body also regenerated to its perfect form without number 18, and even beyond, attributing this to his Saiyan cells as they amplify one's power after near-death experiences. He also discloses that he mastered Goku's instant transmission technique, ironically thanking Goku for it. As the revelation sinks in, Vegeta seethes with anger for Trunks, while Gohan, gathering his resolve, prepares for what's next. Recharged, Gohan's aura crackles to life once more, a smirk displaying on his face. Curious, Cell questions Gohan's amusement, to which the young Saiyan retorts about avenging his father. Cell is dismissive, confident about his advantage this time, while Vegeta, with a look of horror, glances back at the fallen Trunks. Filled with rage, he screams out and charges at Cell, transforming into a Super Saiyan mid-flight. He releases a large energy blast and a barrage of blasts following suit, causing massive destruction. Yet, emerging from the aftermath, an unscathed Cell catches Vegeta off guard, easily knocking him down. Poised to deliver a finishing blow, Cell releases an energy blast at the Saiyan, and in an act of desperation, Gohan intervenes, shielding Vegeta from the impact. The force of the blast has severely injured Gohan's left arm, leaving it bloody and limp, much to Cell's satisfaction. Piccolo shouts in concern for Gohan, while Krillin grumbles about Vegeta's impulsiveness, noting that Trunks could have been resurrected with the Dragon Balls. Declaring the end of the battle, Cell's tone becomes ominous, while Gohan, sensing a significant increase in Cell's strength, becomes apprehensive. Piccolo inquires about any remaining Sensu Beans, but Krillin reveals they're all gone. Preparing for another Kamehameha, Cell vows to completely annihilate the Earth. As Cell powers up, a troubled Gohan braces for what comes next. Internalizing his failure, Gohan reflects, apologizing to his father for letting him down as he couldn't protect the Earth. Vegeta regaining consciousness, expresses his regret for becoming a hindrance and apologizes to Gohan. Observing Vegeta's uncharacteristic apology, Gohan looks in surprise, realizing that Vegeta must know that they have no chance of winning. Meanwhile, Piccolo screams, realizing the gravity of the situation and curses their lack of power. As Cell gathers energy for his blast, the Earth trembles and he boasts about possessing enough energy to destroy the entire solar system. Around the world, citizens panic due to sudden tremors. The announcer at the battlefield describes Cell's radiant and alarming aura, while Hercule dismisses 
dismisses it as an illusion. Cell challenges Gohan for one final defense, but Gohan, void of hope, acknowledges the futility of any resistance. Cell then mocks Gohan, anticipating a swift conclusion to the battle. However, a voice appears from thin air, telling Gohan not to surrender. Gohan searches for its source, learning that it's his father communicating from the afterlife, urging him to unleash a full force Kamehameha. Despite Gohan's objections due to his injuries and diminished strength, Goku assures him of his potential. Cell, misinterpreting the situation, thinks Gohan's lost his mind and is talking to himself. Goku's comforting words and encouragement spark new hope in Gohan, who apologizes for being the cause of his father's demise. Goku, however, brushes off the guilt, conveying his contentment in the afterlife and wishing Gohan a fulfilling life. Determined, Gohan adopts a stance that astonishes all, especially his comrades. With a single-handed gesture, he begins to charge up his Kamehameha, mirroring Cell's energy. Despite Piccolo's doubts about Gohan's capabilities given the visible differences in their power levels, Gohan releases his Kamehameha in response to Cell's. In this intense moment, an apparition of Goku, hands positioned for the blast, appears to support his son. The two colossal Kamehameha waves surge toward each other, and recognizing the imminent danger, Piccolo urges everyone to evacuate. Krillin assists 18, while Tien and Yamcha tend to Trunks' lifeless body. As the beams clash, an enormous explosion ensues, ravaging the landscape as Earth trembles from the immense force exerted by both Gohan and Cell. Piccolo fears the worst, while Cell exclaims he'll finish everyone off now. Urging him forward, Goku tells his son to push on and let his power explode. Gohan responds, asserting he's giving it his all, but Goku counters, stating he's holding back as he's worrying about the Earth. He tells Gohan not to worry, as any damage done can be fixed by the Dragon Balls. In a climactic twist, Cell, about to declare victory, is unexpectedly struck in the face by a beam in the distance. He finds an emboldened Vegeta responsible for the attack, and seizing the moment, Gohan channels every bit of energy into his Kamehameha, overpowering Cells. The impact annihilates Cell entirely, down to his core, and after the final explosion, exhausted and reverting from his Super Saiyan state, Gohan collapses. The aftermath reveals a vast crater in the spot once occupied by Cell, and those present reel with shock of Gohan's victory. Goku beams with pride, and a wearied Gohan grins, catching his breath. Piccolo is in disbelief that Gohan succeeded, and Yamcha is overjoyed. Landing beside Gohan, the group consists of Piccolo, Yamcha, Krillin Cradling 18, and Tien holding trunks. Yamcha showers Gohan with praise, and since they're out of sensu beans, Krillin suggests seeking Dende. Yamcha then takes a tired Gohan, while Tien with trunks, and Krillin with 18 depart. Before leaving, Piccolo questions if Vegeta needs help, but Vegeta with pride declares he doesn't need help from anyone. As Piccolo departs with a smirk, Vegeta initially sits in silence, acknowledging he's been utterly beaten by both Goku and his son. Frustrated that Goku gave up his life, Vegeta goes his own way, vowing to never fight again. Meanwhile, Hercule after rising realizes everyone's gone. When the announcer rises and questions Cell's whereabouts, Hercule confidently declares that he defeated Cell. He dismisses the previous fighter's tactics as mere tricks, and upon broadcasting Hercule's claimed victory, global celebrations erupt in his honor. At the lookout, Dende restores number 18. As Yamcha warns Dende of the possible danger, Krillin calms him, revealing Gohan's triumph over Cell. 18 learns of Gohan's power and is cautioned by Yamcha against any retaliation. She's reminded by Piccolo of Krillin's compassion after she was spit up by Cell, and out of nowhere, Gohan suggests Krillin's love for 18, earning a smack on the head. 18, however, dismisses the notion, departing after calling Krillin a runt. An agitated Yamcha threatens to teach 18 a thing or two, but is checked by Tien, who knows he'll do no such thing. Piccolo then stresses the priority of resurrecting those who were killed by Cell, and Gohan tries to console Krillin, although it doesn't work. As Mr. Popo produces the Dragon Balls, Shenron is summoned under a darkened sky. Yamcha wishes to revive those who were killed by Cell, and Trunks rises, yet Goku remains undetected by Piccolo. A second request to resurrect that Goku is rejected by Shinron, leaving the group to contemplate another way to bring their hero back. However, from the afterlife, Goku conveys a heartfelt message to his friends, telling them not to revive him. He acknowledges being a magnet for villains as stated by Bulma and King Kai, and contemplates a peaceful earth without him. Enjoying a unique status in the afterlife, Goku looks forward to endless challenges in meeting new people. Goku reassures everyone that he's happy where he is, and tells Gohan that he has nothing left to teach him, as he's strong now than he ever was. As the Saiyan bids a farewell to his son and friends, an image of him 
appears in the sky, Krillin noting that even in death, Goku looks cheerful. As the group struggle with Goku's departure, Shenron floats idly by, waiting for the second wish. Shenron grows impatient, prompting the group to make a wish or forfeit their opportunity. Yamcha suggests a necklace for his girlfriend, however, Krillin wishes to transform number 17 and 18 back to regular humans. Unable to do this due to their overwhelming power, Shenron declines. 18 observes discreetly, appearing surprised at Krillin's wish. Yamcha questions why Krillin tried to use the wish for 17, to which Piccolo states that 17 was also brought back to life. Refocusing, Krillin questions if Shenron can instead remove the explosives from the androids' bodies. Shenron states that this wish is possible as it doesn't interfere with the power of the androids. He then grants the wish and bids a farewell, departing as the Dragon Balls scatter across the earth. Trunks inquires about Krillin's motive behind the wish, and Krillin expresses sympathy for the androids, burdened by having a bomb in them as 18 sits discreetly, contemplating on what just happened. When asked about why Krillin helped 17 as well, he states he might just be perfect for 18, contemplating her to come out of hiding, exclaiming that her and 17 are twins. 18 tells Krillin not to get the wrong idea about her, and tells him that she's not thanking him for his wish. However, she turns around before leaving, telling Krillin that she'll see him soon. Yamcha encourages Krillin, suggesting the possibility of romance, while Piccolo remains perplexed by human emotions. As Krillin admits mixed feelings as he still misses Goku, the group disperses. Tien departs for home, telling the group he'll probably never see them again and wishes Trunks the best of luck with the androids in his future. Yamcha decides to leave as well, and Trunks shares his plans to return to the future after a night's rest. Piccolo confirms his residence at the lookout, and after a few farewells, Gohan, Trunks, Yamcha, and Krillin part ways. As they travel, Yamcha enlightens Trunks about Vegeta's reaction to his death, and at Goku's home, Gohan consoles a grieving Chi Chi. The following day sees a farewell gathering for Trunks, with attendees donning their best attire. An appreciative exchange between Trunks and Vegeta marks the occasion, and as Trunks departs in his time machine, an image of Goku lingers among Gohan and his friends. In Trunks' future within West City, he returns via the time machine. Greeting his mother Bulma, she remarks on his growth. He details his time in the hyperbolic time chamber at the lookout, where a day equates to a year of training. As he recounts his experiences, he mentions Goku's death, Gohan's subsequent vengeance, and even Vegeta's emotional reaction to his own demise, which astonishes Bulma. Their conversation is interrupted, however, by news of the androids attacking Parsley City. Confident, Trunks assures Bulma of his eventual success before transforming into a Super Saiyan and departing. In the midst of destruction, number 18 wreaks havoc while 17 observes, attributing her rage to a lost video game. Their banter is disrupted when an old man manages to shoot 17 in the face. In retaliation, 17 wastes no time, taking the gun that he had in his holster and shooting the old man. Soon after, Trunks arrives, declaring his intention to end the androids. In disbelief of Trunks' reappearance, the androids confront him, thinking they'll once again be able to have their way with him. Yet with his newfound power, Trunks swiftly defeats number 18, much to 17's surprise. Trunks then proceeds to overcome 17 in the name of his fallen friends and Gohan, destroying him as well via the bomb in his body. Declaring the battle unfinished, Trunks hints at one more threat looming. Fast forwarding three years, the time machine is ready for a round trip. As Trunks prepares for departure, he anticipates an attack from Cell. Confronting Cell, Trunks reveals he's aware of the plot and he declares the plan's failure and prepares for the showdown. Cell, taken aback by Trunks' confidence, processes his claims. Trunks confidently asserts that Cell was powerful in his perfect form, but Trunks believes that he can defeat him in the form he's in now. Piecing together the puzzle, Cell deduces Trunks' knowledge stems from time traveling, but skeptical, he mentions his surveillance data, which suggests Trunks couldn't even best the androids. Trunks then questions Cell on their current absence, prompting Cell to realize Trunks has defeated them after all. In disbelief, Cell is suddenly sent airborne by a shockwave from Trunks, who pursues him to a desolate terrain. Upon landing, a Super Saiyan transformation engulfs Trunks, prompting Cell to muster his strength as well. As Trunks vows to stop Cell's time-traveling ambitions, their clash ensues. Trunks gains the upper hand, landing a punch that leaves Cell reeling. Despite Cell's desperate tail strike, Trunks adeptly maneuvers, spinning Cell around and throwing him into the air. As Cell prepares to launch a Kamehameha wave at Trunks, he notices as the Super Saiyan powers up immensely, subsequently launching a devastating blast that eradicates Cell completely. Victorious, Trunks reverts to his original state, expressing his gratitude to Goku and the others before heading home, where Bulma warmly greets him. After enduring a rough future, Trunks, alongside Bulma and others, finally relishes true peace. 
The Majin Buu arc takes place seven years after the events of the Cell Saga. We're introduced to a town named after Hercule, who was believed to have saved the Earth from Cell's perfect form. A few thugs decide to rob the Hercule City Bank and start shooting up the place. Meanwhile, Gohan rides in on the flying Nimbus in that direction. Gohan is now 16, having been homeschooled up until this point. Chi Chi set it up though so he could now commute to the high school in Hercule City. Gohan decides to land a few blocks away from the school and bids a farewell to Nimbus for now. He sprints down the road at super speed, but notices the bank robbery nearby. Gohan takes the opportunity to transform into a Super Saiyan to disguise himself and beats up the bank robbers, catching bullets and turning over their truck to prevent them from escaping. He then runs off, leaving the rest to the police. Gohan powers down around the corner, and just then, a girl with a white shirt and two ponytails comes up to him from behind and wonders what happened to the robbers. Gohan says he didn't see, and while the girl stands disappointed that she couldn't stop them herself, he sneaks off in the other direction. An old man then calls the girl now known as Videl, and tells her that the one responsible for this was the Golden Warrior yet again. The man tells her how powerful he was, and says he was coincidentally wearing the same school badge that she was wearing on her shirt. Videl remains suspicious, and we cut to Orange Star High School, as she asks a guy with blonde hair named Sharpner if he's the Golden Warrior, but he denies it. A blonde girl then wonders if the Golden Warrior is stronger than Hercule, but a nerdy kid says there's no way, as he's the champion who saved the Earth. The professor then walks into the room and introduces everyone to their new classmate, Gohan, who nervously comes in and finds a seat next to the blonde girl who finds him attractive. She introduces herself as Eliza and then introduces Videl, telling Gohan that her father is none other than Hercule himself. She then says that had it not been for Videl's father, none of them would be alive. Cutting off the conversation, Videl then recognizes Gohan from the bank robbery scene in the morning. The students discuss the Golden Warrior and how he's been mysteriously appearing, causing Gohan to realize everybody's already made a legend out of him. Videl states the description she got matches Gohan's appearance, but Eliza and Sharpner both dismiss this, stating that Gohan likely isn't a fighter. Videl thinks to herself though, recalling watching a video of the Cell games long ago and witnessing someone transforming with golden hair. We cut to gym class, where Gohan prepares to play baseball with his classmates. Sharpner steps up to bat and knocks Videl's pitch out of the park, but Gohan jumps way into the air to catch it. The class is stunned, and Gohan feels as though he may have overdid it, but steps up next to bat, thinking to himself that he shouldn't hit the ball to avoid unnecessary attention. Sharpner, meanwhile, as pitcher, decides to teach Gohan a lesson by throwing the ball towards his face to scare him. However, Gohan takes the impact of the ball face first with no damage, shocking the class and making Videl even more suspicious. After school, she decides to follow Gohan to get answers, but he realizes she's following him and flies atop a building to avoid detection. Gohan then rides off on the flying Nimbus to head for Bulma, thinking he'll need a disguise to keep his powers a secret. Gohan later arrives at Capsule Corp, where Bulma tells him she'll be able to create a costume for him in two hours. Meanwhile, Gohan runs into Kid Trunks growing up since the battle with Cell, all sweaty from training with Vegeta, who's grooming him to be even stronger than Gohan. Vegeta then greets Gohan, telling him that times may be peaceful now, but if he continues to slack off on his training, he'll become rusty. Two hours come and go, and Gohan puts on his costume, endowed in an orange helmet and red cape, which pleases him greatly. Trunks doesn't think it's very cool, but Gohan takes off on Nimbus, thanking Bulma for all her help. On the way home, Gohan realizes that if he puts his new disguise on, he won't have to worry about anyone seeing him flying. He then transforms and races Nimbus for fun, but is interrupted as he witnesses a car driving recklessly through a city. Gohan lands in front of the car and tells the driver to stop, as two guys get out and ask who he is, prepared to threaten him with their weapons. Gohan then introduces himself as the Great Saiyan Man, but the two guys laugh at him. Irritated, Gohan crushes the ground beneath him with a single stomp, telling the two guys to stop making fun of him as he spent a lot of time thinking up his hero name. Fearful for their lives, the two agree and drive off, saying that they'll practice safe driving from now on. The next day at Goku's house, Gohan leaves for school as the great Saiyan man, but not before saying goodbye to his mother Chi Chi and little brother Goten, a boy who looks exactly like Goku and was conceived before the Cell games. Gohan later arrives at school, talking with a student who wonders if he's heard of a new hero who arrived in town, and he isn't the Golden Warrior. The student says he looks a little funny, but his name is the Great Tire Man or something, but Gohan corrects him in saying it's the Great Saiyan Man. Later in class, Videl's watch starts beeping, alerting her that there was a robbery in progress. She rushes out of the classroom to get there, and Gohan wonders where she's going, but Sharpner and the others tell him not to worry, as she's the daughter of Hercule and can handle herself. Gohan feeling uneasy though, yells to go to the bathroom and rushes out, transforming into the Great Saiyan Man to assist, although he'll have to wait to sense Videl's key, given he doesn't know where she went. Meanwhile, Videl arrives on 
on the scene with the robbers she heard about and tells them to give up the easy way or they might get hurt. The biggest of the two isn't afraid though, underestimating Videl and stating nobody is stronger than him. He tries to grab her, but is met with a solid kick to the chin, alerting the great Saiyan man of Videl's position as he flies off to help. Back at the scene, Videl handles the robber with ease, knocking him around as Saiyan man watches in the distance, surprised that she can handle herself. The robber continues to get knocked around and eventually falls unconscious, but Saiyan man notices that his partner is preparing to shoot Videl, causing him to spring into action and crush the firearm with his bare hands, much to everyone's surprise. The partner wonders who this mysterious man is, to which the hero performs a special dance and introduces himself as the great Saiyan man, having Videl think he looks ridiculous. Determined not to get caught though, the remaining robber throws down a smoke bomb and jumps into his car to escape. However, Saiyan man flies after him, shocking Videl. The robber thinks he's gotten away, but is knocked over the head by Saiyan man and brought back to Videl to be detained. Videl acknowledges Saiyan man's strength, but is curious about who he really is. Having an idea, she calls him by the name Gohan, to which he foolishly responds, alerting her of his identity and the two take off together in her airship. Videl wonders why Gohan decided to wear such a strange costume, to which he replies he just wanted to live a normal life. She wonders if Gohan is actually the golden warrior as well, but he denies it, thinking to himself that those powers must remain a secret. Videl believes him and proceeds to wonder if he'll be participating in the world martial arts tournament this year. Gohan pretends to be oblivious, but Videl points out that the former champion of the tournament was named Son Goku, who shares the same family name as Gohan. She surmises that Gohan is Goku's son and blackmails him to join the tournament to fight her, otherwise she'll tell everyone that he's the great Saiyan man. Gohan of course agrees, and the two head back to class separately to avoid suspicion, as the students make fun of Gohan for being in the bathroom for so long. Back at Capsule Core, Gohan tells Bulma that he'll be entering the World Martial Arts Tournament since Videl forced him. However, he still wants to remain anonymous to his classmates that would be in attendance, so he wonders if Bulma can make him something simple to keep him from being noticed. Because certain devices aren't allowed at the tournament, Bulma gives Gohan a bandana and shades, which pleases him greatly. She says he probably won't have to put in much effort against the competition, but Vegeta cuts in, saying he'll be participating as well. He says how there was a wide gap between he and Gohan's power seven years ago, but now he wants to test his power again. Suddenly, everyone hears a voice off in the distance, and Gohan gets excited, realizing it's Goku's. In the afterlife using communication through King Kai, Goku says that he'll be joining the tournament this year too, as he asked Baba to take him to Earth for one day, much to the satisfaction of Gohan and Vegeta, who patiently await his return. Bulma tells Gohan to let everyone know as soon as possible, and he takes off to Kame House first. Krillin and 18 are there with their daughter as well as Master Roshi, and Krillin gets excited about seeing Goku again. 18 wonders about the prize money and gets pumped about it being 10 million zenny for first place, telling Krillin that they'll both be participating. Gohan then flies off to the lookout next, where he tells Piccolo, Dende, and Mr. Popo the good news. Piccolo decides to participate in the tournament as well, and Gohan takes off to go home. On the way, he says that Bulma will probably contact Yamcha, and there's also Tien and Chaozu, but he can't find them anywhere. He knows though that Chi Chi will be happy to find out Goku is coming home for the day, but wonders if she'll let him join the tournament. Later that night though, Gohan's worries are put to bed, as not only is Chi Chi excited about her husband's return, but she's eager to win 10 million zenny for their family, telling Gohan he can go to school later and train in the meantime. Before bed, Gohan tells Goten to come train with him in the morning, and as dawn breaks, the two begin, with Gohan transformed to a Super Saiyan. Eager to work on his reflexes first, Gohan grabs a stack of rocks and tells Goten to launch them at him as fast as he can. Goten is worried that he's standing a little too close, but Gohan's confident in his abilities and tells him it's okay. Goten throws the first rock though at top speed, nearly hitting Gohan in the face, much to his surprise. Goten is happy that his brother is so strong and gets ready to throw some more, but Gohan frantically moves Goten back a bit so he won't get hurt. After some more throws, Goten asks Gohan if he can be like him, a Super Saiyan. Gohan laughs though, saying that he'd have to train hard to achieve that level of power and that he isn't ready yet. Goten makes his older brother eat his words though, as he effortlessly transforms into a Super Saiyan the moment after, shocking Gohan. Gohan wonders how long he's been a Super Saiyan, but Goten says he's not sure. Gohan then says the two should spar together, and Goten springs into action. The two trade a few blows with Gohan on the defensive, and he jumps in the air to fly and gain some distance. Goten, however, tells him it's not fair as he can't fly himself, making Gohan wonder how the heck he's able to achieve such a transformation but hasn't learned how to fly. Just then, he notices an airship in the distance and spots Fidel, on her way to his house now as he'll have to teach her how to fly as well. Before heading back, Gohan tells his younger brother not to show off any of his strength to her, 
especially his Super Saiyan transformation. The two then sprint back home, and Gohan acknowledges Goten's incredible potential. Goten states, however, that Trunks is a bit stronger than him, prompting Gohan to think he needs to train harder, otherwise he'll be left in the dust by a few kids. Back at home, Chi Chi interrogates Videl, thinking she's come to date Gohan. Videl, however, denies this, and the two brothers arrive. Gohan wonders how Videl was able to find his home, and she tells him she found his address and some documents at school. The two then prepare to head off for flight training, but not before Chi Chi makes another comment about Videl trying to seduce her son. The three begin their training, and Gohan explains the art of key control, stating that it's all you really need to learn how to fly. Videl, of course, is confused on what key is, but Goten explains by shooting a blast from his hand to destroy a nearby boulder, much to her shock. Videl at first thinks key must be some sort of trick, similar to her father during the Cell games, but Gohan tells her that it's real and urges Goten to go play somewhere so he can teach her the basics of key and how to control it. Later that day, Videl progresses in learning key control, but still isn't ready to fly just yet. Meanwhile in the afterlife, Goku trains in base form with some heavy weights on his arms and legs under King Kai. Not long after, the South Kai appears. Surprised Goku is training with a total of 8 tons. He however attempts to brag to King Kai about one of his own champions, which doesn't worry him in the least. Instead, King Kai decides to demonstrate Goku's superiority over all others by changing his training weights to 40 tons total and allowing him to use Super Saiyan, leaving the South Kai in awe. Back on Earth, Videl has already learned to float in the air after only one day of training. She however pales in comparison to Goten, who's zipping around like a bird now. Gohan assures her that she'll improve in time, but Videl says she'll be back tomorrow for more training. Before she leaves though, Gohan tells her that her hair would be better if it were cut short, prompting Videl to blush and ask if he likes girls with short hair. Gohan however says it's not about that and relates it to fighting, which makes her angry as she flies away. The next day though, Videl returns with her hair cut short much to Gohan's confusion. As the World Martial Arts Tournament draws near, we cut to Capsule Court, where Vegeta trains in a gravity room with Trunks at 150 times Earth's normal gravity. Vegeta tells his son that it's too much for him and that he should leave, but Trunks has a better idea and transforms into a Super Saiyan, same as Goten, much to the shock of the Saiyan Prince. As Trunks runs around the room with ease, Vegeta wonders when turning into a Super Saiyan became so easy. He then calls Trunks over, offering to take him to the amusement park if he can land just one hit to his face. Trunks then rushes in, throwing a barrage of punches toward Vegeta and lands a minor hit to the side of his face. Vegeta however gets a little carried away and punches Trunks straight in the face, knocking him to the floor. As his son begins to cry, Vegeta tells him that they'll still be going to the amusement park, but first asks Trunks who's stronger between him and Goten. Trunks states that he's a little stronger and we cut to Videl who can float even higher than before now. She however says she'll keep coming back until she can fly like Goten, prompting Gohan to tell his younger brother to stop flying so fast when she's around. Videl then takes a break and tells Gohan to keep her flying abilities a secret from her dad, as she's not even supposed to be around any guys that aren't as strong as him. Gohan then thinks to himself that Videl isn't even aware that she's far stronger than her father, prompting him to ask if she'd be mad if one day someone beat him. She says she wouldn't be though, and says he needs to learn some humility, as he's been using his fame to meet other women since her mom passed away. Gohan then thinks to himself that this is great, as she won't be upset when he beats her in the tournament. Before heading off, Videl asks Gohan who taught him martial arts, to which he replies his father who passed away and his friends. Goten then foolishly blurts out that their dad will be returning for the tournament though, upsetting Gohan. Videl is confused at first, but assumes their father must have abandoned them and secretly sent them a note that he'd be returning behind their mother's back. Gohan decides not to correct her, and after 10 days, Videl was able to fly freely like Goten and the two brothers continue their training alone. Finally the day of the tournament arrives, and on on the Capsule Core airship, the Dragon Team and the rest of the Peanut Gallery greet one another, Bulma asking Yamcha if he'll be participating, but Yamcha replies no, as he'd be an embarrassment. Gohan then tells Vegeta, Goten, and Trunks that they should refrain from becoming Super Saiyans, as everyone will recognize them from the battle with Cell seven years ago. The three agree, and everyone arrives at the tournament, where Hercule touches down as well, getting swarmed by the press and adoring fans as the man who supposedly saved the Earth. As Chi Chi wonders where her husband might be, Goku touches down and greets everyone with a smile, and we witness tears from some of the group's members as the majority rush in to hug him. Fortune Teller Baba is with him, and tells Goku that he has 24 hours before he has to return to the afterlife, and not long after, Goku notices Goten, who's hiding behind his mother. The Dragon Team then begin registering for the tournament, and everyone heads off to get started. As the team head toward the preliminaries, Goku notices Krillin isn't naturally bald, as he reveals he used to shave it back then. Goten and Trunks discuss who the strongest between their dads 
is, and Goku notices Android 18, who Krillin reveals is his wife who lives with him at Master Roshi's house. He also says the little girl he saw earlier is their daughter, which surprises Goku. The group head toward the locker rooms and get changed, then run into the tournament's announcer, who immediately recognizes Goku and Krillin. He greets them excitedly and whispers that he knows Hercule wasn't the one who defeated Cell, but the Dragon Team, which makes Goku smile. The preliminaries begin with only 16 people allowed to participate, which will be decided on a rating from a punch machine that everyone will have a chance to try. To demonstrate, Hercule comes out in his first up, but is immediately swarmed by the press. Piccolo uses his glare to destroy all the cameras there and in the audience to help Gohan out, so nobody will find out about his true identity. Hercule of course puts on a show for his punch, getting a score of 137 points, which shocks the entire crowd. As the champ leaves, the Dragon Team step up next, 18 being the first to get her score, although Krillin tells her to dial her strength back. 18 receives a score of 774 points, but retries to look weaker with 203. The rest of the group continue on in advance with scores higher than Hercule, shocking the other contestants. Vegeta then steps up, unwilling to hold back his power and completely destroys the punch machine, leaving everyone in awe as he and the group move on to watch Goten and Trunks in the junior division matches. As Videl tries to make sense of everything that's going on, the junior division starts and the world champion Hercule runs out to give his good luck to the kids, but not before making a fool of himself in the process. Backstage, Trunks and Goten talk about what they'll do with the prize money if they win, when suddenly, a kid with a ridiculous looking mullet tries to scare Trunks before he faces off against him in the first round. Trunks, however, is unfazed as we cut back to Hercule's speech, Krillin acknowledging that the Budokai became too fancy and Piccolo says it's like a circus now. The junior division matches officially begin and Trunks wipes the floor with the kid now known as Idasa and moves on, shocking the audience but it was no surprise to the rest of the Z fighters. More matches pass and now it's time for Goten's fight against Idasa's brother. He proves to be no match for the tiny half saying though and passes out, surprising the crowd once again. Goten and Trunks continue to dominate their matches as everyone expected, now prepared to face one another in the final round to decide the winner of the junior division. Hercule decides to come out to watch the match to see what the kids are made of and notices Goten's face looks oddly familiar. The match begins and the two Saiyan warriors rush at one another, blocking strikes, breaking, and flying back into the air, exchanging punches and connecting them as well. The two exchange a few more mid-air blows and finally break away back into the ring, leaving the audience stunned, especially Hercule and Fidel, who try to make sense of how these kids can be so strong. The audience quickly changes their tune though, breaking out into cheers as they witness this incredible battle. Trunks acknowledges how much Goten's improved in such a short amount of time, and decides to test him by firing a key blast that he averts away from the crowd. As Hercule recognizes the move he just witnessed, Goten decides to unleash a blast of his own, firing a Kamehameha that destroys part of the tournament's grounds as Goku notes his son still hasn't learned to control the attack yet. The two agree not to use any more blasts and rush toward each other once again. Trunks throws Goten into the air and locks him into a full Nelson. He insists Goten to give up, but he refuses as Vegeta tells Goku it looks like Trunks is about to win. Determined not to lose though, Goten transforms into a Super Saiyan and breaks free, annoying Trunks and surprising Videl. Goku is surprised that his son was able to become a Super Saiyan already, and it becomes all too clear to Hercule that Goten is Goku's son. Trunks goads Goten into another round, stating that he could beat him without using his left arm. He then flies forward, attacking with his right arm only, but Goten blocks it and kicks him in the face. Goten blocks another one of Trunks' attacks and lands a blow to his face again, only this time Trunks shoots a key blast that Goten is able to dodge. Goten takes off into the air and suddenly launches himself down toward Trunks, Trunks thinking he'll have to dodge at the very last moment to avoid the attack. Goten, however, lands on the stadium floor and launches himself in the direction of Trunks, who nervously transforms into a Super Saiyan and uses his left arm to blast Goten in the back, as he's unable to stop his momentum from landing outside the ring. Trunks is declared the winner, but Goten is upset that he broke his promise in not only using his left arm, but turning Super Saiyan as well. Trunks, however, offers Goten three of his toys as an apology, and Vegeta brags about his son's victory to Goku. The next match is then announced, as the winner of the youth division gets to go head to head with the world champion Hercule, who's absolutely speechless. As the crowd chants his name, Hercule stands backstage, thinking that he'll be slaughtered if he goes in the ring with Trunks. He, however, comes out with a false bravado, and his fans continue to cheer him on. Trunks wonders if this guy is really as strong as everyone says, and Goten cheers on his friend, but Hercule tells him to shut up. The Z Fighters decide to leave as they know how the battle will end, but Videl convinces Gohan to 
to stay, still not fully grasping the situation at hand. Hercule puts on a show for the crowd, and Trunks thinks he looks ridiculous, but prepares to fight. Hercule nervously tries to convince the Half Saiyan to pull his punches, but Trunks insists on going all out. The two argue back and forth as the match looks as though it's about to begin, and Hercule fakes an injury in his knee, although it doesn't work to his favor. The champ tries to strategize how he'll get out of this, and decides he'll pretend to lose on purpose to save face. He convinces Trunks to tap him on the face lightly at the beginning of the match, but Trunks sends him flying out of the ring in an instant, much to the surprise of the crowd. Hercule does his usual lies and persuades the crowd that he let the kid win, and they cheer him on thinking he was such a great guy to lose on purpose. Trunks is confused, and we later see the champ backstage crying about the extreme pain he's in. The announcer states that the adult matches will begin shortly, and the Z Fighters decide to look for some food in the meantime. Meanwhile, Trunks calls Goten over to him, and they both witness a man dressed in a funny looking costume known as Mighty Mask. Trunks suggests taking his costume so the two of them can compete in the adult division, but Goten is understandably cautious. Trunks, however, decides to go along with the plan anyway and knocks the man out, the two then stealing his clothes and running off. Back at the cafeteria, Goku and Vegeta demolish a ton of food in front of them, and Gohan and Videl arrive to join the feast. Time passes and the group finish eating and move on, bumping into a strange pair, which both Goku and Piccolo take notice of especially. The shorter stranger who happens to be floating in the air greets Goku, telling him that he's heard all about him and wanted to spar with him for a long time. He says he doubts he'll win though, and shakes Goku's hand. As the two fall silent, the stranger says that Goku has a good soul after all, and the pair leave, Goku then acknowledging that winning the tournament won't be so easy after all. Piccolo states that those two aren't from Earth and wonders why they're here, but Krillin brushes it off and the team continue to the station to draw for their opponents. Goku scopes out the competition and notices a strange pair of evil looking bald men and mighty mask, thinking he looks weird with his long body. The drawing begins though, and the matches are set. Krillin is set to face off against a man named Punta. The alien who shook Goku's hand earlier, now known as Shin, is set to fight Piccolo. Videl is set to fight one of the big bald guys known as Spopovich. The other alien with Shin, now known as Kibito, will be fighting Gohan, or the Great Saiyaman. 18 is set to fight Hercule, and Vegeta will be fighting Goku, much to his satisfaction. Mighty Mask will fight a man named Killer, and Spopovich's partner, Yamu, will be fighting a man named Jewel. The announcer takes everyone to the waiting room to go over the rules once again, and with that, the Tenkaichi Budokai adult division begins. Krillin is first up against Punta, who leaps around the tournament stage to show off his agility. Krillin, however, makes light work of him and tosses him out of the ring, shocking the entire crowd. The next match is announced as Shin and Piccolo move toward the ring, Piccolo, however, appearing to be nervous. Krillin, Goku, Gohan, and Vegeta observe, as Vegeta thinks to himself that we'll finally be able to see what this mystery fighter is made of. As the two stand in front of each other, Piccolo sweats, wondering why he finds himself so hesitant to attack. As he continues to think to himself as to who in the world this stranger is, Shin speaks, telling Piccolo that he'll find out soon enough. The Namekian is astonished at the fact that Shin was reading his mind and forfeits the match immediately, telling the group backstage that this alien is extremely powerful and that the difference between he and Piccolo is too great. The announcer then moves on to the next match between Videl and Spopovich, and as the big guy and Shin cross paths, Shin glances back with grave concern. As the crowd cheers on Videl, Killer and Jewel notice how different Spopovich looks compared to the last time they saw him at the tournament. The match begins, but we cut to Shin, who encounters Piccolo once again. Piccolo decides to ask him about his identity directly, and Kabito answers, stating that he's the Supreme Kai. Piccolo is frozen in disbelief as the Supreme Kai walks past and tells him to keep this a secret for now. Piccolo then states that he's the Kai above all others, sweating profusely. Goku notices his friend's panic and offers to talk to the alien for him, but Piccolo urges him to stay away, and on another world, King Kai nervously acknowledges the Supreme Kai's presence on Earth as well. We cut back to the fight as Videl lands a devastating kick to Spopovich's face, knocking him to the arena floor. He gets up though and charges in, trading blows with the champ's daughter. Goku comes over to watch as Videl knocks the man to the floor again, but is surprised to see him stand up with minimum effort as he charges toward her repeatedly. Videl lands a devastating combo and ends it with a knee to the face, now out of breath as Spopovich collapses to the floor. The match appears to be over, but he stands up once again, smiling deviously, shocking Gohan. Goku states that Videl better give up while she has a chance, and Spopovich backhands her across the arena, then kicks her into the air, nearly knocking her out of bounds as she saves herself with the flight ability she learned.
learn from Gohan. Gohan thinks there might still be hope for her, but Goku says that it might have been better if she'd lost the match instead, as the guy isn't phased by her attacks at all. Videl launches in and lands a kick to Spopovich's neck and breaks it, much to the shock of the crowd. Spopovich, however, snaps his neck back into place and punches Videl in the nose, drawing blood. Videl launches into the air to gain some distance, but surprisingly, Spopovich can fly too. He launches an energy attack at Videl as she falls to the arena floor. The Z Fighter's trying to figure out what's going on backstage, as this human has more power than he can control. Out in the arena, Videl takes a heavy beating but refuses to give up, leaving Gohan to watch in horror. Spopovich continues to mercilessly beat Videl while Gohan pleads with her to give up. Spopovich grabs her by the hair though and knees her directly in the face, bloodying her and knocking out a few teeth as he throws her to the ground. Gohan boils with anger, watching his schoolmates suffer at the hands of this stranger and suddenly transforms into a Super Saiyan to put a stop to the match. Spopovich's partner Yamu though orders him to quit playing around and end the match, so he drops Videl out of bounds and wins. Gohan then powers down and rushes to her aid, vowing to take down Spopovich at all costs. Noticing they don't have any sensu beans, Goku uses instant transmission to get some from Korin's tower. Meanwhile, Hercule is informed on Videl's loss and rushes to the ER, where he sees her beaten to a pulp. Gohan assures Hercule that Videl will be alright and heads off to prepare for his match. Hercule then putting together that his daughter must be dating him and complains while the doctors treat her wounds. Goku returns with the last three sensu beans that Korin had and gives one to Gohan. Gohan rushes back to the ER and feeds the bean to Videl, although the doctor and champ were giving him a hard time. The half Saiyan then runs off as the next match is about to begin, and Videl jumps up good as new, shocking her father and doctor in the room. Gohan arrives and steps in the ring with his opponent Kabito, and his classmates notice him by the way his hair looks. As they cheer him on thinking he has no chance of winning, Gohan wonders what he should do now that everyone knows his identity. He says to himself that he shouldn't show his full strength, but Kabito tells him to become a Super Saiyan, which surprises Gohan. He's hesitant about transforming in front of his classmates, but Piccolo yells to him to do so. Backstage, the Supreme Kai tells the group that they'll be using Gohan for a moment, and no matter what happens in the next few seconds, they must not interfere. Vegeta of course scoffs at the idea of taking orders from a complete stranger, but Piccolo reveals that this man is the Supreme Kai, which shocks Krillin, Vegeta, and even Goku. Now having decided to grant Kabito's wish, Gohan's energy begins to swell. Backstage, Krillin asks the Supreme Kai what will happen once Gohan transforms. He tells the group that Spopovich and Yamu will attack him, but only to steal his energy. Gohan decides to transform into a Super Saiyan 2 for Kabito, surprising everyone around him. Although Kabito is amazed at Gohan's strength, Vegeta is unimpressed, stating that he isn't even close to the level he was when he defeated Cell. Suddenly, Spopovich and Yamu notice Gohan's power level and rush in with a device marked with the same letter M that they have on their foreheads. As Gohan attempts to defend himself, the Supreme Kai locks him in place with an energy attack and the two stab him with the device, steal his energy, and fly off. As the Z Fighters prepare to help, the Supreme Kai tells them to wait as Kabito will get him back to full strength. He then says that he'll be following Spopovich and Yamu and that the others are welcome to join him to help out. As Chi Chi, Bulma, and the rest of the crowd sit in confusion, Goku agrees to tag along to see how he can help. Meanwhile, as the two fly along with Gohan's stolen energy, Yamu states that the Majin will finally be revived and that someone named Lord Bobbity will be pleased with their work. The Supreme Kai is in pursuit and back at the tournament grounds, Videl rushes over to Gohan as Krillin says he'll go along with Goku, but first he has to talk to 18. Vegeta then gets upset, telling Goku not to skip out on their match as it's the only reason he decided to enter this stupid tournament in the first place. Goku promises to fight him afterward, but Vegeta reminds him that he's only on Earth for one day. Piccolo flies off behind Supreme Kai, and Goku leaves Gohan with Kabito as he takes off as well, followed by a reluctant Vegeta, still upset about this sudden change of events. 18 declines to tag along with the group, and Krillin takes off without her. Kabito restores Gohan, but is shocked to discover his limitless potential in the process. Off in the distance, Goten and Trunks, or Mighty Mask, wonder what's going on, while Gohan stands up, receiving instruction from Kabito to follow him to get up to speed on what's going on. As Gohan prepares to fly off, Videl asks to go along as well. Gohan agrees, so long as she promises to turn around if things get dangerous and the two take off, Hercule surprised that his daughter can fly, just like the boy she's with. Piccolo, Krillin, Goku, and Vegeta catch up with the Supreme Kai, who thanks them
him for coming along to help, as he might not have been able to defeat this new threat on his own. He explains that the two guys they saw at the tournament were only pawns in the plan of a magician named Bibbidi, who once upon a time conjured up a terrifying monster named Majin Buu, who only in a few years destroyed several hundred planets alone. Vegeta thinks to himself that the Saiyan race could do the same, but the Supreme Kai reads his mind and corrects him, stating that at the time of Buu's birth, there were five Supreme Kais, each strong enough to destroy the likes of Frieza with a single blast, and four of them were killed by Majin Buu. The Kai then explains the current situation, saying that Buu's power is currently sealed away. We cut to Kibito, who's also explaining the situation to Gohan and Videl, stating that the Supreme Kai killed Bibidi long ago, but did not destroy Buu, as he left him trapped inside the seal. However, the two recently discovered that Bibidi had a son named Bobbidi, who now plans to resurrect Buu himself. Goku wonders if Bobbidi is strong, and the Supreme Kai says if he's anything like his father, he'll be weak physically, but he wields powerful magic. He goes on to mention that he has the power to use the evil in someone's heart and possess them to do his bidding, which is exactly what he did to Spopovich and Yamu. Meanwhile, Gohan asks Kibito what Yamu and Spopovich wanted with him at the tournament. Kibito explains that in order to bring back Boo, the two needed lots of energy. Those two were sent to the tournament to gather said energy, and Gohan happened to be the ideal target. Kibito and Supreme Kai suspected this though, which is why they chose to enter the competition in the first place. We cut back to Supreme Kai, as Goku wonders why he didn't destroy Boo after Bibidi was defeated. Supreme Kai states that it was nothing he could have done though, as the seal could have been undone if they disturbed it even slightly. Plus, the ball Boo is trapped in was placed where humans couldn't have gone, so it felt safe. Meanwhile, Kibito tells Gohan they need to pick up the pace to catch the others, but Videl says she's already going as fast as she can. Gohan says she should turn back, and tells her to tell Goten and his mom everything that's going on, and she agrees. Before stopping though, Videl asks Gohan if he was really the Golden Warrior, to which he confirms, adding that he didn't want anyone to find out. Videl then puts the pieces together, stating that seven years ago, the group of fighters that battled Cell were the ones who really defeated him, and not her father. Gohan confirms this, and Videl wishes him luck on his new battle, hoping to see him again soon as he and Kibito take off at light speed. Meanwhile, Yamu and Spopovich are still well on their way as Kibito and Gohan catch up to Goku and the others. The group land at the location and suppress their key as they watch closely, noticing an alien standing outside of a dug up area talking to Spopovich and Yamu. Kibito realizes that Bobbidi must have hid his ship underground, and Supreme Kai says that he knew they were coming. Piccolo suggests rushing in to attack, but Supreme Kai urges everyone to wait as they would likely revive Boo outside, not underground. The unknown alien goes back in, and two people emerge from the area, a tall demonic looking man and a small wrinkly alien who's floating. Kibito and Supreme Kai freak out in witnessing that Bobbidi has taken control of the demon man now known as Dabora, king of the demon realm. Supreme Kai explains that in this universe, one of the Z fighters may be the strongest, but in the demon world, Dabora is on top. Krillin starts to get worried, and Gohan realizes the smaller enemy is Bobbidi himself. Supreme Kai again states that he's pretty weak when it comes to physical strength, but his magic is nothing to take lightly. Piccolo wonders if he's strong enough to bend the will of others, but Kibito states that Bobbidi takes advantage of the evil in one's heart and controls them via their thoughts. Supreme Kai says they hadn't counted on Deborah arriving and begins to doubt their chances at survival. Vegeta, however, vows to take this enemy down and prevent Majin Buu's revival. Meanwhile, Bobbidi is pleased with Spopovich and Yamu's work, but decides to dispose of them. He casts a spell on Spopovich which causes him to explode from the inside. Yamu tries to escape, but Bobbidi tells his minion Pui Pui to take him down as he blasts him out of the sky with minimum effort. As the Z fighters witness the carnage, Bobbidi and Deborah conspire amongst themselves as they're fully aware of the Supreme Kai's presence as well as the other six members and decide to get things started. Bobbidi instructs Deborah to kill everyone except Supreme Kai, Goku, Gohan, and Vegeta and departs into his ship along with Pui to make the necessary preparation for Boo. The Z fighters notice everyone leaving except Deborah, and Vegeta catches on to their ruse, screaming that they've been discovered as Deborah rushes in to do his master's bidding. Deborah flies up to Kibito and fires a key blast in his face, immediately killing him. He then spits on Krillin and Piccolo, who are unable to react to the Supreme Kai's warning and turn into stone. Goku wonders if there's a way to get them back to normal, and Supreme Kai tells him that they need to kill Deborah to reverse the effect. Goku says he's glad the fix is so simple, and Deborah flies 
flies back to the ship as Goku, Gohan, and Vegeta follow. Supreme Kai insists they stay away, but reluctantly follows along shortly after. The four enter the ship and land in an empty room. Supreme Kai tells them that the only way to escape is to defeat Bobbity, but Vegeta scoffs at the remark, stating he could destroy the entire ship if he wanted to. Supreme Kai protests though, exclaiming that if he did such a thing, the shock could release Majin Buu, resulting in their inevitable defeat. Meanwhile, Bobbity watches the group through a crystal ball and instructs his minion Pui to steal their energy. Pui then enters the room with Goku and the others and tells them that Bobbity is on the lowest floor, but they'll have to get through him first to get there. Goku, however, doesn't think he'll be much of a challenge. In the room, the trio play rock, paper, scissors to see who will fight first, and Vegeta wins. Supreme Kai gets concerned as he prepares to fight Pui by himself, but Vegeta says that Alien is no match for him. Pui says there's no way to escape, and that all the damage the three received will be absorbed by the ship and transferred to Boo, but Vegeta isn't worried about losing energy at all. Pui rushes in to attack, but Vegeta blocks his kick and knocks him away. Vegeta then uppercuts Pui and gives him a few quick jabs, much to the surprise of Bobbity, Deborah, and even the Supreme Kai. In an attempt to turn the tide of the battle, Bobbity uses his magic to change the room to suit Pui's strength, but it doesn't affect Vegeta at all, as a measly 10 times gravity is nothing to him. Vegeta wastes no time and rushes in, touching him on the chest and blasting him to pieces in an instant, leaving the Supreme Kai and Bobbity in awe. Vegeta complains about how weak his opponent was, and the group descend to the next floor in the ship, much to Bobbity's anger. Deborah wonders which minion his master will use next, and Bobbity decides to use Yakon, stating that these earthlings shouldn't be underestimated, as they defeated Pui without trying. Meanwhile, Vegeta bets that Majin Buu won't be such a big deal, just like Deborah, which shocks the Supreme Kai to hear. Vegeta goes on to further explain that besides his spit, Deborah isn't that impressive, and they could defeat him no problem. Supreme Kai asks Goku if he feels the same, and he agrees, then saying that maybe seven years ago he would have been a threat, as he has the same power level now as Cell did back then. As Goku grows impatient waiting on the next threat, suddenly a big green monster steps into the room, revealing himself as Yakon. The monster immediately attacks Goku and almost scratches him, but only rips his shirt. Supreme Kai suggests jumping in to help Goku, but Gohan tells him that his dad can handle it, which shocks him. Bobbity thinking Goku was scared, decides to raise the stakes by using his magic to take everyone to Yakon's home world, the planet of darkness. The group is unable to see at first as Yakon rushes in to attack, but Goku counters and kicks him in the face, much to his surprise. Goku goes on to say that Yakon really underestimated them, as they can see without having to use their eyes by feeling the vibrations around them and such. To add some light to the room anyway though, Goku transforms into a Super Saiyan, surprising Deborah and Bobbity. Bobbity wonders what happened, but Deborah isn't impressed, saying that he's only glowing. The wizard tells one of his nearby minions to get him the strongest energy measuring device they have, and back at stage 2, Goku tells Yakon that not even having a dark room will help him. Yakon doesn't seem worried though, and meanwhile, Bobbity reads Goku's power level on his monitor to be 3000 Keelys. Deborah is in disbelief, and Bobbity thinks the machine must be broken. He however states that if it is correct, Yakon doesn't stand a chance, as his power level is only 800 Keelys. Yakon suddenly opens his mouth and sucks out Goku's Super Saiyan energy into a ball of light and eats it. Everyone wonders what's going on, but the Supreme Kai yells that Yakon's specialty is eating light energy. Gohan warns Goku, who rather than refraining from making the same mistake twice, transforms into a Super Saiyan yet again to feed Yakon. As the monster begins to suck out his energy once more, Bobbity watches from the crystal ball and yells for him to stop, as if he eats all of Goku's power, there won't be enough to revive Majin Buu. His concerns prove to be pointless though, as Goku instantly raises his power and feeds Yakon way more energy than he could take, causing him to explode. Vegeta notices Goku's ability to exceed the level of a Super Saiyan, and Bobbity stands frozen in disbelief, stating that these earthlings are way stronger than he could have predicted. Noting his master's concern, Deborah decides to step up and finish off the group himself. Bobbity asks him what his plan is, but Deborah states that as the Lord of Darkness, no one can beat him with raw strength alone. Since it's Gohan's turn next, Goku wonders if he's been training, but Vegeta cuts in, saying he's gotten soft in the past seven years. Suddenly though, Deborah appears, congratulating the group for defeating Yakon, but declaring victory over them. Vegeta is unimpressed, and Deborah tells all three of them to attack him at once. Gohan steps in though, saying that it's his turn to fight alone, angering Deborah. Back at the Tenkaichi Budokai, the announcer and staff members figure out how they'll resolve the issue of a lack of fighters, giving 
even most of them took off. Hercule assumes they left because they were scared to face him, then suddenly gets an idea. After hyping up his adoring fans, the champ suggests an all-out battle royale amongst the remaining contestants, which everyone agrees to. One of the staff members then tells Hercule how brave he is, as all the fighters will likely come after him, given he's the strongest one. The announcer updates the crowd on the new plan and calls the remaining contestants, Hercule, Mighty Mask, 18, Jewel, and Killer to the ring. Killer tells Mighty Mask they should take out Hercule together, but he declines and says 18 is the only threat. Meanwhile, Jewel tries to flirt with 18 but is rejected, much to his shock. The announcer then begins the match and Jewel and Killer are knocked out of the ring in an instant by Mighty Mask and 18, leaving them as the last contenders with Hercule. Confident in his abilities, Hercule says he'll take them both down, but the two ignore him, while 18 thinks something is strange about the way Mighty Mask looks. Hercule thinks on how he'll take both of the fighters down and win over the crowd, raising two fingers in the air and announcing his victory. Mighty Mask thinks he's an idiot and decides to keep ignoring him, setting his sights on 18. As Hercule runs in to deliver one of his signature punches, he misses and notices Mighty Mask and 18 trading blows the next moment, surprising him. The two take off into the air and Mighty Mask attempts to land a blow to 18, but is smacked to the arena floor, recovering easily while Hercule just stands in awe. Mighty Mask dodges a blast from 18 and decides he can't fight in base form, so he transforms into a Super Saiyan to raise his power level. 18 is surprised, then realizing Mighty Mask is actually Goten and Trunks in a costume. The two Super Saiyans shoot a giant key blast which actually scares 18, creating an enormous explosion that shocks the entire crowd. Realizing she needs to finish the job quickly, 18 exposes the pair for who they really are and uses a Destructo disc to split the costume in half, defeating Mighty Mask as the two Super Saiyans fly away, disqualifying themselves from the tournament. 18 lands back into the ring and Hercule says he's gonna die. The crowd cheers on both Hercule and 18 as the announcer goes on about the two being the final contestants. Hercule is extremely worried and Bulma and the others celebrate over how 18 is about to win 10 million zenny. Meanwhile, Goten and Trunks mope over their loss but run into Videl outside the tournament grounds and flag her down. Back at the Budokai, 18 makes a move on Hercule who screams in terror thinking he's about to get pummeled. 18 however tells him to shut up and whispers that if he gives her 20 million zenny, she'll intentionally throw the match. Hercule of course agrees to save his reputation and 18 pretends as though she was hurt by the champ. Hercule then puts on a show for the crowd, but 18 tells him to cut it short and get things over with. Hercule then rushes at her with his strongest attack, the Ultra Super Megaton Punch, which lands a direct hit to the face. 18 asks if this is really Hercule's strongest move and flies out of the ring intentionally, giving him the victory. As Hercule is happy about his win, 18 tells him she'll be by to pick up the money tomorrow and if he doesn't pay up, she'll kill him. Videl fills Goten and Trunks in on the current events and rather than looking worried, the two get excited and rush off in the direction of their dads as Super Saiyans, shocking Videl. While Hercule was busy winning the Budokai, Gohan had been facing off against Deborah. Gohan as a Super Saiyan throws a few punches at the demon and kicks him off into the distance, but Deborah catches himself and blows a stream of fire back at the half Saiyan. Gohan easily dodges it and flies back toward Deborah, but hits a few of the demons after images. The real Deborah is a distance away and announces himself just before he shoots an electrified fireball toward Gohan. It's a direct hit and Gohan is knocked into the surrounding water, then flying back up to the surface and throws away his tattered great Saiyaman clothes. Goku says Deborah is a lot stronger than he thought he'd be, but Vegeta says he isn't so strong that they can't beat him. He then gets annoyed as Gohan takes longer to finish the fight. Deborah spits at Gohan, but he's able to react fast enough that it only hits his glove and he removes it before he's turned to stone. Deborah then conjures a sword and nearly hits Gohan, but the Super Saiyan grabs and breaks it before it can make contact. Meanwhile, Bobbity is disappointed with Deborah's performance, while Vegeta grows more irritated that this fight is taking so long and plans to step in, yelling that he's only concerned at this point with fighting Goku, which catches Deborah's attention. Deborah then tells Bobbity to bring him back to the ship, as he's made an interesting discovery. His master does so, and Deborah retreats, telling Gohan that he's found another ideal fighter for him and that he no longer needs to intervene. Deborah then chats with Bobbity, telling him that one of the fighters among the three has evil in his heart that they can use to make him do their bidding. Bobbity likes the idea of the three fighting amongst themselves, saying they could provide enough energy to revive Majin Buu after all. Goku and the others wonder about this fighter that's supposedly better than Deborah, and suddenly, Supreme Kai seems to realize what Deborah meant. The wizard then casts a spell, and Vegeta suddenly starts yelling, transforming into 
into a Super Saiyan. Supreme Kai tells Vegeta that Bobbidi's trying to control him, but the Saiyan Prince can't seem to break free. Bobbidi watches from his crystal ball, stating now that he's under his control, he'll release Vegeta's hidden powers and allow him to overcome his limits. Things then settle down a bit as Vegeta looks up with an M now visible on his forehead, symbolizing the spell's success as Majin Vegeta was born. Pleased with his work, Bobbidi decides to transport the group back to the Tenkaichi Budokai, where Hercule and everyone else witness their arrival. Bobbidi encourages Vegeta to fight everyone as hard as he can and even kill some people if he wants, but Vegeta tells him to shut up, exclaiming that Kakarot is his only target. Bobbidi is surprised that Vegeta wasn't completely under his control, but says it doesn't matter as long as the end goal is reached. Hercule notices the group are the ones who defeated Cell and gets nervous, but before he could process another thought, Vegeta fires an energy blast at Goku, which skids past him and completely massacres hundreds of innocent lives in the tournament seating area and beyond. As the remaining crowd rushes to exit the stadium, Goku looks toward Vegeta in anger. Bulma wonders what's gotten into her husband, and meanwhile, Bobbidi is elated, stating that Vegeta just killed 200 people. Gohan yells at Vegeta and asks what he's doing, but Vegeta ignores him and challenges Goku to a fight. Goku ignores the request and asks Vegeta if he let himself get possessed on purpose, but rather than answering, the Saiyan Prince throws another key blast at the audience and kills hundreds more. Angered, Goku transforms into a Super Saiyan and prepares to fight, but the Supreme Kai tells him to stop as they'd only be playing into Bobbidi's hands. Goku asks the question again though, and Vegeta admits he let himself fall under Bobbidi's spell on purpose so he could settle the score with Goku at full strength once and for all. The Supreme Kai says his reasoning is ridiculous, which causes Vegeta to lash out, exclaiming how Kakarot surpassed his strength, mocked his pride, and even spared his life, which can't be tolerated. Listening in silence, Goku decides to demand Bobbidi to transport him and Vegeta to a location with no people around. He says if he does this, he'll fight Vegeta at full strength like he wants. Supreme Kai interjects though, saying that if they want to fight each other, they'll have to get past him first. Unfortunately for him though, Goku takes him up on his offer and prepares to kill him, much to the surprise of Gohan and even Vegeta. Supreme Kai then backs down, knowing he can't possibly stand up to these Saiyans. Bobbidi grants Goku's request and transports the group to a deserted area where the two Saiyans can fight freely. Supreme Kai then tells the two to do as they please, but he says he and Gohan will find Deborah and Bobbidi and defeat them. As Supreme Kai gets ready to enter the ship once again, Bobbidi commands Vegeta to kill him, but the Saiyan Prince fights the mind control and refuses, stating that nothing will get in the way of his battle with Kakarot. Bobbidi is shocked at Vegeta's reply and tries to command him again, but the Saiyan refuses to be his slave, as he may have taken over his mind and his body, but there's one thing a Saiyan always keeps, and that's his pride. Both Bobbidi and the Supreme Kai are shocked to see Vegeta refuse his wishes, and Deborah thinks they should let Gohan and the Supreme Kai through so they won't destroy the ship. The entrance then opens and the two head down, but not before Gohan takes a sensu bean and bids his father a farewell for now. Gohan and Supreme Kai land in front of Deborah and Bobbidi who greet them, as the Kai prepares to handle Bobbidi and Gohan gears up to battle Deborah once more. Meanwhile, Goku and Vegeta stare each other down. Goku says he'll end the fight as soon as possible so his energy doesn't get taken and transforms into a Super Saiyan 2, stronger than Gohan was at his maximum when he fought Cell seven years ago. Vegeta then powers up, surprising Goku who says this will take longer than he thought and the battle begins. Vegeta throws a hard kick at Goku, but he manages to block it. The two throw out punches that the other catches and they attempt to knee each other until Vegeta headbutts Goku, but Goku kicks the Saiyan Prince away. Vegeta bounces back from the impact though, and the two smirk at each other, ready to continue. Meanwhile, Bobbidi suggests they all return to the surface, as Majin Buu will soon be at full power and might destroy the ship when he emerges from his ball. Supreme Kai actually agrees, although he has no intention of letting Buu get revived. Bobbidi changes locations and asks Deborah if he can defeat Gohan, to which he replies that he's trash and he'll get rid of him soon enough. Gohan then remembers what his father said about him using his anger to his advantage and transforms into a Super Saiyan as they all prepare to fight one another. Suddenly though, the meter on Majin Buu's ball begins to beat, alerting Bobbidi that Majin Buu is at full power as he shouts with joy, much to the terror of both Supreme Kai and Gohan. Supreme Kai wonders how this could be, but Gohan explains that the power emitting from the battle between his father and Vegeta must be so great that it fueled Buu's revival expeditiously. Meanwhile, Goku and Vegeta continue to trade blows in their epic battle, appearing to be on par with each other. Goten and Trunks far off in the distance wonder where that incredible energy has come 
coming from and decide to keep going to figure out what's going on. The two Saiyans pause to catch their breath, and Goku tells Vegeta that although he trained constantly in the afterlife, it appeared as though the two were about the same level of strength. Vegeta says that he himself may have trained harder, but the gap between them in power has always been there, which is why he allowed himself to be controlled by Bobbidi so he could close it and reign supreme. Goku questions Vegeta's true motive though, causing him to exclaim how he wanted to return to the way he was before, the perfect warrior, cold and ruthless, the kind that lived by his strength alone and uninhibited by foolish emotion. He says how Goku's influence softened his heart over the years and how he even settled down, started a family, and even started living the life of a normal earthling. Vegeta states that he needed to find his past self, even if it required the help of someone like Bobbidi, and now, he feels much better. As Goku wonders if he really believes what he's saying, smoke starts to shoot out from Majin Buu's ball, symbolizing his inevitable arrival. The Supreme Kai tells Gohan they should run away, but Gohan says he can't leave things like this. The Kai insists though that not even Gohan could win against Majin Buu, and if they stay, they'll be killed for sure. Rather than running away though, Gohan powers up and fires a Kamehameha at the ball, which Dabor and Babidi barely manage to avoid. The impact is so great that the ball is ejected from its base and crashes to the ground, opening and revealing nothing inside. Bobbidi can't believe the ball is empty, and the Supreme Kai lectures him about how he's lost, saying that he and Gohan have won the day. Gohan, however, sits in fear as he feels a tremendous power emerging out of thin air. Everyone looks up and notices a pink smoke cloud that came out of the sphere, which collects itself and takes shape. Majin Buu reappears once again, much to the shock of Gohan and Supreme Kai. Buu stands smiling as everyone watches. Deborah asks Bobbidi if this creature is really Majin Buu, but Supreme Kai confirms as he says he could never forget such a terrifying face. Deborah, however, thinks he looks ridiculous, and meanwhile, Gohan tells Supreme Kai that he might be able to defeat Majin Buu since he's been in captivity for so long. We cut back to the battle between our Saiyan warriors as Goku pauses after sensing Majin Buu's energy. Vegeta, however, laughs, stating that Buu is nothing as they've proved to be stronger than their opponents at every turn. Goku, however, disagrees, saying that this power is different somehow, but Vegeta, unwilling to stop this fight, ignores the statement. Meanwhile, Bobbidi introduces himself to Boo and tells him that he's his new master. Boo, however, plays around with him, as Deborah says there's nothing to gain from such a weak-minded moron. Hearing this, Boo skips over to Deborah, who welcomes the chance to fight him. Gohan begins to have his doubts about Boo, but Supreme Kai is certain that he's a serious threat. Boo then releases steam from his body and smirks ferociously gouging Deborah's eyes and kicking him into a nearby boulder, surprising everyone watching. As Boo claps for himself like a child, Bobbidi is pleased with his servant's strength. Bobbidi compliments Boo as he dances around, and Gohan can't believe this monster has so much power, stating it explosively grew in an instant. Meanwhile, Trunks feels a huge key and wonders what's going on. Goten wonders which way they should go, and Trunks suggests heading toward it, as it's probably the monster they heard about. Goku notes that Majin Buu's key has increased and says they need to do something now as it's their fault he's been awakened to begin with. Vegeta of course knows this, but still wanting to finish the fight, he says he doesn't care. Goku tells him everyone will be killed, including his wife and son, but Vegeta lashes out again, saying that he gave himself to Bobbidi so he could be free of emotion. Goku however tells him to cut it out, as he's still able to think for himself. Realizing their battle will be put on hold, Vegeta agrees to fight Buu together with Goku and asks for a sensu bean to regain his energy. As Goku reaches for a couple prepared to fight the monster together, Vegeta knocks him out and eats one of the beans, stating that he'll finish off Buu himself since he's to blame for all this. Meanwhile, Gohan suggests killing Bobbidi to the Supreme Kai, but he tells him not to as he's the only one with the power to seal Buu away again when he eventually becomes too much for him to handle. He then gives up, saying all hope is lost, but Gohan suggests trying to escape. Shortly after, Bobbidi gives Buu the orders to kill the two heroes. Gohan grabs Supreme Kai and flies off, stating that he's confident in his own speed. Boo, however, takes off and appears in front of the two in mere moments, surprising Gohan as he's smacked to the ground. Supreme Kai attempts to attack Boo, but Boo claps his hands together and smashes his face, then pounding him to the ground, same as Gohan. Boo lands on the ground next to a beaten Supreme Kai, as Bobbidi cheers him on to kill him and Gohan. The Kai attempts to use his telekinetic powers to hurt Boo, but it has no effect 
effect. Boo, however, recovers and replicates the move, knocking the Supreme Kai across the deserted area and lands on his back, crushing him. Bobbity takes this time to taunt the Supreme Kai, but suddenly Gohan intervenes, kicking Boo in the face and leaving his footprint. Boo recovers and Bobbity runs off as Gohan is amazed by Boo's power. Boo tells Gohan he's annoying and shoots an energy blast his way, sending the Super Saiyan flying into the air, unable to stop himself. As Bobbity cheers in excitement, Supreme Kai uses his telekinetic powers to extinguish the blast as Gohan falls into a forest unconscious. Bobbity tells Boo he can finish off the Supreme Kai now, but Boo says he's hungry and would rather eat him instead. Suddenly, a spear flies right through Majin Boo, revealing a damaged Deborah who threw the weapon, much to Bobbity's anger. Trunks and Goten are nearby and land on a mountain, returning to base form. They try to figure out who's on the battlefield, but manage to recognize Supreme Kai. Not far from them, Goten notices Piccolo and Krillin as statues. Trunks knocks over Piccolo and breaks him, and the two hide behind a rock, nervous about what they just did. Meanwhile, Deborah insists Majin Buu can't be controlled and won't be a fateful servant, but Bobbity is insulted he'd speak that way about his Majin Buu. Buu then pulls out the spear, and the hole left in his belly quickly closes up and he tells Deborah he's gonna eat him. We then cut to Vegeta, who stands over the panel of Bobbity's spaceship, saying he could get in if he destroys it. He then notices Gohan's key is completely gone, alluding to his death and taking full responsibility. Meanwhile, Trunks and Goten are watching as Boo dances around, saying he's going to eat Deborah. Deborah prepares to attack the monster, but Boo immediately turns him into a cookie and devours him whole, killing the Demon King. The two kids are shocked, and suddenly, Krillin returns to normal. He notices Goten and Trunks and wonders why they're here, as Trunks is confused on why he was just a statue. Krillin remembers being spat on by Deborah, and Goten thinks that must have been the guy who was just eaten. Trunks figures Krillin returned to normal once he died, and suddenly has a realization. He runs off towards Piccolo's remains and gets scared thinking he killed him, but the Namekian is on one of the rocks above them, watching the events play out with Boo. Trunks wonders how Piccolo was able to survive, but Piccolo says he can regenerate as long as his brain isn't damaged. Bobbity then commands Boo to eat the Supreme Kai, and Piccolo is taken aback to find him lying weak on the ground. Krillin tells Piccolo to calm down though, as there's no chance for him to defeat someone like Boo. Boo lists off all the different ways he could eat Supreme Kai, but suddenly an explosion interrupts his thoughts. It was Vegeta who destroyed Bobbity's spaceship. Bobbity is of course enraged, while Trunks is overjoyed to see his father. Vegeta identifies the strange and bizarre looking creature as Majin Buu, and he's angry over the loss of Gohan. Piccolo shocked to hear this, and Buu gets upset about the Saiyan Prince calling him ugly. Buu says he'll kill Vegeta, and Bobbity gives him the green light. Krillin notices Buu's key has gotten higher, and Vegeta says he intends to take him and Bobbity to hell with him. Supreme Kai realizes that Vegeta intends to die, as he powers up and rushes in, hitting Buu with a heavy kick and following it up with a punch to the face, sending him flying. Vegeta launches an intense physical attack on Buu, leaving Bobbity confused, Krillin impressed, and Trunks happy. Piccolo observes that Vegeta's power passed that of a Super Saiyan and even Gohan's when he fought Cell. However, he recalls Gohan still being defeated by Majin Buu, then wondering how he was able to achieve this power. Vegeta delivers a massive punch that sends Buu flying, but he easily recovers from the damage and heals himself. Vegeta then fires a powerful key blast that goes straight through Buu's stomach, causing him to fall to the ground and appear dead. Bobbity is frightened, but Goten and Trunks are ecstatic until Buu gets back up. Buu heals himself and expresses his anger toward Vegeta, telling him that attack almost hurt him. Bobbity dances in delight as Buu creates a huge energy ball and screams that Vegeta will regret that. In an instant, Buu unleashes all his stored energy, creating a massive explosion that destroys the entire area, with only a huge crater remaining. Piccolo, Krillin, Trunks, and Goten manage to escape, but Vegeta and Supreme Kai are caught in the blast. Buu and Bobbity float over the crater, while Piccolo worries about Supreme Kai's condition and Trunks notices his father's severe injuries. Vegeta is frustrated with his situation, and his left arm is no longer functioning. Bobbity notices that Vegeta's still alive and thinks he could have been a great servant if he'd been obedient. Piccolo believes Vegeta to be no match for Buu, and that Gohan and even Supreme Kai are gone now. Trunks is in disbelief that his father could lose, but Piccolo refuses to offer reassurance. Boo then tears out a piece of his own stomach and stretches it out before shooting an explosive blast from his mouth, narrowly missed by Vegeta. Boo then throws the piece of stomach around Vegeta and traps him. The monster celebrates 
Prince while Vegeta lies on the ground and kicks the Saiyan Prince, pounding him while he's defenseless. Krillin says at this rate, Vegeta will be killed and wonders where Goku and Gohan are. Goten refuses, however, to believe that his brother is dead. Despite Piccolo's warning, Trunks turns Super Saiyan and flies off to help Vegeta, with Goten following. Trunks kicks Boo off of Vegeta, knocking him away, and Goten unravels Vegeta from the piece of stomach. The boys tend to him, and Bobbidi is surprised that Vegeta still has allies. It doesn't bother him though, as he believes Majin Buu to be invincible and will kill them all. Stating that what he did is unforgivable though, Piccolo tells Bobbidi that he may not be able to defeat Boo, but he can at least kill him. Bobbidi states though that if he dies, no one can seal Boo away, but Piccolo responds that the world will be destroyed even if Bobbidi lives. The wizard tries to call Boo over to help him, but Piccolo cuts him in half with one swift chop. Meanwhile, Vegeta tells Trunks to take care of his mother, and his son is confused as he smiles. Vegeta instructs the boys to find shelter as he plans to confront Majin Buu alone. Trunks suggests fighting together, but Vegeta believes that Buu can't be defeated by normal means. Despite Trunks and Goten's insistence that they can help, Vegeta expresses his desire to hug Trunks, whom he hasn't embraced since he was a baby. Trunks is hesitant, but Vegeta hugs him anyway before knocking him unconscious with a blow to the back of the neck. Vegeta then punches Goten in the stomach, rendering him unconscious as well. Piccolo arrives and carries the boys away as Boo awakens, puzzled about who attacked him. Vegeta asks Piccolo to take the boys far away, and then reveals his intention to sacrifice himself in battle, wondering what will happen to him when he dies. When Piccolo explains that Vegeta's soul will be sent to a different world than Goku's, and his memories will be erased after death, Vegeta expresses regret and urges Piccolo to leave quickly. Vegeta stops Boo from pursuing the boys as Piccolo and Krillin fly away, Vegeta then powering up and preparing to self-destruct in order to defeat the monster. Krillin wonders about Vegeta's plan, and Piccolo explains that Vegeta is finally fighting for someone other than himself for the first time, willing to give up his life in the process. Vegeta then bids a final farewell to Bulma, Trunks, and even Kakarot detonating himself and creating a massive explosion. Piccolo and Krillin feel the impact of the blast despite being far away, mourning the loss of the Saiyan Prince. Meanwhile, Bulma is questioning Vegeta's motives for killing innocent people at the tournament, but Yamcha suggests they focus on using the Dragon Balls to bring back the deceased. Master Roshi notices that Vegeta seemed to be full of evil, and suddenly, the plane experiences turbulence. Roshi points out that a huge explosion occurred in the distance, and Bulma suspects it's related to Vegeta. On the battlefield, only Vegeta's ash figure remains after his final attack, and Piccolo instructs Krillin to take the boys home while he investigates. He tells Krillin to explain what happened to everyone, as he isn't sure about Goku, but is positive that Gohan was killed after hearing Vegeta mention it. At the battlefield, Piccolo realizes that Vegeta's plan was to prevent Majin Buu from regenerating, and sees Bobbidi's remains as he clings on to life. As Piccolo prepares to finish off the wizard, small pieces of Buu start moving and eventually form a larger mass, making the monster whole once again. Piccolo then takes off in fear, and Boo heals Bobbidi, who wants to make the three responsible for his previous condition suffer. Piccolo catches up with Krillin and informs him of Boo's reappearance, as Krillin states that Vegeta died for nothing. Piccolo then takes the boys to the lookout, as they're the world's only hope against Boo and Bobbidi's evil plans. Meanwhile, the Supreme Kai is still alive and hopes that Gohan survived as well. After waking up, Goku realizes that Vegeta took the last Sensu and fought Majin Buu alone while he was knocked out. He senses Buu's key, but not Vegeta's or Gohan's, and wonders what happened. He uses instant transmission and meets with Krillin, Piccolo, Mr. Popo, and Dende at the lookout, later learning that Gohan, Supreme Kai, and even Vegeta have all been killed. Goku explains to his friends that he won't be able to defeat Buu alone, and says that if he was only able to use a fusion technique that he learned from the Metamorines in the afterlife, they'd stand a chance. Mr. Popo suggests Goten and Trunks learning the technique, and Goku agrees to teach it to them before he has to leave. Piccolo warns that it will take a long time for the boys to master the fusion, and many lives will be lost to Majin Buu in the meantime. In the midst of their conversation though, Shenron appears as Bulma and the others summon him to wish back those that were killed by Vegeta's hands. Goku arrives to try to stop them from wasting any wishes for now, but it was too late as the first wish was used. Dende instructs everyone not to use the remaining two 
two wishes so they'll only need to wait four months to use the Dragon Balls again. Goku then contacts Dende to tell Krillin to bring everyone to the lookout and Yamcha asks Goku what's going on, while Bobbidi and Boo continue to fly and Kibito is shocked to find himself alive again. Kibito tries to understand what's happening, but he senses that the Supreme Kai is alive and rushes to his aid. The Kai is barely hanging on, but Kibito heals him just in time. They both feel the immense energy of Majin Buu and fear for the safety of the universe, but Supreme Kai sees a glimmer of hope in Gohan's power, believing that he can surpass Buu with his hidden potential. They then come across Gohan's location and see he's in critical condition and just barely alive. Supreme Kai instructs Kibito to teleport the three of them to their sacred realm, and although he's hesitant at first, Kibito does the Kai's bidding. Meanwhile at Kami's lookout, everyone is gathered. Boma's parents decided to stay home, and Tien and Chaozu were nowhere to be found. Boma and Chi Chi then inquire about the location of Gohan, Goten, Trunks, and Vegeta. Goku informs them that Goten and Trunks are safe, but Gohan and Vegeta had been killed by Majin Buu. This news causes Chi Chi to faint and Boma to cry out in sadness. Suddenly, Bobbidi interrupts everyone's thoughts and addresses the people of Earth, threatening to destroy an entire city if Piccolo, Trunks, and Goten do not surrender to him. Buu demonstrates his strength by turning a city's population into candy and devours them, prompting fear and panic worldwide as the Z Fighters remain powerless. To demonstrate more of Buu's devastating abilities, Bobbidi has him destroy the now deserted city with a single breath. He threatens to turn anyone who knows the whereabouts of Piccolo, Trunks, and Goten into candy and eat them if they don't speak up. Bobbidi gives everyone five days to find them before he destroys the earth, and a Budokai attendant contacts him to reveal the names of the participants. Bobbidi demands their addresses and kills the attendant when he can't provide them, scaring the man next to him. Piccolo suggests going to stop Boo himself, but Goku explains that they need to teach the boys fusion to defeat Boo and that they can restore Earth with the Dragon Balls later. Meanwhile, in the sacred world of the Kais, Gohan is restored by Kibito and thinks he must be dead. However, he's told that he was saved and might have a chance at victory. The Supreme Kai instructs Gohan to use the Z Sword to defeat Majin Buu, and after some hesitation on Kibito's end, the three head toward the sword's location. Meanwhile on Earth, Goku informs Goten and Trunks about the loss of Gohan and Vegeta. The boys cry, and Goku yells at them to stop and focus their efforts to learn a new technique to avenge them. Goku then tells them that they'll be using the hyperbolic time chamber to begin their training. Meanwhile, Gohan asks Kibito what will happen if he removes the Z-Sword, and Kibito responds that he should gain an enormous amount of power, possibly enough to defeat Majin Buu. Gohan is amazed, but Kibito assures him that he won't be able to remove the sword. Despite struggling, Gohan manages to remove the sword while transforming into a Super Saiyan, shocking Kibito and pleasing the Supreme Kai. Kibito continues to doubt Gohan's ability to wield the sword correctly though, and after Gohan hands the sword to him to try it for himself, he drops it, revealing its true weight and power. Kibito, however, tries to downplay it, then claiming Gohan needs to be the one to train hard and master the blade. Back on Earth, Goku explains the fusion technique, stating if performed correctly, Goten and Trunks will be able to stay fused for 30 minutes, but after unfusing, won't be able to do it again for a while. Trunks and Goten are initially hesitant to learn from Goku due to his perceived weakness after the loss of Gohan and Vegeta, but suddenly, Majin Buu destroys another city. Bobbidi threatens to keep killing if Trunks, Goten, and Piccolo don't show themselves. Trunks and Goten, however, call out to Buu, telling him that they'll defeat him once they're ready to fight. Goku sees this anger as an opportunity for the boys to train, and Trunks and Goten finally agree to learn the fusion technique. Goku urges Trunks and Goten to quickly transform into Super Saiyans, telling them to raise their ki as high as possible. Trunks decides to try and surprise Goku by further powering up his ki, but Goku isn't impressed and informs them they must have equal levels to perform fusion. Goku suggests trying to raise their ki levels to the max in their base form before attempting fusion as Super Saiyans, and meanwhile, Bobbidi and Boo plan to destroy West City, where Trunks' grandparents live. Goku reassures Bulma that they can use the Dragon Balls to revive the dead and restore the destroyed city. Bulma interjects though, stating that the Dragon Radar, which is needed to find the Dragon Balls and summon Shenron, will be destroyed if the laboratory is blown up and that they'll never be able to find the Dragon Balls again. Now knowing this, Goku then decides to hold off Bobbidi and Boo while Trunks goes to retrieve the radar. When Goku confronts Bobbidi and Boo, he tells them to stop their pointless destruction and tormenting of the weak and just to wait for three warriors who are undergoing special training to defeat them. The two of course refuse to wait, so Goku decides to stall them for a while and transforms 
turns into a Super Saiyan 2 until Trunks grabs the radar. Piccolo attempts to comprehend Goku's power in Super Saiyan 2, while Bobbity considers it nothing special. Goku notices in the distance that Trunks has stopped moving though and yells at him to hurry up and find the radar. Bobbity is unsure of who Goku is addressing, but believes he must have some sort of pointless plan. Goku, however, continues to stall for time and returns to his normal state, causing Boo to believe he's given up. The Saiyan then states that he intends to explain Super Saiyan to them so that everyone understands, and Bobbity believes the transformations to be pointless. Goku proceeds to demonstrate Super Saiyan and Super Saiyan 2, and reveals he has one more ascension in mind. Goku's friends at the lookout thinks he's bluffing, but the Saiyan powers up to the max, surpassing the form of an ascended Super Saiyan and revealing his ultimate form, the legendary Super Saiyan 3. Everyone is astonished, including Gohan in the realm of the Kais, who pauses his Z-Sword training to sense his father's key on Earth. The Supreme Kai and Kibito can't believe Goku's power has reached their location, while Tien Shenhan, who's in the mountains with Chaozu, feels the Earth shake and wonders what's going on. Now powered up, Goku charges in, punches Buu several times, and sends him flying, crashing into the ocean. Buu retaliates with blasts, but Goku deflects them and evades the attacks. Meanwhile, King Kai watches from his world as well, urging Goku to stop using his extraordinary power, as it's only decreasing his time on Earth and jeopardizing his chances to finish teaching the fusion technique to Goten and Trunks. Goku charges toward Buu and strikes him hard in the face, but Buu responds with a powerful punch of his own, sending Goku flying. Goku quickly regains his balance, turns around, and shoots a massive Kamehameha at Buu's stomach. Despite being hit, Buu heals himself instantly and retaliates with his own Kamehameha. Goku manages to deflect Buu's attack, but Buu redirects it toward Bobbity, narrowly missing him. The resulting explosion destroys an island and is felt even at Kami's lookout. Bobbity scolds Buu for his recklessness and criticizes Goku for destroying a portion of the Earth, along with one-tenth of its population. Goku compliments Buu for his ability to quickly learn his opponent's techniques, and Buu laughs as his nose grows like Pinocchio's. Goku then sends his trunks speeding up and leaving West City with the Dragon Radar, so he reverts to his normal state and Buu questions why he stopped fighting. Goku says he's had enough fun and has to leave, but Bobbity threatens him. He asks for a two-day grace period, promising to return with the three other strong warriors they were looking for. Buu is curious about the upcoming fight, but Bobbity says they'll continue to kill as they please. Goku predicts that Buu will enjoy fighting his allies and threatens to punish Bobbity in the afterlife. Goku then teleports away, and Bobbity orders Buu to find him, insulting him repeatedly in anger. However, having enough, Buu decides to stay behind and strangles Bobbity. In one swift move, Buu then punches Bobbity, causing his head to explode. He throws his former master's body to the side and destroys it with a key blast, dancing with joy while Goku returns to the lookout and informs Piccolo of Bobbity's death. Piccolo believes Buu may become less violent without anyone giving him orders. However, Buu suddenly unleashes a powerful blast that destroys part of a city and wreaks havoc. Piccolo and Goku discuss how they underestimated Buu and how they should teach the younger generation the technique of fusion before he has to return to the afterlife. Goku then states that he only has an hour left on Earth as Super Saiyan 3's energy consumption exhausted him completely, running down his time limit. Fortune teller Baba then suddenly arrives in the midst of their conversation and tells Goku that he actually only has 30 minutes left, surprising the Saiyan. Piccolo then asks why Goku didn't go all out with Super Saiyan 3 and try to kill Buu when he had the chance. Goku tells Piccolo that he probably could have tried, but with him being dead, the generation on Earth should try fighting their own battles rather than relying on him. Piccolo understands his reasoning and meanwhile, Gohan trains with the Z-Sword while Trunks returns with the Dragon Radar. Goku then gathers the two young warriors for training as they're now eager to learn under him after witnessing the power of Super Saiyan 3. Goku first begins by explaining the hard part of the fusion technique as once both Goten and Trunks have adjusted their key to each other, they also have to perform a pose identical to one another for it to be perfect. To demonstrate, Goku teaches them the pose, but Trunks finds it lame. Goku explains the importance of left and right symmetry and mirror reflection movement, but the two half Saiyans get confused. To further clarify how the technique is supposed to look, Goku tells Piccolo to do it with him, and they demonstrate once again. Meanwhile, Buu lands in a village after getting sleepy and turns all of its residents into clay to build a house for himself. He rests for about five seconds and then wakes up to resume his killing spree. Back at the lookout, Goku's time is up on Earth. He tells Piccolo to take over and ensure the boys have mastered fusion by the next day, to which the Namekian agrees. Everyone
everyone says their goodbyes, and Goku promises to give his regards to Gohan in the afterlife, although Videl states that she doesn't think he's dead. Goku then notices that his son Goten wants a hug from his dad before he departs, and Goku gives him one before he heads off with Baba, bidding his friends and family a farewell for good. Baba takes Goku to the afterlife, where he immediately seeks out King Yama to inquire about his son Gohan. Goku informs Yama that everyone on Earth will soon be arriving at the check-in station due to Boo's rampage and wants to know if Gohan had come before them. Yemma confirms that he hadn't seen Gohan, but he does mention that he's seen Debora, the king of the demon realm. Yemma says that he probably would have liked to go to hell, so he sent him to heaven instead. Goku is relieved that his son isn't dead, but becomes curious about his whereabouts. Suddenly, he feels Gohan's energy far away and uses instant transmission to get to the sacred world of the Kais, where he finds Gohan training with the Z-Sword. After explaining the situation on Earth to Gohan in the Supreme Kai, Goku requests to stay and asks for some food. Meanwhile on Earth, Piccolo wakes up the boys and tells them they need to master fusion within a day. Boo continues to destroy cities, but in his travels, he meets a blind boy and restores his sight so he can get scared and run away like all his other victims. The boy, however, is elated and thanks Boo, then sharing a heartwarming moment with him before he leaves to kill more people. Meanwhile, Gohan is easily handling the Z-Sword, and Goku compliments how well he's able to wield it after only one day. Goku bets the sword can cut really well too and wants to test it, then picking up a big boulder and prepares to throw it at Gohan. Supreme Kai cuts in though, stating he wants to test the Z-Sword's true strength with something harder. He creates a cube of Kachin steel, the hardest metal in the universe, and gives it to Goku. Goku throws the block at Gohan, who swings the Z-Sword at it, but the sword shatters upon contact. Supreme Kai and Kibito are shocked to see that the legendary blade has been broken, but Gohan assumes he's already gotten a lot stronger, given he'd been training with such a heavy weapon. Suddenly, an old man reveals himself behind Supreme Kai and Kibito, stating that he's a Supreme Kai from 15 generations ago. The old Kai explains that he was sealed away in the sword long ago by a strong and evil person because of his power. Intrigued at how strong he truly is, Goku tests the old Kai by shooting a blast at him, which hits him in the face, much to his displeasure. After having been convinced by Goku to reveal his special power with the promise of feeling up an attractive woman, the old Kai reveals his super ability to bring out a person's hidden power beyond their limits, which he believes he can make Gohan, the one who removed the Z-Sword, the strongest in the universe. He then performs a ritual to awaken Gohan's power, which will take 5 hours for the ritual and 20 hours for the power up, much to everyone's surprise. Goku goes over to take a nap, leaving Gohan to sit around for the next 25 hours, and meanwhile, Trunks and Goten continue practicing their fusion technique, which Piccolo believes they have nearly perfected. Yamcha informs the group that the boys are going to attempt the fusion technique outside, as they may be too powerful and cause damage inside the lookout. Piccolo instructs the boys to match their key and begin the fusion technique, and after a big flash on the first attempt, a large, pudgy kid appears, shocking everyone. Boma hopes they can return to normal, while Krillin doubts this is the warrior that Goku mentioned. Piccolo scolds the kid for having his fingers out instead of a fist during part of the pose, which caused the fusion to fail. The fusion ends after 30 minutes and they attempt it again, resulting in a very frail kid this time. Piccolo scolds him about the finger placement and they wait another 30 minutes. The third attempt creates a normal looking warrior with an impressive wave of ki and Gotenks, the fused warrior, is born. Piccolo suggests the boys continue practicing, but Gotenks believes he can defeat Majin Buu at his current power level. Piccolo, however, calls him a fool, but Gotenks flies off to fight Boo, returning shortly after, beaten to a pulp. Piccolo demands that the boys train more before facing Boo again, and meanwhile, the old Kai continues to dance around Gohan, who looks miserable. In a single day on Earth, Majin Buu wiped out over 80% of the population, finding it amusing to watch them resist or flee. The Earth's army even tried to fight back, but were unsuccessful, and the remaining people cling to hope that the savior had survived and is preparing to face Majin Buu. This savior is revealed to be Hercule, the strongest warrior in the world. The royal army flies him to a safe distance from Buu's house, where he plans to use his secret weapons to defeat him. Hercule calls out Buu's name, but gets no response until Buu suddenly appears on the roof of his home. In fear of his life, Hercule offers him presents of gourmet chocolate and a Game Boy, but his attempts to poison and destroy Buu 
fail. Boo decides to spare Hercule as his presents were fun and turns him into his servant, offering him human candy balls, which Hercule tries and then spits out. Hercule then convinces the monster to take a photograph with Boo lying on the ground as proof to the world that he defeated him. Hercule then serves him food before washing his back in the bathtub, secretly thinking of a way to kill him. Back at the realm of the Kais, the dance ritual has ended and old Kai faces Gohan with his hands outstretched. However, Gohan opens his eyes and sees that he's dozing off. He yells at him to wake up, but the old man insists he's awake and tells him to be quiet before falling asleep again, Gohan then thinking to himself that this may be a lost cause. Meanwhile on Earth, Piccolo suggests the boys try fusion as Super Saiyans, warning them not to become overconfident like last time. The boys agree and turn Super Saiyan before successfully fusing into Gotenks. Piccolo is impressed by their strength, but questions their agility. Gotenks tells Piccolo that he'll demonstrate to avoid damaging the lookout and flies off, Piccolo following reluctantly behind him. After traveling around the world, Gotenks lands and waits for Piccolo to catch up. He then foolishly becomes overconfident again and decides to test his power against Majin Buu. Piccolo tries to stop him, but Gotenks flies off, the Namekian stating that they only have one more minute left to be fused. Gotenks arrives at Buu's house to challenge him, but he soon reverts back to Trunks and Goten before running away. Buu comes outside, confused on what just happened, but Hercule tells him that it was nothing important, as no one would dare speak to Buu in such a way. Back inside, Hercule reads a book to Buu who finds it amusing. After finishing it, Buu decides to resume killing, offering for Hercule to come along long, but he declines and offers to cook instead. After Boo departs, Hercule insults and threatens him behind his back before pulling out some powerful dynamite from his bag. He intends to use it to save the world by blowing up Boo and hides the dynamite in a pot, hoping the monster returns soon. Meanwhile, a man and his grandma are walking and trying to hide from Boo when suddenly the woman is shot in the head. The shooter is revealed to be a random earthling and his subordinate who says they'll all be killed by Boo anyway, so they might as well have some fun and kill others. The sniper then orders his subordinate to shoot the old man, and the two then drive off to the city to find more people to kill. Back at Boo's house, Hercule is shocked to see Boo return so soon and is cooking when the monster returns with a puppy. The puppy has a hurt leg and he can't run away, so Boo decides to heal him. Instead of being afraid though, the dog takes a liking to the one who healed him. Hercule explains that the puppy is happy to have been helped, and Boo plays with him as he happily follows. Hercule offers to get the dog some food and drives away, then planning to detonate the bomb he placed in Boo's house earlier. However, as Hercule sees how happy Boo looks with his new friend, he decides to hold off on the explosion. Meanwhile, the random humans speed through towns, murdering everyone in their path. Back at the house, Hercule asks Boo why he kills, and he reveals that he was taught to do so by Bibbidi and Bobbidi, his creators. The champ tells Boo that he doesn't have to kill and destroy because it's fun, and Boo promises not to do it anymore, much to Hercule's pleasure. The sniper and his cohort then head toward Boo's house while Boo and the puppy play. He then arrives and shoots the puppy as Hercule and Boo are left speechless. The sniper's cohort is confused as to why Hercule is with Majin Boo, but the sniper says it's irrelevant since they'll kill him and become the new heroes anyway. Hercule sees them on a cliff and the sniper shoots a rocket at the house, but Hercule manages to escape while they celebrate their triumph. When the smoke clears, Boo is unharmed and furious. The sniper gets ready to shoot again, but Hercule cuts cuts in, takes out his cohort, and furiously beats up the sniper. Boo is calmed down by the end of the beating, and Hercule sees that the puppy is still alive as Boo heals him again. Dende and Piccolo are watching from above, and Piccolo is concerned about the situation. In the midst of Hercule and Boo's celebration though, the sniper shoots Hercule with a handgun and runs away. Boo is enraged more than ever before, but heals Hercule and tells him to flee with the puppy or they'll die. Hercule is confused, but Boo insists, so he runs away. Boo releases a massive cloud of steam that begins to take shape, causing concern for him, Hercule, Piccolo, and Dende, who watch from the lookout. Everyone, including the sniper, observes as the cloud changes into a thin Majin Boo. Apparently, the incredible anger that Boo felt caused an evil within him to manifest into another version of him, now introduced as Evil Boo. The Evil Boo immediately flies toward the sniper, who shoots at him with a handgun. However, Boo merely holds out his his hand and fires a blast, obliterating the sniper and creating a large crater. While Hercule 
watches in horror, the evil Boo runs over to the good Boo and the two exchange blows. The evil Boo kicks the good Boo across the ground and continues to attack him. The original Boo proved to be no match as when they separated, most of the power went to the evil one. The good Boo attempts to transform the bad one into chocolate, but the evil Boo deflects the beam, turning the good Boo into chocolate instead. The evil Boo grabs the chocolate, eats it, and releases steam from his body, transforming into a muscular and lean Majin Boo. Suddenly, Boo then starts screaming, sending Hercule flying and causing the ground to crack, as Piccolo can hardly believe what he's witnessing. Krillin asks what's wrong, and Piccolo explains that Boo's energy has undergone a complete transformation due to some foolish earthlings. He goes on to further explain that he's become pure evil and his body is now much more suited for combat. Although Krillin suggests they still have the young fighters and the fusion technique to rely on, Piccolo remains doubtful. Meanwhile, even Goku in the realm of the Kais notices the change in Boo's energy. Gohan worries they won't be able to stop him in time, but Old Kai reassures him and continues reading his book. The sniper's partner who's still alive climbs up on a cliff and tries to shoot Boo with a machine gun, but the bullets have no effect. Boo wickedly laughs and enters the man's mouth, causing him to explode from the inside. Boo then approaches Hercule and his puppy, but stops himself upon seeing them. The champ assumes the monster is scared, but then realizes Boo is floating above him. It seems a part of Boo still cares for Hercule as he utters his name before flying away. Boo continues to laugh maniacally and creates a powerful shockwave as he flies away, suddenly changing direction as he flies straight up and appears before everyone at the lookout. Apparently, he has the ability to sense Ki now, much to the detriment of the Z fighters. Boo suddenly shouts out the word bring, startling everyone at the lookout. Piccolo wonders what Boo wants him to bring, and the monster explains he wants to fight the ones who were promised to battle him by Goku. Piccolo confirms that the fighters are present, but sleeping to prepare. Boo orders Piccolo to wake them up, but the Namekian advises him to wait for them just a little bit longer. Impatient though, Boo declines, saying that he hates waiting. Desperate to buy some more time, Piccolo tells Boo that he can kill everyone on Earth for his amusement in the meantime. Boo then smiles and proceeds to walk around the edge of the lookout. He raises his arm and begins an extinction attack on the Earth, which shoots thousands of beams from the lookout and kills everyone below. Having finished his work, Boo demands Piccolo to bring out his opponent to fight. Piccolo agrees, but requires time to prepare since the fighter is sleeping. He suggests one hour, to which Boo questions the duration. Piccolo creates an hourglass and shows the monster how long it will take, and he initially grows impatient, but Piccolo informs him that Videl, Hercule's child, wants him to wait as well. Boo looks at her and finally agrees, but threatens to kill everyone if Piccolo fails to bring out his opponent at the end of the hour. Piccolo then tells Krillin to take Trunks and Goten to the hyperbolic time chamber where they can train for one hour Earth time, which equals 15 days in there. Meanwhile, Tian Shinhan and Chaozu are seen on Earth alive, having dodged Boo's attack, and Hercule is wandering around. Back in the realm of the Kais, Supreme Kai notices that everyone on Earth has been killed by Majin Buu. Goku is surprised and wonders if the Earth was destroyed, but Supreme Kai clarifies that the Earth is mostly undamaged, but doesn't know exactly what happened. Meanwhile, Gohan's annoyed that the process is taking so long. Old Kai says the ritual isn't done yet, as the Half Saiyan still has a lot of latent power. Having lost his patience though, Gohan stands up and unleashes his new power, surprised so much energy was coming from him. Old Kai tells him to calm down, and Goku's impressed, wondering how much power Gohan really has hidden. At the lookout, Goten and Trunks notice that Boo's changed. Piccolo tells them to enter the hyperbolic time chamber, where one minute outside is equal to six hours of training inside. Shortly after though, Chi Chi foolishly confronts Boo for killing Gohan, and he turns her into an egg, Piccolo then telling an upset Goten to focus on training, as she can be brought back with the Dragon Balls. Later in the chamber, Trunks complains about the conditions of the room, but Goten has already begun training to avenge his family. On the outside, Videl asks Piccolo how Boo knows her father, and he explains that Hercule is the only one who befriended Boo. Their conversation is interrupted though, as Boo gets impatient and destroys the hourglass, demanding Piccolo to bring him his challengers immediately, and he begins walking him to the time chamber. Krillin and the others question why Piccolo is leading Boo there, but Dende explains that if needed, Piccolo could destroy the door and trap Boo in that dimension if Goten and Trunks lose. Assuming they die, they can be brought back with the Dragon Balls as well. Meanwhile, Trunks and Goten are tired from training and discuss their plan 
plan to go beyond Super Saiyan to defeat Boo. Piccolo telepathically informs them though that Boo is on his way and that they need to be prepared sooner than they thought. About a minute later, Piccolo and Boo arrive at the time chamber where Boo initially rushes into battle, but after being yelled at by Trunks, he waits for the boys to fuse into Gotenks to fight him. Gotenks then rushes in and delivers a kick and a few punches to Boo's face, but they have no effect. Piccolo then thinking that the Earth is doomed. Gotenks claims he hasn't gotten serious yet, but intends to display his true abilities on Boo. He rushes toward the monster and unleashes several generic attacks with ridiculous names. This annoys Boo, who slaps Gotenks and sends him flying, as Piccolo is embarrassed by the scene. Boo claims that Gotenks is weak and he's no longer interested in playing around. Gotenks mutters that Boo doesn't understand the situation and will regret making him angry. He transforms into a Super Saiyan, which surprises Piccolo. Gotenks then decides he'll finish finish the battle, but wonders which technique to use. He settles on the galactic donut attack, which forms a ring of ki around Boo. Boo, however, easily breaks free and attacks Gotenks. They collide in mid-air, and Boo is hurt for the first time. Gotenks then uses his ultimate technique, the Super Ghost Kamikaze attack, as he spits out a ghost that looks identical to him, much to everyone's surprise. The ghost then flies towards Boo, as Boo smacks it to stop the attack, but upon impact, the ghost explodes, causing Boo to be severely injured. Gotenks gets confident and creates an additional 10 ghosts to finish off Boo, commanding them like soldiers to fall in line for the next move. Meanwhile, Boo recovers and sips on a green drink while reading a book about cars, and Gotenks sends two of his ghosts after him. Boo avoids the attacks and makes fun of Gotenks, so the fused hero conjures up a plan of attack. Gotenks sends the ghosts to attack Boo again, but two ghosts blow themselves up by accident. The remaining five then distract Boo and detonate on him, leaving the remaining one to go in Boo's mouth and blow him to bits. As the monster's blown away, Gotenk strikes a victory pose, assured that the battle is over. Meanwhile, in the realm of the Kais, Goku and Supreme Kai notice that Majin Buu's key has disappeared, along with Goten and Trunks. Old Kai explains that they've been fighting in the hyperbolic time chamber and that the Namekian led Majin Buu in there for some reason. Back in the chamber, despite thinking they've defeated Buu by burning up his flesh, the monster reforms and begins to collect above them. Piccolo wonders if Gotenks has another attack up his sleeve, but rather than filling him in on his master plan, the fused warrior makes Piccolo sweat, faking as if he's all out of power and options. Suddenly, Boo grabs Gotenks and swings him around with his antenna, then punching him away and knocking his tooth out. Just as Gotenks prepares to show off his hidden technique though, Piccolo destroys the entrance to the hyperbolic time chamber, stating that the three of them are now trapped in the room for eternity. Gotenks scolds the Namekian and tells him he was just joking about being out of options, to which Piccolo gets upset. Meanwhile, shocked about seemingly being trapped forever, Boo screams to the top of his lungs and creates a hole in the time chamber dimension, revealing the lookout. Boo, who's just as surprised as everyone else, gazes at the hole while Piccolo realizes that he was able to break a dimensional wall just with the power of his key. The hole starts to shrink though, and Boo quickly squeezes himself through the tiny opening before it disappears, leaving Piccolo and Gotenks trapped. Meanwhile, Goku senses that Majin Boo has left the hyperbolic time chamber, but Gotenks and Piccolo are still inside. Old Kai creates a crystal ball and throws it to Goku so he can observe the events. In the crystal ball, Goku sees that Boo has returned and turned everyone into chocolate. Gohan is confused on what's going on, but Goku tells him to concentrate on unleashing his potential. Goku remembers that Earth still has the Dragon Balls though, so somehow things should work out. In the hyperbolic time chamber, Piccolo and Gotenks keep screaming, but nothing seems to work. Having been left with no other options, Gotenks decides to use his secret technique and transform into a Super Saiyan 3, surprising Piccolo. Gotenks then screams again and creates his own dimensional hole, and he and Piccolo jump through and find Boo waiting for them. Gotenks tells Boo that he's stronger now, and Piccolo notices that the lookout is damaged. Boo reveals that he ate everyone moments ago, which angers Gotenks. The Saiyan slams his head into Boo and propels him through the main structure of the lookout and into midair, which takes Boo by surprise. He manages to dodge a punch from Gotenks, and his fist is caught and used to throw him to the temple floor causing significant damage to it. Boo then becomes enraged, and Piccolo is saddened by the destruction. Boo curls into a ball and flies toward them repeatedly, destroying the rest of the lookout in the process until only the floor beneath them remains. Gotenks attempts to counter, but Boo breaks the floor, causing Piccolo to urge Gotenks to attack without posing. Gotenks complies and uses his rapid-fire super donut attack to trap Boo in a ball of donuts. Piccolo thinks Boo has been sealed, but Gotenks warns that he'll break free soon. Gotenks then calls for Piccolo's help.
help in performing the Clash Ultra Boo Boo Volleyball move, but Piccolo is hesitant. Despite this, the Namekian agrees and they successfully spike the Boo Volleyball down to Earth, creating a large crater upon impact. Knowing that attack alone wouldn't be sufficient enough to kill Boo, Gotenks tells the monster to pick himself up and urges him to hurry as his power won't last long and it'll take him an hour to regain it. Piccolo shows up and Gotenks begins to doubt Boo's strength, thinking he may have overestimated it and killed him, but suddenly a massive blast emerges from the crater, almost hitting both Gotenks and Piccolo. The Namekian expresses concern, stating that the energy in the blast was powerful enough to instantly destroy the Earth. Gotenks becomes furious and decides to use rapid fire die die missiles on the crater, not caring about destroying the earth since everyone's already dead. However, Piccolo warns Gotenks that he might accidentally destroy a dragon ball, which would prevent them from wishing anyone back. When Boo emerges from the rubble, Gotenks believes that he must be weakened, but Piccolo notes that he's only weakened spiritually and that he's never fought someone as powerful as Gotenks before. Boo headbutts Gotenks and chases him, leading to a fierce battle between the two. As they exchange blows, Goku thinks that Gohan may not even get a chance to fight. As Gotenks lands near a battle-damaged Boo, he declares that he'll finish him off and annihilate him completely, but his Super Saiyan 3 form wears off, causing him to return to his normal state. As Gotenks stands speechless, Boo starts to recover from his injuries. Piccolo believes that it's the end of the battle, and meanwhile in the realm of the Kais, Goku urges Old Kai to hurry up since the fusion is worn off. Old Kai reveals that he's been ready to go for the last 5 minutes, prompting Gohan to ask why he didn't say something sooner. Gohan realizes he needs to act fast and asks for guidance on how to become the warrior of ultimate strength. Old Kai tells him that it's similar to transforming into a Super Saiyan and focusing his ki. Gohan then unleashes his power, almost blowing everyone away. Despite not being in his Super Saiyan form, Gohan's power has impressed Goku. Supreme Kai urges them to hurry to Earth, but Kibito offers to take Gohan alone since the others will just get in the way. Goku feels bad for not being there for his son, but hugs Gohan and wishes him luck before Kibito teleports him away. On Earth, Earth, Gohan asks Kibito for a change of clothes to match his father's gi. Kibito easily fulfills this request and Gohan sets off to face Boo alone. Trunks and Goten are now separated and scared for their lives. Piccolo offers to fight and die with them as they know his help won't make much of a difference. Suddenly though, Boo sits down and falls asleep, confusing Piccolo and the boys. They soon sense a powerful energy heading their way and wonder who or what it is. Piccolo initially thinks it might be a new enemy until it gets closer and he shouts that it's it's Goku. However, Goten corrects him, revealing it to be his brother, Gohan. Gohan lands in front of the group and greets them, explaining that the Supreme Kai saved him and has been caring for him until now. Piccolo notes that Gohan looks different, as his facial features and ki has changed. Gohan then learns from Trunks and Goten that Majin Buu has killed everyone, including his mother and Dende. Noticing a faint ki in the distance though, Gohan smirks and decides to confront Buu, telling him that he intends to kill him. Buu laughs and recalls beating up Gohan in the past, and even Piccolo doesn't believe Gohan can win. The boys then prepare to try to use fusion again to help him out, although it's too early to attempt it anyway. However, Gohan suddenly powers up and attacks Boo relentlessly, stunning Piccolo, Trunks, and Goten. Boo is shocked, and Gohan confidently says that he can't win. Boo realizes that Gohan's the one who possesses the immense power that he felt far away, and says that he can't allow anyone to be more powerful than him. The monster says that he'll eliminate Gohan, but the half saiyan calmly says that that's impossible. Boo then grins and begins to power up, prompting Gohan to realize his intentions and escape with Piccolo and the boys as Boo self-destructs. They land on a cliff that overlooks the explosion, and Gohan notes that Boo didn't die and is currently hiding his key. Goten suggests that Boo might be planning a surprise attack, but Gohan speculates that something else is at play. Trunks assures the group that Gohan can defeat Boo, even if he is alive. Gotenks acknowledges that Gohan is stronger than their super Goten tanks, and Trunks admits that it may be true. Gohan explains to the group that he gained his strength from the Elder Kai, then inquiring about the dragon radar which Piccolo has. Piccolo informs them that Dende is dead, but Gohan detects a faint key that belongs to him. The group set out to locate Dende, and on the way, spot a tired Hercule and rescue him. Piccolo carries him while Goten takes care of his dog. Piccolo wonders why Boo didn't eliminate Dende, and Gohan reminds him that they left the hyperbolic time chamber only a few moments after Boo did. They 
soon find Dende, who tells them that Mr. Popo saved him when Boo returned. Hercule is curious about the green-skinned child, but Trunks informs him that he's the ruler of the Earth. Time passes, and Hercule learns of Fidel's demise, but Goten assures him that they can bring her back to life. Suddenly, the group senses Boo approaching, and Gohan is curious to see what's changed in the last hour that he's been gone. Boo lands and grins while Gohan notices that nothing's changed. Trunks believes that Boo will just run away, but the monster shouts that he wants to fight Goten and Trunks once again. Gohan refuses though, claiming that he's Boo's opponent. However, Boo insists on settling the score with the boys first. Gohan wonders why, but Boo ignores him and accuses the boys of being scared. Trunks and Goten deny it, and Piccolo senses that something strange is happening. Trunks tells Piccolo that Boo is too stupid to have a plan, and they fuse quickly as Gotenks appears in his Super Saiyan 3 form. Boo then splits a part of his back into two blobs, which go unnoticed by the others. As Gotenks prepares the fight, one blob engulfs him while the other takes Piccolo. Boo quickly brings the blobs back to him and absorbs them, causing him to transform. Goku from the Kai Realm urges Gohan to kill Boo, but the transformation is complete before Gohan can act. Boo then looks down at Gohan with a wicked grin, now sporting an elongated antenna in Gotenks' vest. Boo explains that he planned to absorb Gotenks all along to become the strongest, but his power had a time limit, so he waited for an hour for the next chance. Gohan remarks that Boo's intelligence hasn't improved though, as it would have been smarter to absorb him instead. Boo argues that being the strongest would be pointless without anyone to fight, then stating that his greatest motivation is to fulfill his previous Majin Buu's promise of killing Gohan. Buu aims to end the fight quickly due to Super Gotenks' time constraint, Gohan then stating that that's smart thinking and that that must be the Piccolo in him. Gohan tries to attack Buu with a kick, but Buu catches both legs, leaving Gohan helpless. The Half Saiyan shoots a key blast, but Buu avoids it and grabs Gohan's neck with his antenna. Buu then punches Gohan into the distance and fires a powerful key blast at him, but Gohan manages to dodge it. Buu taunts Gohan, who attacks again but gets smacked into the air and trapped by Gotenks' rapid fire super donut move. Goku fears for Gohan's life and is urged by Old Kai to help, but Goku is unable to return to the world of the living. Old Kai then offers to sacrifice himself so that Goku can return and save Gohan. Back on Earth, Buu prepares to use the Kamehameha to finish off a trapped Gohan, but the Half Saiyan breaks free and barely manages to avoid the attack. Meanwhile in the afterlife, King Yama sends a soul back to Earth to a assist in the battle with Boo, and Vegeta is chosen, smiling at the chance to face off against the monster once again. In the realm of the Kais, the old Kai dies and gives Goku his life, but immediately resurrects with a halo and urges the Saiyan to hurry and save Gohan. Boo continues to mock Gohan's persistence to survive their battle. Gohan rushes in once more, but Boo evades it easily and elbows him, causing him to fall to the ground. Gohan retaliates by shooting a blast at Boo, but the monster redirects it back toward him. The blast goes through the ground and flies out into space on the other side of the planet. Boo flies after Gohan, estimating that he only has 10 minutes left for the fusion and wants to make them enjoyable. As Gohan's beaten senseless, Dende advises Hercule to take the dog and leave, but he refuses, then pulling out his 4-5 caliber gun and aims at Boo. In the realm of the Kais, Goku plans to teleport away, but the old Kai stops him and asks how he intends to defeat Boo. Goku gets an idea to fuse with Gohan using the dance he taught Goten and Trunks, but old Kai is skeptical, stating that Boo wouldn't give them enough time to prepare. He then removes the earrings that he's wearing and instructs Goku to put one on his left ear while Gohan puts the other on his right, and the two will begin to fuse. Old Kai claims that the Patara earrings are a superior method of fusion and an ancient treasure of the Kais. To demonstrate, he instructs Supreme Kai and Kibito to remove the earrings on their opposing ears, and the two fly toward one another as we cut back to Gohan, who suddenly crashes out of the ground and is badly injured. Dende rushes to heal him, just as Boo emerges from the ground as well, confused on how Gohan was able to get back to full strength. He however mocks him as he's still weaker, and attacks Gohan with a key shockwave and attempts to kill Dende at the same time, assuming he's the reason for Gohan's recovery. Hercule fires his gun at the blast and it disappears, not at the hands of the champ though, but Tien Shinhan, who'd arrived and used a tri-beam to deflect it. In the meantime, Supreme Kai and Kibito have fused, creating a taller Kai with long straight hair. The warrior now now known as Kibito Kai is thrilled with his new power, but Old Kai quickly 
deflates his ego. Goku wonders how long the Patora fusion lasts, and Old Kai reveals that it lasts forever, much to Kabito Kai's surprise. Goku is shocked as well, realizing that he won't be able to separate from his son. Old Kai then urges Goku to hurry and save Gohan before it's too late, and Goku prepares to head to Earth. Right before leaving though, he wonders if they should transform into Super Saiyan before fusing. However, Old Kai advises against it, as it could have adverse effects on their body and lifespan. Kabito Kai interrupts them though, stating that Buu is about to finish off Gohan, and Goku leaves, then appearing on Earth to cut Buu in half with a Destructo disc to prevent him from destroying the Earth. Gohan wonders how his dad returned from the afterlife, and Buu recognizes Goku as the warrior with the unusual transformations that he fought before. Goku then informs Buu that he possesses a powerful secret weapon to tip the scales, which confuses him. Buu, however, lifts up his cut-off lower half and kicks Tien across the face, knocking him out. After some trash talk, Goku tosses one of the other Patora to Gohan, but he misses it, much to Goku's shock. Goku instructs him to put it on his right ear to fuse and defeat Buu. However, Buu interrupts them and rushes toward Goku. Gohan searches for the Patara while Goku transforms into Super Saiyan 3, but suddenly, Buu stops mid-air and begins to regress, as the boy's fusion has now run out. Goku assumes that Piccolo is the strongest one inside Buu now, and that Gohan can handle things from here, but Buu reveals that he had a backup plan, then using the spare piece of his body that was cut off to engulf Gohan and absorb him. Now out of time and options, Goku searches for another person to fuse with, but Tien Shinhan is out of commission and Dende is no fighter. Goku then considers Hercule as his last option. Buu generously gives Goku 5 seconds to choose a fusion partner, but Goku has trouble deciding as fusing with Hercule would probably do more harm than good. As Goku is about to choose Hercule anyway though, he senses Vegeta's key in the distance. Buu attacks but Goku teleports away just in time. Goku and Vegeta reunite, surprising both of them and Baba. Buu states that he'll hunt Goku down and flies after him, leaving Hercule and Dende behind. Goku asks Vegeta to put on the Patara earring to fuse and defeat Buu, but Vegeta is hesitant. Buu senses their power, but doubts that they'll be strong enough even if they fuse. Goku urges Vegeta to put on the earrings as Buu gets closer, but Vegeta is angry that Goku held back during their fight and didn't use Super Saiyan 3. Goku explains that the transformation was temporary and apologizes, but reveals that Buu killed everyone and absorbed Piccolo, Gohan, Goten, and Trunks. Vegeta remains skeptical about fusion as Buu prepares to attack, but finally puts on the earring in desperation, but not before Goku warns him that they'll be permanently fused. They then join bodies and create a new warrior, surprising Buu. After fusing, Vegeta and Kakarot become Vegito, who then transforms into Super Vegito, a powerful warrior who easily defeats reflects Buu's key attack. Buu tries to attack Vegito with a punch, but the warrior counters with a hard kick to the face, breaking Buu's nose. Vegito taunts Buu and continues to pummel him with punches and kicks, then grabbing Buu's leg and slamming him into the ground, leaving him helpless. Kabito Kai and Old Kai comment on the power of the Patara, stating how the fusion of these two rivals has made them stronger than ever before. Vegito then impales Buu with a key saber and asks him to get serious, but Buu remains defiant. As the two fighters become engulfed, Engulfed in the steam of the monster's anger, they continue to battle, but Vegito emerges victorious, holding Buu's antenna in his hand. He then blows it to bits and vows to erase Buu from existence the same way later, but Old Kai gets upset that the fused warrior isn't taking the fight seriously himself, leaving Buu completely furious. Buu is shocked to see that Vegito's power is so great and the warrior mocks him, prompting Buu to utilize Gotenks' Super Ghost Kamikaze attack. Vegito recognizes the technique though and easily destroys the ghost, taunting Buu, causing him to become increasingly frustrated. Buu flies at Vegito, angry about their unfair fusion, but Vegito easily dodges and strikes, telling him that he absorbed multiple people, so he's the last person who should be complaining. Meanwhile, Dende and Hercule can hear the battle in the distance. Vegito kicks Buu in the face and taunts him some more, but Buu retaliates by turning him into a candy ball. The monster holds the candy in his hand and prepares to eat, but suddenly punches himself in the face, causing the candy to drop and float. Vegito surprisingly retained his strength as a candy ball and attacks Buu, flying around and through his body repeatedly and cutting off a piece of his antenna. Buu eventually turns the warrior back to normal,
animal and out of options begins to sweat. Vegito then gives Boo until the count of 10 to say his prayers and suddenly Boo realizes he can absorb Vegito by using the piece of his antenna that was cut off. He waits carefully and angles the absorption but Vegito is on to his plan. As Boo goes in for it, Vegeta puts up a barrier to protect himself and is absorbed as Boo sits in satisfaction. Kibito Kai is in disbelief that Vegito was absorbed by Majin Boo, who is now taunting the fighter with laughter. The Kai thinks it's the end, but old Kai observes that Boo hasn't powered up or changed his form as he did before, which is strange. He suspects that Vegito may have had a plan and Boo stops laughing, wondering himself why he hasn't transformed, but realizes that he's still the strongest and no one can stop him. Boo then tears off his shirt and laughs maniacally, while deep inside him, Vegito appears, annoyed by his laughter and grateful that the barrier worked. Shortly after, he decides to remove it to search for Gohan and the others, but splits back into Goku and Vegeta. Goku is confused on how they could separate when the fusion was supposed to be permanent, but Vegeta is relieved to be himself again and destroys his Patara earring. Goku scolds him and explains that they could have used that to fight against Buu again, then stating that as long as they're separated, Vegeta will have to go back to the afterlife. Vegeta, however, says that's better than spending an eternity united with Goku. Goku suggests they find Gohan and the others, and Vegeta agrees, warning that they need to hurry before Buu destroys the Earth. As they search for their friends, they find Piccolo, Gohan, Trunks, and Goten trapped in pods connected to Buu's innards. Vegeta notices that the boys have lost their fusion as well, but Goku explains that it's because of the 30 minute time limit for the fusion technique. The two begin to free their loved ones, and on the outside, the monster suddenly reverts back to his pre-absorption form. Goku notices that Buu's power has dropped, but insists that they can't compete with his strength and suggests fusion again. Vegeta realizes Goku's referring to the dance Goten and Trunks performed and refuses to do it, then suddenly notices the innocent Buu trapped in another pod nearby. As they observe and suggest cutting him loose, suddenly a voice interrupts them. The two turn around and see that the Buu they're inside has formed within himself, and Vegeta is perplexed by this. Buu doesn't know why they weren't absorbed, but is angry that they disconnected all the others. Vegeta states that they're in a bad situation, while Goku suggests they should have kept the Patora to fuse again outside for an easy victory. Buu is pleased to hear they can't fuse again, and Vegeta criticizes Goku for giving that away. Buu then prepares to fight, so the two turn Super Saiyan. Goku threatens to blast a large hole in Buu's body, but Buu remains unconcerned. Meanwhile, Dende, Hercule, and the puppy approach Buu on the outside, as Dende can sense his energy. Inside, Goku's attack is ineffective. Buu explains that he felt a small sensation in his head, since they're as small as fleas. Goku says they'll have to find another way to defeat him, but Buu claims it's impossible. Vegeta has another idea though, and asks Buu what would happen if he cut the other Buu's pod free, wondering whether Buu would revert to the fat one or the thin one. Buu pleads with Vegeta to stop though, stating that if this Buu were to be removed, he won't be him anymore. Goku is puzzled by what Buu means, while Vegeta is quite intrigued. The monster rushes at Vegeta, but the Saiyan cuts the pod free before Buu can attack. The inner Buu then collapses and oozes away, while the outer Buu screams in agony. Vegeta suggests they should rescue everyone and leave, so they carry the pods and fly through Buu until they come across one of the steam holes in his head. Outside, they all return to their normal size, but everyone else remains unconscious. Buu still hasn't noticed their escape in the midst of his agony, and Dende is impressed with Goku and Vegeta's rescue of the absorbed individuals. Buu starts to grow larger, and Goku points out that his energy is actually increasing now, much to their surprise. Goku is uneasy about Buu's transformation, as is Kibito Kai. The Kai then panics as he realizes Buu is reverting back to his original form. Buu's agony stops as he transforms into a small, childlike form, which Goku and Vegeta assume will be easy to defeat, but the Kais are shocked and discuss Buu's history. Kibito Kai explains that this version of Buu was created by the mage Bibidi and defeated four of the five total Supreme Kai. The first two to die were the North and West Supreme Kai, but Buu absorbed the other two of them and gained a heart, which reduced his power. However, the detachment from the Fat Buu has now pushed him to his current state as the pure incarnation of evil. Kid Buu screams at the top of his lungs, surprising everyone around him, and without hesitation, fires a blast at the planet, devastating enough to destroy it. Vegeta knocks it away just in time, and the Saiyans try to convince Buu not to destroy the Earth, but Buu ignores them and creates a large energy ball. Realizing they can't stop this attack from destroying their home, Goku decides to use instant transmission to teleport everyone away. Having little time to act, he spots Dende, Hercule, and a puppy on the ground and decides to save them instead, in shock that he can only teleport this one time. Kibito Kai, 
however, appears and takes their hands, teleporting them to the sacred realm of the Kais just as Earth explodes, taking Piccolo, Trunks, Goten, and Gohan along with it. As the group arrive, Goku is devastated that they couldn't save the others, and Vegeta questions why Goku chose to save Dende, Hercule, and the dog over his own children. The old Kai confirms with the group that the Earth is gone, which makes Hercule laugh, thinking the old man is talking nonsense. Dende, however, politely tells Hercule to be quiet and explains the importance of the Kais and the realm. It's all for nothing though, as he brushes it off, still not believing that Dende could possibly be the god of the Earth. Hercule then realizes this must be all a dream and jumps off a cliff to prove it to himself, although he falls immediately and gets hurt. Vegeta is still angry at Goku for saving this idiot instead of their comrades and further states due to the Earth's destruction, the Dragon Balls won't be able to bring back the dead anymore. However, Dende suggests going to planet Namek to get a new set of Dragon Balls. Goku thinks it's too far away, but the Supreme Kai says he can teleport them there. Old Kai, however, is against the idea, stating that the Dragon Ball shouldn't be used for selfish desires, prompting Goku to offer to take a perverted picture of a woman for him in exchange for permission to use the Dragon Balls. Vegeta catches wind of what Goku is planning as he's talking about Bulma and argues with him, exclaiming that he needs to use his own wife instead of his. Meanwhile, Kibito Kai looks at the crystal ball and points out that Boo is reforming in space. With little time to spare, the Kais give Goku and Vegeta another pair of Patara earrings, but they refuse to use them as they want to fight Boo one on one. They believe they must have some time before the final battle, but suddenly, Boo appears in the realm of the Kais, having been able to find everyone after witnessing Kibito Kai use his teleportation technique once. Goku and Vegeta prepare to fight Boo while the others watch via a crystal ball from another planet, and after winning in rock, paper, scissors to decide who fights first, Goku becomes a Super Saiyan 3 and wakes up a sleeping Boo, who then begins howling and beating on his chest. Vegeta steps back and acknowledges that the final battle for the fate of the universe was about to begin. Kid Boo then attacks Goku, but he counters with a Kamehameha. Boo quickly recovers and Goku hits him away, but Boo slows himself and kicks Goku in the face. As the Saiyan backflips to gain distance, he's met with a blast from Boo that he barely manages to teleport away from. The two then begin to trade blows as Vegeta watches, acknowledging how amazing Goku is in his battle, as he himself didn't stand a chance. Vegeta goes on to state that he now knows why he could never come close to Goku in strength, as he always fought for the sheer pleasure of battle and to kill his enemies, while Goku only fights to better himself each time and overcome his limits. He almost never takes the lives of his opponents and cares for others, which Vegeta now understands, confused but accepting how such a gentle Saiyan could still love to fight. Vegeta then continues to watch the battle, as he wishes Goku good luck, saying that he's truly number one. Meanwhile, Goku disintegrates Boo with a powerful Kamehameha, but he regenerates as usual. The Saiyan is frustrated that Boo's physical strength never decreases and that he can always return to his normal state. Vegeta then encouraging Goku to go all out and finish Boo, as he thinks he's holding back for his sake. Goku, however, states that he's actually pushing himself to his limits and needs more time to power up, prompting Vegeta to offer him a minute to gather his strength while he takes on Boo himself. Goku warns Vegeta that if he dies again, he'll vanish from not only the living world, but the afterlife, effectively ceasing to exist. Nevertheless, Vegeta makes up his mind, powering up to Super Saiyan 2 and charges at Boo with a massive key blast that obliterates the lower half of his body. Vegeta unleashes a series of blasts, causing Goku to believe that he can achieve his one minute goal at this pace. Despite the relentless assault though, Boo regenerates behind Vegeta and knocks him down with a forceful blow. Vegeta tries to recover, but Boo can continues to pummel him with lightning fast punches and kicks. Vegeta is astonished by the ferocity of Boo's attacks, surprised that Goku could fight such an adversary on his own. Goku hopes that Vegeta can hold on, but it appears that he might not make it. Goku then states that it's been over a minute, yet he still doesn't have enough power, watching as Boo kicks Vegeta and sends him flying, then grabs him by the neck and begins choking him. Goku is unsure what to do, but suddenly, Hercule interrupts Boo by calling him out and boasting about being the world champion. Boo releases Vegeta and turns his attention to Hercule, preparing to attack him. Hercule of course cowers and covers himself, and Boo misses him. Goku is impressed by Hercule's courage, and Boo suddenly stops attacking as he clutches his head in agony, Hercule then assuming that the monster is afraid of him, and starts laughing. Boo continues his struggle as Hercule and Goku are confused as to why the monster is behaving so strangely. Vegeta asks Goku if he's finished, but the Saiyan says he's actually getting weaker by the second. Kid Boo then spits out Fat Boo, who's apparently still inside him, much to everyone's shock. Dende realizes that the good Boo inside of Kid Boo was preventing him from attacking Hercule, but now that barrier has been removed. Hercule stands his guard against the evil Boo, but he's punched
punched in the face and rolls around in pain. The champ tries to threaten Boo, but he just laughs and beats his chest like an ape, then rushing at Hercule to finish him off. Suddenly, the good Boo appears and stands between Hercule and Evil Boo. The two Boos then launch toward one another, with the Evil Boo getting a hard kick to the good one. Fat Boo recovers and headbutts Kid Boo, but he grabs Fat Boo's antenna and slams him around. Fat Boo fires a blast at Kid Boo, blowing off half his torso, but he quickly regenerates. Meanwhile, Goku's power is fading away and he loses his Super Saiyan 3 form, shocking everyone. The Evil Boo then blows off the Good Boo's head, but he manages to recover. Hercule cheers Fat Boo on, but he says he doubts he can win. Vegeta insults Goku for his inability to gather ki and being able to maintain his Super Saiyan 3 form, which drains the energy of a living body. Disheartened, Goku gives up and the two Boos engage in combat, Kid Boo clearly having the upper hand. Hercule tries to intervene, but is easily swatted away by Kid Boo. Fat Boo manages to break free from the Evil Boo's headlock and attacks him, but the Evil Boo dodges and strikes him from behind. The Good Boo regenerates and they continue fighting, leaving Goku worried about how long they'll be able to keep this up. Vegeta then calls on the Kais and Dende to gather the Dragon Balls on the restored planet Namek, but doesn't explain why. After the trip is made and the balls are gathered, having been done by the Namekians already, Vegeta orders them to make two wishes, restore the Earth and revive everyone who died since the Tenkaichi Budokai, except for the evil ones. Dende realizes that Poronga can only revive one person per wish, but the Namekian leader Mori assures them that Poronga has powered up since Goku's battle with Frieza. Meanwhile, the evil Boo attacks the good Boo and Vegeta notices that the good Boo's power is dropping. Poronga eventually grants the second wish and the people of Earth including Gohan, Piccolo, and the boys are revived. Vegeta then reveals his plan to have Goku prepare a spirit bomb to kill Boo, but Goku doubts that gathering energy from all the Earthlings will be sufficient enough to do the job. Vegeta thinks otherwise though and explains that this will be a lot of energy. Dende informs them that Poronga wants the third wish, but Vegeta isn't interested. He instead wants to speak to all the Earthlings at once, but Kibito Kai says it's impossible. However, Goku recognizes King Kai's voice as he offers to help Vegeta by using his telepathy to speak to Earth's people. Vegeta addresses the Earthlings and asks them to lend their power to defeat Boo, and Goku then raises his hands and asks everyone to lend him as much energy as possible. The others, including Gohan, Trunks, and Goten, follow suit and the energy begins to swell. However, Vegeta realizes that the spirit bomb isn't complete and gets angry when he hears that the Earthlings are hesitant to raise their hands. Goku expresses doubts about their current level of ki and asks if anyone other than their friends has contributed. Vegeta, frustrated by the lack of support, aggressively demands that the people of Earth contribute. However, they still remain skeptical, unwilling to assist. Meanwhile, the evil Boo is attacking the good Boo and Vegeta realizes they're running out of time. Hercule tries to distract the evil Boo with a rock to prevent him from killing the good Boo, but it only annoys him and directs his attention to Goku and the others. Goku appeals to everyone on Earth to lend their energy to help defeat the evil Boo. Some recognize his voice and raise their hands, while others are still skeptical. Vegeta tries to attack the evil Boo, but is quickly overpowered. As Hercule watches Vegeta's suffering and Goku's pleas to the Earth, he grows frustrated with the Earthling's skepticism and steps in, demanding them to help the world champion. The Earthlings recognize Hercule's voice and the champ tells him that he's been battling Majin Buu. Now convinced, the Earthlings raise their hands and send over their energy, chanting Hercule's name throughout the planet in the process. After a few more moments, the power of everyone on Earth is transferred to Goku and the spirit bomb finishes as Goku prepares to launch it at Buu. Goku tells Vegeta to move out of the way to avoid being caught up in the blast. Suddenly, Buu launches an attack at Goku, causing him to quickly disappear to evade it. When he reappears, he sees that Vegeta is no longer near Buu. Hercule is then seen running away with Vegeta slung over his shoulder. Goku commends Hercule for his efforts, stating that he truly is the savior of the world and launches the spirit bomb, but Buu prepares to counter it with a blast of his own. Despite Goku's efforts, Buu manages to hold off the spirit bomb from smothering him. Goku wishes he had some more strength left to push it further, and Vegeta realizes he doesn't have enough physical strength to fully execute the attack. Dende and the Kais try to work out a strategy, then suggesting using the Dragon Balls to restore Goku's strength. Dende fulfills the wish and Poronga agrees and makes it so, restoring the Saiyan to his full power. Goku then turns Super Saiyan and tells Buu that he's amazing, having come so far with his own strength. Goku states that he hopes he can come back one day as a better person, and with that, he pushes the Spirit Bomb down and Kid Buu is completely obliterated from existence. From the air, Goku glances at Vegeta and gives him a thumbs up, signifying the end of the battle as they both smile.
while. Finally, Majin Buu had disappeared completely, with not a single cell remaining, and then the Namekians and Kai celebrate. Piccolo informs Gohan that Buu's energy is completely gone, and on the world of the Kais, Hercule speaks to the citizens on Earth, confirming that it's all over. Everyone cheers and chants except for Videl, who knows her father is lying. Meanwhile, Dende rushes to heal Goku, but Goku asks him to heal Vegeta first. Hercule's reunion with his puppy in celebration is cut short though, when the puppy finds the original Boo beaten to a pulp in some rubble. Vegeta understandably wants to finish off Boo, but Hercule begs him not to, saying that he'll take responsibility for him. Goku asks Dende to heal Boo and says that both he and Hercule helped in the battle, so at the very least, he deserves to live. Kabito Kai thinks it might not be a good idea for Boo to live on Earth since everyone will recognize him, but Goku suggests they can keep him from going outside for six months and ask Shinron to erase Boo's memory from everyone. Vegeta reluctantly agrees, and after Boo is healed, they all return to Earth and everyone greets them happily, except Boo, who everyone needed to get used to at first. Six months later, memories of Boo were erased from everyone's mind, except for those who were heavily involved, and we fast forward 10 years into the future as we witness a now teenage Trunks visiting Gohan, who tells him that Goten and their dad are training in the woods. We cut to a teenage Goten, who's exhausted after training with his father, and Vegeta and Bulma arrive, Goku telling them that they haven't seen each other in a while, and Bulma stating it's been four years. Goku makes a joke about Bulma being old, and she retorts by calling Saiyans freaks, but Vegeta explains that Saiyans remain young longer so they can fight, Bulma then wondering if she should ask Shenron to make her younger. Goku tells Vegeta that he's training to enter the Tenkaichi Budokai tomorrow, as there's an incredible fighter coming, but Vegeta doesn't initially believe it. Trunks then arrives to talk to Goten, the half Saiyan then revealing that he's going to enter the Budokai as well, but not by choice, as Goku's making him go. We're then introduced to Pan, Gohan and Videl's daughter who flew around the earth, stating that she'll be entering the tournament as well. Vegeta then decides to join himself and forces Trunks to do the same, otherwise he'll cut his allowance. The next day, we cut backstage as Hercule schemes with Fat Boo so he can come out on top as the winner in the tournament this year. Goku and the gang arrive and greet him, and we cut to the lottery to determine the matchups, as Goku asks Boo to use his magic to manipulate the drawing for him so he can go head to head with the incredible fighter. The lottery begins and everyone begins to draw numbers. Suddenly, a short village boy named Oob steps up to draw, and Goku makes it known that he's the fighter he was referring to. Vegeta is of course surprised, prompting Goku to explain that 10 years ago when Kid Buu was beaten, he made a wish that the monster could be reborn as a good guy, and King Yemma was listening, confirming that this kid was apparently the reincarnation of Kid Buu. Meanwhile, Oob is nervous about the competition, but hopes to win the prize money to bring back food to his village. The tournament's announcer begins by explaining the procedures, instructing fighters to enter the ring when called and allowing them to relax or warm up beforehand. Goten is unhappy that he has to face Buu in the first round, but Goku believes it wouldn't be an issue if Goten had trained harder. One of the fighters, Mokeko, complains about facing a little kid and insults Pan, causing her to stick out her tongue at him. Otoko Suki is pleased to face Trunks, while Nock taunts Vegeta about his age. Vegeta calmly punches Nock away, knocking him out. The announcer declares that the tournament has begun, and the first match features Pan, a four-year-old girl and grandchild of Hercule, against Mokeko, who lost to Mr. Boo in the last tournament semifinals last year. Despite concerns from some fans and Hercule himself, Pan quickly defeats Mokeko by knocking him out of the ring. The second match features Goku and the 10-year-old boy named Oob, who Goku intends to train. Realizing Oob's nervous nature, Goku decides to trash talk him to get him to fight, and Oob puts up quite a good one, impressing everyone with his abilities. Having seen enough, Goku offers to train Oob, the boy nervous at first as he really only came for the prize money to feed his family, but Goku assures him that Hercule will give him everything he needs. Goku then flies toward his family and bids them a farewell, stating that he doesn't know how long it'll take to train Oob, but he'll come and visit from time to time. And with that, the two leave the tournament to head towards Oob's village. Goku's family can't believe he left so suddenly, while Piccolo states he hasn't seen Goku this happy in a long time. Vegeta then states how he knows Goku all too well, and that him training Oob has nothing to do with protecting the Earth. Meanwhile, Goku makes Oob promise to fight him when his training's complete, and gives him the flying Nimbus, revealing that the kid is in fact pure of heart. The two then take off excitedly on their new adventure, ready to confront any challenge in their way, and remembering that the Dragon Balls will always be there for them in the end.